Introduction to Air Raid What can I say about the next story? Well, actually, I could say so much that I'd be in danger of having the introduction run longer than the story itself. It all began one rather warm afternoon in Damon and Kate's living room at the Milford Conference, as I tried not to doze off while somebody's story was being efficiently deconstructed. It might even have been one of my stories. Suddenly this idea appeared in my head, full-blown. Five minutes later it was more or less completely written. All I had to do was go home and sit at the typewriter for a while. I did it that night, finishing just as the sun was coming up. Ten years later I found myself standing with Chris Christofferson on a steep hillside on the outskirts of Toronto at 3 a.m., so cold I couldn't feel my feet. The hillside was smoking, there were small fires everywhere, and the twisted wreckage of an old 707 which had been trucked in from an airliner graveyard in Mexico was artfully scattered over several blackened acres, along with thousands of crushed suitcases, carefully scorched clothing, and all manner of other junk. There was a line of big trucks along the dirt road behind me, gaffers and grips, vans, craft services dispensing sandwiches and bottles of Avion water to the five hundred people standing around, honey wagons, Winnebago's, mobile makeup and hairdressers' studios. There were thirty cars made up to look like police cruisers from various jurisdictions in Minnesota, right down to fake license plates. There were a dozen real fire trucks ready to spray water over the scene. There were four large camera booms, miles and miles of cables, hundreds of massive lights, and three camera helicopters zooming overhead. The scene was so convincing that two real airline pilots on approach to the Toronto airport a few miles away called the tower to report that a big jet had gone down. Chris swept his arm to indicate the scene and grinned at me. "'John, you wrote all this,' he said. A few minutes later somebody shouted, "'Action!' But I'm getting ahead of myself. I sold the story, Air Raid, to Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine, a new publication which had first been announced while I was attending Milford. It was to appear in the very first issue, but I had already sold him another story. The editor, George Sithers, suggested I might want to use a pseudonym. Back in the forties there were guys who wrote entire issues of SF magazines under eight different names. Asimov said he thought it was a silly custom, but I was tickled by the idea, and used the name Herb Beam. Herbert is my middle name, and the one I used until I decided to become a writer. John Varley just looked better to me, and Beam is my mother's maiden name. It is the only time I've ever used a pseudonym. The story was collected in different anthologies. One of them was read by Dennis Lasker, an assistant to John Foreman, a man who had produced many of Paul Newman's films, most notably Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Air Raid is about people from the future who are taking people off airplanes that are about to crash. They aren't gentle about it. It is without a doubt the most action-packed story I've ever done. Dennis was on a plane when he read it, and later told me he kept looking over his shoulder, worried about being kidnapped. Soon I was on an airplane myself, winging down to Los Angeles. I was taken to the polo lounge in the Beverly Hills Hotel for a lunch meeting. Dustin Hoffman was sitting at the next table. At my table were John Foreman, Douglas Trumbull, the special effects wizard behind 2001, A Space Odyssey, who would be directing the proposed movie, Freddie Fields, who used to be Judy Garland's agent, and David Beagleman. Beagleman's name was familiar. That very morning in the hotel his name had been in the headline of the Los Angeles Times, plea bargaining his way into community service because he forged Cliff Robertson's name on $80,000 worth of checks to cover gambling debts. Many years later David killed himself in a five-star hotel in Beverly Hills. I don't think it had anything to do with the movie we discussed that day, which would come to be called Millennium, but I wouldn't swear to it. It almost drove me to suicide. If any movie ever had a checkered history, it was Millennium. I was hired to write a forty-page treatment turning what could have been a very exciting episode of The Twilight Zone into a feature-length movie. I was also hired to write a novelization, which struck me as putting the cart before the horse. But since I was assured I'd have a totally free hand, 
and wouldn't have to adhere slavishly to whatever script was eventually turned in, I accepted the assignment. A good thing, too. The man they hired to write the script eventually produced something that bore only a passing relationship to Air Raid. I hated it. Luckily, so did everybody else. I showed John the script I had written in four feverish days, adapted from my story, The Phantom of Kansas. He liked it. I allowed as how I'd like a shot at Millennium. Amazingly, he thought that was a good idea. Even more amazingly, so did Doug, David, and Freddy. I was in the screenwriting business. We discussed the project with Paul Newman. John suggested Jane Fonda for the female lead. Pretty heady stuff. I turned in the first draft, which was read and endlessly rehashed as is standard practice in Hollywood. I began on the second draft. Then one night Natalie Wood went swimming, drowned, and Millennium was dead. In hindsight, I know it probably should have stayed dead, but it soon became the development project that wouldn't die. Good science fiction title, that. Why did Natalie Wood's death drive the first stake in the undying heart of Millennium? Simple. Doug Trumbull was directing Brainstorm at the time, and Natalie Wood was starring in it. MGM took a look at the insurance on the project and found, to the surprise and delight of the studio bean counters, that they could make a tidy profit by just closing the picture down. Doug Trumbull thought he could finish it, shoot around her few remaining scenes, and, if necessary, perform some of his special effects hoodoo and morph Wood's face onto a double. Create a Natalie Golem, sort of like Gollum. MGM thought this was in bad taste, and besides, we've got a guaranteed profit. Doug thought it would be a good memorial to Natalie, and besides, he wanted to finish the picture. He took them to court. Within a week, Doug was about as welcome on the MGM lot as Michael Cimino after Heaven's Gate. Okay, so it wasn't so simple, but there it was. Nobody blamed any of this on me, so while John Foreman looked around for ways to get his picture going again, other producers came calling. Over the next ten years I worked on several projects. I was offered Star Trek III, but turned it down because I knew nothing about Star Trek, and don't even like it. And I wrote three screenplays that I still think would make good movies, including an adaptation of Heinlein's Have Space Suit, Will Travel. Nothing happened with them. This is not at all unusual in that business. Everybody in Hollywood has good, unproduced scripts lying around in studio vaults. During those ten years, between bouts of rewriting Millennium, I lived in Eugene but spent a lot of time in Hollywood. I stayed at great hotels, the Beverly Wilshire, the Chateau Marmont, the Westwood Marquis, Le Mondrian. I was treated to lunch and dinner at all the fanciest restaurants. I visited or worked at all the major studios except Universal, Fox, Warner Brothers, Columbia, Disney. None of them looked like they do in the movies, with hundreds of extras milling about the streets in exotic costumes, big stars in limos, stagehands shifting props and scenery and lights. In fact, most of them looked like they ought to have tumbleweeds bouncing down the streets. In appearance, they varied from a bit frayed around the edges to downright decrepit, except Disney, which was neat and clean and looked pretty much like my old high school. I strolled down Goofy Drive, expecting to hear the class bell ringing. At the Burbank Studios, I hung around at the Walton's West Virginia home, which was a hollow shell. I saw appalling indifference to cinema history from gigantic model warships used in in harm's way left out in the weather to fall apart to old storage sheds with film canisters spilling out onto the ground and unreeling. Who knows what was on those old reels? Lost. All lost. At one point I had an office right at the MGM gate. You can see my window on any number of studio documentaries. I could sit there, not working very hard, and watch Eric Estrada arriving to work on Chips, which was about the only thing filming there at the time. I could amble down the avenue with the bungalows that used to belong to Metro's biggest stars, and there were none bigger, and now all housed production companies. I saw Esther Williams' giant swimming pool, now dry. The lot has been renamed Sony Pictures Studios, which I'm sure makes Louis B. Mayer spin rapidly in his grave. During that time, I worked on a development project with Jeffrey Katzenberg, later the K of S.K.G., S for Spielberg, G for Geffen. 
I met Charlton Heston, Art Linkletter, John Voigt, Mel Gibson, Joanne Woodward, Peter O'Toole, Sigourney Weaver, Gary Busey, and Kirk Douglas, among others. All of them were shorter than I had imagined, except Sigourney. None of this has anything to do with Millennium, but it's so much fun to drop names, and I figured this was the best place to do it. A while later, Richard Rush, who made the wonderful The Stunt Man, was signed to direct the project, and we started a rewrite to bring the script more in line with his personal vision. I soon learned that all directors want to do that. It was fun working with Richard, but I soon began to think he was going to turn my story into The Stunt Man 2. Our most memorable meeting was when he flew us to Catalina Island in his plane for buffalo burgers at the airport restaurant. The airport on Catalina is on the highest point, so I'm probably one of the few people to visit there who's never been to the only town on the island, Avalon. And that fell apart because of personality clashes between John Foreman and Richard Rush. We went to Canada some years later and hired Alvin Rakoff. That fell apart, some financing deal in the Netherlands. We hired Philip Borsus. That fell apart. I have no idea why. Finally, everything was in place just about nine years after I wrote the first screenplay, and I was invited to Toronto to work with Michael Anderson. He directed The Dam Busters, which George Lucas stole from when filming the climactic battle in Star Wars. He also directed the best picture of 1958, Around the World in Eighty Days, and had a lot of great stories to tell about Mike Todd, the insane producer of that spectacle. Michael was no stranger to salvaging pictures that were in trouble. He said that on the first day of shooting Orca, the expensive mechanical killer whale that was supposed to be the star of the show caught fire, burned, and sank, never to be seen again. They had to shoot without it. Maybe that should have warned me. We rented a gigantic empty factory building that had formerly made massive transformers and started building what was at the time the largest indoor set ever constructed in Canada. And I got to do something that screenwriters seldom do, which was spend six months in Toronto doing continuous rewrites and watching the movie being made, from early drawings to the first nail being driven into the first board to the last day of principal photography. I have to say that movie making is quite the most exciting pursuit I've ever been involved in. There is an air of urgency, and most of the things you do are far from everyday reality. The people involved are creating illusions very carefully, and it is fascinating. I must also report that it is the dullest work imaginable. You've heard the expression, boring as watching paint dry. It's that dull. In fact, a lot of the movie business is watching paint dry. It can take many hours to set up one shot that lasts five seconds then many hours to set up the next shot. Only the grips and the director are busy most of the time. A writer is usually the least busy of all, until suddenly an actor doesn't like the way a line plays, and then you are very busy indeed. I had a ball, and at the end we got to blow everything up. Big explosions. And in the end, we made a rotten movie. There are lots of people I could blame for that, but I let the blame rest squarely on the one most responsible for it, myself. It's my name on it, and it's my baby. What happened, in hindsight, is that I lost the vision. I should have bailed out on the third or fourth director, but the project had acquired a life of its own. It wouldn't die, and I didn't want to abandon it. I kept thinking I could eventually steer it back on course, but by the end— the script was covered with so many fingerprints it would have baffled a forensic scientist. When rewrites are added to a script in production, they are printed on paper of a different color and tipped into the original. By the last day of shooting, I don't think there were any two pages of the same color. So that's how it happened. I consoled myself by remembering that Harlan Ellison, one of the best writers working in SF movies and television, wrote a rotten script. William Goldman, maybe the best screenwriter ever, wrote a rotten script. So it can happen to any of us. I learned a lot, mostly what not to do and when to stand firm or get out. I love the movies. I see one almost every day. I'll get another shot, maybe at my most recent novel, Red Thunder, and I know I'll do better. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoy this unassuming little story that was the basis of all the racket.
air raid. I was jerked awake by the silent alarm vibrating my skull. It won't shut down until you sit up, so I did. All around me in the darkened bunk room, the snatch team members were sleeping singly and in pairs. I yawned, scratched my ribs, and patted Jean's hairy flank. He turned over. So much for a romantic send-off. Rubbing sleep from my eyes, I reached to the floor for my leg, strapped it on, and plugged it in. Then I was running down the rows of bunks toward Ops. The situation board glowed in the gloom. Sunbelt Airlines, Flight 128, Miami to New York, September 15, 1979. We'd been looking for that one for three years. I should have been happy, but who can afford it when you wake up? Liza Boston muttered past me on the way to prep. I muttered back and followed. The lights came on around the mirrors, and I groped my way to one of them. Behind us, three more people staggered in. I sat down, plugged in, and at last I could lean back and close my eyes. They didn't stay closed for long. Rush! I sat up straight as the sludge I used for blood was replaced with supercharged co-juice. I looked around me and got a series of idiot grins. There was Liza and Pinky and Dave. Against the far wall, Christabel was already turning slowly in front of the airbrush, getting a Caucasian paint job. It looked like a good team. I opened the drawer and started preliminary work on my face. It's a bigger job every time. Transfusion or no, I looked like death. The right ear was completely gone now. I could no longer close my lips. The gums were permanently bared. A week earlier, a finger had fallen off in my sleep. And what's it to you, bugger? While I worked, one of the screens around the mirror glowed. A smiling young woman, blonde, high brow, round face. Close enough. The crawl line read, Mary Katrina Sondergaard, born Crenton, New Jersey, age in 1979, 25. Baby, this is your lucky day. The computer melted the skin away from her face to show me the bone structure, rotated it, gave me cross-sections. I studied the similarities with my own skull, noted the differences. Not bad, and better than some I'd been given. I assembled a set of dentures that included the slight gap and the upper incisors. Putty filled out my cheeks. Contact lenses fell from the dispenser, and I popped them in. Nose plugs widened my nostrils. No need for ears. They'd be covered by the wig. I pulled a blank plastiflesh mask over my face and had to pause while it melted in. It took only a minute to mold it to perfection. I smiled at myself. How nice to have lips. The delivery slot clunked and dropped a blonde wig and a pink outfit into my lap. The wig was hot from the styler. I put it on, then the pantyhose. Mandy, did you get the profile on Sondergaard? I didn't look up. I recognized the voice. Roger, we've located her near the airport. We can slip you in before takeoff, so you'll be the joker. I groaned and looked up at the face on the screen. Alfreda Baltimore, Louisville, director of operational teams, lifeless face and tiny slits for eyes. What can you do when all the muscles are dead? Okay. You take what you get. She switched off, and I spent the next two minutes trying to get dressed while keeping my eyes on the screens. I memorized names and faces of crew members, plus the few facts known about them. Then I hurried out and caught up with the others. Elapsed time from first alarm? Twelve minutes and seven seconds. We'd better get moving. Goddamn sunbelt, Christabel groused, hitching at her bra. At least they got rid of the high heels, Dave pointed out. A year earlier, we would have been teetering down the aisles on three-inch platforms. We all wore short pink shifts with blue and white diagonal stripes across the front and carried matching shoulder bags. I fussed, trying to get the ridiculous pillbox cap pinned on. We jogged into the dark operations control room and lined up at the gate. Things were out of our hands now. Until the gate was ready, we could only wait. I was first a few feet away from the portal. I turned away from it. It gives me vertigo. I focused instead on the gnomes sitting at their consoles, bathed in yellow lights from their screens. None of them looked back at me. They don't like us much. I don't like them either. Withered, emaciated, all of them. Our fat legs and butts and breasts are a reproach to them, a reminder that the snatchers eat five times their ration to stay presentable for the masquerade. Meantime, we continue to rot. One day I'll be sitting at a console. 
One day I'll be built into a console, with all my guts on the outside and nothing left on my body but stink. The hell with him. I buried my gun under a clutter of tissues and lipsticks in my purse. Alfreda was looking at me. Where is she? I asked. Motel room. She was alone from 10 p.m. to noon on flight day. Departure time was 1.15. She had cut it close and would be in a hurry. Good. Can you catch her in the bathroom? Best of all, in the tub? We're working on it. She sketched a smile with a fingertip drawn over lifeless lips. She knew how I liked to operate, but she was telling me I'd take what I got. It never hurts to ask. People are at their most defenseless, stretched out and up to their necks in water. Go, Alfreda shouted. I stepped through, and things started to go wrong. I was facing the wrong way, stepping out of the bathroom door and facing the bedroom. I turned and spotted Mary Katrina Sondergaard through the haze of the gate. There was no way I could reach her without stepping back through. I couldn't even shoot without hitting someone on the other side. Sondergaard was at the mirror, the worst possible place. Few people recognized themselves quickly, but she'd been looking right at herself. She saw me, and her eyes widened. I stepped to the side, out of her sight. What the hell is— Hey! Who the hell— I noted the voice, which can be the trickiest thing to get right. I figured she'd be more curious than afraid. My guess was right. She came out of the bathroom, passing through the gate as if it wasn't there, which it wasn't, since it only has one side. She had a towel wrapped around her. Jesus Christ, what are you doing in my— Words fail you at a time like that. She knew she ought to say something, but what? Excuse me, haven't I seen you in the mirror? I put on my best stew smile and held out my hand. Pardon the intrusion. I can explain everything. You see, I'm— I hit her on the side of the head, and she staggered and went down hard. Her towel fell to the floor. Working my way through college. She started to get up, so I caught her under the chin with my artificial knee. She stayed down. Standard fuggin' oil, I hissed, rubbing my injured knuckles. But there was no time. I knelt beside her, checked her pulse. She'd be okay, but I think I loosened some front teeth. I paused a moment. Lord, to look like that, with no makeup, no prosthetics. She nearly broke my heart. I grabbed her under the knees and wrestled her to the gate. She was a sack of limp noodles. Somebody reached through, grabbed her feet, and pulled. So long, love. How would you like to go on a long voyage? I sat on her rented bed to get my breath. There were car keys and cigarettes in her purse, genuine tobacco worth its weight in blood. I lit six of them, figuring I had five minutes of my very own. The room filled with sweet smoke. They don't make them like that any more. The Hertz sedan was in the motel parking lot. I got in and headed for the airport. I breathed deeply of the air, rich in hydrocarbons. I could see for hundreds of yards into the distance. The perspective nearly made me dizzy, but I live for those moments. There's no way to explain what it's like in the pre-mech world. The sun was a fierce yellow ball through the haze. The other stews were boarding. Some of them knew Sondergaard, so I didn't say much, pleading a hangover. That went over well, with a lot of knowing laughs and sly remarks. Evidently it wasn't out of character. We boarded the 707 and got ready for the goats to arrive. It looked good. The four commandos on the other side were identical twins for the women I was working with. There was nothing to do but be a stewardess until departure time. I hoped there would be no more glitches. Inverting a gate for a joker run into a motel room was one thing, but in a 707 at 20,000 feet... The plane was nearly full when the woman Pinky would impersonate sealed the forward door. We taxied to the end of the runway, then we were airborne. I started taking orders for drinks in first. The goats were the usual lot for 1979. Fat and sassy, all of them, and as unaware of living in a paradise as a fish is of the sea. What would you think, ladies and gentlemen, of a trip to the future? No? I can't say I'm surprised. What if I told you this plane is going to— My alarm beeped as we reached cruising altitude. I consulted the indicator under my lady Bulova and glanced at one of the restroom doors. I felt a vibration pass through the plane. Damn it! Not so soon! The gate was in there. 
I came out quickly and motioned for Diana Gleason, Dave's pigeon, to come to the front. Take a look at this, I said, with a disgusted look. She started to enter the restroom, stopped when she saw the green glow. I planted a boot on her fanny and shoved. Perfect. Dave would have a chance to hear her voice before popping in, though she'd be doing little but screaming when she got a look around. Dave came through the gate, adjusting his silly little hat. Diana must have struggled. Be disgusted, I whispered. What a mess, he said as he came out of the restroom. It was a fair imitation of Diana's tone, though he'd missed the accent. It wouldn't matter much longer. What is it? It was one of the stews from tourists. We stepped aside so she could get a look, and Dave shoved her through. Pinky popped out very quickly. We're minus on minutes, Pinky said. We lost five on the other side. Five? Dave Diana squeaked. I felt the same way. We had a hundred and three passengers to process. Yeah, they lost contact after you pushed my pigeon through. It took that long to realign. You get used to that. Time runs at different rates on each side of the gate, though it's always sequential, past to future. Once we'd started the snatch with me entering Sondergaard's room, there was no way to go back any earlier on either side. Here in 1979, we had a rigid 94 minutes to get everything done. On the other side, the gate could never be maintained longer than three hours. When you left, how long was it since the alarm went in? Twenty-eight minutes. It didn't sound good. It would take at least two hours just customizing the wimps. Assuming there was no more slippage on seventy-nine time, we might just make it. But there's always slippage. I shuddered, thinking about riding it in. No time for any more games, then, I said. Pink, you go back to tourist and call both of the other girls up here. Tell them to come one at a time and tell them we've got a problem. You know the bit. Biting back the tears. Got you. She hurried aft. In no time, the first one showed up. Her friendly Sunbelt Airlines smile was stamped on her face, but her stomach would be churning. Oh, God, this is it. I took her by the elbow and pulled her behind the curtains in front. She was breathing hard. Welcome to the Twilight Zone, I said, and put the gun to her head. She slumped, and I caught her. Pinky and Dave helped me shove her through the gate. Fug! The rotting thing's flickering! Pinky was right. A very ominous sign. But the green glow stabilized as we watched, with who knows how much slippage on the other side. Christabel ducked through. We're plus thirty-three, she said. There was no sense talking about what we were all thinking. Things were going badly. Back to tourist, I said. Be brave. Smile at everyone, but make it just a little bit too good, got it? Check, Christabel said. We processed the other quickly, with no incident. Then there was no time to talk about anything. In eighty-nine minutes, Flight 128 was going to be spread all over a mountain, whether we were finished or not. Dave went into the cockpit to keep the flight crew out of our hair. Me and Pinky were supposed to take care of first class, then back up Christabel and Liza in tourist. We used the standard... Coffee, tea, or milk, Gambit, relying on our speed and their inertia. I leaned over the first two seats on the left. Are you enjoying your flight? Pop, pop. Two squeezes on the trigger, close to the heads and out of sight of the rest of the goats. Hi, folks. I'm Mandy. Fly me. Pop, pop. Halfway to the galley, a few people were watching us curiously. But people don't make a fuss until they have a lot more to go on. One goat in the back row stood up, and I let him have it. By now there were only eight left awake. I abandoned the smile and squeezed off four quick shots. Pinky took care of the rest. We hurried through the curtains, just in time. There was an uproar building in the back of Tourist, with about sixty percent of the goats already processed. Christabel glanced at me, and I nodded. "'Okay, folks,' she bawled. "'I want you to be quiet. Calm down and listen up. You, fathead, pipe down before I cram my foot up your ass sideways. The shock of hearing her talk like that was enough to buy us a little time, anyway. We had formed a skirmish line across the width of the plane, guns out, steadied on seat backs, aimed at the milling, befuddled group of thirty goats. The guns are enough to awe all but the most foolhardy. In essence, a standard-issue stunner is just a plastic rod with two grids about six inches apart, there's not enough metal in it to set off a hijack alarm. 
and to people from the Stone Age to about 2190, it doesn't look any more like a weapon than a ballpoint pen. So equipment section jazzes them up in a plastic shell to real Buck Rogers blasters with a dozen knobs and lights that flash and a barrel like the snout of a hog. Hardly anyone ever walks into one. We are in great danger, and time is short. You must all do exactly as I tell you, and you will be safe. You can't give them time to think. You have to rely on your status as the voice of authority. The situation is just not going to make sense to them, no matter how you explain it. Just a minute. I think you owe us an airborne lawyer. I made a snap decision, thumbed the fireworks switch on my gun, and shot him. The gun made a sound like a flying saucer with hemorrhoids, spit sparks and little jets of flame, and extended a green laser finger to his forehead. He dropped. All pure cark, of course, but it sure is impressive. And it's damn risky, too. I had to choose between a panic if the fathead got them to thinking, and a possible panic from the flash of the gun. But when a twentieth gets to talking about his rights and what he is owed, things can get out of hand. It's infectious. It worked. There was a lot of shouting, people ducking behind seats, but no rush. We could have handled it, but we needed some of them conscious if we were ever going to finish the snatch. Get up. Get up, you slugs, Christabel yelled. He's stunned. Nothing worse. But I'll kill the next one who gets out of line. Now get to your feet and do what I tell you. Children first. Hurry as fast as you can to the front of the plane. Do what the stewardess tells you. Come on, kids, move. I ran back into first class just ahead of the kids, turned at the open restroom door and got on my knees. They were petrified. There were five of them, crying, some of them, which always chokes me up, looking left and right at dead people in the first class seats, stumbling, near panic. Come on, kids, I called to them, giving my special smile. Your parents will be along in just a minute. Everything's going to be all right, I promise you. Come on. I got three of them through. The fourth balked. She was determined not to go through that door. She spread her legs and arms, and I couldn't push her through. I will not hit a child. Never. She raked her nails over my face. My wig came off, and she gaped at my bare head. I shoved her through. Number five was sitting in the aisle, bawling. He was maybe seven. I ran back and picked him up, hugged him and kissed him and tossed him through. God, I needed a rest, but I was needed in tourist. You, 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 and you. Okay, you too. Help him, will you? Pinky had a practiced eye for the ones that wouldn't be any use to anyone, even themselves. We herded them toward the front of the plane, then deployed ourselves along the left side, where we could cover the workers. It didn't take long to prod them into action. We had them dragging the limp bodies forward as fast as they could go. Me and Christabel were in tourist, with the others up front. Adrenaline was being catabolized in my body now. The rush of action left me, and I started to feel very tired. There's an unavoidable feeling of sympathy for the poor dumb goats that starts to get me about this stage of the game. Sure, they were better off. Sure, they were going to die if we didn't get them off the plane. But when they saw the other side, they were going to have a hard time believing it. The first ones were returning for a second load, stunned at what they'd just seen. Dozens of people being put into a cubicle that was crowded when it was empty. One college student looked like he'd been hit in the stomach. He stopped by me, and his eyes pleaded. Look, I want to help you people. Just, what's going on? Is this some new kind of rescue? I mean, are we going to crash? I switched my gun to prod and brushed it across his cheek. He gasped and fell back. Shut your fuggin' mouth and get moving, or I'll kill you. It would be hours before his jaw was in shape to ask any more stupid questions. We cleared tourists and moved up. A couple of the work gang were pretty damn pooped by then. Muscles like horses, all of them, but they can hardly run up a flight of stairs. We let some of them go through, including a couple that were at least fifty years old. Jesus, fifty! We got down to a core of four men and two women who seemed strong— and worked them until they nearly dropped. But we processed everyone in twenty-five minutes. The porta pack came through as we were stripping off our clothes. Christabel knocked on the door to the cockpit, and Dave came out, already naked. A bad sign. I had to cork him, he said. Bleeding captain just had to make his grand march through the plane. I tried everything. Sometimes you have to do it. The plane was on autopilot, as it normally would be at this time. 
but if any of us did anything detrimental to the craft, changed the fixed course of events in any way, that would be it. All that work for nothing, and Flight 128 inaccessible to us for all time. I don't know sludge about time theory, but I know the practical angles. We can do things in the past only at times and in places where it won't make any difference. We have to cover our tracks. There's flexibility. Once a snatcher left her gun behind, and it went in with the plane. Nobody found it, or if they did, they didn't have the smoggiest idea of what it was. So we were okay. Flight 128 was mechanical failure. That's the best kind. It means we don't have to keep the pilot unaware of the situation in the cabin right down to ground level. We can cork him and fly the plane, since there's nothing he could have done to save the flight anyway. A pilot error smash is almost impossible to snatch. We mostly work mid-airs, bombs, and structural failures. If there's even one survivor, we can't touch it. It would not fit the fabric of space-time, which is immutable, though it can stretch a little, and we'd all just fade away and appear back in the ready room. My head was hurting. I wanted that porter pack very badly. Who has the most hours on a 707? Pinky did, so I sent her to the cabin, along with Dave, who could do the pilot's voice for air traffic control. You have to have a believable record in the flight recorder, too. They trailed two long tubes from the porta pack and the rest of us hooked in up close. We stood there, each of us smoking a fistful of cigarettes, wanting to finish them but hoping there wouldn't be time. The gate had vanished as soon as we tossed our clothes and the flight crew through. But we didn't worry long. There's other nice things about snatching, but nothing to compare with the rush of plugging into a porta pack. The wake-up transfusion is nothing but fresh blood rich in oxygen and sugars. What we were getting now was an insane brew of concentrated adrenaline, supersaturated hemoglobin, methadrine, white lightning, TNT, and Kickapoo joy juice. It was like a firecracker in your heart, a boot in the box that rattled your socks. "'I'm growing hair on my chest,' Christabel said solemnly. Everyone giggled. "'Would someone hand me my eyeballs? The blue ones or the red ones?' I think my ass just fell off. We'd heard them all before, but we howled anyway. We were strong, strong, and for one golden moment we had no worries. Everything was hilarious. I could have torn sheet metal with my eyelashes. But you get hyper on that mix. When the gate didn't show and didn't show and didn't sweet G's show, we all started milling. This bird wasn't going to fly all that much longer. Then it did show, and we turned on. The first of the wimps came through, dressed in the clothes taken from a passenger it had been picked to resemble. Two-thirty-five elapsed upside time, Christabel announced. Jesus! It is a deadening routine. You grab the harness around the wimp's shoulders and drag it along the aisle, after consulting the seat number painted on its forehead. The paint would last three minutes. You seat it, strap it in, break open the harness, and carry it back to toss through the gate as you grab the next one. You have to take it for granted. They've done their work right on the other side. Fillings in the teeth, fingerprints, the right match in height and weight and hair color. Most of those things don't matter much, especially on Flight 128, which was a crash and burn. There would be bits and pieces and burned to a crisp at that. But you can't take chances. Those rescue workers are pretty thorough on the parts they do find. The dental work and fingerprints especially are important. I hate wimps. I really hate them. Every time I grab the harness of one of them, if it's a child, I wonder if it's Alice. Are you my kid, you vegetable, you slug, you slimy worm? I joined the Snatchers right after the brain bugs ate the life out of my baby's head. I couldn't stand to think she was the last generation, that the last humans there would ever be would live with nothing in their heads, medically dead by standards that prevailed even in 1979, with computers working their muscles to keep them in tone. You grow up, reach puberty, still fertile, one in a thousand, rush to get pregnant in your first heat. Then you find out your mom or pop passed on a chronic disease bound right into the genes, and none of your kids will be immune. I knew about the paraleprosy. I grew up with my toes rotting away. But this was too much. What do you do? Only one in ten of the wimps had a customized face. It takes time and a lot of skill to build a new face that will stand up to a doctor's autopsy. 
The rest came pre-mutilated. We've got millions of them. It's not hard to find a good match in the body. Most of them would stay breathing, too dumb to stop until they went in with the plane. The plane jerked hard. I glanced at my watch. Five minutes to impact. We should have time. I was on my last wimp. I could hear Dave frantically calling the ground. A bomb came through the gate, and I tossed it into the cockpit. Pinky turned on the pressure sensor on the bomb and came running out, followed by Dave. Liza was already through. I grabbed the limp dolls in stewardess costume and tossed them to the floor. The engine fell off, and a piece of it came through the cabin. We started to depressurize. The bomb blew away part of the cockpit. The ground crash crew would read it. We hoped that part of the engine came through and killed the crew. No more words from the pilot on the flight recorder. And we turned, slowly, left and down. I was lifted toward the hole in the side of the plane, but I managed to hold on to a seat. Christabel wasn't so lucky. She was blown backwards. We started to rise slightly, losing speed. Suddenly it was uphill from where Christabel was lying in the aisle. Blood oozed from her temple. I glanced back. Everyone was gone, and three pink-suited wimps were piled on the floor. The plane began to stall, to nose down, and my feet left the floor. "'Come on, Belle!' I screamed. That gate was only three feet away from me, but I began pulling myself along to where she floated. The plane bumped, and she hit the floor. Incredibly, it seemed to wake her up. She started to swim toward me, and I grabbed her hand as the floor came up to slam us again. We crawled as the plane went through its final death agony, and we came to the door. The gate was gone. There wasn't anything to say. We were going in. It's hard enough to keep the gate in place on a plane that's moving in a straight line. When a bird gets to corkscrewing and coming apart, the math is fearsome. So I've been told. I embraced Christabel and held her bloodied head. She was groggy, but managed to smile and shrug. You take what you get. I hurried into the restroom and got both of us down on the floor, back to the forward bulkhead, Christabel between my legs, back to front, just like in training. We pressed our feet against the other wall. I hugged her tightly and cried on her shoulder. And it was there, a green glow to my left. I threw myself toward it, dragging Christabel, keeping low as two wimps were thrown head first through the gate above our heads. Hands grabbed and pulled us through. I clawed my way a good five yards along the floor. You can leave a leg on the other side, and I didn't have one to spare. I set up as they were carrying Christabel to medical. I patted her arm as she went by on the stretcher, but she was passed out. I wouldn't have minded passing out myself. For a while you can't believe it all really happened. Sometimes it turns out it didn't happen. You come back and find out all the goats in the holding pen have softly and suddenly vanished away, because the continuum won't tolerate the changes and paradoxes you've put into it. The people you've worked so hard to rescue are spread like tomato surprise all over some goddamn hillside in Carolina, and all you've got left is a bunch of ruined wimps and an exhausted snatch team. But not this time. I could see the goats milling around in the holding pen, naked and more bewildered than ever, and just starting to be really afraid. Elfrida touched me as I passed her. She nodded, which meant well done in her limited repertoire of gestures. I shrugged, wondering if I cared. But the surplus adrenaline was still in my veins, and I found myself grinning at her. I nodded back. Jean was standing by the holding pen. I went to him, hugged him. I felt the juices start to flow. Damn it, let's squander a little ration and have us a good time. Someone was beating on the sterile glass wall of the pen. She shouted, mouthing angry words at us. Why? What have you done to us? It was Mary Sondergaard. She implored her bald, one-legged twin to make her understand. She thought she had problems. God, was she pretty. I hated her guts. Jean pulled me away from the wall. My hands hurt, and I'd broken off all my fake nails without scratching the glass. She was sitting on the floor now, sobbing. I heard the voice of the briefing officer on the outside speaker. Centauri Three is hospitable, with an Earth-like climate. By that I mean your Earth, not what it has become. You'll see more of that later. The trip will take five years' ship time. 
Upon landfall, you will be entitled to one horse, a plow, three axes, two hundred kilos of seed grain. I leaned against Jean's shoulder. At their lowest ebb, this very moment, they were so much better than us. I had maybe ten years, half of that as a basket case. They are our best, our very brightest hope. Everything is up to them. That no one will be forced to go, we wish to point out again, not for the last time, that you would all be dead without our intervention. There are things you should know, however. You cannot breathe our air. If you remain on earth, you can never leave this building. We are not like you. We are the result of a genetic winnowing, a mutation process. We are the survivors, but our enemies have evolved along with us. They are winning. You, however, are immune to the diseases that afflict us. I winced and turned away. The other hand, if you emigrate, you will be given a chance at a new life. It won't be easy, but as Americans you should be proud of your pioneer heritage. Your ancestors survived, and so will you. It can be a rewarding experience, and I urge you— Sure. Jean and I looked at each other and laughed. Listen to this, folks. Five percent of you will suffer nervous breakdowns in the next few days and never leave. About the same number will commit suicide, here and on the way. When you get there, sixty to seventy percent will die in the first three years. You will die in childbirth, be eaten by animals, bury two out of three of your babies, starve slowly when the rains don't come. If you live, it will be to break your back behind a plow, sun up to dusk. New earth is heaven, folks. God, how I wish I could go with them. Introduction to Press Enter I've always thought of myself as a high-tech sort of guy, though lately I've fallen a bit behind. I don't have an MP3 player or a DVD burner or a picture cell phone or a plasma television. They bring out the stuff now faster than I can find a use for it. But I bought a CD player when they were pretty new and rare, and I had a JVC VCR back when it was the fanciest one you could buy. There were only thirty titles for rent, blank tapes cost thirty-five dollars, and the remote had a wire on it. I paid one thousand three hundred dollars. The last VCR I bought, probably my sixth, cost me sixty dollars. When I started writing, I wanted the best tools. I skipped right over chisels on rocks, stylus on wet clay plates, quills and fountain pens, even mechanical pencils, and went straight to one of the first popular spin-offs of the aerospace program, the ballpoint pen. They were developed for bomber navigators in the war because fountain pens would squirt all over your leather bomber jacket at altitude. I have a cherished example of the next generation ballpoint, a pressurized space pen cleverly designed to work in weightlessness, given to me by Spider Robinson. At least I cherish it when I can find it. It is also cleverly designed to seek out the lowest point of your desk, roll off, then find the lowest point on the floor, under a heavy piece of furniture. That's because it is cylindrical and lacks a pocket clip to keep it from rolling. In space, I presume, it would float out of your pocket and find a forgotten corner of your spacecraft to hide in. NASA spent three million dollars developing it. Good job, guys. I'm sure it's around here somewhere. When I decided I'd better learn to type, I bought an electric machine. Never learned to type on a manual. I'm hopeless at it. I used carbon paper because Xeroxing was fairly expensive, and whiteout because I made a lot of mistakes. When I wore out the Smith Corona, I invested a lot of money in the Rolls-Royce of typewriters— an IBM correcting Selectric. I could fool around for hours watching the little type ball twitch faster than the eye could follow. No more jammed up keys. You want a new typeface? Pop in another golf ball. No more blobs of white-out glop. No more eraser scraps gumming up the works. Just press a key, and the tape jumps up and sucks the ink right out of the paper. No more smudgy cloth ribbons I used over and over because my innate frugality wouldn't let me throw them away as long as the words were even slightly readable. The IBM used film ribbons, and the print was sharper than a newspaper or book. I loved that machine. I loved it so much that for years I resisted the enthusiastic endorsements of friends who had these infernal machines called word processors. 
Heck, I didn't want to process words. I wanted to write. After a few years, when everybody I knew owned a computer, I even wrote a silly little story called The Unprocessed Word, pointing out the perils of entrusting your golden prose to the uncertain innards of a cantankerous machine, instead of committing them to nice, pretty white paper. And they were uncertain, too. One thing I noticed when people were talking about computers, and by then everybody was talking about computers, you couldn't shut them up once they got started, was that every single one of them had lost massive chunks of data in something called a crash, usually more than once. They spoke about this with an odd pride, but it made me break out in a cold sweat. In my twenty-odd years of writing I had never lost so much as one precious piece of paper, never had to go back and think the whole thing out again. The IBM correcting Selectric was infallible, errorless, crashless. Point two. They were expensive. I gulped hard when I paid $860 for the IBM. With these word processors, $860 was about what you paid for the word processing software. Okay, slight exaggeration. But the first word processor I ever actually used belonged to Richard Rush. We were rewriting the script to Millennium. It was made by one of those defunct pioneers, maybe Osborne. It had a daisy-wheel printer console the size of a Victrola that made a racket like the starting lap at Daytona Beach. If you couldn't afford one of these beasts, there was an alternative, dot matrix printing. Oh, please! The Y and the P and the G and the Q didn't drop below the line. Each letter was formed of about nine little dots. I'd rather read Braille with my toes, with my shoes on. The Osborne had enough memory for forty, maybe fifty pages of text. The whole ensemble, which pretty much filled an office, cost more than fifteen thousand dollars. Richard didn't care. The studio was paying for it. Six times a day it did something inexplicable, or failed to do anything at all. For these times you consulted an instruction manual the size of the Manhattan phone book, written in Sanskrit. I didn't want to learn a new language. I wanted to write. Point three. They were ugly. Ugly, ugly, ugly. You could get any color you wanted in a screen so long as it was green. Later also orange. Big deal. They were gray or beige and looked like a TV set you bought at Kmart. My IBM was black, the only color for serious machinery, and looked like a stealth fighter jet. Lee and her ex-husband had a TRS-80, trash-80, everybody called them affectionately, that used floppy disks the size of dinner plates. It had a capacity much inferior to your average cell phone these days. These computers were made of masonite or fiberglass or linoleum, and made a wimpy little tickety-tickety sound when you typed on them. With my IBM, when I got frustrated and was crumpling sheet after sheet and tossing it in the garbage can, I could pound on the sucker, bang my head on it, bite it, and do no harm except to my teeth. With a computer, you didn't dare look at it sideways, or a connection would come loose, and you could spend days finding it. Hit it, and you could be out five or six grand. My dear friend Spider Robinson came to visit and proudly brought his Mac, a pathetic little beige tower with a screen quite a bit bigger than a watch face. It was user-friendly, he said. You could play pinball on it. I tried and concluded it would never replace my arcade-sized Gorgar machine. I was wrong, eventually. Two days ago I saw a three-by-five-foot flat-screen plasma pinball machine that belongs to Michael Jackson. Wow! Point four. You always needed something else. New modem. Bigger external drive. Maybe as much as one hundred kilobytes. Huge capacity. Printer cable. Expansion port. More programs or updates to old ones. It took an hour to assemble it all, and you ended up with a nest of wires that would strangle a rat. It seemed obvious to me this was not a mature technology. A toaster is a mature technology. You buy one for twelve dollars, take it out of the box, you throw away the instruction manual because all it's going to tell you is not to use it in the bathtub or blow-dry your cat with it. You plug it in. You drop in a piece of bread. A minute later you butter your toast. An IBM correcting Selectric was a mature technology. 
You roll in a piece of paper, you turn it on, you sit there for three hours, and you've probably only got one sentence, and that's a bad sentence, but that sentence will not go away if somebody plugs in a toaster in the kitchen and blows a fuse. I vowed that I would not buy a computer until it was as simple as a toaster. Step one, remove from box. Step two, plug in. Step three, turn on. Step four, write beautiful prose. Step four is always a little iffy, but I knew the first three steps were doable. I knew the day would come. I didn't wait that long. I broke down and bought one when I saw windows demonstrated, and figured that even an ex-physics major like me could operate it. I decided to go with ninety percent of the world and get a PC, and Spider has never forgiven me. I am now on my third computer. This one is the toaster. It's an HP Pavilion ZE 1110, and I paid nine hundred dollars for it two years ago. It weighs a couple of pounds. It came with three things in the box. The laptop, the power cord, and a telephone cord, which I didn't need because I already had six of them, just like you. I didn't use the four-page instruction manual, which had almost no text, but lots of helpful pictures for illiterates. Didn't need to. I wasn't going to use it in the bathtub. It is about one million times more powerful than the computer that was on Apollo 11. It has a twenty-gigabyte hard drive, of which I've used one. It has a CD-DVD drive. It would be way too much computer to run a starship on a thousand-year voyage to Alpha Centauri. It was obsolete twenty-three months ago, but I don't care. And I still manage to lose a page or two of priceless prose every year. In fact, last month I had a brain freeze and hit the wrong key twice and lost eighty percent of my email for 2003. The following story was written long before I got a computer, long before I knew anything but the ABCs of them. I take that back. I was still working on B. I knew some of the basic terms, modem, CRT, dot matrix, bit, byte, kilobyte. The computer slang I got from something called the Hacker's Dictionary, which Richard Rush found and downloaded, a new word at the time, while surfing the infant Internet. Much of it is obsolete now. LOL, colon, dash, parenthesis, as is all of the hardware. After it was published, two things surprised me. One was that people assumed I knew not only ABC, but DEFG, HIJK, LMNOP, and maybe Q about computers. They want to share their epic computer crash stories with me and discuss the virtues and drawbacks of ASCII and WordPerfect and URLs and WYSIWYG and GIGO, and were amazed to discover I didn't know what any of these things were, that I didn't even own one, not even a trash 80. So I guess I faked it adequately. I was proud of that, because faking is the very essence of science fiction, possibly of life in general. The second thing was that lots of people told me the story had scared the silicon chips out of them. This amazed me, because I hadn't thought it was particularly scary. Sad and gruesome and lonely, sure. But scary? I went back and read it again, something I seldom do after a story is published. And it creeped me out. I hope it creeps you out, too. In a nice way. Press Enter. This is a recording. Please do not hang up until... I slammed the phone down so hard it fell onto the floor. Then I stood there, dripping wet and shaking with anger. Eventually the phone started to make that buzzing noise they make when a receiver is off the hook. It's twenty times as loud as any sound a phone can normally make, and I always wondered why. As though it was such a terrible disaster. Emergency. Your telephone is off the hook. Phone answering machines are one of the small annoyances of life. Confess, do you really like talking to a machine? But what had just happened to me was more than a petty irritation. I had just been called by an automatic dialing machine. They're fairly new. I'd been getting about two or three such calls a month. Most of them come from insurance companies. They give you a two-minute spiel and then a number to call if you are interested. I called back once to give them a piece of my mind and was put on hold, complete with Muzak. They use lists, 
I don't know where they get them. I went back to the bathroom, wiped water droplets from the plastic cover of the library book, and carefully lowered myself back into the water. It was too cool. I ran more hot water and was just getting my blood pressure back to normal when the phone rang again. So I sat there through fifteen rings, trying to ignore it. Did you ever try to read with the phone ringing? On the sixteenth ring I got up, I dried off, put on a robe, walked slowly and deliberately into the living room. I stared at the phone for a while. On the fiftieth ring I picked it up. This is a recording. Please do not hang up until the message has been completed. This call originates from the house of your next-door neighbor, Charles Kluge. It will repeat every ten minutes. Mr. Kluge knows he has not been the best of neighbors and apologizes in advance for the inconvenience. He requests that you go immediately to his house. The key is under the mat. Go inside and do what needs to be done. There will be a reward for your services. Thank you. Click. Dial tone. I'm not a hasty man. Ten minutes later, when the phone rang again, I was still sitting there thinking it over. I picked up the receiver and listened carefully. It was the same message. As before, it was not Kluge's voice. It was something synthesized, with all the human warmth of a speak and spell. I heard it out again and cradled the receiver when it was done. I thought about calling the police. Charles Kluge had lived next door to me for ten years. In that time I may have had a dozen conversations with him, none lasting longer than a minute. I owed him nothing. I thought about ignoring it. I was still thinking about that when the phone rang again. I glanced at my watch. Ten minutes. I lifted the receiver and put it right back down. I could disconnect the phone. It wouldn't change my life radically. But in the end I got dressed and went out the front door, turned left, and walked toward Kluge's property. My neighbor across the street, Hal Lanier, was out mowing the lawn. He waved to me, and I waved back. It was about seven in the evening of a wonderful August day. The shadows were long. There was the smell of cut grass in the air. I've always liked that smell. About time to cut my own lawn, I thought. It was a thought Kluge had never entertained. His lawn was brown and knee-high and choked with weeds. I rang the bell. When nobody came, I knocked. Then I sighed, looked under the mat, and used the key I found there to open the door. Kluge? I called out as I stuck my head in. I went along the short hallway, tentatively, as people do when unsure of their welcome. The drapes were drawn, as always, so it was dark in there. But in what had once been the living room, ten television screens gave more than enough light for me to see Kluge. He sat in a chair in front of a table, with his face pressed into a computer keyboard, and the side of his head blown away. Hal Lanier operates a computer for the LAPD, so I told him what I had found, and he called the police. We waited together for the first car to arrive. Hal kept asking if I'd touched anything, and I kept telling him no except for the front doorknob. An ambulance arrived without the siren. Soon there were police all over and neighbors standing out in the yards or talking in front of Kluge's house. Crews from some of the television stations arrived in time to get pictures of the body, wrapped in the plastic sheet being carried out. Men and women came and went. I assumed they were doing all the standard police things, taking fingerprints, collecting evidence. I would have gone home, but had been told to stick around. Finally, I was brought in to see Detective Osborne, who was in charge of the case. I was led into Kluge's living room. All the television screens were still turned on. I shook hands with Osborne. He looked me over before he said anything. He was a short guy, balding. He seemed very tired until he looked at me. Then, though nothing really changed in his face, he didn't look tired at all. "'You're Victor Apfel?' he asked. I told him I was. He gestured at the room. "'Mr. Apfel, can you tell me if anything has been taken from this room?' I took another look around, approaching it as a puzzle. There was a fireplace, and there were curtains over the windows. There was a rug on the floor. Other than those items, there was nothing else you would expect to find in a living room. All the walls were lined with tables, leaving a narrow aisle down the middle. On the tables were monitor screens, keyboards, disk drives, 
all the glossy bric-a-brac of the new age. They were interconnected by thick cables and cords. Beneath the tables were still more computers, and boxes full of electronic items. Above the tables were shelves that reached the ceiling, and were stuffed with boxes of tapes, discs, cartridges. There was a word for which I couldn't recall just then. It was software. There's no furniture, is there? Other than that, how would I know? Then I realized what the misunderstanding was. Oh, you thought I'd been here before. The first time I ever set foot in this room was about an hour ago. He frowned, and I didn't like that much. The medical examiner says the guy had been dead about three hours. How come you came over when you did, Victor? I didn't like him using my first name, but didn't see what I could do about it, and I knew I had to tell him about the phone call. He looked dubious, but there was one easy way to check it out, and we did that. Hal and Osborne and I and several others trooped over to my house. My phone was ringing as we entered. Osborne picked it up and listened. He got a very sour expression on his face. As the night wore on, it just got worse and worse. We waited ten minutes for the phone to ring again. Osborne spent the time examining everything in my living room. I was glad when the phone rang again. They made a recording of the message, and we went back to Kluge's house. Osborne went into the backyard to see Kluge's forest of antennas. He looked impressed. Mrs. Madison down the street thinks he was trying to contact Martians, Hal said with a laugh. Me? I just thought he was stealing HBO. There were three parabolic dishes. There were six tall masts, and some of those things you see on telephone company buildings for transmitting microwaves. Osborne took me to the living room again. He asked me to describe what I had seen. I didn't know what good that would do, but I tried. He was sitting in that chair, which was here in front of this table. I saw the gun on the floor. His hand was hanging down toward it. You think it was suicide? Yes, I guess I did think that. I waited for him to comment, but he didn't. Is that what you think? He sighed. There wasn't any note. They don't always leave notes, Hal pointed out. No, but they do often enough that my nose starts to twitch when they don't. He shrugged. It's probably nothing. That phone call, I said. That might be a kind of suicide note. Osborne nodded. Was there anything else you noticed? I went to the table and looked at the keyboard. It was made by Texas Instruments, model TI-99-4A. There was a large blood stain on the right side of it, where his head had been resting. Just that he was sitting in front of this machine... I touched a key in the monitor screen behind the keyboard immediately filled with words. I quickly drew my hand back, then stared at the message there. Program name? Goodbye, Real World. Date? 820. Contents? Last Will and Testament. Miscellaneous Features. Programmer? Charles Kluge. To run? Press Enter. The black square at the end flashed on and off. Later I learned it was called a cursor. Everyone gathered around. Hal, the computer expert, explained how many computers went blank after ten minutes of no activity so the words wouldn't be burned into the television screen. This one had been green until I touched it, then displayed black letters on a blue background. "'Has the console been checked for prints?' Osborne asked. Nobody seemed to know, so Osborne took a pencil and used the eraser to press the Enter key. The screen cleared, stayed blue for a moment, then filled with little ovoid shapes that started at the top of the screen and descended like rain. There were hundreds of them in many colors. "'Those are pills,' one of the cops said, in amazement. "'Look, that's got to be a quaalude. There's an imbutol. Other cops pointed out other pills. I recognized the distinctive red stripe around the center of a white capsule that had to be a dilantin. I had been taking them every day for years.' Finally, the pills stopped falling, and the damned thing started to play music at us. Nearer, my God, to thee, in three-part harmony. A few people laughed. I don't think any of us thought it was funny. It was creepy as hell listening to that eerie dirge. But it sounded like it had been scored for penny whistle, calliope, and kazoo. What could you do but laugh? 
As the music played, a little figure composed entirely of squares entered from the left of the screen and jerked spastically toward the center. It was like one of those human figures from a video game, but not as detailed. You had to use your imagination to believe it was a man. A shape appeared in the middle of the screen. The man stopped in front of it. He bent in the middle, and something that might have been a chair appeared under him. What's that supposed to be? A computer, isn't it? It must have been, because the little man extended his arms, which jerked up and down like Liberace at the piano. He was typing. The words appeared above him. Somewhere along the line I missed something. I sit here, night and day, a spider in the center of a coaxial web. Master of all I survey. And it is not enough. There must be more. Enter your name here. Jesus Christ, Hal said. I don't believe it. An interactive suicide note. Come on, we've got to see the rest of this. I was nearest the keyboard, so I leaned over and typed my name. But when I looked up, what I had typed was V-I-C-T-9-R. How do you back this up? I asked. Just enter it, Osborne said. He reached around me and pressed enter. Do you ever get that feeling, Vict 9R? You have worked all your life to be the best there is at what you do, and one day you wake up to wonder why you are doing it. That is what happened to me. Do you want to hear more, Vict 9R? Y slash N. The message rambled from that point. Kluge seemed to be aware of it, apologetic about it, because at the end of each forty- or fifty-word paragraph the reader was given the Y-N option. I kept glancing from the screen to the keyboard, remembering Kluge slumped across it. I thought about him sitting here alone, writing this. He said he was despondent. He didn't feel like he could go on. He was taking too many pills. More of them rained down the screen at this point and he had no further goal. He had done everything he set out to do. We didn't understand what he meant by that. He said he no longer existed. We thought that was a figure of speech. Are you a cop, Vict 9R? If you are not, a cop will be here soon. So to you or the cop, I was not selling narcotics. The drugs in my bedroom were for my own personal use. I used a lot of them, and now I will not need them any more. Press Enter. Osborne did, and a printer across the room began to chatter, scaring the hell out of all of us. I could see the carriage zipping back and forth, printing in both directions, when Hal pointed at the screen and shouted, Look! Look at that! The copyographic man was standing again. He faced us. He had something that had to be a gun in his hand, which now pointed at his head. Don't do it! Hal yelled. The little man didn't listen. There was a denatured gunshot sound, and the little man fell on his back. A line of red dripped down the screen. Then the green background turned to blue, the printer shut off, and there was nothing left but the little black corpse lying on its back and the word, Done, at the bottom of the screen. I took a deep breath and glanced at Osborne. It would be an understatement to say he did not look happy. What's this about drugs in the bedroom, he said. We watched Osborne pulling out drawers in dressers and bedside tables. He didn't find anything. He looked under the bed and in the closet. Like all the other rooms in the house, this one was full of computers. Holes had been knocked in walls for the thick sheaves of cables. I had been standing near a big cardboard drum, one of several in the room. It was about thirty-gallon capacity, the kind you ship things in. The lid was loose, so I lifted it. I sort of wished I hadn't. Osborne, I said, you'd better look at this. The drum was lined with a heavy-duty garbage bag, and it was two-thirds full of quaaludes. They pried the lids off the rest of the drums. We found drums full of amphetamines, of nimbutols, of valium, all sorts of things. With the discovery of the drugs, a lot more police returned to the scene. With them came the television camera crews. In all the activity, no one seemed concerned about me, so I slipped back to my own house and locked the door. From time to time I peeked out the curtains. I saw reporters interviewing the neighbors. 
Hal was there and seemed to be having a good time. Twice Cruz knocked on my door, but I didn't answer. Eventually they went away. I ran a hot bath and soaked in it for about an hour. Then I turned the heat up as high as it would go and got in bed, under the blankets. I shivered all night. Osborne came over about nine the next morning. I let him in. Hal followed, looking very unhappy. I realized they had been up all night. I poured coffee for them. "'You'd better read this first, Osborne said, and handed me the sheet of computer printout. I unfolded it, got out my glasses, and started to read. It was in that awful dot matrix printing. My policy is to throw any such trash into the fireplace unread, but I made an exception this time. It was Kluge's will. Some probate court was going to have a lot of fun with it. He stated again that he didn't exist, so he could have no relatives. He had decided to give all his worldly property to somebody who deserved it. But who was deserving, Kluge wondered. Well, not Mr. and Mrs. Perkins, four houses down the street. They were child abusers. He cited court records in Buffalo and Miami in a pending case locally. Mrs. Radner and Mrs. Polonsky, who lived across the street from each other five houses down, were gossips. The Andersons' oldest son was a car thief. Marion Flores cheated on her high school algebra tests. There was a guy nearby who was diddling the city on a freeway construction project. There was one wife in the neighborhood who made out with door-to-door -door salesmen, and two having affairs with men other than their husbands. There was a teenage boy who got his girlfriend pregnant, dropped her, and bragged about it to his friends. There were no fewer than nineteen couples in the immediate area who had not reported income to the IRS, or who had padded their deductions. Kluge's neighbors in back had a dog that barked all night. Well, I could vouch for the dog. He'd kept me awake often enough. But the rest of it was crazy. For one thing, where did a guy with two hundred gallons of illegal narcotics get the right to judge his neighbors so harshly? I mean, the child abusers were one thing. But was it right to tar a whole family because their son stole cars? And for another, how did he know some of this stuff? But there was more, specifically four philandering husbands. One was Harold Hal Lanier, who for three years had been seeing a woman named Tony Jones, a co-worker at the LAPD data processing facility. She was pressuring him for a divorce. He was waiting for the right time to tell his wife. I glanced up at Hal. His red face was all the confirmation I needed. Then it hit me. What had Kluge found out about me? I hurried down the page, searching for my name. I found it in the last paragraph. For thirty years Mr. Apfel has been paying for a mistake he did not even make. I won't go so far as to nominate him for sainthood, but by default, if for no other reason, I hereby leave all deed and title to my real property and the structure thereon to Victor Apfel. I looked at Osborne, and those tired eyes were weighing me. But I don't want it. Do you think this is the reward Kluge mentioned in the phone call? It must be, I said. What else could it be? Osborne sighed and sat back in his chair. At least he didn't try to leave you the drugs. Are you still saying you didn't know the guy? Are you accusing me of something? He spread his hands. Mr. Apfel, I'm simply asking a question. You're never one hundred percent sure in a suicide. Maybe it was murder. If it was, you can see that so far you're the only one we know of that's gained by it. He was almost a stranger to me. He nodded, tapping his copy of the computer printout. I looked back at my own, wishing it would go away. What's this mistake you didn't make? I was afraid that would be the next question. I was a prisoner of war in North Korea, I said. Osborne chewed that over for a while. They brainwash you? Yes. I hit the arm of my chair and suddenly had to be up and moving. The room was getting cold. No! I don't... There's been a lot of confusion about that word. Did they brainwash me? Yes. Did they succeed? Did I offer a confession of my war crimes and denounce the U.S. government? No. Once more I felt myself being inspected by those deceptively tired eyes. It's not something you forget. Is there anything you want to say about it? It's just that it was also... No. 
No, I have nothing further to say. Not to you, not to anybody. I'm going to have to ask you more questions about Kluge's death. I think I'll have my lawyer present for those. Christ, now I'm going to have to get a lawyer. I didn't know where to begin. Osborne just nodded again. He got up and went to the door. I was ready to write this one down as a suicide, he said. The only thing that bothered me was there was no note. Now we've got a note. He gestured in the direction of Kluge's house and started to look angry. This guy not only writes a note, he programs the fucking thing into his computer, complete with special effects straight out of Pac-Man. Now I know people do crazy things. I've seen enough of them. But when I heard the computer playing a hymn, that's when I knew this was murder. Tell you the truth, Mr. Apfel, I don't think you did it. There must be two dozen motives for murder in that printout. Maybe he was blackmailing people around here. Maybe that's how he bought all those machines. And people with that amount of drugs usually die violently. I've got a lot of work to do on this one, and I'll find who did it. He mumbled something about not leaving town and that he'd see me later and left. Vic, Hal said. I looked at him. About that printout, he finally said. I'd appreciate it. Well, they said they'd keep it confidential, if you know what I mean. He had eyes like a basset hound. I'd never noticed that before. Hal, if you'll just go home, you have nothing to worry about from me. He nodded and scuttled for the door. I don't think any of that will get out, he said. It all did, of course. It probably would have, even without the letters that began arriving a few days after Kluge's death, all postmarked, Trenton, New Jersey, all computer-generated from a machine no one was ever able to trace. The letters detailed the matters Kluge had mentioned in his will. I didn't know about any of that at the time. I spent the rest of the day after Hal's departure lying on my bed under the electric blanket. I couldn't get my feet warm. I got up only to soak in the tub or to make a sandwich. Reporters knocked on my door, but I didn't answer. On the second day I called a criminal lawyer, Martin Abrams, the first in the book, and retained him. He told me they'd probably call me down to the police station for questioning. I told him I wouldn't go, popped two dilantin, and sprinted for the bed. A couple of times I heard sirens in the neighborhood. Once I heard a shouted argument down the street. I resisted the temptation to look. I'll admit I was a little curious, but you know what happened to the cat. I kept waiting for Osborne to return, but he didn't. The days turned into a week. Only two things of interest happened in that time. The first was a knock on my door. This was two days after Kluge's death. I looked through the curtains and saw a silver Ferrari parked at the curb. I couldn't see who was on the porch, so I asked who it was. My name's Lisa Fu, she said. You asked me to drop by. I certainly don't remember it. Isn't this Charles Kluge's house? That's next door. Oh, sorry. I decided I ought to warn her Kluge was dead, so I opened the door. She turned and smiled at me. It was blinding. Where does one start in describing Lisa Fu? Remember when newspapers used to run editorial cartoons of Hirohito and Tojo, when the Times used the word Jap without embarrassment? Little guys with faces wide as footballs, ears like jug handles, thick glasses, two big rabbity buck teeth and pencil-thin mustaches. Leaving out only the mustache, she was a dead ringer for a cartoon Tojo. She had the glasses and the ears and the teeth, but her teeth had braces like piano keys wrapped in barbed wire and she was five-eight or five-nine and couldn't have weighed more than a hundred and ten. I'd have said a hundred, but added five pounds each for her breasts, so improbably large on her scrawny frame that all I could read of the message on her T-shirt was, Pock Live. It was only when she turned sideways that I saw the S's before and after. She thrust out a slender hand. "'Looks like I'm going to be your neighbor for a while,' she said at least until we get that dragon's lair next door straightened out. If she had an accent, it was San Fernando Valley. That's nice. Did you know him? Kluge, I mean. Or at least that's what he called himself. You don't think that was his name? I doubt it. Klug means clever in German. 
and its hacker slang for being tricky. And he sure was a tricky bugger. Definitely some glitches in the wetware. She tapped the side of her head meaningfully. Viruses and phantoms and demons jumping out every time they try to key in. Software rot, bit buckets overflowing onto the floor. She babbled on in that vein for a time. It might as well have been Swahili. Did you say there were demons in his computers? That's right. Sounds like they need an exorcist. She jerked her thumb at her chest and showed me another half acre of teeth. That's me. Listen, I gotta go. Drop in and see me any time. The second interesting event of the week happened the next day. My bank statement arrived. There were three deposits listed. The first was the regular check from the VA for $487. The second was for $392.54, interest on the money my parents had left me 15 years ago. The third deposit had come in on the 20th, the day Charles Kluge died. It was for $700,083.04. A few days later, Hal Lanier dropped by. Boy, what a week, he said. Then he flopped down on the couch and told me all about it. There had been a second death on the block. The letters had stirred up a bit of trouble, especially with the police going house to house questioning everyone. Some people had confessed to things when they were sure the cops were closing in on them. The woman who used to entertain salesmen while her husband was at work had admitted her infidelity, and the guy had shot her. He was in the county jail. That was the worst incident, but there had been others, from fist fights to rocks thrown through windows. According to Hal, the IRS was thinking of setting up a branch office in the neighborhood. So many people were being audited. I thought about this seven hundred thousand and eighty-three dollars and four cents. I didn't say anything, but my feet were getting cold. I suppose you want to know about me and Betty, he said at last. I didn't. I didn't want to hear any of this, but I tried for a sympathetic expression. That's all over, he said with a satisfied sigh. Between me and Tony, I mean. I told Betty all about it. It was real bad for a few days, but I think our marriage is stronger for it now. He was quiet for a moment, basking in the warmth of it all. I had kept a straight face under worst provocation, so I trust I did well enough then. He wanted to tell me all they'd learned about Kluge and he wanted to invite me over for dinner, but I begged off on both, telling him my war wounds were giving me hell. I just about had him to the door when Osborne knocked on it. There was nothing to do but let him in. Hal stuck around, too. I offered Osborne coffee, which he gratefully accepted. He looked different. I wasn't sure what it was at first. Same old tired expression. No, it wasn't. Most of that weary look had been either an act or a cop's built-in cynicism. Today it was genuine. The tiredness had moved from his face to his shoulders to his hands to the way he walked and the way he slumped in the chair. There was a sour aura of defeat around him. "'Am I still a suspect?' I asked. "'You mean should you call your lawyer? I'd say don't bother. I checked you out pretty good. That will ain't gonna hold up, so your motive is pretty half-assed. Way I figure it, every coke dealer in the marina had a better reason to snuff Kluge than you. He sighed. I got a couple questions. You can answer them or not. Give it a try. You remember any unusual visitors he had? People coming and going at night? The only visitors I ever recall were deliveries. Post office, Federal Express, freight companies, that sort of thing. I suppose the drugs could have come in any of those shipments. That's what we figure, too. There's no way he was dealing nickel and dime bags. He must have been a middleman. Ship it in, ship it out. He brooded about that for a while and sipped his coffee. So, are you making any progress? I asked. You want to know the truth? The case is going in the toilet. We've got too many motives and not a one of them that works. As far as we can tell, nobody on the block had the slightest idea Kluke had all that information. We've checked bank accounts and we can't find evidence of blackmail. So the neighbors are pretty much out of the picture. Though if he were alive, most people around here would like to kill him now. Damn straight, Hal said. Osborne slapped his thigh. If the bastard was alive, I'd kill him, he said. But I'm beginning to think he never was alive. I don't understand. 
If I hadn't seen the goddamn body, he sat up a little straighter. He said he didn't exist. Well, he practically didn't. The power company never heard of him. He's hooked up to their lines, and a meter reader came by every month, but they never billed him for a single kilowatt. Same with the phone company. He had a whole exchange in that house that was made by the phone company and delivered by them and installed by them, but they have no record of him. We talked to the guy who hooked it all up. He turned in his records, and the computer swallowed them. Kluge didn't have a bank account anywhere in California, and apparently he didn't need one. We've tracked down a hundred companies that sold things to him, shipped them out, and then either marked his account paid or forgot they ever sold him anything. Some of them have check numbers and account numbers in their books, for accounts or even banks that don't exist. He leaned back in his chair, simmering at the perfidy of it all. The only guy we've found who ever heard of him was the guy who delivered his groceries once a month. Little store down on Sepulveda. They don't have a computer, just paper receipts. He paid by check. Wells Fargo accepted them, and the checks never bounced, but Wells Fargo never heard of him. I thought it over. He seemed to expect something of me at this point, so I made a stab at it. He was doing all this by computers? That's right. Now, the grocery store scam, I understand, almost. But more often than not, Kluge got right into the basic programming of the computers and wiped himself out. The power company was never paid by check or any other way, because as far as they were concerned, they weren't selling him anything. No government agency has ever heard of him. We've checked him with everybody from the post office to the CIA. Kluge was probably an alias, right? I offered. Yeah, but the FBI doesn't have his fingerprints. We'll find out who he was eventually, but it doesn't get us any closer to whether or not he was murdered. He admitted there was pressure to simply close the felony part of the case, label it suicide, and forget it. But Osborne would not believe it. Naturally, the civil side would go on for some time as they attempted to track down all Kluge's deceptions. It's all up to the dragon lady, Osborne said. Hal snorted. Fat chance, Hal said, and muttered something about boat people. That girl? She's still over there? Who is she? She's some sort of giant brain from Caltech. We called out there and told them we were having problems, and she's what they sent. It was clear from Osborne's face what he thought of any help she might provide. I finally managed to get rid of them. As they went down the walk, I looked over at Kluge's house. Sure enough, Lisa Fu's silver Ferrari was sitting in his driveway. I had no business going over there. I knew that better than anyone. So I set about preparing my evening meal. I made a tuna casserole, which is not as bland as it sounds, the way I make it, put it in the oven and went out to the garden to pick the makings for a salad. I was slicing cherry tomatoes and thinking about chilling a bottle of white wine when it occurred to me that I had enough for two. Since I never do anything hastily, I sat down and thought it over for a while. What finally decided me was my feet. For the first time in a week they were warm. So I went to Kluge's house. The front door was standing open. There was no screen. Funny how disturbing that can look, the dwelling wide open and unguarded. I stood on the porch and leaned in, but all I could see was the hallway. "'Miss Fu?' I called. There was no answer. The last time I'd been here I had found a dead man. I hurried in. Lisa Fu was sitting on a piano bench before a computer console. She was in profile, her back very straight, her brown legs in lotus position, her fingers poised at the keys as words sprayed rapidly onto the screen in front of her. She looked up and flashed her teeth at me. "'Somebody told me your name was Victor Apfel,' she said. "'Yes. Ah, uh, the door was open. It's hot,' she said, reasonably, pinching the fabric of her shirt near her neck and lifting it up and down like you do when you're sweaty. What can I do for you? Nothing, really. I came into the dimness and stumbled on something. It was a cardboard box, the large fat kind used for delivering a jumbo pizza. I was just fixing dinner, and it looks like there's plenty for two, so I was wondering if you— I trailed off as I had just noticed something else. I had thought she was wearing shorts. In fact, all she had on was the shirt and a pair of pink bikini underpants— this did not seem to make her uneasy. 
Would you like to join me for dinner? Her smile grew even broader. I'd love to, she said. She effortlessly unwound her legs and bounced to her feet, then brushed past me, trailing the smells of perspiration and sweet soap. Be with you in a minute. I looked around the room again, but my mind kept coming back to her. She liked Pepsi with her pizza. There were dozens of empty cans. There was a deep scar on her knee and upper thigh. The ashtrays were empty, and the long muscles of her calves bunched strongly as she walked. Kluge must have smoked, but Lisa didn't, and she had fine downy hairs in the small of her back, just visible in the green computer light. I heard water running in the bathroom sink, looked at a yellow notepad covered with the kind of penmanship I hadn't seen in decades, and smelled soap, and remembered tawny brown skin and an easy stride. She appeared in the hall wearing cut-off jeans, sandals, and a new T-shirt. The old one had advertised Burroughs Office Systems. This one featured Mickey Mouse and Snow White's castle and smelled of fresh, bleached cotton. Mickey's ears were laid back on the upper slopes of Lisa Foo's incongruous breasts. I followed her out the door. Tinkerbell twinkled in pixie dust from the back of her shirt. I like this kitchen, she said. You don't really look at a place until someone says something like that. The kitchen was a time capsule. It could have been lifted bodily from an issue of life in the early fifties. There was the hump-shouldered frigid air of a vintage when that word had been a generic term like Kleenex or Coke. The countertops were yellow tile, the sort that's only found in bathrooms these days. There wasn't an ounce of formica in the place. Instead of a dishwasher, I had a wire rack and double sink. There was no electric can opener, Cuisinart, trash compactor, or microwave oven. The newest thing in the whole room was a fifteen-year-old blender. I'm good with my hands. I like to repair things. This bread is terrific, she said. I had baked it myself. I watched her mop her plate with a crust, and she asked if she might have seconds. I understand cleaning one's plate with bread is bad manners. Not that I cared. I do it myself. And other than that, her manners were impeccable. She polished off three helpings of my casserole, and when she was done, the plate hardly needed washing. I had a sense of ravenous appetite, barely held in check. She settled back in her chair, and I refilled her glass with white wine. Are you sure you wouldn't like some more peas? I'd bust. She patted her stomach contentedly. Thank you so much, Mr. Apple. I haven't had a home-cooked meal in ages. You can call me Victor. I just love American food. I didn't know there was such a thing. I mean, not like Chinese or... You are American, aren't you? She just smiled. What I mean... I know what you meant, Victor. I'm a citizen, but not native-born. Would you excuse me for a moment? I know it's impolite to jump right up, but with braces I find I have to brush instantly after eating. I could hear her as I cleared the table. I ran water in the sink and started doing the dishes. Before long she joined me, grabbed a dish towel, and began drying the things in the rack over my protests. You live alone here? she asked. Yes, have ever since my parents died. Ever married? If it's none of my business, just say so. That's all right. No, I never married. You do pretty good for not having a woman around. I've had a lot of practice. Can I ask you a question? Shoot. Where are you from? Taiwan? I have a knack for languages. Back home I spoke Pidgin American, but when I got here I cleaned up my act. I also speak rotten French, illiterate Chinese in four or five varieties, gutter Vietnamese, and enough Thai to holler, Me want to see American consul pretty damn quick, you. I laughed. When she said it, her accent was thick. I've been here eight years now. You figured out where home is? Vietnam, I ventured. The sidewalks of Saigon, for sure. Or Ho Chi Minh's shitty, as the pajama heads renamed it. May their dinks rot off and their butts be filled with jagged punji sticks. Pardon my French. She ducked her head in embarrassment. What had started out light had turned hot very quickly. I sensed a hurt, at least as deep as my own, and we both backed off from it. I took you for a Japanese, I said. Yeah, ain't it a pisser? I'll tell you about it some day. Victor, is that a laundry room through that door there, with an electric washer? That's right. 
Would it be too much trouble if I did a load? It was no trouble at all. She had seven pairs of faded jeans, some with the legs cut away, and about two dozen T-shirts. It could have been a load of boys' clothing except for the frilly underwear. We went into the backyard to sit in the last rays of the setting sun. Then she had to see my garden. I'm quite proud of it. When I'm well, I spend four or five hours a day working out there, year-round, usually in the morning hours. You can do that in Southern California. I have a small greenhouse I built myself. She loved it, though it was not in its best shape. I had spent most of the week in bed or in the tub. As a result, weeds were sprouting here and there. We had a garden when I was little, she said, and I spent two years in a rice paddy. That must be a lot different than this. Damn straight. Put me off rice for years. She discovered an infestation of aphids, so we squatted down to pick them off. She had that double-jointed Asian peasant's way of sitting that I remembered so well and could never imitate. Her fingers were long and narrow, and soon the tips of them were green from squashed bugs. We talked about this and that. I don't remember quite how it came up, but I told her I had fought in Korea. I learned she was twenty-five. It turned out we had the same birthday, so some months back I had been exactly twice her age. The only time Kluge's name came up was when she mentioned how she liked to cook. She hadn't been able to at Kluge's house. He has a freezer in the garage full of frozen dinners, she said. He had one plate, one fork, one spoon, and one glass. He's got the best microwave oven on the market. And that's it, man. Ain't nothing else in his kitchen at all. She shook her head and executed an aphid. He was one weird dude. When her laundry was done, it was late evening, almost dark. She loaded it into my wicker basket, and we took it out to the clothesline. It got to be a game. I would shake out a T-shirt and study the picture or message there. Sometimes I got it, and sometimes I didn't. There were pictures of rock groups, a map of Los Angeles, Star Trek tie-ins, a little of everything. What's the L-5 society? I asked her. Guys that want to build these great big farms in space. I asked them if they were going to grow rice, and they said they didn't think it was the best crop for zero-G, so I bought the shirt. How many of these things do you have? Wow, it's got to be four or five hundred. I usually wear them two or three times and then put them away. I picked up another shirt, and a bra fell out. It wasn't the kind of bra girls wore when I grew up. It was very sheer, though somehow functional at the same time. You like Yank? Her accent was very thick. You ought to see my sister. I glanced at her, and her face fell. I'm sorry, Victor, she said. You don't have to blush. She took the bra from me and clipped it to the line. She must have misread my face. True, I had been embarrassed, but I was also pleased in some strange way. It had been a long time since anybody had called me anything but Victor or Mr. Apfel. The next day's mail brought a letter from a law firm in Chicago. It was about the $700,000. The money had come from a Delaware holding company which had been set up in 1933 to provide for me in my old age. My mother and father were listed as the founders. Certain long-term investments had matured, resulting in my recent windfall. The amount in my bank was after taxes. It was ridiculous on the face of it. My parents had never had that kind of money. I didn't want it. I would have given it back if I could find out who Kluge had stolen it from. I decided that if I wasn't in jail this time next year, I'd give it all to some charity, save the whales, maybe, or the L-5 Society. I spent the morning in the garden. Later I walked to the market and bought some fresh ground beef and pork. I was feeling good as I pulled my purchases home in my fold-up wire basket. When I passed the silver Ferrari, I smiled. She hadn't come to get her laundry. I took it off the line and folded it, then knocked on Kluge's door. It's me, Victor. Come on in, Yank. She was where she had been before, but decently dressed this time. She smiled at me then hit her forehead when she saw the laundry basket. She hurried to take it from me. I'm sorry, Victor. I meant to get this. Don't worry about it, I said. It was no trouble. And it gives me the chance to ask if you'd like to dine with me again. Something happened to her face which she covered quickly. Perhaps she didn't like American food as much as she professed to. 
or maybe it was the cook. Sure, Victor, I'd love to. Let me take care of this. And why don't you open those drapes? It's like a tomb in here. She hurried away. I glanced at the screen she had been using. It was blank, but for one word, intercourse, dash, P. I assumed it was a typo. I pulled the drapes open in time to see Osborne's car park at the curb. Then Lisa was back, wearing a new T-shirt. This one said, a change of Hobbit, and had a picture of a squat, hairy-footed creature. She glanced out the window and saw Osborne coming up the walk. I say, Watson, she said, it's Lestrade of the Yard. Do show him in. That wasn't nice of her. He gave me a suspicious glance as he entered. I burst out laughing. Lisa sat on the piano bench, poker-faced. She slumped indolently, one arm resting near the keyboard. Well, Apple, Osborne said, we finally found out who Kluge really was. Patrick William Gavin. Lisa said. Quite a time went by before Osborne was able to close his mouth. Then he opened it right up again. How the hell did you find that out? She lazily caressed the keyboard beside her. Well, of course I got it when it came into your office this morning. There's a little stoolie program tucked away in your computer that whispers in my ear every time the name Kluge is mentioned. But I didn't need that. I figured it out five days ago. Then why the... Why didn't you tell me? You didn't ask me. They glared at each other for a while. I had no idea what events had led up to this moment, but it was quite clear they didn't like each other, even a little bit. Lisa was on top just now and seemed to be enjoying it. Then she glanced at her screen, looked surprised, and quickly tapped a key. She gave me an inscrutable glance, then faced Osborne again. If you recall, you brought me in because all your own guys were getting was a lot of crashes— this system was brain-damaged when I got here, practically catatonic. Most of it was down, and you couldn't get it up. She had to grin at that. You decided I couldn't do any worse than your guys were doing, so you asked me to try and break Kluge's codes without frying the system. Well, I did it. All you had to do was come by and interface, and I would have downloaded n tons of wallpaper right in your lap. Osborne listened quietly. Maybe even he knew he had made a mistake. What did you get? Can I see it now? She nodded and pressed a few keys. Words started to fill her screen and one close to Osborne. I got up and read Lisa's terminal. It was a brief bio of Kluge Gavin. He was about my age, but while I was getting shot at in a foreign land, he was cutting a swath through the infant computer industry. He had been there from the ground up, working at many of the top research facilities. It surprised me that it had taken over a week to identify him. I compiled this anecdotally, Lisa said as we read. The first thing you have to realize about Gavin is that he exists nowhere in any computerized information system. So I called people all over the country. Interesting phone system he's got, by the way. It generates a new number for each call, and you can't call back or trace it. And started asking who the top people were in the fifties and sixties. I got a lot of names. After that, it was a matter of finding out who no longer existed in the files. He faked his death in 1967. I located one account of it in a newspaper file. Everybody I talked to who had known him knew of his death. There is a paper birth certificate in Florida. That's the only other evidence I found of him. He was the only guy so many people in the field knew who left no mark on the world. That seemed conclusive to me. Osborne finished reading, then looked up. All right, Miss Fu. What else have you found out? I've broken some of his codes. I had a piece of luck getting into a basic rape and plunder program he'd written to attack other people's programs, and I've managed to use it against a few of his own. I've unlocked a file of passwords with notes on where they came from, and I've learned a few of his tricks, but it's the tip of the iceberg. She waved a hand at the silent metal brains in the room. What I haven't gotten across to anyone is just what this is— this is the most devious electronic weapon ever devised. It's armored like a battleship. It has to be. There's a lot of very slick programs out there that grab an invader and hang on like a terrier. If they ever got this far, Kluge could deflect them. But usually they never even knew they'd been burgled. Kluge'd come in like a cruise missile, low and fast and twisty, and he'd route his attack through a dozen cutoffs. He had a lot of advantages. Big systems these days are heavily protected— People use passwords and very sophisticated codes. 
But Kluge helped invent most of them. You need a damn good lock to keep out a locksmith. He helped install a lot of the major systems. He left informants behind, hidden in the software. If the codes were changed, the computer itself would send the information to a safe system that Kluge could tap later. It's like you buy the biggest, meanest, best-trained watchdog you can, and that night the guy who trained the dog comes in, pats him on the head, and robs you blind. There was a lot more in that vein. I'm afraid that when Lisa began talking about computers, ninety percent of my head shot off. I'd like to know something, Osborne, Lisa said. What would that be? What is my status here? Am I supposed to be solving your crime for you, or just trying to get this system back to where a competent user can deal with it? Osborne thought it over. What worries me, she added, is that I'm poking around in a lot of restricted data banks. I'm worried about somebody knocking on the door and handcuffing me. You ought to be worried, too. Some of these agencies wouldn't like a homicide cop looking into their affairs. Osborne bridled at that. Maybe that's what she intended. What do I have to do, he snarled, beg you to stay? No, I just want your authorization. You don't have to put it in writing. Just say you're behind me. Look, as far as L.A. County and the state of California are concerned, this house doesn't exist. There is no lot here. It doesn't appear in the assessor's records. This place is in a legal limbo. If anybody can authorize you to use this stuff, it's me, because I believe a murder was committed in it. So you just keep doing what you've been doing. That's not much of a commitment, she mused. It's all you're going to get. Now, what else have you got? She turned to her keyboard and typed for a while. Pretty soon a printer started, and Lisa leaned back. I glanced at her screen. It said, Osculate Posterior, dash P. I remembered that osculate meant kiss. Well, these people have their own language. Lisa looked up at me and grinned. Not you, she said quietly. Him. I hadn't the faintest notion of what she was talking about. Osborne got his print out and was ready to leave. Again, he couldn't resist turning at the door for final orders. If you find anything to indicate he didn't commit suicide, let me know. Okay. He didn't commit suicide. Osborne didn't understand for a moment. I want proof. Well, I have it, but you probably can't use it. He didn't write that ridiculous suicide note. How do you know that? I knew that my first day here. I had the computer list the program. Then I compared it to Kluge's style. No way he could have written it. It's tighter than a bug's ass, not a spare line in it. Kluge didn't pick his alias for nothing. You know what that means? Clever, I said. Literally. But it means a Rube Goldberg device, something overly complex, something that works but for the wrong reason. You Kluge around bugs in a program. It's the hacker's Vaseline. So, Osborne wanted to know. So Kluge's programs were really crocked. They were full of bells and whistles he never bothered to clean out. He was a genius, and his programs worked, but you wonder why they did. Routines so bletcherous, they'd make your skin crawl. Real crufty bagbiters. But good programming so rare, even his diddles were better than most people's super Moby hacks. I suspect Osborne understood about as much of that as I did. So you base your opinion on his programming style? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's going to be ten years or so before that's admissible in court, like graphology or fingerprints. But if you know anything about programming, you can look at it and see it. Somebody else wrote that suicide note. Somebody damn good, by the way. That program called up his last will and testament in a subroutine. And he definitely did write that. It's got his fingerprints all over it. He spent the last five years spying on the neighbors as a hobby. He tapped into military records, school records, word records, tax files, and bank accounts. And he turned every telephone for three blocks into a listening device. He was one hell of a snoop. Did he mention anywhere why he did that? Osborne asked. I think he was more than half crazy. Possibly he was suicidal. He sure wasn't doing himself any good with all those pills he took. But he was preparing himself for death, and Victor was the only one he found worthy of leaving it all to. I'd have believed he committed suicide if not for that note. But he didn't write it. I'll swear to that. We eventually got rid of him, and I went home to fix dinner. Lisa joined me when it was ready. Once more she had a huge appetite. 
I fixed lemonade, and we sat on my small patio and watched evening gather around us. I woke up in the middle of the night, sweating. I sat up, thinking it out, and I didn't like my conclusions. So I put on my robe and slippers and went over to Kluge's. The front door was open again. I knocked anyway. Lisa stuck her head around the corner. Victor, is something wrong? I'm not sure, I said. May I come in? She gestured, and I followed her into the living room. An open can of Pepsi sat beside her console. Her eyes were red as she sat on her bench. What's up? she said, and yawned. You should be asleep, for one thing, I said. She shrugged and nodded. Yeah, I can't seem to get in the right phase. Just now I'm in day mode. But, Victor, I'm used to working odd hours and long hours, and you didn't come over here to lecture me about that, did you? No. You say Kluge was murdered. He didn't write his suicide note. That seems to leave murder. I was wondering why someone would kill him. He never left the house, so it was for something he did here with his computers. And now you're... Well, I don't know what you're doing, frankly, but you seem to be poking into the same things. Isn't there a danger the same people will come after you? People? She raised an eyebrow. I felt helpless. My fears were not well formed enough to make sense. I don't know. You mentioned agencies. You notice how impressed Osborne was with that? You think there's some kind of conspiracy Kluge tumbled to? Or you think the CIA killed him because he found out too much about something? Or I don't know, Lisa, but I'm worried the same thing could happen to you. Surprisingly, she smiled at me. Thank you so much, Victor. I wasn't going to admit it to Osborne, but I've been worried about that, too. Well, what are you going to do? I want to stay here and keep working, so I gave some thought to what I could do to protect myself. I decided there wasn't anything. Surely there's something. Well, I got a gun, if that's what you mean. But think about it. Kluge was off in the middle of the day. Nobody saw anybody enter or leave the house. So I asked myself, who can walk into a house in broad daylight, shoot Kluge, program that suicide note, and walk away, leaving no traces he'd ever been there? Somebody very good. Goddamn good. So good there's not much chance one little gook's going to be able to stop him if he decides to waste her. She shocked me, both by her words and by her apparent lack of concern for her own fate. But she had said she was worried. Then you have to stop this. Get out of here. I won't be pushed around that way, she said. There was a tone of finality to it. I thought of things I might say and rejected them all. You could at least lock your front door, I concluded lamely. She laughed and kissed my cheek. I'll do that, Yank, and I appreciate your concern. I really do. I watched her close the door behind me, listened to her lock it, then trudged through the moonlight toward my house. Halfway there I stopped. I could suggest she stay in my spare bedroom. I could offer to stay with her at Kluge's. No, I decided. She would probably take that the wrong way. I was back in bed before I realized, with a touch of chagrin and more than a little disgust at myself, that she had every reason to take it the wrong way, and me exactly twice her age. I spent the morning in the garden, planning the evening's menu. I have always liked to cook, but dinner with Lisa had rapidly become the high point of my day. Not only that, I was already taking it for granted. So it hit me hard, around noon, when I looked out the front and saw her car gone. I hurried to Kluge's front door. It was standing open. I made a quick search of the house. I found nothing until the master bedroom, where her clothes were stacked neatly on the floor. Shivering, I pounded on the Lanier's front door. Betty answered and immediately saw my agitation. "'The girl at Kluge's house,' I said. "'I'm afraid something's wrong. Maybe we'd better call the police.' "'What happened?' Betty asked, looking over my shoulder. Did she call you? I see she's not back yet. Back? I saw her drive away about an hour ago. That's quite a car she has. Feeling like a fool, I tried to make nothing of it, but I caught a look in Betty's eye. I think she'd have liked to pat me on the head. It made me furious. But she'd left her clothes, so surely she was coming back. I kept telling myself that then went to run a bath, as hot as I could stand it.
When I answered the door, she was standing there with a grocery bag in each arm and her usual blinding smile on her face. I wanted to do this yesterday, but I forgot until you came over, and I know I should have asked first, but then I wanted to surprise you, so I just went to get one or two items you didn't have in your garden, and a couple of things that weren't in your spice rack. She kept talking as we unloaded the bags in the kitchen. I said nothing. She was wearing a new T-shirt. There was a big V, comma, and under it a picture of a screw, followed by a hyphen and a small case P. I thought it over as she babbled on. V, comma, screw, hyphen, P. I was determined not to ask what it meant. Do you like Vietnamese cooking? I looked at her and finally realized she was very nervous. I don't know, I said. I've never had it. But I like Chinese and Japanese and Indian. I like to try new things. The last part was a lie, but not as bad as it might have been. I do try new recipes, and my tastes in food are Catholic. I didn't expect to have much trouble with Southeast Asian cuisine. Well, when I get through, you still won't know, she laughed. My mama was half Chinese. So what you're going to get here is a mongrel meal. She glanced up, saw my face, and laughed. I forgot. You've been to Asia. No, Yank, I ain't going to serve any dog meat. There was only one intolerable thing, and that was the chopsticks. I used them for as long as I could, then put them aside and got a fork. I'm sorry, I said. Chopsticks happen to be a problem for me. You use them very well. I had plenty of time to learn how. It was very good, and I told her so. Each dish was a revelation, not quite like anything I had ever had. Toward the end, I broke down halfway. Does the V stand for victory? I asked. Maybe. Beethoven? Churchill? World War II? She just smiled. Think of it as a challenge, Yank. Do I frighten you, Victor? You did it first. It's my face, isn't it? It's a generalized phobia of Orientals. I suppose I'm a racist, not because I want to be. She nodded slowly, there in the dark. We were on the patio again, but the sun had gone down a long time ago. I can't recall what we had talked about for all those hours. It had kept us busy, anyway. I have the same problem, she said. Fear of Orientals? I admit it as a joke. Of Cambodians. She let me take that in for a while, then went on. When Saigon fell, I fled to Cambodia. It took me two years with stops when the Khmer Rouge put me in labor camps. I'm lucky to be alive, really. I thought they called it Kampuchea now. She spat. I'm not even sure she was aware she had done it. It's the People's Republic of Syphilitic Dogs. The North Koreans treated you very badly, didn't they, Victor? That's right. Koreans are pus suckers. I must have looked surprised because she chuckled. You Americans feel so guilty about racism, as if you had invented it and nobody else, except maybe the South Africans and the Nazis, had ever practiced it as heinously as you. And you can't tell one yellow face from another, so you think of the yellow races as one homogeneous block, when in fact Orientals are among the most racist peoples on earth. The Vietnamese have hated the Cambodians for a thousand years. The Chinese hate the Japanese. The Koreans hate everybody. And everybody hates the ethnic Chinese. The Chinese are the Jews of the East. I've heard that. She nodded, lost in her own thoughts. And I hate all Cambodians, she said at last. Like you, I don't wish to. Most of the people who suffered in the camps were Cambodians. It was the genocidal leaders, the Pol Pot scum, who I should hate. She looked at me. But sometimes we don't get a lot of choice about things like that, do we, Yank? The next day I visited her at noon. It had cooled down but was still warm in her dark den. She had not changed her shirt. She told me a few things about computers. When she let me try some things on the keyboard, I quickly got lost. We decided I needn't plan on a career as a computer programmer. One of the things she showed me was called a telephone modem, whereby she could reach other computers all over the world. She interfaced with someone at Stanford who she had never met, and who she knew only as Bubble Sorter. They typed things back and forth at each other. At the end, Bubble Sorter wrote, Bye, hyphen, P. Lisa typed, T. What's T? I asked. True. 
means yes, but yes would be too straightforward for a hacker. You told me what a byte is. What's a biap? She looked at me seriously. It's a question. Add P to a word and make it a question. So by hyphen P means Bubble Sorter was asking if I wanted to log out. Sign off. I thought that over. So how would you translate osculate posterior hyphen P? Do you want to kiss my ass? But remember, that was for Osborne. I looked at her T-shirt again, then up to her eyes, which were quite serious and serene. She waited, hands folded in her lap. Intercourse hyphen P. Yes, I said. I would. She put her glasses on the table and pulled her shirt over her head. We made love in Kluge's big water bed. I had a certain amount of performance anxiety. It had been a long, long time. After that, I was so caught up in the touch and smell and taste of her that I went a little crazy. She didn't seem to mind. At last we were done and bathed in sweat. She rolled over, stood, and went to the window. She opened it, and a breath of air blew over me. Then she put one knee on the bed, leaned over me, and got a pack of cigarettes from the bedside table. She lit one. I hope you're not allergic to smoke, she said. No, my father smoked, but I didn't know you did. Only afterwards, she said with a quick smile. She took a deep drag. Everybody in Saigon smoked, I think. She stretched out on her back beside me, and we lay like that, soaking wet, holding hands. She opened her legs, so one of her bare feet touched mine. It seemed enough contact. I watched the smoke rise from her right hand. I haven't felt warm in thirty years, I said. I've been hot, but I've never been warm. I feel warm now. Tell me about it, she said. So I did, as much as I could, wondering if it would work this time. At thirty years removed, my story does not sound so horrible. We've seen so much in that time. There were people in jails at that very moment, enduring conditions as bad as any I encountered. The paraphernalia of oppression is still pretty much the same. Nothing physical happened to me that would account for thirty years lived as a recluse. I was badly injured, I told her. My skull was fractured. I still have problems from that. Korea can get very cold, and I was never warm enough. But it was the other stuff, what they call brainwashing now. We didn't know what it was. We couldn't understand that even after a man had told them all he knew, they'd keep on at us, keeping us awake, disorienting us. Some guys signed confessions, made up all sorts of stuff. But even that wasn't enough. They just keep on at you. I never did figure it out. I guess I couldn't understand an evil that big. But when they were sending us back and some of the prisoners wouldn't go, they really didn't want to go. They really believed— I had to pause there. Lisa sat up, moved quietly to the end of the bed, and began massaging my feet. We got a taste of what the Vietnam guys got later. Only for us it was reversed. The G.I.s were heroes and the prisoners were— You didn't break, she said. It wasn't a question. No, I didn't. That would be worse. I looked at her. She had my foot pressed against her flat belly, holding me by the heel while her other hand massaged my toes. The country was shocked, I said. They didn't understand what brainwashing was. I tried telling people how it was. I thought they were looking at me funny. After a while, I stopped talking about it, and I didn't have anything else to talk about. A few years back, the Army changed its policy. Now they don't expect you to withstand psychological conditioning. It's understood you can say anything or sign anything. She just looked at me, kept massaging my foot, and nodded slowly. Finally she spoke. Cambodia was hot, she said. I kept telling myself when I finally got to the U.S. I'd live in Maine or some place where it snowed. And I did go to Cambridge, but I found out I didn't like snow. She told me about it. The last time I heard, a million people had died over there. It was a whole country, frothing at the mouth and snapping at anything that moved. Or like one of those sharks you read about that, when its guts are ripped out, bends in a circle and starts devouring itself. She told me about being forced to build a pyramid of severed heads. Twenty of them working all day in the hot sun finally got it ten feet high before it collapsed. 
If any of them stopped working, their own heads were added to the pile. It didn't mean anything to me. It was just another job. I was pretty crazy by then. I didn't start to come out of it until I got across the Thai border. That she had survived it at all seemed a miracle. She had gone through more horror than I could imagine, and she had come through it in much better shape. It made me feel small. When I was her age, I was well on my way to building the prison I have lived in ever since. I told her that. Part of it is preparation, she said wryly. What you expect out of life, what your life has been so far. You said it yourself. Korea was new to you. I'm not saying I was ready for Cambodia, but my life up to that point hadn't been what you'd call sheltered. I hope you haven't been thinking I made a living in the streets by selling apples. She kept rubbing my feet, staring off into scenes I could not see. How old were you when your mother died? She was killed during Tet, 1968. I was ten. By the Viet Cong? Who knows? Lots of bullets flying, lots of grenades being thrown. She sighed, dropped my foot, and sat there, a scrawny Buddha without a rope. You ready to do it again, Yank? I don't think I can, Lisa. I'm an old man. She moved over me and lowered herself with her chin just below my sternum, settling her breasts in the most delicious place possible. We'll see, she said, and giggled. There's an alternative sex act I'm pretty good at, and I'm pretty sure it would make you a young man again, but I haven't been able to do it for about a year on account of these. She tapped her braces. It'd be sort of like sticking it in a buzz saw. So now I do this instead. I call it touring the Silicon Valley. She started moving her body up and down just a few inches at a time. She blinked innocently a couple of times, then laughed. At last I can see you, she said. I'm awfully myopic. I let her do that for a while, then lifted my head. Did you say silicone? Uh-huh. You didn't think they were real, did you? I confessed that I had. I don't think I've ever been so happy with anything I ever bought, not even the car. Why did you? Does it bother you? It didn't, and I told her so, but I couldn't conceal my curiosity. Because it was safe to. In Saigon I was always angry that I never developed. I could have made a good living as a prostitute, but I was always too small, too skinny, and too ugly. Then in Cambodia I was lucky. I managed to pass for a boy some of the time. If not for that, I'd have been raped a lot more than I was. And in Thailand I knew I'd get to the West one way or another, and when I got there I'd get the best car there was, eat anything I wanted any time I wanted to, and purchase the best tits money could buy. You can't imagine what the West looks like from the camps. A place where you can buy tits. She looked down between them, then back at my face. Looks like it was a good investment, she said. They do seem to work okay, I had to admit. We agreed that she would spend the nights at my house. There were certain things she had to do at Kluge's, involving equipment that had to be physically loaded— but many things she could do with a remote terminal and an armload of software. So we selected one of Kluge's best computers and about a dozen peripherals and installed her at a cafeteria table in my bedroom. I guess we both knew it wasn't much protection if the people who got Kluge decided to get her, but I know I felt better about it, and I think she did too. The second day she was there, a delivery van pulled up outside, and two guys started unloading a king-size waterbed. She laughed and laughed when she saw my face. Listen, you're not using Kluge's computers to— Relax, Yank. How'd you think I could afford a Ferrari? I've been curious. If you're really good at writing software, you can make a lot of money. I own my own company. But every hacker picks up tricks here and there. I used to run a few Kluge scams myself. But not any more? She shrugged. Once a thief, always a thief, Victor. I told you I couldn't make ends meet selling my bod. Lisa didn't need much sleep. We got up at seven and I made breakfast every morning. Then we would spend an hour or two working in the garden. She would go to Kluge's and I'd bring her a sandwich at noon, then drop in on her several times during the day. That was for my own peace of mind. I never stayed more than a minute. 
Sometime during the afternoon I would shop or do household chores, then at seven one of us would cook dinner. We alternated. I taught her American cooking, and she taught me a little of everything. She complained about the lack of vital ingredients in American markets. No dogs, of course, but she claimed to know great ways of preparing monkey, snake, and rat. I never knew how hard she was pulling my leg, and didn't ask. After dinner, she stayed at my house. We would talk, make love, bathe. She loved my tub. It is about the only alteration I have made in the house, and my only real luxury. I put it in, having to expand the bathroom to do so, in 1975, and never regretted it. We would soak for twenty minutes or an hour, turning the jets and bubblers on and off, washing each other, giggling like kids. Once we used bubble bath and made a mountain of suds four feet high, then destroyed it, splashing water all over the place. Most nights she let me wash her long black hair. She didn't have any bad habits, or at least none that clashed with mine. She was neat and clean, changing her clothes twice a day, and never so much as leaving a dirty glass on the sink. She never left a mess in the bathroom. Two glasses of wine was her limit. I felt like Lazarus. Osborne came by three times in the next two weeks. Lisa met him at Kluge's and gave him what she had learned. It was getting to be quite a list. Kluge once had an account in a New York bank with nine trillion dollars in it, she told me after one of Osborne's visits. I think he did it just to see if he could. He left it in for one day, took the interest, and fed it to a bank in the Bahamas, then destroyed the principal, which never existed anyway. In return, Osborne told her what was new on the murder investigation, which was nothing, and on the status of Kluge's property, which was chaotic. Various agencies had sent people out to look the place over. Some FBI men came, wanting to take over the investigation. Lisa, when talking about computers, had the power to cloud men's minds. She did it first by explaining exactly what she was doing, in terms so abstruse that no one could understand her. Sometimes that was enough. If it wasn't, if they started to get tough, she just moved out of the driver's seat and let them try to handle Kluge's contraption. She let them watch in horror as dragons leaped out of nowhere and ate up all the data on a disk, then printed, You stupid putts, on the screen. I'm cheating them, she confessed to me. I'm giving them stuff I know they're going to step in, because I already stepped in it myself. I've lost about forty percent of the data Kluge had stored away. But the others lose a hundred percent. You ought to see their faces when Kluge drops a logic bomb into their work. That second guy threw a three-thousand-dollar printer clear across the room, then tried to bribe me to be quiet about it. When some federal agency sent out an expert from Stanford, and he seemed perfectly content to destroy everything in sight, in the firm belief that he was bound to get it right sooner or later, Lisa showed him how Kluge entered the IRS mainframe computer in Washington, and neglected to mention how Kluge had gotten out. The guy tangled with some watchdog program. During his struggles, it seemed, he had erased all the tax records from the letter S down into the W's. Lisa let him think that for half an hour. I thought he was having a heart attack, she told me. All the blood drained out of his face, and he couldn't talk. So I showed him where I had, with my usual foresight, arranged for that to be recorded, told him how to put it back where he found it, and how to pacify the watchdog. He couldn't get out of that house fast enough. Pretty soon he's going to realize you can't destroy that much information with anything short of dynamite because of the backups and the limits of how much can be running at any one time. But I don't think he'll be back. It sounds like a very fancy video game, I said. It is, in a way. But it's more like Dungeons and Dragons. It's an endless series of closed rooms with dangers on the other side. You don't dare take it a step at a time. You take it a hundredth of a step at a time. Your questions are like, how this isn't a question, but if it entered my mind to ask this question, which I'm not about to do, concerning what might happen if I looked at this door here, and I'm not touching it, I'm not even in the next room, what do you suppose you might do? And the program crunches on that, decides if you fulfilled the conditions for getting a great big cream pie in the face, then either throws it, or allows us how it might just move from step A to step A prime. Then you say, well, maybe I am looking at that door. And sometimes the program says, You looked, you looked, you dirty crook, and the fireworks start. 
Silly as all that sounds, it was very close to the best explanation she was ever able to give me about what she was doing. Are you telling everything, Lisa? I asked her. Well, not everything. I didn't mention the four cents. Four cents? Oh, my God. Lisa, I didn't want that. I didn't ask for it. I wish he'd never— Calm down, Yank. It's going to be all right. He kept records of all that, didn't he? That's what I spend most of my time doing, decoding his records. How long have you known? About the seven hundred thousand dollars? It was in the first disc I cracked. I just want to give it back. She thought that over and shook her head. Victor, it'd be more dangerous to get rid of it now than it would be to keep it. It was imaginary money at first, but now it's got a history. The IRS thinks it knows where it came from. The taxes are paid on it. The state of Delaware is convinced that a legally chartered corporation dispersed it. An Illinois law firm has been paid for handling it. Your bank has been paying you interest on it. I'm not saying it would be impossible to go back and wipe all that out, but I wouldn't like to try. I'm good, but I don't have Kluge's touch. How could he do all that? You say it was imaginary money. That's not the way I thought money worked. He could just pull it out of thin air? Lisa patted the top of her computer console and smiled at me. This is money, Yank, she said, and her eyes glittered. At night she worked by candlelight so she wouldn't disturb me. That turned out to be my downfall. She typed by touch and needed the candle only to locate software. So that's how I go to sleep every night, looking at her slender body bathed in the glow of the candle. I was always reminded of melting butter dripping down a roasted ear of corn, golden light on golden skin. Ugly, she had called herself. Skinny. It was true she was thin. I could see her ribs when she sat with her back impossibly straight, her tummy tucked in, her chin up. She worked in the nude these days, sitting in lotus position. For long periods she would not move, her hands lying on her thighs. Then she would poise, as if to pound the keys. But her touch was light, almost silent. It looked more like yoga than programming. She said she went into a meditative state for her best work. I had expected a bony angularity, all sharp elbows and knees. She wasn't like that. I had guessed her weight ten pounds too low and still didn't know where she put it but she was soft and rounded and strong beneath. No one was ever going to call her face glamorous. Few would even go so far as to call her pretty. The braces did that, I think. They caught the eye and held it, drawing attention to that unsightly jumble. But her skin was wonderful. She had scars, not as many as I had expected. She seemed to heal quickly and well. I thought she was beautiful. I had just completed my nightly survey when my eye was caught by the candle. I looked at it, then tried to look away. Candles do that sometimes. I don't know why. In still air, with the flame perfectly vertical, they began to flicker. The flame leaps up, then squats down, up and down, up and down, brighter and brighter in regular rhythm, two or three beats to the second. And I tried to call out to her, wishing the candle would stop its regular flickering, but already I couldn't speak. I could only gasp, and I tried once more as hard as I could to yell, to scream, to tell her not to worry, and felt the nausea building. I tasted blood. I took an experimental breath, did not find the smells of vomit, urine, feces. The overhead lights were on. Lisa was on her hands and knees, leaning over me, her face very close. A tear dropped on my forehead. I was on the carpet, on my back. Victor, can you hear me? I nodded. There was a spoon in my mouth. I spit it out. You just lie there. The ambulance is on its way. No, don't need it. Well, it's on its way. You just take it easy and help me up. Not yet. You're not ready. She was right. I tried to sit up and fell back quietly. I took deep breaths for a while. Then the doorbell rang. She stood up and started to the door. I just managed to get my hand around her ankle. Then she was leaning over me again, her eyes as wide as they would go. What is it? What's wrong now? Get some clothes on, I told her. She looked down at herself, surprised. Oh, right. She got rid of the ambulance crew. 
Lisa was a lot calmer after she made coffee and we were sitting at the kitchen table. It was one o'clock and I was still pretty rocky. But it hadn't been a bad one. I went to the bathroom and got the bottle of Dilantin I'd hidden when she moved in. I let her see me take one. I forgot to do this today, I told her. It's because you hid them. That was stupid. I know. There must have been something else I could have said. It didn't please me to see her look hurt. But she was hurt because I wasn't defending myself against her attack, and that was a bit too complicated for me to dope out just after a grand mall. You can move out if you want to, I said. I was in rare form. So was she. She reached across the table and shook me by the shoulders. She glared at me. I won't take a lot more of that kind of shit, she said, and I nodded and began to cry. She let me do it. I think that was probably best. She could have babied me, but I do a pretty good job of that myself. How long has this been going on? she finally said. Is that why you've stayed in your house for thirty years? I shrugged. I guess it's part of it. When I got back they operated, but it just made it worse. Okay. I'm mad at you because you didn't tell me about it, so I didn't know what to do. I want to stay, but you'll have to tell me how. Then I won't be mad any more. I could have blown the whole thing right there. I'm amazed I didn't. Through the years I've developed very good methods for doing things like that. But I pulled through when I saw her face. She really did want to stay. I didn't know why, but it was enough. The spoon was a mistake, I said. If there's time, and if you can do it without risking your fingers, you could jam a piece of cloth in there, part of a sheet or something, but nothing hard. I explored my mouth with a finger. I think I broke a tooth. Serves you right, she said. I looked at her and smiled. Then we were both laughing. She came around the table and kissed me, then sat on my knee. The biggest danger is drowning. During the first part of the seizure, all my muscles go rigid. That doesn't last long. Then they all start contracting and relaxing at random. It's very strong. I know. I watched, and I tried to hold you. Don't do that. Get me on my side. Stay behind me and watch out for flailing arms. Get a pillow under my head if you can. Keep me away from things I could injure myself on. I looked her square in the eye. I want to emphasize this. Just try to do all those things. If I'm getting too violent, it's better you stand off to the side. Better for both of us. If I knock you out, you won't be able to help me if I start strangling on vomit. I kept looking at her eyes. She must have read my mind because she smiled slightly. Sorry, Yank. I am not freaked out. I mean, like it's totally gross, you know. And it barfs me out to the max. You could gag me with a spoon, I know. Okay, right. I know I was dumb, and that's about it. I might bite my tongue or the inside of my cheek. Don't worry about it. There is one more thing. She waited, and I wondered how much to tell her. There wasn't a lot she could do, but if I died on her, I didn't want her to feel it was her fault. Sometimes I have to go to the hospital. Sometimes one seizure will follow another. If that keeps up for too long, I won't breathe and my brain will die of oxygen starvation. That only takes about five minutes, she said, alarmed. I know. It's only a problem if I start having them frequently, so we could plan for it if I do. But if I don't come out of one, start having another right on the heels of the first, or if you can't detect any breathing for three or four minutes, you'd better call an ambulance. Three or four minutes? You'd be dead before they got here. It's that or live in a hospital. I don't like hospitals. Neither do I. The next day she took me for a ride in her Ferrari. I was nervous about it, wondering if she was going to do crazy things. If anything, she was too slow. People behind her kept honking. I could tell she hadn't been driving long from the exaggerated attention she put into every movement. A Ferrari is wasted on me, I'm afraid, she confessed at one point. I never drive it faster than fifty-five. We went to an interior decorator in Beverly Hills, and she bought a low-watt gooseneck lamp at an outrageous price. I had a hard time getting to sleep that night. I suppose I was afraid of having another seizure, though Lisa's new lamp wasn't going to set it off. Funny about seizures. When I first started having them, everyone called them fits. 
Then gradually it was seizures, until fits began to sound dirty. I guess it's a sign of growing old when the language changes on you. There were rafts of new words. A lot of them were for things that didn't even exist when I was growing up, like software. I always visualized a limp wrench. What got you interested in computers, Lisa? I asked her. She didn't move. Her concentration when sitting at the machine was pretty damn good. I rolled onto my back and tried to sleep. It's where the power is, Yank. I looked up. She had turned to face me. Did you pick it all up since you got to America? I had a head start. I didn't tell you about my captain, did I? I don't think you did. He was strange. I knew that. I was about fourteen. He was an American, and he took an interest in me. He got me a nice apartment in Saigon, and he put me in school. She was studying me, looking for a reaction. I didn't give her one. He was surely a pedophile, and probably had homosexual tendencies, since I looked so much like a skinny little boy. Again, the wait. This time she smiled. He was good to me. I learned to read well. From there on, anything is possible. I didn't actually ask you about your captain. I asked why you got interested in computers. That's right, you did. Is it just a living? It started that way. It's the future, Victor. God knows I've read that enough times. It's true. It's already here. It's power, if you know how to use it. You've seen what Kluge was able to do. You can make money with one of these things. I don't mean earn it. I mean make it, like if you had a printing press. Remember Osborne mentioned that Kluge's house didn't exist? Did you think what that means? That he wiped it out of the memory banks? That was the first step. But the lot exists in the county plat books, wouldn't you think? I mean, this country hasn't entirely given up paper. So the county really does have a record of that house? No. That page was torn out of the records. I don't get it. Kluge never left the house. Oldest way in the world, friend. Kluge looked through the LAPD files until he found a guy known as Sammy. He sent him a cashier's check for a thousand dollars, along with a letter saying he could earn twice that if he'd go to the Hall of Records and do something. Sammy didn't bite, and neither did McGee or Molly Unger. But little Billy Phipps did, and he got a check just like the letter said, and he and Kluge had a wonderful business relationship for many years. Little Billy drives a new Cadillac now and hasn't the faintest notion who Kluge was or where he lived. It didn't matter to Kluge how much he spent. He just pulled it out of thin air. I thought that over for a while. I guess it's true that with enough money you can do just about anything, and Kluge had all the money in the world. Did you tell Osborne about little Billy? I erased that disc, just like I erased your seven hundred thousand. You never know when you might need somebody like little Billy. You're not afraid of getting into trouble over it? Life is risk, Victor. I'm keeping the best stuff for myself, not because I intend to use it, but because if I ever needed it badly and didn't have it, I'd feel like such a fool. She cocked her head and narrowed her eyes, which made them practically disappear. Tell me something, Yank. Kluge picked you out of all your neighbors because you'd been a Boy Scout for thirty years. How do you react to what I'm doing? You're cheerfully amoral, and you're a survivor, and you're basically decent, and I pity anybody who gets in your way. She grinned, stretched, and stood up. Cheerfully amoral. I like that. She sat beside me, making a great sloshing in the bed. You want to be amoral again? In a little bit. She started rubbing my chest. So you got into computers because they were the wave of the future. Don't you ever worry about them? I don't know. I guess it sounds corny. Do you think they'll take over? Everybody thinks that until they start to use them, she said. You've got to realize just how stupid they are. Without programming, they are good for nothing, literally. Now, what I do believe is that the people who run the computers will take over. They already have. That's why I study them. I guess that's not what I meant. Maybe I can't say it right. She frowned. Kluge was looking into something. He'd been eavesdropping in artificial intelligence labs and reading a lot of neurological research. I think he was trying to find a common thread. Between human brains and computers? Not quite. He was thinking of computers and neurons, brain cells. 
she pointed to her computer. That thing, or any other computer, is light years away from being a human brain. It can't generalize or infer or categorize or invent. With good programming, it can appear to do some of those things, but it's an illusion. There's an old speculation about what would happen if we finally built a computer with as many transistors as the human brain has neurons. Would there be a self-awareness? I think that's baloney. A transistor isn't a neuron, and a quintillion of them aren't any better than a dozen. So Kluge, who seems to have felt the same way, started looking into the possible similarities between a neuron and an eight-bit computer. That's why he had all that consumer junk sitting around his house, those trash 80s and Ataris and TIs and Sinclairs, for Christ's sake. He was used to much more powerful instruments. He ate up the home units like candy. What did he find out? Nothing, it looks like. An 8-bit unit is more complex than a neuron, and no computer is in the same galaxy as an organic brain. But see, the words get tricky. I said an Atari is more complex than a neuron, but it's hard to really compare them. It's like comparing a direction with a distance, or a color with a mass. The units are different, except for one similarity. What's that? The connections. Again, it's different, but the concept of networking is the same. A neuron is connected to a lot of others. There are trillions of them, and the way messages pulse through them determines what we are and what we think and what we remember. And with that computer I can reach a million others. It's bigger than the human brain, really, because the information in that network is more than all humanity could cope with in a million years. It reaches from Pioneer 10, out beyond the orbit of Pluto, right into every living room that has a telephone in it. With that computer, you can tap tons of data that has been collected, but nobody's even had the time to look at. That's what Kluge was interested in. The old critical mass computer idea, the computer that becomes aware, but with a new angle. Maybe it wouldn't be the size of the computer, but the number of computers. There used to be thousands of them. Now there's millions. They're putting them in cars, in wristwatches. Every home has several, from the simple timer on a microwave oven up to a video game or home terminal. Kluge was trying to find out if critical mass could be reached that way. What did he think? I don't know. He was just getting started. She glanced down at me. But you know what, Yank? I think you've reached critical mass while I wasn't looking. I think you're right. I reached for her. Lisa liked to cuddle. I didn't at first, after fifty years of sleeping alone. But I got to like it pretty quickly. That's what we were doing when we resumed the conversation we had been having. We just lay in each other's arms and talked about things. Nobody had mentioned love yet, but I knew I loved her. I didn't know what to do about it, but I would think of something. Critical mass, I said. She nuzzled my neck and yawned. What about it? What would it be like? It seems like it would be such a vast intelligence, so quick, so omniscient, godlike. Could be. Wouldn't it run our lives? I guess I'm asking the same questions I started off with. Would it take over? She thought about it for a long time. I wonder if there would be anything to take over. I mean, why should it care? How could we figure what its concerns would be? Would it want to be worshipped, for instance? I doubt it. Would it want to rationalize all human behavior, to eliminate all emotions, as I'm sure some sci-fi film computer must have told some damsel in distress in the fifties? You can use a word like awareness, but what does it mean? An amoeba must be aware. Plants probably are. There may be a level of awareness in a neuron, even in an integrated circuit chip. We don't even know what our own awareness really is. We've never been able to shine a light on it, dissect it, figure out where it comes from or where it goes when we're dead. To apply human values to a thing like this hypothetical computer net consciousness would be pretty stupid but I don't see how it could interact with human awareness at all. It might not even notice us, any more than we notice cells in our bodies, or neutrinos passing through us, or the vibrations of the atoms in the air around us. So she had to explain what a neutrino was. One thing I always provided her with was an ignorant audience, and after that I pretty much forgot about our mythical hypercomputer. What about your captain? I asked, much later. Do you really want to know, Yank? She mumbled sleepily. 
I'm not afraid to know. She sat up and reached for her cigarettes. I had come to know she sometimes smoked them in times of stress. She had told me she smoked after making love, but that first time had been the only time. The lighter flared in the dark. I heard her exhale. My major, actually. He got a promotion. Do you want to know his name? Lisa, I don't want to know any of it if you don't want to tell it. But if you do, what I want to know is, did he stand by you? He didn't marry me, if that's what you mean. When he knew he had to go, he said he would, but I talked him out of it. Maybe it was the most noble thing I ever did. Maybe it was the most stupid. It's no accident I look Japanese. My grandmother was raped in forty-two by a Jap soldier of the occupation. She was Chinese, living in Hanoi. My mother was born there. They went south after Dien Bien Phu. My grandmother died. My mother had it hard. Being Chinese was tough enough, but being half Chinese and half Japanese was worse. My father was half French and half Annamese. Another bad combination. I never knew him. But I'm sort of a capsule history of Vietnam. The end of her cigarette glowed brighter once more. I've got one grandfather's face and the other grandfather's height, with tits by Goodyear. About all I missed was some American genes, but I was working on that for my children. When Saigon was falling, I tried to get to the American embassy. Didn't make it. You know the rest, until I got to Thailand, and when I finally got Americans to notice me, it turned out my major was still looking for me. He sponsored me over here, and I made it in time to watch him die of cancer. Two months I had with him, all of it in the hospital. My God! I had a horrible thought. That wasn't the war, too, was it? I mean, the story of your life is the rape of Asia. No, Victor, not that war, anyway. But he was one of those guys who got to see atom bombs up close, out in Nevada. He was too regular army to complain about it, but I think he knew that's what killed him. Did you love him? What do you want me to say? He got me out of hell. Again the cigarette flared, and I saw her stub it out. No, she said. I didn't love him. He knew that. I've never loved anybody. He was very dear, very special to me. I would have done almost anything for him. He was fatherly to me. I felt her looking at me in the dark. Aren't you going to ask how old he was? Fifty-ish, I said. On the nose. Can I ask you something? I guess it's your turn. How many girls have you had since you got back from Korea? I held up my hand and pretended to count on my fingers. One, I said at last. How many before you went? One. We broke up before I left for the war. How many in Korea? Nine. All at Madame Park's jolly little whorehouse in Pusan. So you've made love to one white and ten Asians. I bet none of the others were as tall as me. Korean girls have fatter cheeks, too, but they all had your eyes. She nuzzled against my chest, took a deep breath, and sighed. We're a hell of a pair, aren't we? I hugged her, and her breath came again hot on my chest. I wondered how I'd lived so long without such a simple miracle as that. Yes, I think we really are. Osborne came by again about a week later. He seemed subdued. He listened to the things Lisa had decided to give him without much interest. He took the printout she handed him and promised to turn it over to the departments that handled those things. But he didn't get up to leave. I thought I ought to tell you, Apple, he said at last. The Gavin case has been closed. I had to think a moment to remember Kluge's real name had been Gavin. The coroner ruled suicide a long time ago. I was able to keep the case open quite a while on the strength of my suspicions. He nodded toward Lisa, and on what she said about the suicide note. But there was just no evidence at all. It probably happened quickly, Lisa said. Somebody caught him, tracked him back. It can be done. Kluge was lucky for a long time, and did him the same day. You don't think it was suicide? I asked Osborne. No, but whoever did it is home free unless something new turns up. I'll tell you if it does, Lisa said. That's something else, Osborne said. I can't authorize you to work over there any more. The county's taken possession of house and contents. Don't worry about it, Lisa said softly. 
There was a short silence as she leaned over to shake a cigarette from the pack on the coffee table. She lit it, exhaled, and leaned back beside me, giving Osborne her most inscrutable look. He sighed. I'd hate to play poker with you, lady, he said. What do you mean, don't worry about it? I bought the house four days ago, and its contents. If anything turns up that would help you reopen the murder investigation, I will let you know. Osborne was too defeated to get angry. He studied her quietly for a while. I'd like to know how you swung that. I did nothing illegal. You're free to check it out. I paid good cash money for it. The house came onto the market. I got a good price at the sheriff's sale. How'd you like it if I put my best men on the transaction, see if they can dig up some funny money, maybe fraud? How about I get the FBI in to look it all over? She gave him a cool look. You're welcome to. Frankly, Detective Osborne, I could have stolen that house, Griffith Park, and the Harbor Freeway, and I don't think you could have caught me. So where does that leave me? Just where you were, with a closed case and a promise from me. I don't like you having all that stuff, if it can do the things you say it can do. I didn't expect you would. But that's not your department, is it? The county owned it for a while, through simple confiscation. They didn't know what they had, and they let it go. Maybe I can get the fraud detail out here to confiscate your software. There's criminal evidence on it. You could try that, she agreed. They stared at each other for a while. Lisa won. Osborne rubbed his eyes and nodded. Then he heaved himself to his feet and slumped to the door. Lisa stubbed out her cigarette. We listened to him going down the walk. I'm surprised he gave up so easy, I said. Or did he? Do you think he'll try a raid? It's not likely. He knows the score. Maybe you could tell it to me. For one thing, it's not his department, and he knows it. Why did you buy the house? You ought to ask, how? I looked at her closely. There was a gleam of amusement behind the poker face. Lisa, what did you do? That's what Osborne asked himself. He got the right answer because he understands Kluge's machines, and he knows how things get done. It was no accident. I was the only bidder. I used one of Kluge's pet councilmen. You bribed him? She laughed and kissed me. I think I finally managed to shock you, Yank. That's got to be the biggest difference between me and a native-born American. Average citizens don't spend much on bribes over here. In Saigon, everybody bribes. Did you bribe him? Nothing so indelicate. One has to go in the back door over here. Several entirely legal campaign contributions appeared in the accounts of a state senator, who mentioned a certain situation to someone who happened to be in the position to do legally what I happened to want done. She looked at me askance. Of course I bribed him, Victor. You'd be amazed to know how cheaply. Does that bother you? Yes, I admitted. I don't like bribery. I'm indifferent to it. It happens, like gravity. It may not be admirable, but it gets things done. I assume you covered yourself. Reasonably well. You're never entirely covered with a bribe because of the human element. The councilman might geek if they got him in front of a grand jury, but they won't because Osborne won't pursue it. That's the second reason he walked out of here without a fight. He knows how the world wobbles. He knows what kind of force I now possess, and he knows he can't fight it. There was a long silence after that. I had a lot to think about, and I didn't feel good about most of it. At one point Lisa reached for the pack of cigarettes, then changed her mind. She waited for me to work it out. It is a terrific force, isn't it? I finally said. It's frightening, she agreed. Don't think it doesn't scare me. Don't think I haven't had fantasies of being superwoman. Power is an awful temptation, and it's not easy to reject. There's so much I could do. Will you? I'm not talking about stealing things or getting rich. I didn't think you were. This is political power, but I don't know how to wield it. It sounds corny, but to use it for good. I've seen so much evil come from good intentions. I don't think I'm wise enough to do any good. And the chances of getting torn up like Kluge did are large. But I'm wise enough to walk away from it. I'm still a street urchin from Saigon, Yank. I'm smart enough not to use it unless I have to. But I can't give it away, and I can't destroy it. Is that stupid? I didn't have a good answer for that one. 
but I had a bad feeling. My doubts had another week to work on me. I didn't come to any great moral conclusions. Lisa knew of some crimes, and she wasn't reporting them to the authorities. That didn't bother me much. She had at her fingertips the means to commit more crimes, and that bothered me a lot. Yet I really didn't think she planned to do anything. She was smart enough to use the things she had only in a defensive way. But with Lisa, that could cover a lot of ground. When she didn't show up for dinner one evening, I went over to Kluge's and found her busy in the living room. A nine-foot section of shelving had been cleared. The discs and tapes were stacked on a table. She had a big plastic garbage can and a magnet the size of a softball. I watched her wave a tape near the magnet, then toss it in the garbage can, which was almost full. She glanced up, did the same operation with a handful of discs, then took off her glasses and wiped her eyes. "'Feel any better now, Victor?' she asked. What do you mean? I feel fine. No, you don't. And I haven't felt right either. It hurts me to do it, but I have to. You want to go get the other trash can? I did, and helped her pull more software from the shelves. You're not going to wipe at all, are you? No. I'm wiping records and something else. Are you going to tell me what? There are things it's better not to know, she said darkly. I finally managed to convince her to talk over dinner. She had said little, just eating and shaking her head. But she gave in. Rather dreary, actually, she said. I've been probing around some delicate places the last couple days. These are places Kluge visited at will, but they scare the hell out of me. Dirty places. Places where they know things I thought I'd like to find out. She shivered and seemed reluctant to go on. Are you talking about military computers? The CIA? The CIA is where it starts. It's the easiest. I've looked around at NORAD. That's the guys who get to fight the next war. It makes me shiver to see how easy Kluge got in there. He cobbled up a way to start World War III, just as an exercise. That's one of the things we just erased. The last two days I was nibbling around the edges of the big boys. The Defense Intelligence Agency and the National Security... something... D.I.A. and N.S.A. Each of them is bigger than the C.I.A. Something knew I was there, some watchdog program. As soon as I realized that, I got out quick, and I've spent the last five hours being sure it didn't follow me. And now I'm sure, and I've destroyed all that, too. You think they're the ones who killed Kluge? They're surely the best candidates. He had tons of their stuff. I know he helped design the biggest installation at N.S.A., and he'd been poking around in there for years. One false step is all it would take. Did you get it all? I mean, are you sure? I'm sure they didn't track me. I'm not sure I've destroyed all the records. I'm going back now to take a last look. I'll go with you. We worked until well after midnight. Lisa would review a tape or a disc, and if she was in any doubt, toss it to me for the magnetic treatment. At one point, simply because she was unsure, she took the magnet and passed it in front of an entire shelf of software. It was amazing to think about it. With that one swipe, she had randomized billions of bits of information. Some of it might not exist anywhere else in the world. I found myself confronted by even harder questions. Did she have the right to do it? Did knowledge exist for everyone? But I confess I had little trouble quelling my protests. Mostly I was happy to see it go. The old reactionary in me found it easier to believe there are things we are not meant to know. We were almost through when her monitor screen began to malfunction. It actually gave off a few hisses and pops, so Lisa stood back from it for a moment. Then the screen started to flicker. I stared at it for a while. It seemed to me there was an image trying to form in the screen, something three-dimensional. Just as I was starting to get a picture of it, I happened to glance at Lisa, and she was looking at me. Her face was flickering. She came to me and put her hands over my eyes. Victor, you shouldn't look at that. It's okay, I told her. And when I said it, it was. But as soon as I had the words out, I knew it wasn't. And that is the last thing I remembered for a long time. I'm told it was a very bad two weeks. I remember very little of it. I was kept under high dosage of drugs, and my few lucid periods were always followed by a fresh seizure. 
The first thing I recalled clearly was looking up at Dr. Stewart's face. I was in a hospital bed. I later learned it was in Cedars Sinai, not the veterans' hospital. Lisa had paid for a private room. Stewart put me through the usual questions. I was able to answer them, though I was very tired. When he was satisfied as to my condition, he finally began to answer some of my questions. I learned how long I had been there and how it had happened. You went into consecutive seizures, he confirmed. I don't know why, frankly. You haven't been prone to them for a decade. I was thinking you were well under control, but nothing is ever really stable, I guess. So Lisa got me here in time. She did more than that. She didn't want to level with me at first. It seems that after the first seizure she witnessed, she read everything she could find. From that day, she had a syringe and solution of Valium handy. When she saw you couldn't breathe, she injected you with 100 milligrams, and there's no doubt it saved your life. Stuart and I had known each other a long time. He knew I had no prescription for Valium, though we had talked about it the last time I was hospitalized. Since I lived alone, there would be no one to inject me if I got in trouble. He was more interested in results than anything else, and what Lisa did had the desired result. I was still alive. He wouldn't let me have any visitors that day. I protested, but soon was asleep. The next day she came. She wore a new T-shirt. This one had a picture of a robot wearing a gown and mortarboard, and said, Class of 11111-000000. It turns out that was 1984 in binary notation. She had a big smile and said, Hi, Yank. And as she sat on the bed, I started to shake. She looked alarmed and asked if she should call the doctor. It's not that, I managed to say. I'd like it if you just held me. She took off her shoes and got under the covers with me. She held me tightly. At some point a nurse came in and tried to shoo her out. Lisa gave her profanities in Vietnamese, Chinese, and a few startling ones in English, and the nurse left. I saw Dr. Stewart glance in later. I felt much better when I finally stopped crying. Lisa's eyes were wet, too. I've been here every day, she said. You look awful, Victor. I feel a lot better. Well, you look better than you did, but your doctor says you'd better stick around another couple of days just to make sure. I think he's right. I'm planning a big dinner for when you get back. You think we should invite the neighbors? I didn't say anything for a while. There were so many things we hadn't faced. Just how long could it go on between us? How long before I got sour about being so useless? How long before she got tired of being with an old man? I don't know just when I had started to think of Lisa as a permanent part of my life, and I wondered how I could have thought that. Do you want to spend more years waiting in hospitals for a man to die? What do you want, Victor? I'll marry you if you want me to, or I'll live with you in sin. I prefer sin, but if it'll make you happy. I don't know why you want to saddle yourself with an epileptic old fart. Because I love you. It was the first time she had said it. I could have gone on questioning, bringing up her major again, for instance, but I had no urge to. I'm very glad I didn't so I changed the subject. Did you get the job finished? She knew which job I was talking about. She lowered her voice and put her mouth close to my ear. Let's don't be specific about it here, Victor. I don't trust any place I haven't swept for bugs. But to put your mind at ease, I did finish, and it's been a quiet couple of weeks. No one is any wiser, and I'll never meddle in things like that again. I felt a lot better. I was also exhausted. I tried to conceal my yawns, but she sensed it was time to go. She gave me one more kiss, promising many more to come, and left me. It was the last time I ever saw her. At about ten o'clock that evening, Lisa went into Kluge's kitchen with a screwdriver and some other tools and got to work on the microwave oven. The manufacturers of those appliances are very careful to ensure they can't be turned on with the door open as they emit lethal radiation. But with simple tools and a good brain, it is possible to circumvent the safety interlocks. Lisa had no trouble with them. About ten minutes after she entered the kitchen, she put her head in the oven and turned it on. It is impossible to say how long she held her head in there. 
It was long enough to turn her eyeballs to the consistency of boiled eggs. At some point she lost voluntary muscle control and fell to the floor, pulling the microwave down with her. It shorted out, and a fire started. The fire set off the sophisticated burglar alarm she had installed a month before. Betty Lanier saw the flames and called the fire department as Hal ran across the street and into the burning kitchen. He dragged what was left of Lisa out onto the grass. When he saw what the fire had done to her upper body, and in particular her breasts, he threw up. She was rushed to the hospital. The doctors there amputated one arm and cut away the frightful masses of vulcanized silicone, pulled all her teeth, and didn't know what to do about the eyes. They put her on a respirator. It was an orderly who first noticed the blackened and bloody T-shirt they had cut from her. Some of the message was unreadable, but it began, I can't go on this way any more. There is no other way I could have told all that. I discovered it piecemeal, starting with the disturbed look on Dr. Stewart's face when Lisa didn't show up the next day. He wouldn't tell me anything, and I had another seizure shortly after. The next week is a blur. I remember being released from the hospital, but I don't remember the trip home. Betty was very good to me. They gave me a tranquilizer called Transine, and it was even better. I ate them like candy. I wandered in a drugged haze, eating only when Betty insisted, sleeping, sitting up in my chair, coming awake, not knowing where or who I was. I returned to the prison camp many times. Once I recall helping Lisa stack severed heads. When I saw myself in the mirror, there was a vague smile on my face. It was Transine caressing my frontal lobes. I knew that if I was to live much longer, me and Transine would have to become very good friends. I eventually became capable of something that passed for rational thought. I was helped along somewhat by a visit from Osborne. I was trying at that time to find reasons to live and wondered if he had any. I'm very sorry, he started off. I said nothing. This is on my own time, he went on. The department doesn't know I'm here. Was it suicide? I asked him. I brought along a copy of the, the note. She ordered it from a shirt company in Westwood three days before the accident. He handed it to me and I read it. I was mentioned, though not by name. I was the man I love. She said she couldn't cope with my problems. It was a short note. You can't get too much on a T-shirt. I read it through five times, then handed it back to him. She told you Kluge didn't write his note. I tell you, she didn't write this. He nodded reluctantly. I felt a vast calm with a howling nightmare just below it. Praise Transine. Can you back that up? She saw me in the hospital shortly before she died. She was full of life and hope. You say she ordered the shirt three days before. I would have felt that. And that note is pathetic. Lisa was never pathetic. He nodded again. Some things I want to tell you. There were no signs of a struggle. Mrs. Lanier is sure no one came in the front. The crime lab went over the whole place, and we're sure no one was in there with her. I'd stake my life on the fact that no one entered or left that house. Now, I don't believe it was suicide either, but do you have any suggestions? The NSA, I said. I explained about the last things she had done while I was still there. I told him of her fear of the government spy agencies. That was all I had. Well, I guess they're the ones who could do a thing like that, if anyone could. But I'll tell you, I have a hard time swallowing it. I don't know why, for one thing. Maybe you believe those people kill like you and I'd swat a fly? His look made it into a question. I don't know what I believe. I'm not saying they wouldn't kill for national security or some such shit. But they'd have taken the computers, too. They wouldn't have let her alone. They wouldn't even have let her near that stuff after they killed Kluge. What you're saying makes sense. He muttered on about it for quite some time. Eventually I offered him some wine. He accepted, thankfully. I considered joining him. It would be a quick way to die, but did not. He drank the whole bottle and was comfortably drunk when he suggested we go next door and look it over one more time. I was planning on visiting Lisa the next day, and I knew I had to start somewhere building myself up for that, so I agreed to go with him. We inspected the kitchen. 
The fire had blackened. The counters had melted some linoleum, but not much else. Water had made a mess of the place. There was a brown stain on the floor, which I was able to look at with no emotion. So we went back to the living room, and one of the computers was turned on. There was a short message on the screen. If you wish to know more, press Enter. Don't do it, I told him. But he did. He stood blinking solemnly as the words wiped themselves out and a new message appeared. You looked. The screen started to flicker, and I was in my car, in darkness, with a pill in my mouth and another in my hand. I spit out the pill and sat for a moment, listening to the old engine ticking over. In my other hand was the plastic pill bottle. I felt very tired, but opened the car door and shut off the engine. I felt my way to the garage door and opened it. The air outside was fresh and sweet. I looked down at the pill bottle and hurried into the bathroom. When I got through what had to be done, there were a dozen pills floating in the toilet that hadn't even dissolved. There were the wasted shells of many more, and a lot of other stuff I won't bother to describe. I counted the pills in the bottle, remembered how many there had been, and wondered if I would make it. I went over to Kluge's house and could not find Osborne. I was getting tired, but I made it back to my house and stretched out on the couch to see if I would live or die. The next day I found the story in the paper. Osborne had gone home and blown out the back of his head with his revolver. It was not a big story. It happened to cops all the time. He didn't leave a note. I got on the bus and rode out to the hospital and spent three hours trying to get in to see Lisa. I wasn't able to do it. I was not a relative, and the doctors were quite firm about her having no visitors. When I got angry, they were as gentle as possible. It was then I learned the extent of her injuries. Hal had kept the worst from me. None of it would have mattered, but the doctors swore there was nothing left in her head. So I went home. She died two days later. She had left a will, to my surprise. I got the house and contents. I picked up the phone as soon as I learned of it and called a garbage company. While they were on the way, I went for the last time into Kluge's house. The same message. Press Enter. I cautiously located the power switch and turned it off. I had the garbage people strip the place to the bare wall. I went over my own house very carefully, looking for anything that was even the first cousin to a computer. I threw out the radio. I sold the car and the refrigerator and the stove and the blender and the electric clock. I drained the waterbed and threw out the heater. Then I bought the best propane stove on the market and hunted a long time before I found an old icebox. I had the garage stacked to the ceiling with firewood. I had the chimney cleaned. It would be getting cold soon. One day I took the bus to Pasadena and established the Lisa Fu Memorial Scholarship Fund for Vietnamese refugees and their children. I endowed it with $700,083.04. I told them it could be used for any field of study except computer science. I could tell they thought me eccentric. And I really thought I was safe, until the phone rang. I thought it over for a long time before answering it. In the end, I knew it would just keep on going, until I did. So I picked it up. For a few seconds there was a dial tone, but I was not fooled. I kept holding it to my ear, and finally the tone turned off. There was just silence. I listened intently. I heard some of those far-off musical tones that live in phone wires, echoes of conversations taking place a thousand miles away, and something infinitely more distant and cool. I do not know what they have incubated out there at the NSA. I don't know if they did it on purpose, or if it just happened, or if it even has anything to do with them in the end. But I know it's out there, because I heard its soul breathing on the wires. I spoke very carefully. I do not wish to know any more, I said. I won't tell anyone anything. Kluge, Lisa, and Osborne all committed suicide. I am just a lonely man, and I won't cause you any trouble. There was a click and a dial tone. Getting the phone taken out was easy. Getting them to remove all the wires was a little harder, since once a place is wired, they expect it to be wired forever. They grumbled, but when I started pulling them out myself, they relented, though they warned me it was going to cost. The power company was harder. 
They actually seemed to believe there was a regulation requiring each house to be hooked up to the grid. They were willing to shut off my power, though hardly pleased about it, but they just weren't going to take the wires away from my house. I went up on the roof with an axe and demolished four feet of eaves as they gaped at me. Then they coiled up their wires and went home. I threw out all my lamps, all things electrical. With hammer, chisel, and handsaw, I went to work on the drywall just above the baseboards. As I stripped the house of wiring, I wondered many times why I was doing it. Why was it worth it? I couldn't have very many years before a final seizure finished me off. Those years were not going to be a lot of fun. Lisa had been a survivor. She would have known why I was doing this. She had once said I was a survivor, too. I survived the camp. I survived the death of my mother and father and managed to fashion a solitary life. Lisa survived the death of just about everything. No survivor expects to live through it all. But while she was alive, she would have worked to stay alive. And that's what I did. I got all the wires out of the walls, went over the house with a magnet to see if I had missed any metal, then spent a week cleaning up, fixing the holes I had knocked in the walls, ceiling, and attic. I was amused trying to picture the real estate agent selling this place after I was gone. It's a great little house, folks. No electricity. Now I live quietly, as before. I work in my garden during most of the daylight hours. I've expanded it considerably and even have things growing in the front yard now. I live by candlelight and kerosene lamp. I grow most of what I eat. It took a long time to taper off the transine and the dilantin, but I did it, and now take the seizures as they come. I've usually got bruises to show for it. In the middle of a vast city I have cut myself off. I am not part of the network, growing faster than I can conceive. I don't even know if it's dangerous to ordinary people. It noticed me and Kluge and Osborne and Lisa. It brushed against our minds like I would brush away a mosquito, never noticing I had crushed it. Only I survived. But I wonder. It would be very hard. Lisa told me how it can get in through the wiring. There's something called a carrier wave that can move over wires carrying household current. That's why the electricity had to go. I need water for my garden. There's just not enough rain here in Southern California, and I don't know how else I could get the water. Do you think it could come through the pipes? Introduction to The Pusher Not long before the Monte Carlo burned to the ground, we had moved into a travel trailer on Sovi Island, ten minutes outside Portland. Lewis and Clark camped there for a while, almost two hundred years before. They complained that quacking Canada geese kept them awake all night. Not surprising. There are hundreds of thousands of them. You'd never know Portland was so close. We were right on the Columbia River. Huge ships would glide by silently all day long. In the spring and summer we picked and ate the best peaches, strawberries, raspberries, and tomatoes I've ever had. Our plan was to travel around the country, stopping here and there for a couple months. We ended up staying on Sovi a lot longer than we planned, but eventually traded the trailer in on an RV and hit the road. We got as far as the central coast of California area near Pismo Beach, where we've been for a while. It's a great spot. We're parked about fifty yards from the beach. Most days I feel like Jim Rockford, except I don't get shot at as much. The weather here is mild, but the geology is exciting. A few days before this last Christmas we had a 6.5 earthquake that tossed the RV around like a matchbox toy, cracked the pavements and sewers and a few houses down the street, and left us without an Internet connection or electricity for 24 hours. The area has historically attracted some odd people. About a quarter of a mile from us there was, in the 1930s, a community of artists, nonconformists, communists, and nudists who called themselves Dunites because they lived in rent-free shacks in the dunes. Forty-five miles north of us is San Simeon, where William Randolph Hearst, a stately pleasure dome, decreed. You can see it up on the hill if you stand on the beach where eight thousand elephant seals haul out for winter mating and forty-five miles south of us is another pleasure dome, Neverland Ranch. A few days ago, as I write this, Michael Jackson was arraigned in criminal court in Santa Maria 
fifteen miles south of us. Lee and I like circuses, so we went down there to watch it. All we saw of the King of Pop was a pale, pale hand stuck out of an SUV's window, waving. After that, just the top of an umbrella, moving slowly over the tops of heads. I could describe the scene, but unless you never watch TV news, or are having this book delivered via FedEx hypermail to a planet-circling Beetlejuice, and the television signal hasn't reached you yet, you've already seen it all. Probably a lot more than you wanted to see. But there were guys there from the Nation of Islam handing out invitations to Neverland. In the spirit of love and togetherness, Michael Jackson would like to invite his fans and supporters to his Neverland Ranch. Please join us Friday, January 16, 2004, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Refreshments will be served. We'll see you there. We are neither fans nor supporters, but when we got there, no one asked us to sign a loyalty oath. We were required to sign a secrecy agreement, however, promising not to write about our experiences within the gates for profit. These introductions would seem to fall into that category, so that's all I can say about the day we spent there. But I specifically asked if it was okay to write an account and post it on my website, and was told that was fine. So if you're interested, you can find it at www.varley.net. For free. I can't tell you why Michael Jackson is the perfect way to start an introduction to the following story without spoiling the story for you. I can tell you that it is the only story I ever wrote that my ex-wife didn't like. She had always been my first reader, and after she finished this one, she practically threw the pages back in my face. Harsh words were exchanged, and I finally prevailed on her to read it again, which she did. She had missed something vital and totally misunderstood the story. I don't blame her for getting angry. If I had been saying what she thought I was saying, I'd have been enraged, too. Pretty much as enraged as I'll be at Michael Jackson if the allegations against him are proved to be true in court. The Pusher Things change. Ian Hayes expected that. Yet there are certain constants dictated by function and use. Ian looked for those, and he seldom went wrong. The playground was not much like the ones he had known as a child. But playgrounds are built to entertain children. They will always have something to swing on, something to slide down, something to climb. This one had all those things, and more. Part of it was thickly wooded. There was a swimming hole. The stationary apparatus was combined with dazzling light sculptures that darted in and out of reality. There were animals, too. Pygmy rhinoceros and elegant gazelles no taller than your knee. They seemed unnaturally gentle and unafraid. But most of all the playground had children. Ian liked children. He sat on a wooden park bench at the edge of the trees, in the shadows, and watched them. They came in all colors and all sizes, in both sexes. There were black ones like animated licorice jelly beans, and white ones like bunny rabbits, and brown ones with curly hair, and more brown ones with slanted eyes and straight black hair, and some who had been white, but were now toasted browner than some of the brown ones. Ian concentrated on the girls. He tried with boys before, long ago, but it had not worked out. He watched one black child for a time, trying to estimate her age. He thought it was around eight or nine. Too young. Another one was more like thirteen, judging from her skirt. A possibility, but he'd prefer something younger. Somebody less sophisticated, less suspicious. Finally, he found a girl he liked. She was brown, but with startling blonde hair. Ten? Possibly eleven young enough at any rate. He concentrated on her, and did the strange thing he did when he had selected the right one. He didn't know what it was, but it usually worked. Mostly it was just a matter of looking at her, keeping his eyes fixed on her no matter where she went or what she did, not allowing himself to be distracted by anything. And sure enough, in a few minutes she looked up, looked around, and her eyes locked with his. She held his gaze for a moment, then went back to her play. He relaxed. Possibly what he did was nothing at all. He had noticed with adult women that if one really caught his eye so he found himself staring at her, she would usually look up from what she was doing and catch him. It never seemed to fail. Talking to other men, he had found it to be a common experience. It was almost as if they could feel his gaze. 
Women had told him it was nonsense, or if not, it was just reaction to things seen peripherally by people trained to alertness for sexual signals. Merely an unconscious observation penetrating to the awareness. Nothing mysterious, like ESP. Perhaps. Still, Ian was very good at this sort of eye contact. Several times he had noticed the girls rubbing the backs of their necks while he observed them, or hunching their shoulders. Maybe they developed some kind of ESP and just didn't recognize it as such. Now he merely watched. He was smiling so that every time she looked up to see him, which she did with increasing frequency, she saw a friendly, slightly graying man with a broken nose and powerful shoulders. His hands were strong, too. He kept them clasped in his lap. Presently she began to wander in his direction. No one watching her would have thought she was coming toward him. She probably didn't know it herself. On her way she found reasons to stop and tumble, jump on the soft rubber mats, or chase a flock of noisy geese. But she was coming toward him, and she would end up on the park bench beside him. He glanced around quickly. As before, there were few adults in this playground. It had surprised him when he arrived. Apparently the new conditioning techniques had reduced the numbers of the violent and twisted to the point that parents felt it safe to allow their children to run without supervision. The adults present were involved with each other. No one had given him a second glance when he arrived. That was fine with Ian. It made what he planned to do much easier. He had his excuses ready, of course— but it could be embarrassing to be confronted with the questions representatives of the law ask single middle-aged men who hang around playgrounds. For a moment he considered with real concern how the parents of these children could feel so confident, even with mental conditioning. After all, no one was conditioned until he had first done something. New maniacs were presumably being produced every day. Typically they looked just like everyone else until they proved their difference by some demented act. Somebody ought to give those parents a stern lecture, he thought. Who are you? Ian frowned. Not eleven, surely, not seen up this close, maybe not even ten. She might be as young as eight. Would eight be all right? He tasted the idea with his usual caution, looked around again for curious eyes. He saw none. My name is Ian. What's yours? No, not your name. Who are you? You mean, what do I do? Yes. I'm a pusher. She thought that over, then smiled. She had permanent teeth crowded into a small jaw. You give away pills? He laughed. Very good, he said. You must do a lot of reading. She said nothing, but her manner indicated she was pleased. No, he said, that's an old kind of pusher. I'm the other kind. But you knew that, didn't you? When he smiled, she broke into giggles. She was doing the pointless things with her hands that little girls do. He thought she had a pretty good idea of how cute she was, but no inkling of her forbidden eroticism. She was a ripe seed with sexuality ready to burst to the surface. Her body was a bony sketch, a framework on which to build a woman. How old are you? That's a secret. What happened to your nose? I broke it a long time ago. I'll bet you're twelve. She giggled, then nodded. Eleven, then, and just barely. Do you want some candy? He reached into his pocket and pulled out the pink and white striped paper bag. She shook her head solemnly. My mother says not to take candy from strangers. But we're not strangers. I'm Ian, the pusher. She thought that over. While she hesitated, he reached into the bag and picked out a chocolate thing, so thick and gooey it was almost obscene. He bit into it, forcing himself to chew. He hated sweets. Okay, she said, and reached toward the bag. He pulled it away. She looked at him in innocent surprise. I just thought of something, he said. I don't know your name, so I guess we are strangers. She caught on to the game when she saw the twinkle in his eye. He'd practiced that. It was a good twinkle. My name is Radiant. Radiant Shining Star Smith. A very fancy name, he said, thinking how names had changed. For a very pretty girl. He paused and cocked his head. No, I don't think so. You're Radiant Star, with two R's. 
Captain Radiant Star of the Star Patrol. She was dubious for a moment. He wondered if he'd judged her wrong. Perhaps she was really Miss Radiant Fainting Heart Bell or Mrs. Radiant Motherhood. But her fingernails were a bit dirty for that. She pointed a finger at him and made a Donald Duck sound as her thumb worked back and forth. He put his hand to his heart and fell over sideways, and she dissolved in laughter. She was careful, however, to keep her weapon firmly trained on him. And you'd better give me that candy or I'll shoot you again. The playground was darker now and not so crowded. She sat beside him on the bench, swinging her legs. Her bare feet did not quite touch the dirt. She was going to be quite beautiful. He could see it clearly in her face. As for the body, who could tell? Not that he really gave a damn. She was dressed in a little of this and a little of that, worn here and there without much regard for his concepts of modesty. Many of the children wore nothing. It had been something of a shock when he arrived. Now he was almost used to it, but he still thought it incautious on the part of her parents. Did they really think the world was that safe, to let an eleven-year-old girl go practically naked in a public place? He sat there, listening to her prattle about her friends, the ones she hated and the one or two she simply adored, with only part of his attention. He inserted ums and uh-huhs in the right places. She was cute, there was no denying it. She seemed as sweet as a child that age ever gets, which can be very sweet, and as poisonous as a rattlesnake almost at the same moment. She had the capacity to be warm, but it was on the surface. Underneath she cared mostly about herself. Her loyalty would be a transitory thing, bestowed easily, just as easily forgotten. And why not? She was young. It was perfectly healthy for her to be that way. But did he dare try to touch her? It was crazy. It was insane, as they all told him it was. It worked so seldom. Why would it work with her? He felt a weight of defeat. Are you okay? Huh? Me? Oh, sure, I'm all right. Isn't your mother going to be worried about you? I don't have to be in for hours and hours yet. For a moment she looked so grown up he almost believed the lie. Well, I'm getting tired of sitting here. And the candy's all gone. He looked at her face. Most of the chocolate had ended up in a big circle around her mouth, except where she had wiped it daintily on her shoulder or forearm. What's back there? She turned. That? That's the swimming hole. Why don't we go over there? I'll tell you a story. The promise of a story was not enough to keep her out of the water. He didn't know if that was good or bad. He knew she was smart, a reader, and she had an imagination— but she was also active. That pull was too strong for him. He sat far from the water under some bushes and watched her swim with the three other children still in the park this late in the evening. Maybe she would come back to him, and maybe she wouldn't. It wouldn't change his life either way, but it might change hers. She emerged dripping and infinitely cleaner from the murky water. She dressed again in her random scraps for whatever good it did her, and came to him shivering. I'm cold, she said. Here. He took off his jacket. She looked at his hands as he wrapped it around her, and once she reached out and touched the hardness of his shoulder. You sure must be strong, she commented. Pretty strong. I work hard, being a pusher. Just what is a pusher, she said, and stifled a yawn. Come sit on my lap, and I'll tell you. He did tell her and it was a very good story that no adventurous child could resist. He had practiced that story, refined it, told it many times into a recorder until he had the rhythms and cadences just right, until he found just the right words. Not too difficult words, but words with some fire and juice in them. And once more he grew encouraged. She had been tired when he started, but he gradually caught her attention. It was possible no one had ever told her a story in quite that way. She was used to sitting before the screen and having a story shoved into her eyes and ears. It was something new to be able to interrupt with questions and get answers. Even reading was not like that. It was the oral tradition of storytelling, and it could still mesmerize the nth generation of the electronic age. That sounds great, she said when she was sure he was through. You liked it? I really, truly did. I think I want to be a pusher when I grow up. 
That was a really neat story. Well, that's not actually the story I was going to tell you. That's just what it's like to be a pusher. You mean you have another story? Sure. He looked at his watch. But I'm afraid it's getting late. It's almost dark and everybody's gone home. You'd probably better go, too. She was in agony, torn between what she was supposed to do and what she wanted. It really should be no contest if she was who he thought she was. Well, but, but I'll come back here tomorrow and you— He was shaking his head. My ship leaves in the morning, he said. There's no time. Then tell me now. I can stay out. Tell me now. Please, please, please. He coyly resisted, harumped, protested, but in the end allowed himself to be seduced. He felt very good. He had her like a five-pound trout on a twenty-pound line. It wasn't sporting. But then he wasn't playing a game. So at last he got to his specialty. He sometimes wished he could claim the story for his own, but the fact was he could not make up stories. He no longer tried to. Instead, he cribbed from every fairy tale and fantasy story he could find. If he had a genius, it was in adapting some of the elements to fit the world she knew, while keeping it strange enough to enthrall her, and in ad-living the end to personalize it. It was a wonderful tale, he told. It had enchanted castles sitting on mountains of glass, moist caverns beneath the sea, fleets of starships and shining riders, astride horses that flew the galaxy. There were evil alien creatures, and others with much good in them. There were drugged potions. Scaled beasts roared out of hyperspace to devour planets. Amid all the turmoil strode the prince and princess. They got into frightful jams and helped each other out of them. The story was never quite the same. He watched her eyes. When they wandered, he threw away whole chunks of story. When they widened, he knew what parts to plug in later. He tailored it to her reactions. The child was sleepy. Sooner or later she would surrender. He needed her in a trance state, neither awake nor asleep. That is when the story would end. And though the healers labored long and hard, they could not save the princess. She died that night, far from her prince. Her mouth was a little round O. Oh, stories were not supposed to end that way. Is that all? She died, and she never saw the prince again? Well, not quite all, but the rest of it probably isn't true, and I shouldn't tell it to you. Ian felt pleasantly tired. His throat was a little raw, making him hoarse. Radiant was a warm weight on his lap. You have to tell me, you know, she said reasonably. He supposed she was right. He took a deep breath. All right. At the funeral, all the greatest people from that part of the galaxy were in attendance. Among them was the greatest sorcerer who ever lived. His name, but I really shouldn't tell you his name. I'm sure he'd be very cross if I did. This sorcerer passed by the princess's beer. That's a... I know, I know, Ian. Go on. Suddenly he frowned and leaned over her pale form. What is this? he thundered. Why was I not told? Everyone was very concerned. This sorcerer was a dangerous man. One time when someone insulted him, he made a spell that turned everyone's head backwards, so they had to walk around with rearview mirrors. No one knew what he would do if he got really angry. This princess is wearing the star stone, he said, and drew himself up and frowned all around as if he were surrounded by idiots. I'm sure he thought he was, and maybe he was right, because he went on to tell them just what the star stone was and what it did, something no one there had ever heard before. And this is the part I'm not sure of. Because, though everyone knew the sorcerer was a wise and powerful man, he was also known as a great liar. He said that the Star Stone was capable of capturing the essence of a person at the moment of her death. All her wisdom, all her power, all her knowledge and beauty and strength would flow into the stone and be held there, timelessly. In suspended animation, Radiant breathed. Precisely. When they heard this, the people were amazed. They buffeted the sorcerer with questions, to which he gave few answers, and those only grudgingly. Finally he left in a huff. When he was gone, everyone talked long into the night about the things he had said. 
Some felt the sorcerer had held out hope that the princess might yet live on, that if her body were frozen, the prince, upon his return, might somehow infuse her essence back within her. Others thought the sorcerer had said that was impossible, that the princess was doomed to a half-life locked in the stone. But the opinion that prevailed was this. The princess would probably never come fully back to life, but her essence might flow from the star stone and into another, if the right person could be found. All agreed this person must be a young maiden. She must be beautiful, very smart, swift of foot, loving, kind. Oh, my, the list was very long. Everyone doubted such a person could be found. Many did not even want to try. But at last it was decided the star stone would be given to a faithful friend of the prince. He would search the galaxy for this maiden. If she existed, he would find her. So he departed with the blessings of many worlds behind him, vowing to find the maiden and give her the star stone. He stopped again, cleared his throat, and let the silence grow. "'Is that all?' she said, at last, in a whisper. "'Not quite all,' he admitted. "'I'm afraid I tricked you.' "'Tricked me?' He opened the front of his coat, which was still draped around her shoulders. He reached in past her bony chest and down into an inner pocket of the coat. He came up with the crystal. It was oval, with one side flat. It pulsed ruby light as it sat in the palm of his hand. "'It shines,' she said, looking at it wide-eyed and open-mouthed. "'Yes, it does, and that means you're the one.' "'Me?' "'Yes. Take it.' He handed it to her, and as he did so he nicked it with his thumbnail. Red light spilled into her hands, flowed between her fingers, seemed to soak into her skin. When it was over, the crystal still pulsed, but dimmed. Her hands were trembling. It felt very, very hot, she said. That was the essence of the princess. And the prince? Is he still looking for her? No one knows. I think he's still out there, and some day he will come back for her. And what then? He looked away from her. I can't say. I think, even though you are lovely, and even though you have the star stone, that he will just pine away. He loved her very much. I'd take care of him, she promised. Maybe that would help. But I have a problem now. I don't have the heart to tell the prince that she is dead. Yet I feel that the star stone will draw him to it one day. If he comes and finds you, I fear for him. I think perhaps I should take the stone to a far part of the galaxy, some place he could never find it. Then at least he would never know. It might be better that way. But I'd help him, she said earnestly. I promise I'd wait for him, and when he came I'd take her place. You'll see. He studied her. Perhaps she would. He looked into her eyes for a long time, and at last let her see his satisfaction. Very well. You can keep it, then. I'll wait for him, she said. You'll see. She was very tired, almost asleep. You should go home now, he suggested. Maybe I could just lie down for a moment, she said. All right. He lifted her gently and placed her prone on the ground. He stood looking down at her, then knelt beside her and began to gently stroke her forehead. She opened her eyes with no alarm, then closed them again. He continued to stroke her. Twenty minutes later, he left the playground, alone. He was always depressed afterwards. It was worse than usual this time. She had been much nicer than he had imagined at first. Who could have guessed such a romantic heart beat beneath all that dirt? He found a phone booth several blocks away. Punching her name into information yielded a fifteen-digit number, which he called. He held his hand over the camera eye. A woman's face appeared on the screen. "'Your daughter is in the playground, at the south end by the pool, under the bushes,' he said. He gave the address of the playground. "'We were so worried. What? Is she—' Who is? He hung up and hurried away. Most of the other pushers thought he was sick. Not that it mattered. Pushers were a tolerant group when it came to other pushers, and especially when it came to anything a pusher might care to do to a puller. He wished he had never told anyone how he spent his leave time, but he had, and now he had to live with it. 
So while they didn't care if he amused himself by pulling the legs and arms off infant polar pups, they were all just back from ground leave and couldn't pass up an opportunity to get on each other's nerves. They ragged him mercilessly. How are the swing sets this trip, Ian? Did you bring me those dirty knickers I asked for? Was it good for you, honey? Did she pant and slobber? My ten-year-old baby, she's a-pulling me back home. Ian bore it stoically. It was an extremely bad taste, and he was the brunt of it, but it really didn't matter. It would end as soon as they lifted again. They would never understand what he sought, but he felt he understood them. They hated coming to earth. There was nothing for them there, and perhaps they wished there was. And he was a pusher himself. He didn't care for pullers. He agreed with the sentiment expressed by Marion shortly after liftoff. Marion had just finished her first ground leave after her first voyage, so naturally she was the drunkest of them all. Gravity sucks, she said, and threw up. It was three months to Amity and three months back. He hadn't the foggiest idea of how far it was in miles. After the tenth or eleventh zero, his mind clicked off. Amity. Shit city. He didn't even get off the ship. Why bother? The planet was peopled with things that looked like ten-ton caterpillars and a little like sentient green turds. Toilets were a revolutionary idea to the Amatai. So were ice cream bars, sherbets, sugar donuts, and peppermint. Plumbing had never caught on, but sweets had, so the ship was laden with plain and fancy desserts from every nation on earth. In addition, there was a pouch of reassuring mail for the forlorn human embassy. The cargo for the return trip was some grayish sludge that Ian supposed someone on earth found tremendously valuable, and a packet of desperate mail for the folks back home. Ian didn't need to read the letters to know what was in them. They could all be summed up as, Get me out of here. He sat at the viewport and watched an Amity family lumbering and farting its way down the spaceport road. They paused every so often to do something that looked like an alien clusterfuck. The road was brown. The land was brown, and in the distance were brown, unremarkable hills. There was a brown haze in the air, and the sun was yellow-brown. He thought of castles perched on mountains of glass, of princes and princesses, of shining white horses galloping among the stars. He spent the return trip just as he had on the way out sweating down in the gargantuan pipes of the star drive. Just beyond the metal walls, unimaginable energies pulsed, and on the walls themselves tiny plasmoids grew into bigger plasmoids. The process was too slow to see, but if left unchecked, the incrustations would soon impair the engines. His job was to scrape them off. Not everyone was cut out to be an astrogator. And what of it? It was honest work. He had made his choices long ago. You spent your life either pulling G's or pushing C, and when you got tired, you grabbed some Z's. If there was a pusher's code, that was it. The plasmoids were red and crystalline, teardrop-shaped. When he broke them free of the walls, they had one flat side. They were full of a liquid light that felt as hot as the center of the sun. It was always hard to get off the ship. A lot of pushers never did. One day he wouldn't either. He stood for a few moments looking at it all. It was necessary to soak it in passively at first, get used to the changes. Big changes didn't bother him. Buildings were just the world's furniture, and he didn't care how it was arranged. Small changes worried the shit out of him. Ears, for instance. Very few of the people he saw had earlobes. Each time he returned, he felt a little more like an ape who has fallen from his tree. One day he'd return to find everybody had three eyes or six fingers, or that little girls no longer cared to hear stories of adventure. He stood there, dithering, getting used to the way people were painting their faces, listening to what sounded like Spanish being spoken all around him. Occasional English or Arabic words seasoned it. He grabbed a crewmate's arm and asked him where they were. The man didn't know, so he asked the captain, and she said it was Argentina or it had been when they left. The phone booths were smaller. He wondered why. There were four names in his book. He sat there facing the phone, wondering which name to call first. 
His eyes were drawn to Radiant Shining Star Smith, so he punched that name into the phone. He got a number and an address in Novosibirsk. Checking the timetable he had picked up, putting off making the call, he found the Antipodean shuttle left on the hour. Then he wiped his hands on his pants and took a deep breath and looked up to see her standing outside the phone booth. They regarded each other silently for a moment. She saw a man much shorter than she remembered, but powerfully built, with big hands and shoulders and a pitted face that would have been forbidding but for the gentle eyes. He saw a tall woman around forty years old who was fully as beautiful as he had expected she would be. The hand of age had just begun to touch her. He thought she was fighting that waistline and fretting about those wrinkles, but none of that mattered to him. Only one thing mattered, and he would know it soon enough. You are Ian Hayes, aren't you? she said at last. It was sheer luck I remembered you again, she was saying. He noted the choice of words. She could have said coincidence. It was two years ago. We were moving again, and I was sorting through some things, and I came across that plasmoid. I hadn't thought about you in, oh, it must have been fifteen years. He said something noncommittal. They were in a restaurant away from most of the other patrons, at a booth near a glass wall, beyond which spaceships were being trundled to and from the blast pits. "'I hope I didn't get you into trouble,' he said. She shrugged it away. "'You did, some, but that was so long ago. I certainly wouldn't bear a grudge that long, and the fact is I thought it was all worth it at the time.' She went on to tell him of the uproar he had caused in her family of the visits by the police, the interrogation, puzzlement, and final helplessness. No one knew quite what to make of her story. They had identified him quickly enough only to find he had left Earth and would not be back for a long, long time. I didn't break any laws, he pointed out. That's what no one could understand. I told them you had talked to me and told me a long story, and then I went to sleep. None of them seemed interested in what the story was about, so I didn't tell them. And I didn't tell them about the... the Starstone. She smiled. Actually, I was relieved they hadn't asked. I was determined not to tell them. But I was a little afraid of holding it all back. I thought they were agents of the... Who were the villains in your story? I've forgotten. It's not important. I guess not. But something is. Yes. Maybe you should tell me what it is. Maybe you can answer the question that's been in the back of my head for twenty-five years, ever since I found out that thing you gave me was just the scrapings from a starship engine. Was it, he said, looking into her eyes. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it was more than that. I'm asking you if it wasn't more. She looked at him again. He felt himself being appraised for the third or fourth time since they met. He still didn't know the verdict. Yes, I guess it was more she said at last. I'm glad. I believed in that story passionately for, oh, years and years. Then I stopped believing it. All at once? No, gradually. It didn't hurt much. Part of growing up, I guess. And you remembered me. Well, that took some work. I went to a hypnotist when I was twenty-five and recovered your name and the name of the ship. Did you know? Yes, I mentioned them on purpose. She nodded, and they fell silent again. When she looked at him now, he saw more sympathy, less defensiveness. But there was still a question. Why? she said. He nodded, then looked away from her out to the starships. He wished he was on one of them, pushing sea. It wasn't working. He knew it wasn't. He was a weird problem to her, something to get straightened out, a loose end in her life that would irritate until it was made to fit in then be forgotten. To hell with it. Hoping to get laid, he said. When he looked up, she was slowly shaking her head back and forth. Don't trifle with me, Hayes. You're not as stupid as you look. You knew I'd be married, leading my own life. You knew I wouldn't drop it all because of some half-remembered fairy tale thirty years ago. Why? And how could he explain the strangeness of it all to her? What do you do? He recalled something and rephrased it. Who are you? She looked startled. I'm a mysteliologist. He spread his hands. 
I don't even know what that is. Come to think of it, there was no such thing when you left. That's it, in a way, he said. He felt helpless again. Obviously, I had no way of knowing what you'd do, what you'd become, what would happen to you that you had no control over. All I was gambling on was that you'd remember me, because that way— He saw the planet Earth looming up once more, out the viewport. So many, many years, and only six months later, a planet full of strangers. It didn't matter that Amity was full of strangers, but Earth was home, if that word still had any meaning for him. I wanted someone my own age I could talk to, he said. That's all. All I want is a friend. He could see her trying to understand what it was like. She wouldn't, but maybe she'd come close enough to think she did. Maybe you've found one, she said, and smiled. At least I'm willing to get to know you, considering the efforts you've put into this. It wasn't much effort. It seems so long-term to you, but it wasn't to me. I held you on my lap six months ago. She giggled in almost the same way she had six months before. How long is your leave? she asked. Two months. Would you like to come stay with us for a while? We have room in our house. Will your husband mind? Neither my husband nor my wife. That's them sitting over there pretending to ignore us. Ian looked, caught the eye of a woman in her late twenties. She was sitting across from a man Ian's age who now turned and looked at Ian with some suspicion, but no active animosity. The woman smiled. The man reserved judgment. Radiant had a wife. Well, times change. Those two in the red skirts are police, Radiant was saying. So is that man over by the wall, and the one at the end of the bar. I spotted two of them, Ian said. When she looked surprised, he said, Cops always have a look about them. That's one of the things that don't change. You go back quite a ways, don't you? I'll bet you have some good stories. Ian thought about it and nodded. Some, I suppose. I should tell the police they can go home. I hope you don't mind that we brought them in. Of course not. I'll do that and then we can go. Oh, and I guess I should call the children and tell them we'll be home soon. She laughed, reached across the table and touched his hand. See what can happen in six months? I have three children, and Jillian has two. He looked up, interested. Are any of them girls? Introduction to Tango Charlie and Foxtrot Romeo This story contains a lot of dogs. They are Shetland sheepdogs, known to the people who love them as I do as Shelties, to the people who know nothing about them as miniature collies, and to all small children as Look, Mom, it's a little lassie. This seems a good time to say a few words about the living soul who I have shared my life with longer than anyone else. Longer than my first wife, longer than my sons. Longer than I lived at home with my parents and sisters. Longer than I have lived with Lee, though I hope in a few more years that will have changed. I'm speaking of the finest dog that ever lived, my beloved Shelty Chiroco. That's my prejudiced opinion, of course— but I would have no respect for any dog owner who wouldn't proudly say the same thing about that special dog who, for a time, made your life worth living through the down and lonely hours. She was our second Sheltie. We got the first, Fuchsia, from a friend in Marin County with half a dozen of them, who was basically letting her newest litter run wild at her country house. She was giving them away. Fuchsia lived for eleven years, brightening our lives then one day ran out in front of a car. The lady who hit her took her to the vet who couldn't save her. I was in Los Angeles when I heard the news, in the polo lounge taking my first meeting with the Millennium Production people. I couldn't continue, and they all understood. Chiroco's name came from the main character in the books I was writing at the time, the Gia Trilogy. I got her in a very well-run puppy farm one of a couple dozen Sheltie pups that swarmed me in the owner's living room. This one little female hung back, but when the rest started playing with each other, she came over and made me fall in love with her. The owner sneered. That's too white, she said. She has too much white on her legs and around the collar, and that little white spot on her butt. She's a cull. That means she is purebred, descended from champions, but I won't give you her papers unless you have her spade. 
Two whites' jeans were to be swept from the pool like rotten leaves. That struck me as monumentally stupid, but I didn't say so because it meant I could have her for one hundred fifty dollars instead of the five hundred dollars to six hundred dollars she wanted for the others. Dog breeders come in two varieties. The most finicky people on earth, fanatical about the breed standards, or cynical exploiters who churn out the most popular mutt of the moment, in breeding willy-nilly until they are producing animals with congenital defects that make hemophiliac European royalty seem handsome, healthy, and sane. I decided to be grateful this woman was the first type. I wasn't planning to show the dog or breed her. Again, I know I'm prejudiced, but I have been to quite a few dog shows, and I have never seen a Sheltie with a more magnificent coat than the one Shiroko soon grew, including the Sheltie that stood in the best-in-show circle a few years ago at Westminster. She was playful, as all puppies are, and loved to have fun later when she grew up, like all happy dogs do. But there was a dignity about her that was partly a characteristic of the breed and partly her own personality. She didn't care for little children. She would never, never bite them. But she tended to want to chivy them into a herd, round them up, and head them out the front door, as a good sheepdog should. She didn't fall on strangers, but after a while she would daintily accept a piece of cheese or a potato chip from them. Then later she would come back for more. Food is a dog's religion, as someone once said, and she worshipped at the same altar as all of her species. But she had to know you first. We were living in a big house on a hill overlooking Eugene when we got her. It had a fenced backyard that was at about a forty-five-degree angle. She would spend most of the day bounding up and crashing back down through the ivy, pausing at the three knot-holes in the fence where she could spy on the neighbor's German shepherds. I never heard her whine, not once in her life. She would yip at a sharp pain, and that was all. One night I heard her howl in agony. I threw open the back door, and she came slinking toward me as if she had done something bad. Her face was covered in blood. She had chased a raccoon that had been stealing her food. Nobody ever told her about raccoons, which should be attacked only with your pack backing you up. She had one bleeding cut on her face and four deep bites on the backs of her hind legs. Conclusion? She caught the coon, took one swipe across the face, then turned and ran. I would have, too. She was a lover, not a fighter. Once she was overcome with an insane spirit of adventure, and dug her way under the fence and went out to see the world, and promptly got lost. I spent a frantic hour driving the neighborhood, then found her in the dog pound, having a swell time playing with the little black dog. The instant she saw me, she tried to look miserable, repentant, and frightened. It was Academy Award time. The card pinned to the cage said something like, Sweet, affectionate, well cared for. This is someone's precious baby. Damn straight. When I went to pay her bail, I learned there was already quite a waiting list to adopt her. I could tell you a thousand stories about Shiroko. I could turn this into a book about Shiroko. If you want to know more about her, go to my website. She has her own page with pictures. Tell me if she isn't the most beautiful Sheltie you've ever seen. It all comes down, in the end, to death. They don't live as long as we do. We usually outlive them. It's probably better that way than the reverse, because if we die first, who will take care of them? At the age of nineteen and a half, Shiroko was still as beautiful as ever. You'd never know to see her sitting there that she was mostly blind, half-deaf, and so crippled by arthritis that she could no longer get on her feet by herself. After she spent the night lying in her own filth because she couldn't get up, we decided it was time. We gave her a good meal, which she enjoyed, took her for a last walk in the park, where she looked with great interest at things she could barely see, and tottered around for a bit. Then we took her to the vet, who gave her a lethal injection that killed her in seconds, with no evidence of pain. There was plenty of pain in the room, but it wasn't hers. Her ashes were scattered in an apple orchard in the Hood River Valley, one of the prettiest places on earth. Rereading this story, I wondered if I was somehow preparing myself for Shiroko's death. If so, it didn't work. I still miss her every day. Tango Charlie and Foxtrot Romeo
The police probe was ten kilometers from Tango Charlie's wheel when it made rendezvous with the unusual corpse. At this distance the wheel was still an imposing presence, blinding white against the dark sky, turning in perpetual sunlight. The probe was often struck by its beauty, by the myriad ways the wheel caught the light in its thousand and one windows. It had been composing a thought poem around that theme when the corpse first came to its attention. There was a pretty irony about the probe. Less than a meter in diameter, it was equipped with sensitive radar, very good visible light camera eyes, and a dim awareness. Its sentient qualities came from a walnut-sized lump of human brain tissue cultured in a lab. This was the cheapest and simplest way to endow a machine with certain human qualities that were often useful in spying devices. The part of the brain used was the part humans used to appreciate beautiful things. While the probe watched, it dreamed endless beautiful dreams. No one knew this but the probe's control, which was a computer that had not bothered to tell anyone about it. The computer did think it was rather sweet, though. There were many instructions the probe had to follow. It did so religiously. It was never to approach the wheel more closely than five kilometers. All objects larger than one centimeter leaving the wheel were to be pursued, caught, and examined. Certain categories were to be reported to higher authorities. All others were to be vaporized by the probe's small battery of lasers. In thirty years of observation, only a dozen objects had needed reporting. All of them proved to be large structural components of the wheel which had broken away under the stress of rotation. Each had been destroyed by the probe's larger brother, on station five hundred kilometers away. When it reached the corpse, it immediately identified it that far. It was a dead body, frozen in a vaguely fetal position. From there on, the probe got stuck. Many details about the body did not fit the acceptable parameters for such a thing. The probe examined it again, and still again, and kept coming up with the same unacceptable answers. It could not tell what the body was, and yet it was a body. The probe was so fascinated that its attention wavered for some time, and it was not as alert as it had been these previous years. So it was unprepared when the second falling object bumped gently against its metal hide. Quickly the probe leveled a camera eye at the second object. It was a single, long-stemmed red rose of a type that had once flourished in the wheel's florist shop. Like the corpse, it was frozen solid. The impact had shattered some of the outside petals, which rotated slowly in a halo around the rose itself. It was quite pretty. The probe resolved to compose a thought poem about it when this was all over. The probe photographed it, vaporized it with its lasers, all according to instruction, then sent the picture out on the airwaves along with a picture of the corpse and a frustrated shout. Help! the probe cried and sat back to await developments. "'A puppy?' Captain Herfer asked, arching one eyebrow dubiously. "'A Shetland sheepdog puppy, sir,' said Corporal Anna Louise Bach, handing him the batch of hollows of the enigmatic orbiting object, and the single shot of the shattered rose. He took them, leafed through them rapidly, puffing on his pipe. "'And it came from Tango Charlie?' "'There is no possible doubt about it, sir.' Bach stood at parade rest across the desk from her seated superior and cultivated a detached gaze. "'I'm only awaiting orders,' she told herself. "'I have no opinions of my own. I'm brimming with information, as any good recruit should be, but I will offer it only when asked, and then I will pour it forth until asked to stop.' That was the theory, anyway. Bach was not good at it. It was her ineptitude at humoring incompetence in superiors that had landed her in this assignment— and put her in contention for the title of oldest living recruit apprentice in the new Dresden Police Department. A Shetland sheepdog, sir. She glanced down at him and interpreted the motion of his pipe stem to mean he wanted to know more. A variant of the collie developed on the Shetland Isles of Scotland. A working dog, very bright, gentle, good with children. You're an authority on dogs, Corporal Bach? No, sir. I've only seen them in the zoo. I took the liberty of researching this matter before bringing it to your attention, sir. He nodded, which she hoped was a good sign. What else did you learn? They come in three varieties. Black, blue merle, and sable. 
They were developed from Icelandic and Greenland stock, with infusions of collie and possible spaniel genes. Specimens were first shown at Crufts in London in 1906 and in America. No, no, I don't give a damn about Shelties. Ah, uh, we have confirmed that there were four Shelties present on Tango Charlie at the time of the disaster. They were being shipped to the zoo at Clavius. There were no other dogs of any breed resident at the station. We haven't determined how it is that their survival was overlooked during the investigation of the tragedy. Somebody obviously missed them. Yes, sir. Herford jabbed at a hollow with his pipe. What's this? Have you researched that yet? Bach ignored what she thought might be sarcasm. Herfer was pointing to the opening in the animal's side. The computer believes it to be a birth defect, sir. The skin is not fully formed. It left an opening into the gut. And what's this? Intestines. The bitch would lick the puppy clean after birth. When she found this malformation, she would keep licking as long as she tasted blood. The intestines were pulled out, and the puppy died. It couldn't have lived anyway, not with that hole. No, sir. If you'll notice, the forepaws are also malformed. The computer feels the puppy was stillborn. Herfer studied the various hollows in a blue cloud of pipe smoke, then sighed and leaned back in his chair. It's fascinating, Buck. After all these years, there are dogs alive on Tango Charlie, and breeding, too. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Now it was Bach's turn to sigh. She hated this part. Now it was her job to explain it to him. It's even more fascinating than that, sir. We knew Tango Charlie was largely pressurized, so it's understandable that a colony of dogs could breed there. But barring an explosion, which would have spread a large amount of debris into the surrounding space, this dead puppy must have left the station through an airlock. His face clouded, and he looked at her in gathering outrage. Are you saying there are humans alive aboard Tango Charlie? Sir, it has to be that, or some very intelligent dogs. Dogs can't count. Charlie kept telling herself that as she knelt on the edge of forever and watched little Albert dwindling, hurrying out to join the whirling stars. She wondered if he would become a star himself. It seemed possible. She dropped the rose after him and watched it dwindle, too. Maybe it would become a rosy star. She cleared her throat. She had thought of things to say, but none of them sounded good, so she decided on a hymn, the only one she knew, taught her long ago by her mother, who used to sing it for her father, who was a spaceship pilot. Her voice was clear and true. Lord, guard and guide all those who fly through thy great void above the sky. Be with them all on every flight, in radiant day or darkest night. O oh, hear our prayer, extend thy grace to those in peril deep in space. She knelt silently for a while, wondering if God was listening, and if the hymn was good for dogs, too. Albert sure was flying through the void, so it seemed to Charlie he ought to be deserving of some grace. Charlie was perched on a sheet of twisted metal on the bottom, or outermost layer of the wheel. There was no gravity anywhere in the wheel, but since it was spinning, the farther down you went, the heavier you felt. Just beyond the sheet of metal was a void, a hole ripped in the wheel's outer skin, fully twenty meters across. The metal had been twisted out and down by the force of some long-ago explosion, and this part of the wheel was a good place to walk carefully if you had to walk here at all. She picked her way back to the airlock, let herself in, and sealed the outer door behind her. She knew it was useless, knew there was nothing but vacuum on the other side, but it was something that had been impressed on her very strongly. When you go through a door, you lock it behind you. Lock it tight. If you don't, the breath-sucker will get you in the middle of the night. She shivered and went to the next lock, which also led only to vacuum, as did the one beyond that. Finally, at the fifth airlock, she stepped into a tiny room that had breathable atmosphere, if a little chilly. Then she went through yet another lock before daring to take off her helmet. At her feet was a large plastic box, and inside it, resting shakily on a scrap of bloody blanket and not at all at peace with the world, were two puppies. She picked them up, one in each hand, which didn't make them any happier, and nodded in satisfaction. She kissed them and put them back in the box. 
Tucking it under her arm, she faced another door. She could hear claws scratching at this one. Down, Fuchsia, she shouted. Down, Mama Dog. The scratching stopped, and she opened the last door and stepped through. Fuchsia O'Charlie's station was sitting obediently, her ears pricked up, her head cocked, and her eyes alert with that total, quivering concentration only a mother dog can achieve. I've got him, Fuchs, Charlie said. She went down on one knee and allowed Fuchsia to put her paws up on the edge of the box. See, there's Helga, and there's Conrad, and there's Albert, and there's Conrad and Helga. One, two, three, four. Eleventy-nine and six makes twenty-seven. See? Fuchsia looked at them doubtfully, then leaned in to pick one up. But Charlie pushed her away. I'll carry them, she said, and they set out along the darkened corridor. Fuchsia kept her eyes on the box, whimpering with the desire to get to her pups. Charlie called this part of the wheel the swamp. Things had gone wrong here a long time ago, and the more time went by, the worse it got. She figured it had been started by the explosion, which in its turn had been an indirect result of the dying. The explosion had broken important pipes and wires. Water had started to pool in the corridor. Drainage pumps kept it from turning into an impossible situation. Charlie didn't come here very often. Recently plants had started to grow in the swamp. They were ugly things, corpse white or dental plaque yellow or mushroom gray. There was very little light for them, but they didn't seem to mind. She sometimes wondered if they were plants at all. Once she thought she had seen a fish. It had been white and blind. Maybe it had been a toad. She didn't like to think of that. Charlie slashed through the water, the box of puppies under one arm and her helmet under the other. Fuchsia bounced unhappily along with her. At last they were out of it and back into regions she knew better. She turned right and went three flights up a staircase, dogging the door behind her at every landing, then out into the promenade deck, which she called home. About half the lights were out. The carpet was wrinkled and musty and worn in the places Charlie frequently walked. Parts of the walls were streaked with water stains or grew mildew and leprous patches. Charlie seldom noticed these things unless she was looking through her pictures from the old days or was coming up from the maintenance levels as she was now. Long ago she had tried to keep things clean, but the place was just too big for a little girl. Now she limited her housekeeping to her own living quarters, and like any little girl sometimes forgot about that, too. She stripped off her suit and stowed it in the locker where she always kept it, then padded a short way down the gentle curve of the corridor to the presidential suite, which was hers. As she entered, with fuchsia on her heels, a long, dormant television camera mounted high on the wall stuttered to life. Its flickering red eye came on, and it turned jerkily on its mount. Anna Louise Bach entered the darkened monitoring room, mounted the five stairs to her office at the back, sat down and put her bare feet up on her desk. She tossed her uniform cap, caught it on one foot, and twirled it idly there. She laced her fingers together, leaned her chin on them, and thought about it. Corporal Steiner, her number two on sea watch, came up the platform, pulled a chair close, and sat beside her. Well, how did it go? You want some coffee? Bach asked him. When he nodded, she pressed a button in the arm of her chair. Bring two coffees to the watch commander's station. Wait a minute. Bring a pot and two mugs. She put her feet down and turned to face him. He did figure out there had to be a human aboard. Steiner frowned. You must have given him a clue. Well, I mentioned the airlock angle. See? He'd never have seen it without that. All right. Call it a draw. So then what did our leader want to do? Bach had to laugh. Herfer was unable to find his left testicle without a copy of Gray's Anatomy. He came to a quick decision. We had to send a ship out there at once, find the survivors, and bring them to New Dresden with all possible speed. And then you reminded him that no ship had been allowed to get within five kilometers of Tango Charlie for thirty years, that even our probe had to be small, slow, and careful to operate in the vicinity, and that if it crossed the line it would be destroyed too. He was all set to call the Oberluftwaffe headquarters and ask for a cruiser. I pointed out that, A, we already had a robot cruiser on station, 
under the reciprocal trade agreement with Algemeine Fernsehen Gesellschaft, b. that it was perfectly capable of defeating Tango Charlie without any more help, but c. any battle like that would kill whoever was on Charlie, but that in any case, d. even if a ship could get to Charlie, there was a good reason for not doing so. Emil Steiner winced, pretending pain in the head. Anna, Anna, you should never list things to him like that, and if you do, you should never get to point D. Why not? Because you're lecturing him. If you have to make a speech like that, make it a set of options, which I'm sure you've already seen, sir, but which I will list for you, sir, to get all our ducks in a row, sir. Bach grimaced, knowing he was right. She was too impatient. The coffee arrived, and while they poured and took the first sips, she looked around the big monitoring room. This is where impatience gets you. In some ways it could have been a lot worse. It looked like a good job. Though only a somewhat senior recruit apprentice, Bach was in command of thirty other R.A.s on her watch, and had the rank of corporal. The working conditions were good. Clean, high-tech surroundings, low job stress, the opportunity to command, however fleetingly. Even the coffee was good. But it was a dead end, and everyone knew it. It was a job many rookies held for a year or two before being moved on to more important and prestigious assignments, part of a routine career. When an R.A. stayed in the monitoring room for five years, even as a watch commander, someone was sending her a message. Bach understood the message, had realized the problem long ago. But she couldn't seem to do anything about it. Her personality was too abrasive for routine promotions. Sooner or later she angered her commanding officers in one way or another. She was far too good for anything overtly negative to appear in her yearly evaluations. But there were ways such reports could be written, good things left unsaid, a lack of excitement on the part of the reporting officer, all things that added up to stagnation. So here she was in navigational tracking, not really a police function at all, but something the new Dresden Police Department had handled for a hundred years and would probably handle for a hundred more. It was a necessary job. So is garbage collection. But it was not what she had signed up for ten years ago. Ten years. God, it sounded like a long time. Any of the skilled guilds were hard to get into, but the average apprenticeship in New Dresden was six years. She put down her coffee cup and picked up a hand mic. Tango Charlie, this is Foxtrot Romeo. Do you read? She listened and heard only background hiss. Her troops were trying every available channel with the same message, but this one had been the main channel back when TC-38 had been a going concern. Tango Charlie, this is Foxtrot Romeo. Come in, please. Again, nothing. Steiner put his cup close to hers and leaned back in his chair. So did he remember what the reason was, why we can't approach? He did, eventually. His first step was to slap a top-priority security rating on the whole affair, and he was confident the government would back him up. We got that part. The alert came through about twenty minutes ago. I figured it wouldn't do any harm to let him send it. He needed to do something. And it's what I would have done. It's what you did as soon as the pictures came in. You know I don't have the authority for that. Anna, when you get that look in your eye and say, If one of you bastards breathes a word of this to anyone, I will cut out your tongue and eat it for breakfast. Well, people listen. Did I say that? Your very words. No wonder they all love me so much. She brooded on that for a while, until T.A. 3 Klosinski hurried up the steps to her office. Corporal Bach, we've finally seen something, he said. Bach looked at the big semicircle of flat television screens, over three hundred of them on the wall facing her desk. Below the screens were the members of her watch, each at a desk console, each with a dozen smaller screens to monitor. Most of the large screens displayed the usual data from the millions of objects monitored by NavTrack radar, cameras, and computers. But fully a quarter of them now showed curved, empty corridors where nothing moved, or equally lifeless rooms. In some of them, skeletons could be seen. The three of them faced the largest screen on Bach's desk and unconsciously leaned a little closer as a picture started to form. At first it was just streaks of color. Klosinski consulted a data pad on his wrist. 
This is from camera 14P Delta. It's on the promenade deck. Most of that deck was a sort of PX, with shopping areas, theaters, clubs, so forth. But one sector had VIP suites for when people visited the station. This one's just outside the presidential suite. What's wrong with the picture? Kwasinski sighed. Same thing wrong with all of them. The cameras are old. We've got about five percent of them in some sort of working order, which is a miracle. The Charlie computer is fighting us for every one. I figured it would. In just a minute. There, did you see it? All Bach could see was a stretch of corridor, maybe a little fancier than some of the views already up on the wall, but not what Bach thought of as VIP. She peered at it, but nothing changed. No, nothing's going to happen now. This is a tape. We got it when the camera first came on. He fiddled with his data pad, and the screen resumed its multicolored static. I rewound it. Watch the door on the left. This time, Klesinski stopped the tape on the first recognizable image on the screen. This is someone's leg, he said, pointing, and this is the tail of a dog. Bach studied it. The leg was bare, and so was the foot. It could be seen from just below the knee. That looks like a Sheltie's tail, she said. We thought so, too. What about the foot? Look at the door, Steiner said. In relation to the door, the leg looks kind of small. You're right, Bach said. A child? she wondered. Okay, watch this one around the clock. I suppose if there was a camera in that room, you'd have told me about it. I guess VIPs don't like to be watched. Then carry on as you were. Activate every camera you can and tape them all. I've got to take this to Herfer. She started down out of her wallless office, adjusting her cap at an angle she hoped looked smart and alert. Anna, Steiner called. She looked back. How did Herford take it when you reminded him Tango Charlie only has six more days left? He threw his pipe at me. Charlie put Conrad and Helga back in the whelping box, along with Dieter and Inga. All four of them were squealing, which was only natural— but the quality of their squeals changed when Fuchsia jumped in with them, sat down on Dieter, then plopped over on her side. There was nothing that sounded or looked more determined than a blind, hungry, newborn puppy, Charlie thought. The babies found the swollen nipples, and Fuchsia fussed over them, licking their little bottoms. Charlie held her breath. It almost looked as if she was counting her brood, and that certainly wouldn't do. Good dog, Fuchsia, she cooed, to distract her. And it did. Fuchsia looked up, said, I haven't got time for you now, Charlie, and went back to her chores. How was the funeral? asked Tick-Tock the clock. Shut up, Charlie hissed. You, you big idiot. It's okay, Fuchsia. Fuchsia was already on her side, letting the pups nurse and more or less ignoring both Charlie and Tick-Tock. Charlie got up and went into the bathroom. She closed and secured the door behind her. The funeral was very beautiful, she said, pushing the stool nearer the mammoth marble wash basin and climbing up on it. Behind the basin, the whole wall was a mirror, and when she stood on the stool, she could see herself. She flounced her blonde hair out and studied it critically. There were some tangles. Tell me about it, Tick-Tock said. I want to know every detail. So she told him, pausing a moment to sniff her armpits. Wearing the suit always made her smell so gross. She clambered up onto the broad marble counter, went around the basin, and goosed the twenty-four-carat gold tails of the two dolphins who cavorted there, and water began gushing out of their mouths. She sat with her feet in the basin, touching one tail or another when the water got too hot, and told Tick-Tock all about it. Charlie used to bathe in the big tub. It was so big it was more suited for swimming laps than bathing. One day she slipped and hit her head and almost drowned. Now she usually bathed in the sink, which was not quite big enough, but a lot safer. The rose was the most wonderful part, she said. I'm glad you thought of that. It just turned and turned and turned. Did you say anything? I sang a song, a hymn. Could I hear it? She lowered herself into the basin. Resting the back of her neck on a folded towel, the water came up to her chin, and her legs from the knees down stuck out the other end. She lowered her mouth a little and made burbling sounds in the water. Can I hear it? I'd like to hear. 
Lord, guide and guard all those who fly. Tick-tock listened to it once, then joined in harmony as she sang it again, and on the third time through added an organ part. Charlie felt the tears in her eyes again and wiped them with the back of her hand. Time to scrub a scrub a scrub a Tick-tock suggested. Charlie sat on the edge of the basin with her feet in the water and lathered a washcloth. Scrub a scrub beside your nose, Tick-tock sang. Scrub a scrub beside your nose, Charlie repeated, and industriously scoured all around her face. Scrub a scrub between your toes, scrub all the jelly out of your belly, scrub your butt in your you-know-what. Tick-tock led her through the ritual she'd been doing so long she didn't even remember how long. A couple times she made her giggle by throwing in a new verse. He was always making them up. When she was done, she was about the cleanest little girl anyone ever saw, except for her hair. I'll do that later, she decided, and hopped to the floor, where she danced the drying-off dance in front of the warm air blower until Tick-Tock told her she could stop. Then she crossed the room to the vanity table and sat on the high stool she had installed there. Charlie, there's something I wanted to talk to you about, Tick-Tock said. Charlie opened a tube called coral peaches and smeared it all over her lips. She gazed at the thousand other bottles and tubes, wondering what she'd use this time. Charlie, are you listening to me? Sure, Charlie said. She reached for a bottle labeled the Glen Livet, twelve years old, twisted the cork out of it and put it to her lips. She took a big swallow, then another, and wiped her mouth on the back of her arm. Holy mackerel! That's real sippin' whiskey, she shouted, and set the bottle down. She reached for a tin of rouge. "'Some people have been trying to talk to me,' Tick-Tock said. "'I believe they may have seen Albert and wondered about him.' Charlie looked up, alarmed, and doing so accidentally made a solid streak of rouge from her cheekbone to her chin. "'Do you think they shot at Albert?' "'I don't think so. I think they're just curious. "'Will they hurt me?' "'You never can tell.' Charlie frowned and used her finger to spread black eyeliner all over her left eyelid. She did the same for the right, then used another jar to draw violent purple frown lines on her forehead. With a thick pencil, she outlined her eyebrows. What do they want? They're just prying people, Charlie. I thought you ought to know. They'll probably try to talk to you later. Should I talk to them? That's up to you. Charlie frowned even deeper. Then she picked up the bottle of scotch and had another belt. She reached for the Roger's ruby and hung it around her neck. Fully dressed and made up now, Charlie paused to kiss Fuchsia and tell her how beautiful her puppies were, then hurried out to the promenade deck. As she did, the camera on the wall panned down a little and turned a few degrees on its pivot. That made a noise in the rusty mechanism, and Charlie looked up at it. The speaker beside the camera made a hoarse noise, then did it again. There was a little puff of smoke, and an alert sensor quickly directed a spray of extinguishing gas toward it, then itself gave up the ghost. The speaker said nothing else. Odd noises were nothing new to Charlie. There were places on the wheel where the clatter of faltering mechanisms behind the walls was so loud you could hardly hear yourself think. She thought of the Snoopy people Tick-Tock had mentioned. That camera was probably just the kind of thing they'd like. So she turned her butt to the camera, bent over, and farted at it. She went to her mother's room and sat beside her bed, telling her all about little Albert's funeral. When she felt she'd been there long enough, she kissed her dry cheek and ran out of the room. Up one level were the dogs. She went from room to room, letting them out, accompanied by a growing horde of barking, jumping Shelties. Each was deliriously happy to see her as usual, and she had to speak sharply to a few when they kept licking her face. They stopped on command. Charlie's dogs were all good dogs. When she was done, there were seventy-two almost identical dogs, yapping and running along with her in a sable and white tide. They rushed by another camera with a glowing red light, which panned to follow them up, up and out of sight, around the gentle curb of Tango Charlie. Bach got off the slide walk at the 34 Strasse intersection. She worked her way through the crowds in the shopping arcade, then entered the intersection park, where the trees were plastic but the winos sleeping on the benches were real. She was on level eight. Up here at 34 Strasse was tap rooms and casinos, 
second-hand stores, missions, pawn shops, and cheap bordellos. Freelance whores, naked or in elaborate costumes according to their specialty, eyed her and sometimes propositioned her. Hope springs eternal. These men and women saw her every day on her way home. She waved to a few she had met, though never in a professional capacity. It was a kilometer and a half to Count Otto von Zeppelin Residential Corridor. She walked beside the slidewalk. Typically it operated two days out of seven. Her own quarters were at the end of Count Otto, apartment 80. She palmed the print pad and went in. She knew she was lucky to be living in such large quarters on a T.A. salary. It was two rooms plus a large bath and a tiny kitchen. She had grown up in a smaller place, shared by a lot more people. The rent was so low because her bed was only ten meters from an arterial tubeway. The floor vibrated loudly every thirty seconds as the capsules rushed by. It didn't bother her. She had spent her first ten years sleeping within a meter of a regional air circulation station, just beyond a thin metal apartment wall. It left her with a hearing loss she had been too poor to correct until recently. For most of her ten years in Auto 80 she had lived alone. Five times, for periods varying from two weeks to six months, she shared with a lover, as she was doing now. When she came in, Ralph was in the other room. She could hear the steady huffing and puffing as he worked out. Bach went to the bathroom and ran a tub as hot as she could stand it, eased herself in, and stretched out. Her blue paper uniform brief floated to the surface. She skimmed, wadded up, and tossed the soggy mass toward the toilet. She missed. It had been that sort of day. She lowered herself until her chin was in the water. Beads of sweat popped out on her forehead. She smiled and mopped her face with a washcloth. After a while, Ralph appeared in the doorway. She could hear him, but didn't open her eyes. "'I didn't hear you come in,' he said. "'Next time I'll bring a brass band.' He just kept breathing heavy, gradually getting it under control. That was her most vivid impression of Ralph, she realized. Heavy breathing. That and lots and lots of sweat. And it was no surprise he had nothing to say. Ralph was oblivious to sarcasm. It made him tiresome sometimes, but with shoulders like his, he didn't need to be witty. Bach opened her eyes and smiled at him. Luna's low gravity made it hard for all but the most fanatical to aspire to the muscle mass one could develop on the earth. The typical Lunarian was taller than earth normal and tended to be thinner. As a much younger woman, Bach had become involved, very much against her better judgment, with an earthling of the species Jock. It hadn't worked out, but she still bore the legacy and a marked preference for beefcake. This doomed her to consorting with only two kinds of men, well-muscled mesomorphs from Earth and single-minded Lunarians, who thought nothing of pumping iron for ten hours a day. Ralph was one of the latter. There was no rule so far as Bach could discover that such specimens had to be mental midgets. That was a stereotype. It also happened, in Ralph's case, to be true. While not actually mentally defective, Ralph Goldstein's idea of a tough intellectual problem was how many kilos to bench press. His spare time was spent brushing his teeth or shaving his chest or looking at pictures of himself in bodybuilding magazines. Bach knew for a fact that Ralph thought the earth and sun revolved around Luna. He had only two real interests, lifting weights and making love to Anna Louise Bach. She didn't mind that at all. Ralph had a swastika tattooed on his penis. Early on, Bach had determined that he had no notion of the history of the symbol. He had seen it in an old film and thought it looked nice. It amused her to consider what his ancestors might have thought of the adornment. He brought a stool close to the tub and sat on it, then stepped on a floor button. The tub was Bach's chief luxury. It did a lot of fun things. Now it lifted her on a long rack until she was half out of the water. Ralph started washing that half. She watched his soapy hands. "'Did you go to the doctor?' he asked her. "'Yeah, I finally did.' "'What did he say?' "'Said I have cancer.' "'How bad?' "'Real bad. It's going to cost a bundle. I don't know if my insurance will cover it all.' She closed her eyes and sighed. It annoyed her to have him be right about something. He had nagged her for months to get her medical checkup. Will you get it taken care of tomorrow? 
No, Ralph, I don't have time tomorrow. Next week, I promise. This thing has come up, but it'll be all over next week, one way or another. He frowned, but didn't say anything. He didn't have to. The human body, its care and maintenance, was the one subject Ralph knew more about than she did. But even she knew it would be cheaper in the long run to have the work done now. She felt so lazy he had to help her turn over. Damn, but he was good at this. She had never asked him to do it. He seemed to enjoy it. His strong hands dug into her back and found each sore spot as if by magic. Presently it wasn't sore any more. What's this thing that's come up? I can't tell you about it. Classified for now. He didn't protest, nor did he show surprise, though it was the first time Bach's work had taken her into the realm of secrecy. It was annoying, really. One of Ralph's charms was that he was a good listener. While he wouldn't understand the technical side of anything, he could sometimes offer surprisingly good advice on personal problems. More often, he showed the knack of synthesizing and expressing things Bach had already known, but had not allowed herself to see. Well, she could tell him part of it. There's this satellite, she began. Tango Charlie. Have you ever heard of it? That's a funny name for a satellite. It's what we call it on the tracking logs. It never really had a name. Well, it did a long time ago. But GWA took it over and turned it into a research facility and an exec's retreat. And they just let it be known as TC-38. They got it in a war with Telecommunion, part of the peace treaty. They got Charlie, the bubble, a couple other big wheels. The thing about Charlie, it's coming down in about six days. It's going to spread itself all over the far side. Should be a pretty big bang. Ralph continued to knead the backs of her legs. It was never a good idea to rush him. He would figure things out in his own way, at his own speed, or he wouldn't figure them out at all. Why is it coming down? It's complicated. It's been derelict for a long time. For a while it had the capacity to make course corrections, but it looks like it's run out of reaction mass, or the computer that's supposed to stabilize it isn't working anymore. For a couple of years it hasn't been making corrections. Why does it... A lunar orbit is never stable. There's the Earth tugging on the satellite, the solar wind, mass concentrations of Luna's surface, a dozen things that add up over time. Charlie's in a very eccentric orbit now. Last time it came within a kilometer of the surface. Next time it's going to miss us by a gnat's whisker, and the time after that it hits. Ralph stopped massaging. When Bach glanced at him, she saw he was alarmed. He had just understood that a very large object was about to hit his home planet, and he didn't like the idea. Don't worry, Bach said. There's a surface installation that might get some damage from the debris, but Charlie won't come within a hundred kilometers of any settlements. We got nothing to worry about on that score. Then why don't you just push it back up? You know, go up there and do whatever it is you do, Bach finished for him. He had no real idea what kept a satellite in orbit in the first place, but knew there were people who handled such matters all the time. There were other questions he might have asked as well. Why leave Tango Charlie alone all these years? Why not salvage it? Why allow things to get to this point at all? All those questions brought her back to classified ground. She sighed and turned over. I wish we could, she said sincerely. She noted that the swastika was saluting her, and that seemed like a fine idea, so she let him carry her into the bedroom. And as he made love to her, she kept seeing that incredible tide of shelties with the painted child in the middle. After the run, ten laps around the promenade deck, Charlie led the pack to the Japanese garden and let them run free through the tall weeds and vegetable patches. Most of the trees in the garden were dead. The whole place had once been a formal and carefully tended place of meditation. Four men from Tokyo had been employed full time to take care of it. Now the men were buried under the temple gate. The ponds were covered in green scum. The gracefully arched bridge had collapsed, and the flower beds were choked with dog turds. Charlie had to spend part of each morning in the flower beds feeding Mr. Shipface. This was a cylindrical structure with a big round hole in its side, an intake for the wheel's recycling system. 
It ate dog feces, weeds, dead plants, soil, scraps, practically anything Charlie shoveled into it. The cylinder was painted green like a frog and had a face painted on it with big lips outlining the hole. Charlie sang the shit-shoveling song as she worked. Tick-Tock had taught her the song, and he used to sing it with her. But a long time ago he had gone deaf in the Japanese garden. Usually all Charlie had to do was talk and Tick-Tock would hear, but there were some places, and more of them every year, where Tick-Tock was deaf. "'Raise that leg,' Charlie puffed. "'Lift that tail. If I gets in trouble, will you go my bail?' She stopped and mopped her face with a red bandana. As usual, there were dogs sitting on the edge of the flower bed watching Charlie work. Their ears were lifted. They found this endlessly fascinating. Charlie just wished it would be over. But she took the bad with the good. She started shoveling again. I gets weary of all this shoveling. When she was finished, she went back on the promenade. What's next? she asked. Plenty, said Tick-Tock. The funeral put you behind schedule. He directed her to the infirmary with the new litter. There they weighed, photographed, x-rayed, and catalogued each puppy. The results were put on file for later registration with the American Kennel Club. It quickly became apparent that Conrad was going to be a cull. He had an overbite. With the others, it was too early to tell. She and Tick-Tock would examine them weekly, and their standards were an order of magnitude more stringent than the AKC's. Most of her culls would easily have best of breed in a show. And as for her breeding animals, I ought to be able to write champion on most of these pedigrees. You must be patient. Patient, yeah, she'd heard that before. She took another drink of scotch. Champion Fuchsia O'Charlie Station, she thought. Now that would really make a breeder's day. After the puppies, there were two from an earlier litter who were now ready for a final evaluation. Charlie brought them in, and she and Tick-Tock argued long and hard about points so fine few people would have seen them at all. In the end, they decided both would be sterilized. Then it was noon feeding. Charlie never enforced discipline here. She let them jump and bark and nip at each other as long as it didn't get too rowdy. She led them all to the cafeteria, and was tracked by three wall cameras, where the troughs of hard kibble and soft soya burger were already full. Today it was chicken-flavored, Charlie's favorite. Afternoon was training time. Consulting the records Tick-Tock displayed on a screen, she got the younger dogs one at a time and put each of them through thirty minutes of leash work up and down the promenade, teaching them heel, sit, stay, down, come, according to their degree of progress and Tick-Tock's rigorous schedules. The older dogs were taken to the ring in groups, where they sat obediently in a line as she put them, one by one, through free healing paces. Finally, it was evening meals, which she hated. It was all human food. Eat your vegetables, Tick-Tock would say. Clean up your plate. People are starving in New Dresden. It was usually green salads and yucky broccoli and beets and stuff like that. Tonight it was yellow squash, which Charlie liked about as much as a root canal. She gobbled up the hamburger patty and then dawdled over the squash until it was a yellowish mess all over her plate like baby shit. Half of it ended up on the table. Finally, Tick-Tock relented and let her get back to her duties, which in the evening was grooming. She brushed each dog until the coats shone. Some of the dogs had already settled in for the night, and she had to wake them up. At last, yawning, she made her way back to her room. She was pretty well plastered by then. Tick-Tock, who was used to it, made allowances and tried to jolly her out of what seemed a very black mood. "'There's nothing wrong,' she shouted at one point, tears streaming from her eyes. Charlie could be an ugly drunk. She staggered out to the promenade deck and lurched from wall to wall, but she never fell down. Ugly or not, she knew how to hold her liquor. It had been ages since it made her sick. The elevator was in what had been a commercial zone. The empty shops gaped at her as she punched the button. She took another drink, and the door opened. She got in. She hated this part. The elevator was rising up through a spoke toward the hub of the wheel. She got lighter as the car went up, and the trip did funny things to the inner ear. She hung on to the handrail until the car shuddered to a stop. Now everything was fine. She was almost weightless up here. 
Weightlessness was great when you were drunk. When there was no gravity to worry about, your head didn't spin, and if it did, it didn't matter. This was one part of the wheel where the dogs never went. They could never get used to falling, no matter how long they were kept up here. But Charlie was an expert in falling. When she got the blues, she came up here and pressed her face to the huge ballroom window. People were only a vague memory to Charlie. Her mother didn't count. Though she visited every day, Mom was about as lively as V.I. Lenin. Sometimes Charlie wanted to be held, so much it hurt. The dogs were good, they were warm, they licked her, they loved her, but they couldn't hold her. Tears leaked from her eyes, which was really a bitch in the ballroom because tears could get huge in here. She wiped them away and looked out the window. The moon was getting bigger again. She wondered what it meant. Maybe she would ask Tick-Tock. She made it back as far as the garden. Inside, the dogs were sleeping in a huddle. She knew she ought to get them back to their rooms, but she was far too drunk for that, and Tick-Tock couldn't do a damn thing about it in here. He couldn't see and he couldn't hear. She lay down on the ground, curled up, and was asleep in seconds. When she started to snore, the three or four dogs who had come over to watch her sleep licked her mouth until she stopped. Then they curled up beside her. Soon they were joined by others, until she slept in the middle of a blanket of dogs. A crisis team had been assembled in the monitoring room when Bach arrived the next morning. They seemed to have been selected by Captain Herfer, and there were so many of them that there was not enough room for everyone to sit down. Bach led them to a conference room just down the hall, and everyone took a seat around the long table. Each seat was equipped with a computer display, and there was a large screen on the wall behind Herfer at the head of the table. Bach took her place on his right, and across from her was Deputy Chief Zeiss, a man with a good reputation in the department. He made Bach very nervous. Herfer, on the other hand, seemed to relish his role. Since Zeiss seemed content to be an observer, Bach decided to sit back and speak only if called upon. Noting that every seat was filled and that what she assumed were assistants had pulled up chairs behind their principals, Bach wondered if this many people were really required for this project. Steiner, sitting at Bach's right, leaned over and spoke quietly. Pick a time, he said. What's that? I said, pick a time. We're running an office pool. If you come closest to the time security is broken, you win a hundred marks. Is ten minutes from now spoken for? They quieted when Herfer stood up to speak. Some of you have been working on this problem all night, he said. Others have been called in to give us your expertise in the matter. I'd like to welcome Deputy Chief Zeiss, representing the mayor and the chief of police. Chief Zeiss. Would you like to say a few words? Zeiss merely shook his head, which seemed to surprise Herfer. Bach knew he would never have passed up an opportunity like that, and probably couldn't understand how anyone else could. Very well. We can start with Dr. Bloom. Bloom was a sour little man who affected wire-rimmed glasses and a cheap toupee over what must have been a completely bald head. Bach thought it odd that a medical man would wear such clumsy prosthetics, calling attention to problems that were no harder to cure than a hangnail. She idly called up his profile on her screen and was surprised to learn he had a Nobel Prize. The subject is a female caucasoid, almost certainly earthborn. On the wall behind Herfer and on Bach's screen, tapes of the little girl and her dogs were being run. She displays no obvious abnormalities. In several shots, she is nude and clearly has not yet reached puberty. I estimate her age between seven and ten years old. There are small discrepancies in her behavior. Her movements are economical, except when playing. She accomplishes various hand-eye tasks with a maturity beyond her apparent years. The doctor sat down abruptly. It put her for off balance. Ah, uh, that's fine, doctor. But if you recall, I just asked you to tell me how old she is and if she's healthy. She appears to be eight. I said that. Yes, but what do you want from me? Bloom said, suddenly angry. He glared around at many of the assembled experts. There's something badly wrong with that girl. I say she is eight. Fine. Any fool could see that. I say I can observe no health problems visually. For this you need a doctor? 
Bring her to me, give me a few days, and I'll give you six volumes on her health. But videotapes? He trailed off, his silence as eloquent as his words. Thank you, Dr. Bloom, Herfer said. As soon as— I'll tell you one thing, though, Bloom said in a low, dangerous tone. It is a disgrace to let that child drink liquor like that. The effects in later life will be terrible. I have seen large men in their thirties and forties who could not hold half as much as I saw her drink. In one day. He glowered at Herfer for a moment. I was sworn to silence, but I want to know who is responsible for this. Bach realized he didn't know where the girl was. She wondered how many of the others in the room had been filled in, and how many were working only on their own part of the problem. It will be explained, Zeiss said quietly. Bloom looked from Zeiss to Herfer and back, then settled into his chair, not mollified but willing to wait. Thank you, Dr. Bloom, Herfer said again. Next we'll hear from Lutmila Rosnikova, representing the GMA conglomerate. Terrific, thought Bach. He's brought GMA into it. No doubt he swore Miss Rosnikova to secrecy, and if he really thought she would fail to mention it to her supervisor, then he was even dumber than Bach had thought. She had worked for them once, long ago, and though she was just an employee, she had learned something about them. GMA had its roots deep in twentieth-century Japanese industry. When you went to work on the executive level at GMA, you were set up for life. They expected and received loyalty that compared favorably with that demanded by the Mafia, which meant that, by telling Rosnikova his secret, Herfer had ensured that three hundred GMA execs knew about it three minutes later. They could be relied on to keep a secret, but only if it benefited GMA. The computer on Tango Charlie was a custom-designed array, Rosnikova began. That was the usual practice in those days, with biologic computers. It was designated the same as the station, Biologic TC-38. It was one of the largest installations of its time. At the time of the disaster, when it was clear that everything had failed, the TC-38 was given its final instructions. Because of the danger, it was instructed to impose an interdiction zone around the station, which you'll find described under the label interdiction on your screens. Rosnikova paused while many of those present called up this information. To implement the zone, the TC-38 was given command of certain defensive weapons. These included ten Bevawat lasers and other weapons which I have not been authorized to name or describe other than to say they are at least as formidable as the lasers. Herfer looked annoyed and was about to say something, but Zeiss stopped him with a gesture. Each understood that the lasers were enough in themselves. So while it is possible to destroy the station, Rostnikova went on, there is no chance of boarding it, assuming anyone would even want to try. Bach thought she could tell from the different expressions around the table which people knew the whole story, and which knew only their part of it. A couple of the latter seemed ready to ask a question, but Herfer spoke first. How about canceling the computer's instructions, he said. Have you tried that? That's been tried many times over the last few years, as this crisis got closer. We didn't expect it to work, and it did not. Tango Charlie won't accept a new program. Oh, my God! Dr. Bloom gasped. Bach saw that his normally florid face had paled. Tango Charlie? She's on Tango Charlie. That's right, doctor, said Herfer, and we're trying to figure out how to get her off. Dr. Wilhelm? Wilhelm was an older woman with the stocky build of the earthborn. She rose and looked down at some notes in her hand. Information's under the label Neurotropic Agent X on your machines, she muttered, then looked up at them. But you needn't bother. That's about as far as we got, naming it. I'll sum up what we know, but you don't need an expert for this. There are no experts on Neuro-X. It broke out on August 9, thirty years ago next month. The initial report was five cases, one death. Symptoms were progressive paralysis, convulsions, loss of motor control, numbness. Tango Charlie was immediately quarantined as a standard procedure. An epidemiological team was dispatched from Atlanta— followed by another from New Dresden. All ships which had left Tango Charlie were ordered to return, except for one on its way to Mars, 
and another already in parking orbit around Earth. The one in Earth orbit was forbidden to land. By the time the teams arrived, there were over a hundred reported cases and six more deaths. Later symptoms included blindness and deafness. It progressed at different rates in different people, but it was always quite fast. Mean survival time from onset of symptoms was later determined to be forty-eight hours. Nobody lived longer than four days. Both medical teams immediately came down with it, as did a third and a fourth team. All of them came down with it, each and every person. The first two teams had been using Class Three isolation techniques. It didn't matter. The third team stepped up the precautions to Class Two. Same result. Very quickly we had been forced into Class One procedures, which involves isolation as total as we can get it. No physical contact whatsoever, no sharing of air supplies, all air to the investigators filtered through a sterilizing environment. They still got it. Six patients and some tissue samples were sent to a Class I installation two hundred miles from New Dresden, and more patients were sent, with Class I precautions, to a hospital ship close to Charlie. Everyone at both facilities came down with it. We almost sent a couple of patients to Atlanta. She paused, looking down and rubbing her forehead. No one said anything. I was in charge, she said quietly. I can't take credit for not shipping anyone to Atlanta. We were going to. And suddenly there wasn't anybody left on Charlie to load patients aboard, all dead or dying. We backed off. Bear in mind this all happened in five days. What we had to show for those five days was a major space station with all aboard dead, three ships full of dead people, and an epidemiological research facility here on Luna full of dead people. After that, politicians began making most of the decisions, but I advised them. The two nearby ships were landed by robot control at the infected research station. The derelict ship going to Mars was, I think it's still classified, but what the hell, it was blown up with a nuclear weapon. Then we started looking into what was left. The station here was easiest. There was one cardinal rule. Nothing that went into that station was to come out. Robot crawlers brought in remote manipulators and experimental animals. Most of the animals died. Neuro-X killed most mammals. Monkeys, rats, cats. Dogs? Bach asked. Wilhelm glanced at her. He didn't kill all the dogs. Half of the ones we sent in lived. Did you know that there were dogs alive on Charlie? No. The interdiction was already set up by then. Charlie Station was impossible to land, and too close and too visible to nuke, because that would violate about a dozen corporate treaties, and there seemed no reason not to just leave it there. We had our samples isolated here at the Lunar Station. We decided to work with that and forget about Charlie. Thank you, Doctor. As I was saying, it was by far the most virulent organism we had ever seen. It seemed to have a taste for all sorts of neural tissue in almost every mammal. The teams that went in never had time to learn anything. They were all disabled too quickly, and just as quickly they were dead. We didn't find out much either, for a variety of reasons. My guess is it was a virus, simply because we would certainly have seen anything larger almost immediately. But we never did see it. It was fast getting in. We don't know how it was vectored, but the only reliable shield was several miles of vacuum— and once it got in, I suspect it worked changes on genetic material of the host, setting up a secondary agent, which I'm almost sure we isolated. And then it went away and hid very well. It was still in the host in some form. It had to be. But we think its active life in the nervous system was on the order of one hour. But by then it had already done its damage. It set the system against itself, and the host was consumed in about two days. Wilhelm had grown increasingly animated. A few times Bach thought she was about to get incoherent. It was clear the nightmare of Nero X had not diminished for her with the passage of thirty years. But now she made an effort to slow down again. The other remarkable thing about it was, of course, its infectiousness. Nothing I've ever seen was so persistent in evading our best attempts at keeping it isolated. Add that to its mortality rate, which at the time seemed to be one hundred percent, and you have the second great reason why we learned so little about it. What was the first? Herfer asked. Wilhelm glared at him. 
the difficulty of investigating such a subtle process of infection by remote control. Ah, of course. The other thing was simply fear. Too many people had died for there to be any hope of hushing it up. I don't know if anyone tried. I'm sure those of you who were old enough remember the uproar. So the public debate was loud and long, and the pressure for extreme measures was intense, and, I should add, not unjustified. The argument was simple. Everyone who got it was dead. I believe that if those patients had been sent to Atlanta, everyone on earth would have died. Therefore, what was the point of taking a chance by keeping it alive and studying it? Dr. Bloom cleared his throat, and Wilhelm looked at him. As I recall, doctor, he said, there were two reasons raised. One was the abstract one of scientific knowledge. Though there might be no point in studying NeuroX, since no one was afflicted with it, we might learn something by the study itself. Point taken, Wilhelm said, and no argument. And the second was, we never found out where NeuroX came from. There were rumors it was a biological warfare agent. He looked at Rosnikova, as if asking her what comment GMA might want to make about that. Rosnikova said nothing. But most people felt it was a spontaneous mutation. There have been several instances of that in the high-radiation environment of a space station, and if it happened once, what's to prevent it from happening again? Again, you'll get no argument from me. In fact, I supported both those positions when the question was being debated. Wilhelm grimaced, then looked right at Bloom. But the fact is, I didn't support them very hard, and when the lunar station was sterilized, I felt a lot better. Bloom was nodding. I'll admit it, I felt better, too. And if NeuroX were to show up again, she went on quietly, my advice would be to sterilize immediately, even if it meant losing a city. Bloom said nothing. Bach watched them both for a while in the resulting silence, finally understanding just how much Wilhelm feared this thing. There was a lot more. The meeting went on for three hours, and everyone got a chance to speak. Eventually, the problem was outlined to everyone's satisfaction. Tango Charlie could not be boarded. It could be destroyed. Some time was spent debating the wisdom of the original interdiction order, beating a dead horse as far as Bach was concerned, and questioning whether it might be possible to countermand it. But things could leave Tango Charlie. It would only be necessary to withdraw the robot probes that had watched so long and faithfully, and the survivors could be evacuated. That left the main question. Should they be evacuated? The fact that only one survivor had been sighted so far was not mentioned. Everyone assumed others would show up sooner or later. After all, it was simply not possible that just one eight-year-old girl could be the only occupant of a station no one had entered or left for thirty years. Wilhelm, obviously upset but clinging strongly to her position, advocated blowing up the station at once. There was some support for this, but only about ten percent of the group. The eventual decision, which Bach had predicted before the meeting even started, was to do nothing at the moment. After all, there were almost five whole days to keep thinking about it. "'There's a call waiting for you,' Steiner said when she got back to the monitoring room. "'The switchboard says it's important.' Bach went into her office, wishing yet again for one with walls, flipped a switch. Bach, she said. Nothing came on the vision screen. I'm curious, said a woman's voice. Is this the Anna Louise Bach who worked in the bubble ten years ago? For a moment Bach was too surprised to speak, but she felt a wave of heat as blood rushed to her face. She knew the voice. Hello, are you there? Why no vision, she asked. First, are you alone, and is your instrument secure? The instrument is secure if yours is. Bach flipped another switch, and a privacy hood descended around her screen. The sounds of the room faded as a sonic scrambler began operating. And I'm alone. Megan Galloway's face appeared on the screen. One part of Bach's mind noted that she hadn't changed much, except that her hair was curly and red. I thought you might not wish to be seen with me, Galloway said. Then she smiled. Hello, Anna Louise. How are you? I don't think it really matters if I'm seen with you, Bach said. No? 
Then would you care to comment on why the new Dresden Police Department, among other government agencies, is allowing an eight-year-old child to go without the rescue she so obviously needs? Bach said nothing. Would you comment on the rumor that the NDPD does not intend to affect the child's rescue, that if it can get away with it, the NDPD will let the child be smashed to pieces? Still, Bach waited. Galloway sighed and ran a hand through her hair. You're the most exasperating woman I've ever known, Bach, she said. Listen, don't you even want to try to talk me out of going with the story? Bach almost said something, but decided to wait once more. If you want to, you can meet me at the end of your shift, the Mozart plots. I'm on the Great Northern, Sweet One, but I'll see you in the bar on the top deck. I'll be there, Bach said, and broke the connection. Charlie sang the Hangover song most of the morning. It was not one of her favorites. There was penance to do, of course. Tick-tock made her drink a foul glop that, she had to admit, did do wonders for her headache. When she was done, she was drenched in sweat, but her hangover was gone. "'You're lucky,' Tick-tock said. "'Your hangovers are never severe.' "'They're severe enough for me,' Charlie said. He made her wash her hair, too. After that, she spent some time with her mother— she always valued that time. Tick-Tock was a good friend, mostly, but he was so bossy. Charlie's mother never shouted at her, never scolded or lectured. She simply listened. True, she wasn't very active, but it was nice to have somebody just to talk to. One day, Charlie hoped, her mother would walk again. Tick-Tock said that was unlikely. Then she had to round up the dogs and take them for their morning run. And everywhere she went, the red camera eyes followed her. Finally, she had enough. She stopped, put her fists on her hips, and shouted at a camera. You stop that, she said. The camera started to make noises. At first, she couldn't understand anything. Then some words started to come through. Lee, Tango, Foxtrot, in please, Tango Charlie. Hey, that's my name. The camera continued to buzz and spit noise at her. Tick-tock, is that you? I'm afraid not, Charlie. What's going on, then? It's those nosy people. They've been watching you, and now they're trying to talk to you. But I'm holding them off. I don't think they'll bother you if you just ignore the cameras. But why are you fighting them? I didn't think you'd want to be bothered. Maybe there was some of that hangover still around. Anyway, Charlie got real angry at Tick-Tock and called him some names he didn't approve of. She knew she'd pay for it later, but... For now, Tick-Tock was pissed and in no mood to reason with her. So he let her have what she wanted, on the principle that getting what you want is usually the worst thing that can happen to anybody. Tango Charlie, this is Foxtrot Romeo. Come in, please. Tango. Come in where? Charlie asked reasonably. And my name isn't Tango. Bach was so surprised to have the little girl actually reply that for a moment she couldn't think of anything to say. Uh, it's just an expression, Bach said. Come in. That's radio talk for please answer. Then you should say please answer, the little girl pointed out. Maybe you're right. My name is Bach. You can call me Anna Louise if you'd like. We've been trying to... Why should I... Excuse me? Excuse you for what? Bach looked at the screen and drummed her fingers silently for a short time. Around her in the monitoring room there was not a sound to be heard. At last she managed to smile. Maybe we started off on the wrong foot. Which foot would that be? The little girl just kept staring at her. Her expression was not amused, not hostile, not really argumentative. Then why was the conversation suddenly so maddening? Could I make a statement? Bach tried. I don't know, can you? Bach's fingers didn't tap this time. They were balled up in a fist. I shall, anyway. My name is Anna Louise Bach. I'm talking to you from New Dresden, Luna. That's a city on the moon, which you can probably see. I know where it is. Fine. I've been trying to contact you for many hours, but your computer has been fighting me all the time. That's right. He said so. Now, I can't explain why he's been fighting me, but I know why. He thinks you're nosy. I won't deny that, but we're trying to help you. Why? Because it's what we do. 
Now, if you could— Hey, shut up, will you? Bach did so. With forty-five other people at their scattered screens, Bach watched the little girl, the horrible little girl, as she was beginning to think of her, take a long pull from the green glass bottle of Scotch whiskey. She belched, wiped her mouth with the back of her hand, and scratched between her legs. When she was done, she smelled her fingers. She seemed about to say something, then cocked her head, listening to something Bach couldn't hear. That's a good idea, she said, then got up and ran away. She was just vanishing around the curve of the deck when Herfer burst into the room, trailed by six members of his advisory team. Bach leaned back in her chair and tried to fend off thoughts of homicide. I was told you'd established contact, Herfer said, leaning over Bach's shoulder in a way she absolutely detested. He peered at the lifeless scene. What happened to her? I don't know, she said. That's a good idea. Got up and ran off. I told you to keep her here until I got a chance to talk to her. I tried, Bach said. You should have— I have her on camera 19, Steiner called out. Everyone watched as the technicians followed the girl's progress on the working cameras. They saw her enter a room to emerge in a moment with a big-screen monitor. Bach tried to call her each time she passed a camera— but it seemed only the first one was working for incoming calls. She passed through the range of four cameras before coming back to the original, where she carefully unrolled the monitor and tacked it to a wall, then paid out the cord and plugged it in very close to the wall camera box team had been using. She unshipped this camera from its mount. The picture jerked around for a while and finally steadied. The girl had set it on the floor. Stabilize that, Bach told her team and the picture on her monitor righted itself. She now had a worm's-eye view of the corridor. The girl sat down in front of the camera and grinned. "'Now I can see you,' she said. Then she frowned. "'If you send me a picture—' "'Bring a camera over here,' Bach ordered. While it was being set up, Herfer shouldered her out of the way and sat in her chair. "'There you are,' the girl said. And again she frowned. "'That's funny.' I was sure you were a girl. Did somebody cut your balls off? Now it was Herfer's turn to be speechless. There were a few badly suppressed giggles. Bach quickly silenced them with her most ferocious glare, while giving thanks no one would ever know how close she had come to bursting into laughter. Never mind that, Herfer said. My name is Herfer. Would you go get your parents? We need to talk to them. No, said the girl, and no. What's that? No, I won't get them, the girl clarified, and no, you don't need to talk to them. Herfer had a little experience dealing with children. Now, please be reasonable, he began in a wheedling tone. We're trying to help you, after all. We have to talk to your parents to find out more about your situation. After that, we're going to help you get out of there. I want to talk to the lady, the girl said. She's not here. I think you're lying. She talked to me just a minute ago. I'm in charge. In charge of what? Just in charge. Now go get your parents. They all watched as she got up and moved closer to the camera. All they could see at first was her feet. Then water began to splash on the lens. Nothing could stop the laughter this time as Charlie urinated on the camera. For three hours Bach watched the screens. Every time the girl passed the prime camera, Bach called out to her. She had thought about it carefully. Bach, like Herford, did not know a lot about children. She consulted briefly with the child psychologist on Herford's team, and the two of them outlined a tentative game plan. The guy seemed to know what he was talking about, and, even better, his suggestions agreed with what Bach's common sense told her should work. So she never said anything that might sound like an order. While Herford seethed in the background, Bach spoke quietly and reasonably every time the child showed up. I'm still here, she would say. We could talk, was a gentle suggestion. You want to play? She longed to use one line the psychologist suggested, one that would put Bach and the child on the same team, so to speak. The line was, The idiot's gone. You want to talk now? Eventually the girl began glancing at the camera. She had a different dog every time she came by. At first Bach didn't realize this, as they were almost completely identical. 
Then she noticed they came in slightly different sizes. That's a beautiful dog, she said. The girl looked up, then started away. I'd like to have a dog like that. What's its name? This is Madam's Sweet Brown Sideburns. Say hi, Brownie. The dog yipped. Sit up for Mommy, Brownie. Now roll over. Stand tall. Now go in a circle, Brownie. That's a good doggy. Walk on your hind legs. Now jump, Brownie. Jump, jump, jump. The dog did exactly as he was told, leaping into the air and turning a flip each time the girl commanded it. Then he sat down, pink tongue hanging out, eyes riveted on his master. I'm impressed, Bach said, and it was the literal truth. Like other citizens of Luna, Bach had never seen a wild animal, had never owned a pet, knew animals only from the municipal zoo, where care was taken not to interfere with natural behaviors. She had had no idea animals could be so smart, and no inkling of how much work had gone into the exhibition she had just seen. "'It's nothing,' the girl said. "'You should see his father. Is this Anna Louise again?' "'Yes, it is. What's your name?' "'Charlie. You ask a lot of questions.' "'I guess I do. I just want to. I'd like to ask some questions, too.' "'All right. Go ahead. I have six of them to start off with. One, why should I call you Anna Louise? Two, why should I excuse you? Three, what is the wrong foot? Four, but that's not a question, really, since you already proved you can make a statement, if you wish, by doing so. Four, why are you trying to help me? Five, why do you want to see my parents? It took Bach a moment to realize that these were the questions Charlie had asked in their first maddening conversation, questions she had not gotten answers for, and they were in their original order, and they didn't make a hell of a lot of sense. But the child psychologist was making motions with his hands and nodding his encouragement to Bach, so she started in. You should call me Anna Louise because it's my first name, and friends call each other by their first names. Are we friends? Well, I'd like to be your friend. Why? Look, you don't have to call me Anna Louise if you don't want to. I don't mind. Do I have to be your friend? Not if you don't want to. Why should I want to? And it went on like that. Each question spawned a dozen more, and a further dozen sprang from each of those. Bach had figured to get Charlie's six, make that five questions out of the way quickly, then get to the important things. She soon began to think she'd never answer even the first question. She was involved in a long and awkward explanation of friendship, going over the ground for the tenth time, when words appeared at the bottom of her screen. Put your foot down, they said. She glanced up at the child psychologist. He was nodding but making quieting gestures with his hands. But gently, the man whispered. Right, Bach thought. Put your foot down and get off on the wrong foot again. That's enough of that, Bach said abruptly. Why? asked Charlie. Because I'm tired of that. I want to do something else. All right, Charlie said. Bach saw Herfer waving frantically just out of camera range. Uh, Captain Herfer is still here. He'd like to talk to you. That's just too bad for him. I don't want to talk to him. Good for you, Bach thought. But Herfer was still waving. Why not? He's not so bad. Bach felt ill, but avoided showing it. He lied to me. He said you'd gone away. Well, he's in charge here, so— I'm warning you, Charlie said, and waited a dramatic moment, shaking her finger at the screen. You put that poo-poo head back on, and I won't come in ever again. Bach looked helplessly at Herfer, who at last nodded. I want to talk about dogs, Charlie announced. So that's what they did for the next hour. Bach was thankful she had studied up on the subject when the dead puppy first appeared. Even so, there was no doubt as to who was the authority. Charlie knew everything there was to know about dogs, and of all the experts Herfer had called in, not one could tell Bach anything about the goddamn animals. She wrote a note and handed it to Steiner, who went off to find a zoologist. Finally, Bach was able to steer the conversation around to Charlie's parents. "'My father is dead,' Charlie admitted. "'I'm sorry,' Bach said. "'When did he die?' "'Oh, a long time ago. He was a spaceship pilot, and one day he went off in his spaceship and never came back. 
For a moment she looked far away. Then she shrugged. I was real young. Fantasy, the psychologist wrote at the bottom of her screen. But Bach had already figured that out. Since Charlie had to have been born many years after the Charlie Station plague, her father could not have flown any spaceships. What about your mother? Charlie was silent for a long time, and Bach began to wonder if she was losing contact with her. At last she looked up. You want to talk to my mother? I'd like that very much. Okay, but that's all for today. I've got work to do. You've already put me way behind. Just bring your mother here, and I'll talk to her, and you can do your work. No, I can't do that. But I'll take you to her. Then I'll work, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bach started to protest that tomorrow was not soon enough, but Charlie was not listening. The camera was picked up, and the picture bounced around as she carried it with her. All Bach could see was a very unsteady, upside-down view of the corridor. "'She's going into room 350,' said Steiner. "'She's been in there twice, and she stayed a while both times.' Bach said nothing. The camera jerked wildly for a moment, then steadied. "'This is my mother,' Charlie said. Mother, this is my friend, Anna Louise. The Mozart plots had not existed when Bach was a child. Construction on it had begun when she was five, and the first phase was finished when she was fifteen. Tenants had begun moving in soon after that. During each succeeding year, new sectors had been opened, and, though a structure as large as the Mozart plots would never be finished, two major sectors were currently under renovation, it had been essentially completed six years ago. It was a virtual copy of the Solari-class arcology atriums that had sprouted like mushrooms on the earth in the last four decades, with the exception that on earth you built up and on Luna you went down. First dig a trench fifteen miles long and two miles deep. Vary the width of the trench, but never let it get narrower than one mile nor broader than five. In some places make the base of the trench wider than the top, so the walls of rock loom outward. Now put a roof over it, fill it with air, and start boring tunnels into the sides. Turn those tunnels into apartments and shops and everything else humans need in a city. You end up with dizzying vistas, endless terraces that reach higher than the eye can see, a madness of light and motion and spaces too wide to echo. Do all that, and you still wouldn't have the Mozart plots. To approach that ridiculous level of grandeur, there were still a lot of details to attend to. Build four mile-high skyscrapers to use as table legs to support the mid-air golf course. Crisscross the open space with bridges having no visible means of support, and encrusted with shops and homes that cling like barnacles. Suspend apartment buildings from silver balloons that rise half the day and descend the other half reachable only by glider. Put in a fountain with more water than Niagara and a ski slope on a huge spiral ramp. Dig a ten-mile lake in the middle with a bustling port at each end for the luxury ships that ply back and forth. Attach runways to balconies so residents can fly to their front door. Stud the interior with zeppelin ports and railway stations and hanging gardens. And you still don't have Mozart plots, but you're getting closer. The upper, older parts of New Dresden, the parts she had grown up in, were Spartan and claustrophobic. Long before her time, Lunarians had begun to build larger when they could afford it. The newer, lower parts of the city were studded with downscale versions of the Mozart plots, open spaces half a mile wide and maybe fifty levels deep. This was just a logical extension. She felt she ought to dislike it because it was so overdone, so fantastically huge, such a waste of space, and oddly so standardized. It was a taste of the culture of old earth, where Paris looked just like Tokyo. She had been to the new Beethoven plots at Clavius, and it looked just like this place. Six more Arco malls were being built in other lunar cities. And Bach liked it. She couldn't help herself. One day she'd like to live here. She left her tube capsule in the bustling central station, went to a terminal, and queried the location of the Great Northern. It was docked at the southern port, five miles away. It was claimed that any form of non-animal transportation humans had ever used was available in the Mozart plots. Bach didn't doubt it. She had tried most of them. 
But when she had a little time, as she did today, she liked to walk. She didn't have time to walk five miles, but compromised by walking to the trolley station a mile away. Starting out on a brick walkway, she moved to cool marble, then over a glass bridge with lights flashing down inside. This took her to a boardwalk, then down to a beach where machines made four-foot breakers, each carrying a new load of surfers. The sand was fine and hot between her toes. Mozart Plotz was a sensual delight for the feet. Few Lunarians ever wore shoes, and they could walk all day through old Dresden and feel nothing but different types of carpeting and composition flooring. The one thing Bach didn't like about the place was the weather. She thought it was needless, preposterous, and inconvenient. It began to rain, and, as usual, caught her off guard. She hurried to a shelter where, for a tenth mark, she rented an umbrella, but it was too late for her paper uniform. As she stood in front of a blower, drying off, she wadded it up and threw it away, then hurried to catch the trolley, nude but for her creaking leather equipment belt and police cap. Even this stripped down, she was more dressed than a quarter of the people around her. The conductor gave her a paper mat to put on the artificial leather seat. There were cut flowers and crystal vases attached to the sides of the car. Bach sat by an open window and leaned one arm outside in the cool breeze, watching the passing scenery. She craned her neck when the Graf Zeppelin muttered by overhead. They said it was an exact copy of the first world-girdling dirigible— and she had no reason to doubt it. It was a great day to be traveling. If not for one thing, it would be perfect. Her mind kept coming back to Charlie and her mother. She had forgotten just how big the Great Northern was. She stopped twice on her way down the long dock to board it, once to buy a lime sherbet ice cream cone, and again to purchase a skirt. As she fed coins into the clothing machine, she looked at the great metal wall of the ship. It was painted white, trimmed in gold. There were five smokestacks and six towering masts. Midships was the housing for the huge paddle wheel. Multicolored pennants snapped in the breeze from the forest of rigging. It was quite a boat. She finished her cone, punched in her size, then selected a simple above-the-knee skirt and a gaudy print of tropical fruit and palm trees. The machine hummed as it cut the paper to size, hemmed it, and strengthened the waist with elastic— then rolled it out into her hand. She held it up against herself. It was good, but the equipment belt spoiled it. There were lockers along the deck. She used yet another coin to rent one. In it went the belt and cap. She took the pen out of her hair and shook it down around her shoulders, fussed with it for a moment, then decided it would have to do. She fastened the skirt with its single button, wearing it low on her hips, South Sea style. She walked a few steps, studying the effect. The skirt tended to leave one leg bare when she walked, which felt right. Look at you, she chided herself under her breath. You think you look all right to meet a world-famous, glamorous tube personality? Who you happen to despise? She thought about reclaiming her belt, then decided that would be foolish. The fact was it was a glorious day, a beautiful ship, and she was feeling more alive than she had in months. She climbed the gangplank and was met at the top by a man in an outlandish uniform. It was all white, covered everything but his face, and was festooned with gold braid and black buttons. It looked hideously uncomfortable, but he didn't seem to mind it. That was one of the odd things about Mozart plots. In jobs at places like the Great Northern, people often worked in period costumes, though it meant wearing shoes or things even more grotesque. He made a small bow and tipped his hat, then offered her a hibiscus, which he helped her pin in her hair. She smiled at him. Bach was a sucker for that kind of treatment, and knew it, perhaps because she got so little of it. I'm meeting someone in the bar on the top deck. If madame would walk this way, he gestured, then led her along the side rail toward the stern of the ship. The deck underfoot was gleaming, polished teak. She was shown to a wicker table near the rail. The steward held the chair out for her and took her order. She relaxed, looking up at the vast reaches of the Arco Mall, feeling the bright sunlight washing over her body, smelling the salt water, hearing the lap of waves against wood pilings. The air was full of bright balloons, gliders, putt-putting nanolights, and people in 
muscle-powered flight harnesses. Not too far away, a fish broke the surface. She grinned at it. Her drink arrived, with sprigs of mint and several straws and a tiny parasol. It was good. She looked around. There were only a few people out here on the deck. One couple was dressed in full-period costume, but the rest looked normal enough. She settled on one guy sitting alone across the deck. He had a good pair of shoulders on him. When she caught his eye, she made a hand signal that meant, I might be available. He ignored it, which annoyed her for a while, until he was joined by a tiny woman who couldn't have been five feet tall. She shrugged. No accounting for taste. She knew what was happening to her. It was silly, but she felt like going on the hunt. It often happened to her when something shocking or unpleasant happened at work. The police head shrinker said it was compensation, and not that uncommon. With a sigh, she turned her mind away from that. It seemed there was no place else for it to go but back into that room on Charlie's station and to the thing in the bed. Charlie knew her mother was very sick. She had been that way a long, long time. She left the camera, pointed at her mother while she went away to deal with her dogs. The doctors had gathered around and studied the situation for quite some time, then issued their diagnosis. She was dead, of course, by any definition medical science had accepted for the last century. Someone had wired her to a robot doctor, probably during the final stages of the epidemic. It was capable of doing just about anything to keep a patient alive and was not programmed to understand brain death. That was a decision left to the human doctor when he or she arrived. The doctor had never arrived. The doctor was dead, and the thing that had been Charlie's mother lived on. Bach wondered if the verb to live had ever been so abused. All of its arms and legs were gone, victims of gangrene. Not much else could be seen of it, but a forest of tubes and wires entered and emerged. Fluids seeped slowly through the tissue. Machines had taken over the function of every vital organ. There were patches of greenish skin here and there, including one on the side of its head, which Charlie had kissed before leaving. Bach hastily took another drink as she recalled that, and signaled the waiter for another. Bloom and Wilhelm had been fascinated. They were dubious that any part of it could still be alive, even in the sense of cell cultures. There was no way to find out, because— the Charlie Station computer, tick-tock to the little girl, refused access to the auto-doctor's data outputs. But there was a very interesting question that emerged as soon as everyone was convinced Charlie's mother had died thirty years ago. Hello, Anna Louise. Sorry I'm late. She looked up and saw Megan Galloway approaching. Bach had not met the woman in just over ten years, though she, like almost everyone else, had seen her frequently on the tube. Galloway was tall, for an earth woman, and not as thin as Bach remembered her. But that was understandable, considering the recent change in her life. Her hair was fiery red and curly, which it had not been ten years ago. It might even be her natural color. She was almost nude, and the colors matched, though that didn't have to mean much, but it looked right on her. She wore odd-looking silver slippers, and her upper body was traced by a quite lovely filigree of gilded curving lines. It was some sort of tattoo, and it was all that was left of the machine called the Golden Gypsy. It was completely symbolic. Being the Golden Gypsy was worth a lot of money to Galloway. Megan Galloway had broken her neck while still in her teens. She became part of the early development of a powered exoskeleton, research that led to the hideously expensive and beautiful Golden Gypsy, of which only one was ever built. It abolished wheelchairs and crutches for her. It returned her to life in her own mind, and it made her a celebrity. An odd byproduct to learning to use an exoskeleton was the development of skills that made it possible to excel in the new technology of emotional recording, the feelies. The world was briefly treated to the sight of quadriplegics dominating a new art form. It made Galloway famous as the best of the trans sisters. It made her rich, as her trans tapes outsold everyone else's. She made herself extremely rich by investing wisely. Then she and a friend of Box had made her fabulously rich by being the first to capture the experience of falling in love on a trans tape. In a sense, Galloway had cured herself. 
She had always donated a lot of money to neurological research, never really expecting it to pay off. But it did, and three years ago she had thrown the golden gypsy away forever. Bach had thought her cure was complete, but now she wondered. Galloway carried a beautiful crystal cane. It didn't seem to be for show. She leaned on it heavily and made her way through the tables slowly. Bach started to get up. No, no, don't bother, Galloway said. It takes me a while, but I get there. She flashed that famous smile with the gap between her front teeth. There was something about the woman. The smile was so powerful that Bach found herself smiling back. It's so good to walk, I don't mind taking my time. She let the waiter pull the chair back for her and sat down with a sigh of relief. I'll have a devil's nightlight, she told him, and get another of whatever that was for her. A banana daiquiri, Bach said surprised to find her own drink was almost gone, and a little curious to find out what a devil's nightlight was. Galloway stretched as she looked up at the balloons and gliders. It's great to get back to the moon, she said. She made a small gesture that indicated her body. Great to get out of my clothes. I always feel so free in here. Funny thing, though, I just can't get used to not wearing shoes. She lifted one foot to display a slipper. I feel too vulnerable without them like I'm going to get stepped on. You can take your clothes off on earth, too, Bach pointed out. Some places, sure, but aside from the beach, there's no place where it's fashionable, don't you see? Bach didn't, but decided not to make a thing out of it. She knew social nudity had evolved in Luna because it never got hot or cold, and that earth would never embrace it as fully as Lunarians had. The drinks arrived. Bach sipped hers and eyed Galloway's, which produced a luminous smoke ring every ten seconds. Galloway chattered on about nothing in particular for a while. "'Why did you agree to see me?' Galloway asked at last. "'Shouldn't that be my question?' Galloway raised an eyebrow, and Bach went on. "'You've got a hell of a story. I can't figure out why you didn't just run with it. Why arrange a meeting with someone you barely knew ten years ago and haven't seen since, and never liked even back then?' I always liked you, Anna Louise, Galloway said. She looked up at the sky. For a while she watched a couple peddling a sky cycle. Then she looked at Bach again. I feel like I owe you something. Anyway, when I saw your name, I thought I should check with you. I don't want to cause you any trouble. Suddenly she looked angry. I don't need the story, Bach. I don't need any story. I'm too big for that. I can let it go or I can use it. It makes no difference. Oh, that's cute. Bach said. Maybe I don't understand how you pay your debts. Maybe they do it different on earth. She thought Galloway was going to get up and leave. She had reached for her cane, then thought better of it. I gather it doesn't matter then if I go with the story? Bach shrugged. She hadn't come here to talk about Charlie anyway. How is Q.M., by the way, she said. Galloway didn't look away this time. She sat in silence for almost a minute, searching Bach's eyes. "'I thought I was ready for that question,' she said at last. "'He's living in New Zealand, on a commune. From what my agents tell me, he's happy. They don't watch television. They don't marry. They worship, and they screw a lot. "'Did you really give him half of the profits on that—that that tape?' "'Did give him? Am giving him?' and will continue to give him until the day I die. And it's half the gross, my dear, which is another thing entirely. He gets half of every mark that comes in. He's made more money off it than I have, and he's never touched a tenth mark. It's piling up on a Swiss account I started in his name. Well, he never sold anything. Bach hadn't meant that to be as harsh as it came out, but Galloway did not seem bothered by it. The thing she had sold— had there ever been anyone as thoroughly betrayed as Q.M. Cooper? Bach wondered. She might have loved him herself, but he fell totally in love with Megan Galloway. And Galloway fell in love with him. There could be no mistake about that. Doubters are referred to Hitana de Oro, Catalog No. 1, an emotional recording entitled simply Love. Put it in your trans tape player, don the headset, punch play— and you will experience just how hard and how completely Galloway fell in love with Q.M. Cooper. But have your head examined first. 
GDO No. 1 had been known to precipitate suicide. Cooper had found this an impediment to the course of true love. He had always thought that love was something between two people, something exclusive, something private. He was unprepared to have Galloway mass-produce it, put it in a box with liner notes and a price tag of LM-1495, and hawk copies in every trans-tape shop from Peoria to Tibet. The supreme irony of it to the man, who eventually found refuge in a minor cult in a far corner of the earth, was that the tape itself, the means of his betrayal, his humiliation, was proof that Galloway had returned his love. And Galloway had sold it, never mind that she had her reasons, or that they were reasons with which Bach could find considerable sympathy. She had sold it. All Bach ever got out of the episode was a compulsion to seek lovers who looked like the earth-muscled Cooper. Now it seemed she might get something else. It was time to change the subject. "'What do you know about Charlie?' she asked. "'You want it all, or just a general idea?' Galloway didn't wait for an answer. "'I know her real name is Charlotte Isolde Hill Perkins Smith. I know her father is dead, and her mother's condition is open to debate.' Lita Perkins Smith has a lot of money, if she's alive. Her daughter would inherit if she's dead. I know the names of ten of Charlie's dogs. And, oh, yes, I know that, appearances to the contrary, she is thirty-seven years old. Your source is very up-to-date. It's a very good source. You want to name him? I'll pass on that for the moment. She regarded Bach easily, her hands folded on the table in front of her. So, what do you want me to do? Is it really that simple? My producers will want to kill me, but I'll sit on the story for at least twenty-four hours if you tell me to. By the way, she turned in her seat and crooked a finger at another table. It's probably time you met my producers. Bach turned slightly and saw them coming toward her table. These are the Myers twins, Joy and Jay. Waiter, do you know how to make a Shirley Temple and a Roy Rogers? The waiter said he did, and went off with the order, while Joy and Jay pulled up chairs and sat in them, several feet from the table but very close to each other. They had not offered to shake hands. Both were armless, with no sign of amputation, just bare, rounded shoulders. Both wore prosthetics made of golden welded wire and powered by tiny motors. The units were one piece, fitting over their backs in a harness-like arrangement. They were quite pretty, light and airy perfectly articulated, cunningly wrought, and also creepy. "'You've heard of Amparole?' Galloway asked. Bach shook her head. "'That's the slang word for it. It's a neo-Muslim practice. Joy and Jay were convicted of murder.' "'I have heard of it.' She hadn't paid much attention to it, dismissing it as just another hare-brained earthling idiocy. "'Their arms are being kept in cryonic suspension for twenty years.' The theory is if they send no more, they'll get them back. Those prosthetics won't pick up a gun or a knife. They won't throw a punch. Joy and Jay were listening to this with complete stolidity. Once Bach got beyond the arms, she saw another unusual thing about them. They were dressed identically, in loose, bell-bottomed trousers. Joy had small breasts, and Jay had a small mustache. Other than that, they were absolutely identical in face and body. Bach didn't care for the effect. They also took slices out of the cerebrums, and they're on a maintenance dosage of some drug. Calms them down. You don't want to know who they killed or how. But they were proper villains, these two. No, I don't think I do, Bach decided. Like many cops, she looked at eyes. Joy and Jay's were calm, placid, and deep inside was a steel-gray coldness. If they try to get naughty again, the um, late units go on strike. I suppose they might find a way to kill with their feet. The twins glanced at each other, held each other's gaze for a moment, and exchanged wistful smiles. At least Bach hoped they were just wistful. Yeah, okay, Bach said. Don't worry about them. They can't be offended with the drugs they're taking. I wasn't worried, Bach said. She couldn't have cared less what the freaks felt. She wished they'd been executed. "'Are they really twins?' she finally asked, against her better judgment. "'Really. One of them had a sex change. I don't know which one. And to answer your next question, yes, they do, but only in the privacy of their own room.' "'I wasn't—' 
And your other question, they are very good at what they do. Who am I to judge about the other? And I'm in a highly visible industry. It never hurts to have conversation pieces around. You need to get noticed. Bach was starting to get angry, and she was not quite sure why. Maybe it was the way Galloway so cheerfully admitted her base motives, even when no one had accused her of having them. We were talking about the story, she said. We need to go with it, Joy said, startling Bach. Somehow she had not really expected the cyborg thing to talk. Our source is good, and the security on the story is tight. But it's dead certain to come out in twenty-four hours, Jay finished for her. Maybe less, Joy added. Shut up, Galloway said, without heat. Anna Louise, you were about to tell me your feeling on the matter. Bach finished her drink as the waiter arrived with more. She caught herself staring as the twins took theirs. The metal hands were marvels of complexity. They moved just as cleverly as real hands. I was considering leaking the story myself. It looked like things were going against Charlie. I thought they might just let the station crash and then swear us all to secrecy. It strikes me, Galloway said slowly, that today's developments give her an edge. Yeah, but I don't envy her. Me either. But it's not going to be easy to neglect a girl whose body may hold the secret of eternal life. If you do, somebody's bound to ask awkward questions later. It may not be eternal life, Bach said. What do you call it, then? Jay asked. Why do you say that? Joy wanted to know. All we know is she's lived thirty years without growing any older, externally. They'd have to examine her a lot closer to find out what's actually happening. And there's pressure to do so. Exactly. It might be the biggest medical breakthrough in a thousand years. What I think has happened to her is not eternal life, but extended youth. Galloway looked thoughtful. You know, of the two, I think extended youth would be more popular. I think you're right. They brooded over that in silence for a while. Bach signaled the waiter for another drink. Anyway, she went on, Charlie doesn't seem to need protection just now, but she may, and quickly. So you aren't in favor of letting her die? Bach looked up, surprised and beginning to be offended. Then she remembered Dr. Wilhelm. The good doctor was not a monster, and Galloway's question was a reasonable one, given the nature of Nero X. There has to be a way to save her, and protect ourselves from her. That's what I'm looking toward, anyway. Let me get this straight, then. You were thinking of leaking the story so the public outcry would force the police to save her? Sure, I thought. Bach trailed off, suddenly realizing what Galloway was saying. You mean you think— Galloway waved her hand impatiently. It depends on a lot of things, but mostly on how the story is handled. If you start off with the plague story, there could be pressure to blast her out of the skies and have done with it. She looked at Jay and Joy, who went into a trance-like state. Sure, sure, Jay said. The plague got big play. Almost everybody remembers it. Use horror show tapes of the casualties. Line up the big brains to start the scare, Joy said. You can even add sob stuff after it gets rolling. What a tragedy! This little girl has to die for the good of us all. Somber commentary. The world watches as she cashes in. You can make it play. No problem. Bach's head had been ping-ponging between the two of them. When Galloway spoke, it was hard to swing around and look at her. Or you could start off with the little girl, Galloway prompted. Much better, Joy said. Twice the story there. Indignant expose stuff. Did you know, fellow citizens— there's this little girl, this innocent child, swinging around up there in space, and she's going to die. A rich little girl, too, and her dying mother. Later get the immortality angle. Not too soon, Joy cautioned. At first, she's ordinary. Second lead is, she's got money. Third lead, she holds the key to eternal youth. Immortality. Youth, honey, youth. Who the fuck knows what living forever is like? Youth you can sell. It's the only thing you can sell. Megan, this is the biggest story since Jesus. Or at least we'll make it the biggest story. See why they're so valuable, Galloway said. Bach hardly heard her. She was reassessing what she had thought she knew about the situation. I don't know what to do, she finally confessed. I don't know what to ask you to do either. I guess you ought to go with what you think is best. 
Galloway frowned. Both for professional and personal reasons, I'd rather try to help her. I'm not sure why. She is dangerous, you know. I realize that, but I can't believe she can't be handled. Neither can I. She glanced at her watch. Tell you what, you come with us, on a little trip. Bach protested at first, but Galloway would not be denied, and Bach's resistance was at a low ebb. By speedboat, trolley, and airplane, they quickly made their way on the top of Mozart plots, where Bach found herself in a four-seat PTP, or point-to-point -point ballistic vehicle. She had never ridden in a PTP. They were rare, mostly because they wasted a lot of energy for only a few minutes' gain in travel time. Most people took the tubes, which reached speeds of 3,000 miles per hour, hovering inches above their induction rails in Luna's excellent vacuum. But for a celebrity like Galloway, the PTP made sense. She had trouble going places in public without getting mobbed, and she certainly had the money to spare. There was a heavy initial acceleration, then weightlessness. Bach had never liked it, and enjoyed it even less with a few drinks in her. Little was said during the short journey. Bach had not asked where they were going, and Galloway did not volunteer it. Bach looked out one of the wide windows at the fleeting moonscape. As she counted the valleys, rills, and craters flowing past beneath her, she soon realized her destination. It was a distant valley, in the sense that no tube track ran through it. In a little over an hour, Tango Charlie would come speeding through, no more than a hundred meters from the surface. The PTP landed itself in a cluster of transparent, temporary domes. There were over a hundred of them, and more PTPs than Bach had ever seen before. She decided most of the people in and around the domes fell into three categories. There were the very wealthy, owners of private spacecraft, who had erected most of these portable Xanadus and filled them with their friends. There were civic dignitaries in city-owned domes, and there were the news media. This last category was there in its teeming hundreds. It was not what they would call a big story, but it was a very visual one. It should yield spectacular pictures for the evening news. A long, wide black stripe had been created across the sun-drenched plain, indicating the path Tango Charlie would take. Many cameras and quite a few knots of pressure-suited spectators were situated smack in the middle of that line, with many more off to one side to get an angle on the approach. Beyond it were about a hundred large glass-roofed touring buses and a motley assortment of private crawlers, sun-skimmers, jet sleds, and even some hikers, the common people, come to see the event. Bach followed along behind the uncommon people. Galloway, thin and somehow spectral in the translucent suit, leaning on her crystal cane. The Myers twins, whose Amparo Lee arms would not fit in the suits, so that the empty sleeves stuck out, bloated like crucified ghosts. And most singular of all, the wire sculpture arm units themselves, walking independently on their fingertips, looking like some demented, disjointed mechanical camel as they lurched through the dust. They entered the largest of the domes, set on the edge of the gathering nearest the black line, which put it no more than a hundred meters from the expected passage. The first person Bach saw as she was removing her helmet was Herfer. He did not see her immediately. He and many of the other people in the dome were watching Galloway, so she saw his face as his gaze moved from the celebrity to Joy and Jay, and saw amazement and horror far too strong to be simple surprise at their weirdness. It was a look of recognition. Galloway had said she had an excellent source. She noticed Bach's interest, smiled, and nodded slightly. Still struggling to remove her suit, she approached Bach. That's right. The twins heard a rumor something interesting might be going on at Navtrack, so they found your commander. Turns out he has rather odd sexual tastes— though it's probably fairly pedestrian to Joy and Jay. They scratched his itch, and he spilled everything. I find that rather interesting, Bach admitted. I thought you would. Were you planning to make a career out of being an R.A. in navigational tracking? That wasn't my intention. I didn't think so. Listen, don't touch it. I can handle it without there being any chance of it backfiring on you. Within the week you'll be promoted out of there. I don't know if... If what? Galloway was looking at her narrowly. Bach hesitated only a moment. I may be stiff-necked, but I'm not a fool. Thank you. Galloway turned away a little awkwardly, 
then resumed struggling with her suit. Bach was about to offer some help when Galloway frowned at her. How come you're not taking off your pressure suit? That dome up there is pretty strong, but it's only one layer. Look around you. Most of the natives have just removed their helmets, and a lot are carrying those around. Most of the earthlings are out of their suits. They don't understand vacuum. You're saying it's not safe? No, but vacuum doesn't forgive. It's trying to kill you all the time. Galloway looked dubious, but stopped trying to remove her suit. Bach wandered the electronic wonderland, helmet in hand. Tango Charlie would not be visible until less than a minute before the close encounter, and then would be hard to spot, as it would be only a few seconds of arc above the horizon line. But there were cameras, hundreds of miles down track, which could already see it, both as a bright star, moving visibly against the background, and as a jittery image in some very long lenses. Bach watched as the wheel filled one screen until she could actually see furniture behind one of the windows. For the first time since arriving, she thought of Charlie. She wondered if Tick-Tock, no, damn it, if the Charlie station computer, had told her of the approach, and if so, would Charlie watch it? Which window would she choose? It was shocking to think that, if she chose the right one, Bach might catch a glimpse of her. Only a few minutes to go. Knowing it was stupid, Bach looked along the line indicated by the thousand cameras, hoping to catch the first glimpse. She saw Megan Galloway doing a walk-around, followed by a camera crew, no doubt saying bright, witty things to her huge audience. Galloway was here less for the event itself than for the many celebrities who had gathered to witness it. Bach saw her approach a famous TV star who smiled and embraced her, making some sort of joke about Galloway's pressure suit. You can meet him if you want, she told herself. She was a little surprised to discover she had no interest in doing so. She saw Joy and Jay in heated conversation with Herfer. The twins seemed distantly amused. She saw the countdown clock ticking toward one minute. Then the telescopic image in one of the remote cameras began to shake violently. In a few seconds, it had lost its fix on Charlie Station. Bach watched as annoyed technicians struggled to get it back. Seismic activity, one of them said, loud enough for Bach to hear. She looked at the other remote monitor, which showed Tango Charlie as a very bright star sitting on the horizon. As she watched, the light grew visibly until she could see it as a disk. And in another part of the screen, at a site high in the lunar hills, there was a shower of dust and rock. That must be the seismic activity, she thought. The camera operator zoomed in on this eruption, and Bach frowned. She couldn't figure out what sort of lunar quake could cause such a commotion. It looked more like an impact. The rocks and dust particles were fountaining up with lovely geometrical symmetry, each piece from the largest boulder to the smallest moat, moving at about the same speed and in a perfect mathematical trajectory, unimpeded by any air resistance, in a way that could never be duplicated on Earth. It was a dull gray expanding dome shape, gradually flattening on top. Frowning, she turned her attention to the spot on the plain where she had been told Charlie would first appear. She saw the first light of it, but more troubling, she saw a dozen more of the expanding domes. From here they seemed no larger than soap bubbles. Then another fountain of rock erupted, not far from the impromptu parking lot full of tourist buses. Suddenly she knew what was happening. "'It's shooting at us!' she shouted. Everyone fell silent, and as they were still turning to look at her, she yelled again, "'Suit up!' Her voice was drowned out by the sound every Lunarian dreads, the high, haunting shriek of escaping air. Step number one, she heard a long-ago instructor say. See to your own pressure integrity first. You can't help anybody, man, woman, or child, if you pass out before you get into your suit. It was a five-second operation to don and seal her helmet, one she had practiced a thousand times as a child. She glimpsed a great hole in the plastic roof. Debris was pouring out of it, swept up in the sudden wind, paper, clothing, a couple of helmets. Sealed up, she looked around and realized many of these people were doomed. They were not in their suits, and there was little chance they could put them on in time. She remembered the next few seconds in a series of vivid impressions. A boulder, several tons of dry lunar rock, crashed down on a bank of television monitors. A chubby little man, his hands shaking, unable to get his helmet over his bald head. Bach tore it from his hands, slapped it in place, and gave it a twist hard enough to knock him down. 
Joy and Jay, as good as dead, killed by the impossibility of fitting the mechanical arms into their suits, holding each other calmly in metallic embrace. Beyond the black line, a tour bus, rising slowly in the air, turning end over end, a hundred of the hideous gray domes of explosions growing like mushrooms all through the valley. And there was Galloway. She was going as fast as she could, intense concentration on her face as she stumbled along after her helmet, which was rolling on the ground. Blood had leaked from one corner of her nose. It was almost soundless in the remains of the dome now. Bach snagged the helmet and hit Galloway with a flying tackle, just like a drill, put helmet in place, twist, hit three snap interlocks, then the emergency pressurization switch. She saw Galloway howl in pain and try to put her hands to her ears. Lying there, she looked up as the last big segment of the dome material lifted in a dying wind to reveal Tango Charlie. It was a little wheel rolling on the horizon, no bigger than a coin. She blinked, and it was here, vast towering coming directly at her through a hell of burning dust. It was the dust that finally made the lasers visible. The great spokes of light were flashing on and off in millisecond bursts and in each pulse a trillion dust motes were vaporized in an eyeball-frying purple light. It was impossible that she saw it for more than a tenth of a second, but it seemed much longer. The sight would remain with her, and not just in memory. For days afterward her vision was scored with a spider web of purple lines. But much worse was the awesome grandeur of the thing, the whirling menace of it as it came rushing out of the void. That picture would last much longer than a few days. It would come out only at night, in dreams that would wake her for years, drenched in sweat. And the last strong image she would carry away from the valley was of Galloway, turned over now, pointing her crystal cane at the wheel, already far away on the horizon. A line of red laser light came out of the end of the cane and stretched away into infinity. Wow, said Charlotte Isolde Hill Perkins Smith. Wow, Tick-Tock, that was great. Let's do it again. Hovering in the dead center of the hub, Charlie had watched all of the encounter. It had been a lot like she imagined a roller coaster would be when she watched the films in Tick-Tock's memory. If it had a fault, and she wasn't complaining, far from it, it was that the experience had been too short. For almost an hour she had watched the moon get bigger until it no longer seemed round and the landscape was rolling by beneath her but she'd seen that much before. This time it just got larger and larger and faster and faster, until she was scooting along at about a zillion miles an hour. Then there was a lot of flashing lights, and gradually the ground got farther away again. It was still back there, dwindling, no longer very interesting. "'I'm glad you liked it,' Tick-Tock said. "'Only one thing. How come I had to put on my pressure suit?' "'Just a precaution.' She shrugged and made her way to the elevator. When she got out at the rim, she frowned. There were alarms sounding far around the rim on the wheel. We got a problem? she asked. Minor, Tick-Tock said. What happened? We got hit by some rocks. We must have passed real close. Charlie, if you'd been down here when we passed, you could have reached out and written your name on a rock. She giggled at that idea, then hurried off to see the dogs. It was about two hours later that Anna Louise called. Charlie was inclined to ignore it. She had so much to do, but in the end she sat down in front of the camera. Anna Louise was there, and sitting beside her was another woman. "'Are you okay, Charlie?' Anna wanted to know. "'Why shouldn't I be?' "'Damn,' she thought. She wasn't supposed to answer a question with another question. But then what right did Anna have to ask her to do that?' I was wondering if you were watching a little while ago when you passed so close to the moon. I sure was. It was great. There was a short pause. The two women looked at each other. Then Anna Louise sighed and faced Charlie again. Charlie, there are a few things I have to tell you. As in most disasters involving depressurization, there was not a great demand for first aid. Most of the bad injuries were fatal. Galloway was not hearing too well, and Bach still had spots before her eyes. Herfer hadn't even bumped his head. The body count was not complete, but it was going to be high. 
For a perilous hour after the passage, there was talk of shooting Tango Charlie out of the sky. Much of the advisory team had already gathered in the meeting room by the time Bach and Herfer arrived, with Galloway following closely behind. A hot debate was in progress. People recognized Galloway, and a few seemed inclined to question her presence here, but Herfer shut them up quickly. A deal had been struck in the PTP on the way back from the disaster. The fix was in, and Megan Galloway was getting an exclusive on the story. Galloway had proved to Herfer that Joy and Jay had kept tapes of his security lapse. The eventual explanation for the unprovoked and insane attack was simple. The Charlie Station computer had been instructed to fire upon any object approaching within five kilometers. It had done so, faithfully, for thirty years, not that it ever had much to shoot at. The close approach of Luna must have been an interesting problem. Tick-Tock was no fool. Certainly he would know the consequences of his actions. But a computer did not think at all like a human, no matter how much it might sound like one. There were rigid hierarchies in a brain like Tick-Tock. One part of him might realize something was foolish, but be helpless to override a priority order. Analysis of the pattern of laser strikes helped to confirm this. The hits were totally random. Vehicles, domes, and people had not been targeted. However, if they were in the way, they were hit. The one exception to the randomness concerned the black line Bach had seen. Tick-Tock had found a way to avoid shooting directly ahead of himself without violating his priority order. Thus he avoided stirring up debris that Charlie Station would be flying through in another few seconds. The decision was made to take no reprisals on Tango Charlie. Nobody was happy about it, but no one could suggest anything short of total destruction. But action had to be taken now. Very soon the public was going to wonder why this dangerous object had not been destroyed before the approach. The senior police present and the representatives of the mayor's office all agreed that the press would have to be let in. They asked Galloway if they could have her cooperation in the management of this phase. And Bach watched as, with surprising speed, Megan Galloway took over the meeting. "'You need time right now,' she said at one point. The best way to get it is to play the little girl angle and play it hard. You were not so heartless as to endanger the little girl, and you had no reason to believe the station was any kind of threat. What you have to do now is tell the truth about what we know and what's been done. How about the immortality angle, someone asked. What about it? It's going to leak some day. Might as well get it out in front of us. But it will prejudice the public in favor of— Wilhelm looked around her and decided not to finish her objection. It's a price we have to pay, Galloway said smoothly. You folks will do what you think is right, I'm sure of that. You wouldn't let public opinion influence your decision. Nobody had anything to say to that. Bach managed not to laugh. The big thing is to answer the questions before they get asked. I suggest you get started on your statements, then call in the press. In the meantime, Corporal Bach has invited me to listen in on her next conversation with Charlie Perkins Smith, so I'll leave you now. Bach led Galloway down the corridor toward the operations room, shaking her head in admiration. She looked over her shoulder. I've got to admit, you're very smooth. It's my profession. You're pretty smooth yourself. What do you mean? I mean, I owe you. I'm afraid I owe you more than I'll be able to repay. Bach stopped, honestly bewildered. You saved my life, Galloway shouted. Thank you. So what if I did? You don't owe me anything. It's not the custom. What's not the custom? You can be grateful, sure. I'd be if somebody pressurized me. But it would be an insult to try to pay me back for it. Like on the desert. You know, you have to give water to somebody dying of thirst. Not in the deserts I've been to, Galloway said. They were alone in the hallway. Galloway seemed distressed, and Bach felt awkward. We seem to be at a cultural impasse. I feel I owe you a lot, and you say it's nothing. No problem, Bach pointed out. You were going to help me get promoted out of this stinking place. Do that, and we'll call it even. Galloway was shaking her head. I don't think I'll be able to now. You know that fat man you stuffed into a helmet before you got to me? He asked me about you. He's the mayor of Clavius. He'll be talking to the mayor of New Dresden, and you'll get the promotion and a couple of medals and maybe a reward, too. They regarded each other uneasily. 
Bach knew that gratitude could equal resentment. She thought she could see some of that in Galloway's eyes. But there was determination, too. Megan Galloway paid her debts. She had been paying one to Q.M. Cooper for ten years. By unspoken agreement they left it at that and went to talk to Charlie. Most of the dogs didn't like the air blower. Mistress Too White O'Hawk was the exception. Too White would turn her face into the stream of warm air as Charlie directed the hose over her sable pelt. Then she would let her tongue hang out in an expression of such delight that Charlie would usually end up laughing at her. Charlie brushed the fine hair between Too White's legs, the hair that was white almost an inch higher than it should be on a champion Sheltie. Just one little inch, and Too White was sterilized. She would have been a fine mother. Charlie had seen her looking at puppies whelped by other mothers, and she knew it made Too White sad. But you can't have everything in this world. Tick-tock had said that often enough. And you can't let all your dogs breed, or pretty soon you'll be knee-deep in dogs. Tick-tock said that, too. In fact, Tick-tock said a lot of things Charlie wished were not true, but he had never lied to her. Were you listening? she asked. During your last conversation, of course I was. Charlie put Two White down on the floor and summoned the next dog. This was Engelbert, who wasn't a year old yet and still inclined to be frisky when he shouldn't be. Charlie had to scold him before he would be still. Some of the things she said, Tick-Tock began. It seemed like she disturbed you, like how old you are. That's silly, Charlie said quickly. I knew how old I am. This was the truth, and yet it wasn't everything. Her first four dogs were all dead. The oldest had been thirteen. There had been many dogs since then. Right now the oldest dog was sixteen and sick. He wouldn't last much longer. I just never added it up, Charlie said truthfully. There was never any reason to. But I don't grow up, she said softly. Why is that, Tick-Tock? I don't know, Charlie. Anna said if I go down to the moon they might be able to find out. Tick-Tock didn't say anything. Was she telling the truth? About all those people who got hurt? Yes. Maybe I shouldn't have got mad at her. Again, Tick-Tock was silent. Charlie had been very angry. Anna and a new woman, Megan, had told her all these awful things, and when they were done, Charlie knocked over the television equipment and went away. That had been almost a day ago, and they had been calling back almost all the time. Why did you do it? she said. I didn't have any choice. Charlie accepted that. Tick-Tock was a mechanical man, not like her at all. He was a faithful guardian and the closest thing she had to a friend, but she knew he was different. For one thing, he didn't have a body. She had sometimes wondered if this inconvenienced him any, but she had never asked. Is my mother really dead? Yes. Charlie stopped brushing. Engelbert looked around at her, then waited patiently until she told him he could get down. I guess I knew that. I thought you did, but you never asked. She was someone to talk to, Charlie explained. She left the grooming room and walked down the promenade. Several dogs followed behind her, trying to get her to play. She went into her mother's room and stood for a moment looking at the thing in the bed. Then she moved from machine to machine, flipping switches, until everything was quiet. And when she was done, that was the only change in the room. The machines no longer hummed, rumbled, and clicked. The thing on the bed hadn't changed at all. Charlie supposed she could keep on talking to it if she wanted to, but she suspected it wouldn't be the same. She wondered if she ought to cry. Maybe she should ask Tick-Tock, but he'd never been very good with those kind of questions. Maybe it was because he couldn't cry himself, so he didn't know when people ought to cry. But the fact was Charlie had felt a lot sadder at Albert's funeral. In the end, she sang her hymn again, then closed and locked the door behind her. She would never go in there again. She's back, Steiner called across the room. Bach and Galloway hastily put down their cups of coffee and hurried over to Bach's office. She just plugged this camera in, Steiner explained, as they took their seats. Looks a little different, doesn't she? Bach had to agree. They had glimpsed her in other cameras as she went about her business. Then about an hour ago she had entered her mother's room again. 
From there she had gone to her own room, and when she emerged, she was a different girl. Her hair was washed and combed. She wore a dress that seemed to have started off as a woman's blouse. The sleeves had been cut off, and bits of it had been inexpertly taken in. There was red polish on her nails. Her face was heavily made up. It was overdone and completely wrong for someone of her apparent age, but it was not the wild, almost tribal paint she had worn before. Charlie was seated behind a huge wooden desk, facing the camera. "'Good morning, Anna and Megan,' she said solemnly. "'Good morning, Charlie,' Galloway said. "'I'm sorry I shouted at you,' Charlie said. Her hands were folded carefully in front of her. There was a sheet of paper just to the left of them. Other than that, the desk was bare. I was confused and upset, and I needed some time to think about the things you said. That's all right, Bach told her. She did her best to conceal a yawn. She and Galloway had been awake for a day and a half. There had been a few catnaps, but they were always interrupted by sightings of Charlie. I've talked things over with Tick-Tock, Charlie went on, and I turned my mother off. You were right. She was dead anyway. Bach could think of nothing to say to that. She glanced at Galloway, but could read nothing in the other woman's face. I've decided what I want to do, Charlie said. But first I— Charlie, Galloway said quickly, could you show me what you have there on the table? There was a brief silence in the room. Several people turned to look at Galloway, but nobody said anything. Bach was about to, but Galloway was making a motion with her hand under the table— where no one but Bach was likely to see it. Bach decided to let it ride for the moment. Charlie was looking embarrassed. She reached for the paper, glanced at it, then looked back at the camera. I drew this picture for you, she said, because I was sorry I shouted. Could I see it? Charlie jumped down off the chair and came around to hold the picture up. She seemed proud of it, and she had every right to be. Here at last was visual proof that Charlie was not what she seemed to be. No eight-year-old could have drawn this fine pencil portrait of a Sheltie. "'This is for Anna,' she said. "'That's very nice, Charlie,' Galloway said. "'I'd like one, too.' "'I'll draw you one,' Charlie said happily, and ran out of the picture. There was angry shouting for a few moments. Galloway stood her ground, explaining that she had only been trying to cement the friendship— and how was she to know Charlie would run off like that? Even Herfer was emboldened enough to take a few shots, pointing out, logically in Bach's opinion, the time was running out, and if anything was to be done about her situation, every second was valuable. All right, all right, so I made a mistake. I promise I'll be more careful next time. Anna, I hope you'll call me when she comes back. And with that she picked up her cane and trudged from the room. Bach was surprised. It didn't seem like Galloway to leave the story before it was over, even if nothing was happening. But she was too tired to worry about it. She leaned back in her chair, closed her eyes, and was asleep in less than a minute. Charlie was hard at work on the picture for Megan when Tick-Tock interrupted her. She looked up in annoyance. Can't you see I'm busy? I'm sorry, but this can't wait. There's a telephone call for you. There's a what? But Tick-Tock said no more. Charlie went across the room to the phone, silent these thirty years. She eyed it suspiciously, then pressed the button. As she did, dim memories flooded through her. She saw her mother's face. For the first time she felt like crying. "'This is Charlotte Perkins Smith,' she said in a childish voice. "'My mother isn't—my mother—' "'May I ask who's calling, please?' There was no picture on the screen, but after a short pause there was a familiar voice. This is Megan Calloway, Charlie. Can we talk? When Steiner shook Bach's shoulder, she opened her eyes to see Charlie sitting on the desk once more. Taking a quick sip of the hot coffee Steiner had brought, she tried to wipe the cobwebs from her mind and get back to work. The girl was just sitting there, hands folded once more. Hello, Anna, the girl said. I just wanted to call and tell you I'll do whatever you people think is best— I've been acting silly. I hope you'll forgive me. It's been a long time since I had to talk to other people. That's okay, Charlie. I'm sorry I pissed on Captain Herfer. Tick-Tock said that was a bad thing to do, and that I ought to be more respectful to him since he's the guy in charge. So if you'll get him, I'll do whatever he says. 
All right, Charlie, I'll get him. Bach got up and watched Herfer take her chair. You'll be talking just to me from now on, he said, with what he must have felt was a friendly smile. Is that all right? Sure, Charlie said indifferently. You can go get some rest now, Corporal Bach, Herfer said. She saluted and turned on her heel. She knew it wasn't fair to Charlie to feel betrayed, but she couldn't help it. True, she hadn't talked to the girl all that long. There was no reason to feel a friendship had developed. But she felt sick watching Herford talk to her. The man would lie to her, she was sure of that. But then, could she have done any different? It was a disturbing thought. The fact was, there had as yet been no orders on what to do about Charlie. She was all over the news, the public debate had begun, and Bach knew it would be another day before public officials had taken enough soundings to know which way they should leap. In the meantime, they had Charlie's cooperation, and that was good news. Bach wished she could be happier about it. Anna, there's a phone call for you. She took it at one of the vacant consoles. When she pushed the talk button, a light came on, indicating the other party wanted privacy. So she picked up the handset and asked who was calling. Anna, said Galloway, come at once to room 569 in the Pension Kleist. That's four corridors from the main entrance to nav track level. I can find it. What's this all about? You got your story. I'll tell you when you get there. The first person Bach saw in the small room was Ludmila Rosnikova, the computer expert from GMA. She was sitting in a chair across the room, looking uncomfortable. Bach shut the door behind her and saw Galloway sprawled in another chair before a table littered with electronic gear. I felt I had to speak to TikTok privately, Galloway began, without preamble. She looked about as tired as Bach felt. Is that why you sent Charlie away? Galloway gave her a truly feral grin, and for a moment did not look tired at all. Bach realized she loved this sort of intrigue, loved playing fast and loose, taking chances. That's right. I figured Miss Rosnikova was the woman to get me through, so now she's working for me. Bach was impressed. It would not have been cheap to hire Rosnikova away from GMA. She would not have thought it possible. GMA doesn't know that, and it won't know if you can keep a secret, Galloway went on. I assured Ludmilla that you could. You mean she's spying for you? Not at all. She's not going to be working against GMA's interests, which are quite minimal in this affair. We're just not going to tell them about her work for me. And next year Ludmilla will take early retirement and move into a dacha in Georgia she's coveted all her life. Bach looked at Rosnikova, who seemed embarrassed. So everybody has her price, Bach thought. So what else is new? Turns out she had a special code which she withheld from the folks back at Navtrack. I suspected she might. I wanted to talk to him without anyone else knowing I was doing it. Your control room was a bit crowded for that. Ludmilla, you want to take it from there? She did, telling Bach the story in a low voice with reserved, diffident gestures. Bach wondered if she would be able to live with her defection, decided she'd probably get over it soon enough. Rosnikova had raised Charlie's station, which in this sense was synonymous with TikTok, the station computer. Galloway had talked to him. She wanted to know what he knew, as she suspected he was well aware of his own orbital dynamics. He knew he was going to crash into the moon. So what did he intend to do about Charlotte Perkins Smith, Galloway wanted to know. What are you offering? TikTok responded. The important point is, he doesn't want Charlie to die. He can't do anything about his instruction to fire on intruders, but he claims he would have let Charlie go years ago, but for one thing. Our quarantine probes, Bach said. Exactly. He's got a lifeboat in readiness. A few minutes from impact, if nothing has been resolved, he'll load Charlie in it and blast her away, after first killing both your probes. He knows there's not much of a chance, but impact on the lunar surface is no chance at all. Bach finally sat down. She thought it over for a minute, then spread her hands. Great, she said. It sounds like all our problems are solved. We'll just take this to Herfer, and we can call off the probes. Galloway and Rosnikova were silent. At last, Galloway sighed. It may not be as simple as that. 
Fox stood again, suddenly sure of what was coming next. I've got good sources, both in the news media and in City Hall. Things are not looking good for Charlie. I can't believe it, Box shouted. They're ready to let a little girl die? They're not even going to try to save her? Galloway made soothing motions, and Bach gradually calmed down. It's not definite yet, but the trend is there. For one thing, she is not a little girl, as you well know. I was counting on the public perception of her as a little girl, but that's not working out so well. But all your stories have been so positive. I'm not the only newscaster, and the public doesn't always determine it anyway. Right now they're in favor of Charlie seventy-thirty, but that's declining and a lot of that seventy percent is soft, as they say. Not sure. The talk is the decision-makers are going to make it look like an unfortunate accident. Tick-tock will be a great help there. It'll be easy to provoke an incident that could kill Charlie. It's just not right, Box said gloomily. Galloway leaned forward and looked at her intently. That's what I wanted to know. Are you still on Charlie's side, all the way? And if you are— what are you willing to risk to save her? Bach met Galloway's intense stare. Slowly, Galloway smiled again. That's what I thought. Here's what I want to do. Charlie was sitting obediently by the telephone in her room at the appointed time, and it rang just when Megan had said it would. She answered it as she had before. Hi there, kid. How's it going? I'm fine. Is Anna there, too? She sure is. Want to say hi to her? I wish you'd tell her it was you that told me to. I already did, and she understands. Did you have any trouble? Charlie snorted. With him? What a doo-doo head. He'll believe anything I tell him. Are you sure he can't hear us in here? Positive. Nobody can hear us. Did Tick-Tock tell you what all you have to do? I think so. I wrote some of it down. We'll go over it again, point by point. We can't have any mistakes. When they got the final word on the decision, it was only twelve hours to impact. None of them had gotten any sleep since the close approach. It seemed like years ago to Bach. The decision is to have an accident, Galloway said, hanging up the phone. She turned to Rosnikova, who bent, hollow-eyed, over her array of computer keyboards. How's it coming with the probe? I'm pretty sure I've got it now, she said, leaning back. I'll take it through the sequence one more time. She sighed, then looked at both of them. Every time I try to reprogram it, it wants to tell me about this broken rose blossom and the corpse of a puppy, and the way the wheel looks with all the lighted windows. She yawned hugely. Some of it's kind of pretty, actually. Bach wasn't sure what Rosnikova was talking about, but the important thing was the probe was taken care of. She looked at Galloway. My part is all done, Galloway said, in record time, too. I'm not even going to guess what it cost you, Bach said. It's only money. What about Dr. Bloom? He's with us. He wasn't even very expensive. I think he wanted to do it anyway. She looked from Bach to Rosnikova and back again. What do you say? Are we ready to go? Say in one hour? Neither of them raised an objection. Silently they shook each other's hand. They knew it would not go easy with them if they were discovered— but that had already been discussed and accepted, and there seemed no point in mentioning it again. Bach left them in a hurry. The dogs were more excited than Charlie had ever seen them. They sensed something was about to happen. They're probably just picking it up from you, Tick-Tock ventured. That could be it, Charlie agreed. They were leaping and running all up and down the corridor. It had been hell getting them all down here by a route Tick-Tock had selected that would avoid all the operational cameras used by Captain Herfer and those other busy bodies. But here they finally were, and there was the door to the lifeboat, and suddenly she realized that Tick-Tock could not come along. "'What are you going to do?' she finally asked him. "'That's a silly question, Charlie.' "'But you'll die.' "'Not possible. Since I was never alive, I can't die.' "'Oh, you're just playing with words.' She stopped and couldn't think of anything good to say. Why didn't they have more words? There ought to be more words, so some of them would be useful for saying goodbye. Did you scrub a scrub? Tick-tock asked. You want to look nice? Charlie nodded. 
wiping away a tear. Things were just happening so fast. Good. Now you remember to do all the things I taught you to do. It may be a long time before you can be with people again, but I think you will, some day. And in the meantime, Anna Louise and Megan have promised me that they'll be very strict with little girls who won't pick up their rooms and wash their hair. I'll be good, Charlie promised. I want you to obey them just like you've obeyed me. I will. Good. You've been a very good little girl, and I'll expect you to continue to be a good girl. Now get in that lifeboat and get going. So she did, along with dozens of barking Shelties. There was a guard outside the conference room, and Box Badge would not get her past him, so she assumed that was where the crime was being planned. She would have to be very careful. She entered the control room. It was understaffed, and no one was at her old chair. A few people noticed her as she sat down, but no one seemed to think anything of it. She settled down, keeping an eye on the clock. Forty minutes after her arrival, all hell broke loose. It had been an exciting day for the probe. New instructions had come. Any break in the routine was welcome, but this one was doubly good because the new programmer wanted to know everything, and the probe finally got a chance to transmit its poetry. It was a hell of a load off one's mind. When it finally managed to assure the programmer that it understood and would obey, it settled back in a cybernetic equivalent of wild expectation. The explosion was everything it could have hoped for. The wheel tore itself apart in a ghastly silence and began spreading itself wildly to the blackness. The probe moved in, glistening, glistening. And there it was, the soothing song it had been told to listen for, coming from a big oblong hunk of the station that moved faster than the rest of it. The probe moved in close, though it had not been told to. As the oblong flashed by, the probe had time to catalog it. Lifeboat, Type 4A, functioning. and to get just a peek into one of the portholes. The face of a dog peered back, ears perked alertly. The probe filed the image away for later contemplation, and then moved in on the rest of the wreckage, lasers blazing in the darkness. Bach had a bad moment when she saw the probe move in on the lifeboat, then settled back and tried to make herself inconspicuous as the vehicle bearing Charlie and the dogs accelerated away from the cloud of wreckage. She had been evicted from her chair, but she had expected that. As people ran around, shouting at each other, she called room 569 at the Kleist, then passed Ross Nakova into her tracking computers. She was sitting at an operator's console in a corner of the room, far from the excitement. Ross Nakova was a genius. The blip vanished from her screen. If everything was going according to plan, no data about the lifeboat was going into the memory of the tracking computer. It would be like it never existed. Everything went so smoothly, Bach thought later. You couldn't help taking it as a good omen, even if, like Bach, you weren't superstitious. She knew nothing was going to be easy in the long run, that there were bound to be problems they hadn't thought of. But all in all, you just had to be optimistic. The remotely piloted PTP made rendezvous right on schedule. The transfer of Charlie and the dogs went like clockwork. The empty lifeboat was topped off with fuel and sent on a solar escape orbit, airless and lifeless, its only cargo a barrel of radioactive death that should sterilize it if anything would. The PTP landed smoothly at the remote habitat Galloway's agents had located and purchased. It had once been a biological research station, so it was physically isolated in every way from lunar society. Some money changed hands, and all records of the habitat were erased from computer files. All food, air, and water had to be brought in by crawler over a rugged mountain pass. The habitat itself was large enough to accommodate a hundred people in comfort. There was plenty of room for the dogs. A single-dish antenna was the only link to the outside world. Galloway was well satisfied with the place. She promised Charlie that one of these days she would be paying a visit. Neither of them mentioned the reason that no one would be coming out immediately— Charlie settled in for a long stay, privately wondering if she would ever get any company. One thing they hadn't planned on was alcohol. Charlie was hooked bad, and not long after her arrival she began letting people know about it. Bloom reluctantly allowed a case of whiskey to be brought in on the next crawler, 
reasoning that a girl in full-blown withdrawal would be impossible to handle remotely. He began a program to taper her off, but in the meantime Charlie went on a three-day bender that left her bleary-eyed. The first biological samples sent in all died within a week. These were a guinea pig, a rhesus monkey, and a chicken. The symptoms were consistent with Neuro-X, so there was little doubt the disease was still alive. A dog, sent in later, lasted eight days. Bloom gathered valuable information from all these deaths, but they upset Charlie badly. Bach managed to talk him out of further live animal experiments for at least a few months. She had taken accumulated vacation time and was living in a condominium on a high level of the Mozart plots, bought by Galloway and donated to what they were coming to think of as the Charlie Project. With Galloway back on Earth and Rosnikova neither needed nor inclined to participate further, Charlie Project was Bach and Dr. Bloom. Security was essential. Four people knowing about Charlie was already three too many, Galloway said. Charlie seemed cheerful and cooperated with Bloom's requests. He worked through robotic instruments, and it was frustrating. But she learned to take her own blood and tissue samples and prepare them for viewing. Bloom was beginning to learn something of the nature of Neuro-X, though he admitted that, working alone, it might take him years to reach a breakthrough. Charlie didn't seem to mind. The isolation techniques were rigorous. The crawler brought supplies to within one hundred yards of the habitat— and left them sitting there in the dust. A second crawler would come out to bring them in. Under no circumstances was anything allowed to leave the habitat, nor to come in contact with anything that was going back to the world, and indeed the crawler was the only thing in the latter category. Contact was strictly one way. Anything could go in, but nothing could come out. That was the strength of the system, and its final weakness. Charlie had been living in the habitat for fifteen days when she started running a fever. Dr. Bloom prescribed bed rest and aspirin and didn't tell Bach how worried he was. The next day was worse. She coughed a lot, couldn't keep food down. Bloom was determined to go out there in an isolation suit. Bach had to physically restrain him at one point and be very firm with him until he finally calmed down and saw how foolish he was being. It would do Charlie no good for Bloom to die. Bach called Galloway, who arrived by express liner the next day. By then, Bloom had some idea what was happening. "'I gave her a series of vaccinations,' he said mournfully. "'It's so standard. I hardly gave it a thought. Measles, D1, the Manila strain mumps, all the normal communicable diseases we have to be so careful of in a lunar environment. Some of them were killed viruses, some were weakened, and they seemed to be attacking her.' Galloway raged at him for a while. He was too depressed to fight back. Bach just listened, withholding her own judgment. The next day he learned more. Charlie was getting things he had not inoculated her against, things that could have come in as hitchhikers on the supplies or that might have been lying dormant in the habitat itself. He had carefully checked her thirty-year-old medical record. There had been no hint of any immune system deficiency— and it was not the kind of syndrome that could be missed, but somehow she had acquired it. He had a theory. He had several of them. None would save his patient. Maybe the Neuro-X destroyed her immune system, but you'd think she would have succumbed to stray viruses there on the station, unless the Neuro-X attacked the viruses too and changed them. He mumbled things like that for hours on end as he watched Charlie waste away on his television screen. For whatever reason, she was in a state of equilibrium there on the station. Bringing her here destroyed that. If I could understand how, I still might save her. The screen showed a sweating, gaunt-faced little girl. Much of her hair had fallen out. She complained that her throat was very dry and she had trouble swallowing. She just keeps fighting, Bach thought, and felt the tightness in the back of her own throat. Charlie's voice was still clear. "'Tell Megan I finally finished her picture,' she said. "'She's right here, honey,' Bach said. "'You can tell her yourself.' "'Oh!' Charlie licked her lips with a dry tongue, and her eyes wandered around. "'I can't see much. Are you there, Megan?' "'I'm here.' "'Thanks for trying.' She closed her eyes, and for a moment Bach thought she was gone. 
Then the eyes opened again. Anna Louise? I'm still right here, darling. Anna, what's going to happen to my dogs? I'll take care of them, she lied. Don't you worry. Somehow she managed to keep her voice steady. It was the hardest thing she had ever done. Good. Tick-tock would tell you which ones to breed. They're good dogs, but you can't let them take advantage of you. I won't. Charlie coughed and seemed to become a little smaller when she was through. She tried to lift her head, could not, and coughed again. Then she smiled, just a little bit, but enough to break Bach's heart. I'll go see Albert, she said. Don't go away. We're right here. She closed her eyes. She continued breathing raggedly for over an hour, but her eyes never opened again. Bach let Galloway handle the details of cleaning up and covering up. She felt listless, uninvolved. She kept seeing Charlie as she had first seen her, a painted savage in a brown tide of dogs. When Galloway went away, Bach stayed on at the Mozart plots, figuring the woman would tell her if she had to get out. She went back to work, got the promotion Galloway had predicted, and began to take an interest in her new job. She evicted Ralph and his barbells from her old apartment, though she continued to pay the rent on it. She grew to like Mozart plots even more than she had expected she would, and dreaded the day Galloway would eventually sell the place. There was a broad balcony with potted plants where she could sit with her feet propped up and look out over the whole insane buzz and clatter of the place, or prop her elbows on the rail and spit into the lake over a mile below. The weather was going to take some getting used to, though, if she ever managed to afford a place of her own here. The management sent rainfall and windstorm schedules in the mail, and she faithfully posted them in the kitchen, then always forgot and got drenched. The weeks turned into months. At the end of the sixth month, when Charlie was no longer haunting box dreams, Galloway showed up. For many reasons, Bach was not delighted to see her, but she put on a brave face and invited her in. She was dressed this time, earth fashion, and she seemed a lot stronger. Can't stay long, she said. Sitting on the couch, Bach had secretly begun to think of as her own. She took a document out of her pocket and put it on a table near Bach's chair. This is the deed to this condo. I've signed it over to you, but I haven't registered it yet. There are different ways to go about it, for tax purposes, so I thought I'd check with you. I told you I always pay my debts. I was hoping to do it with Charlie, but that turned out... Well, it was more something I was doing for myself, so it didn't count. Bach was glad she had said that. She had been wondering if she would be forced to hit her. This won't pay what I owe you, but it's a start. She looked at Bach and raised one eyebrow. It's a start, whether or not you accept it. I'm hoping you won't be too stiff-necked, but with loonies, or should I say citizens of Luna, I've found you can never be too sure. Bach hesitated but only for a split second. Loonies, Lunarians, who cares? She picked up the deed. I accept. Galloway nodded and took an envelope out of the same pocket the deed had been in. She leaned back and seemed to search for words. I thought I ought to tell you what I've done. She waited and Bach nodded. They both knew, without mentioning Charlie's name, what she was talking about. The dogs were painlessly put to sleep, the habitat was depressurized and irradiated for about a month, then reactivated. I had some animals sent in, and they survived. So I sent in a robot on a crawler and had it bring these out. Don't worry. They've been checked over a thousand ways, and they're absolutely clean. She removed a few sheets of paper from the envelope and spread them out on the table. Bach leaned over and looked at the pencil sketches. You remember she said she'd finally finished that picture for me? I've already taken that one out. But there were these others, one with your name on it, and I wondered if you wanted any of them. Bach had already spotted the one she wanted. It was a self-portrait, just the head and shoulders. In it, Charlie had a faint smile. Or did she? It was that kind of drawing. The more she looked at it, the harder it was to tell just what Charlie had been thinking when she drew it. At the bottom it said, To Anna Louise my friend. Bach took it and thanked Galloway, who seemed almost as anxious to leave as Bach was to have her go. 
Bach fixed herself a drink and sat back in her chair in her home. That was going to take some getting used to, but she looked forward to it. She picked up the drawing and studied it, sipping her drink. Frowning, she stood and went through the sliding glass doors onto her balcony. There, in the brighter light of the atrium, she held the drawing up and looked closer. There was somebody behind Charlie. But maybe that wasn't right either. Maybe it was just that she had started to draw one thing, had erased it, and started again. Whatever it was, there was another network of lines in the paper that were very close to the picture that was there, but slightly different. The longer Bach stared at it, the more she was convinced she was seeing the older woman Charlie had never had a chance to become. She seemed to be in her late thirties, not a whole lot older than Bach. Bach took a mouthful of liquor and was about to go back inside when a wind came up and snatched the paper from her hand. "'Goddamn weather!' she shouted as she made a grab for it. But it was already twenty feet away, turning over and over and falling. She watched it dwindle past all hope of recovery. Was she relieved? "'Can I get that for you?' She looked up, startled, and saw a man in a flight harness flapping like crazy to remain stationary. Those contraptions required an amazing amount of energy, and this fellow showed it with bulging biceps and huge thigh muscles and a chest big as a barrel. The metal wings glittered, and the leather straps creaked, and the sweat poured off him. "'No, thanks,' she said. Then she smiled at him. "'But I'd be proud to make you a drink.' He smiled back, asked her apartment number, and flapped off toward the nearest landing platform. Bach looked down, but the paper with Charlie's face on it was already gone, vanished in the vast spaces of Mozart plots. Bach finished her drink, then went to answer the knock on her door. Introduction to Options When I was thinking about what society might be like in the eight worlds, naturally I was influenced by the social and political ferment that was all around me at the time. I grew up in Texas in the 1950s, where there were segregated restrooms and drinking fountains. In my life I have gone from referring to a certain minority group as something we now call the N-word, which I didn't even know was pejorative, to Negroes, to Spades, when that was fashionable in the Haight-Ashbury, to Afro-Americans, to black people, to people of color, to the current usage of African-American. My racism was of the unconscious liberal variety. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. was praised from the pulpit of my Lutheran church for the work he was doing in the South, but nobody in the pews, or in the pulpit for that matter, would have wanted him to marry their daughter. When I began writing, we were in the most exciting years of the feminist movement. A few women somewhere burned a few bras as a lark. Someone took a picture of it and people started calling feminists bra-burners. That were women's livers, lesbians, ball-busters, or harpies. A favorite word to describe them was strident. I read a lot of the literature, saw their point, and did my best to shake off my sexism as I had shed myself of racism. The gay rights movement was just getting started. It hadn't really made a lot of noise yet. No need to go through the terms that were thrown around at them. We have come such a long way. Consider in this day and age, when Queer Eye for the Straight Guy is a big hit on television, that in my high school days it would have been about the deadliest insult you could hurl, fighting words. Now it is a word of pride. Sure, there are still toothless rednecks who feel themselves superior to Nelson Mandela because they are white. There are those who love to beat the crap out of people because of who they choose to go to bed with. There are those like a certain big, fat, lying, hypocritical, junky, crybaby felon who calls progressive women feminazis. There is much still to do, and I don't know where it will all end up, but compare today in America to 1955 in Texas, like I do, and you will know there has been much progress. Back when I started writing, everyone was exploring sex roles, redefining what it was to be a man or a woman, of whatever orientation. Nature or nurture? Is testosterone or estrogen all-powerful? Is a man gay because his mother made him wear dresses, or was he born that way? 
I spent a long time thinking about sex and came to the conclusion that there is not one statement you can make about all men or about all women that is valid. People are now seeking equal rights for gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and the transgendered. I'm not even sure if that includes hermaphrodites or the small minority of people who just plain don't have any interest in sex at all. Neuters. So what would things be like in two or three hundred years? I was always deliberately vague about dates in the Eight World Series. With the earth subjugated by aliens who, if they weren't actually God, could pinch hit for him. If you take a jump that far ahead in the world of science fiction, you can postulate absolutely anything you want. Just look what has happened in fifty years in the field of electronics. Not a single one of the great technological writers came anywhere near imagining the computers we have now. Not Asimov, not Clark, not Heinlein. They imagined plenty of things we don't have, like 3D television. I decided that the advances in biology would be far beyond what we could imagine in 1974. We're well on our way there, thirty years later. The human genome has been mapped. Nanotechnology is still in its infancy, but presents stunning possibilities in medicine. What could all this mean to that great engine that drives all human endeavors, the primal urge of sex? One of the key postulates of the eight worlds was that it would be possible to jump over the divide of gender, to see how the other fifty percent experiences the world. I wasn't talking about sex reassignment surgery, which merely rearranges some skin, and I'm sure is a great comfort to those who feel they were born in the wrong body, but does nothing at the genetic level. And you can't go back next week and tell the doctor it was all a big mistake. I hate being female, and I want my penis back. I was considering a quick, painless, and totally reversible procedure, so complete that someone who had once been male would now be able to bear a child. How would that affect society? How would this be done? I haven't got a clue any more than Robert Heinlein had a clue about silicon chips which were on the horizon, or Larry Niven has about hyperspace which may or may not be in the future. In science fiction you usually just skip over all that hard stuff— how it was developed, how it works, and simply say, Beam me up, Scotty. I wrote several stories exploring these possibilities, including my very first sale, Picnic on Nearside. I must say I had considerable trepidation about how these stories might be received. Trepidation? I was scared stiff. Would I be seen as some sort of pervert? Would people call me a queer? I'll admit that still would have hurt me back then. Hey, it was the worst thing you could say about a guy. To my relief, they were well received. There were even a few people who, reading some of the stories, wondered if I was a woman writing under a pen name, as James Tiptree, Jr. turned out to be. I took this as flattering. I took it as meaning that I got it right, or at least as right as a male could. Over the years I have posed the question to many people, on panels and in discussions, if you could change sex, easily, painlessly, and most of all, reversibly, would you buy a ticket on that particular weekend cruise? The answers have been almost unanimous. Sign me up. Now, I know science fiction readers are an adventurous crew. I know there are millions and millions of others who would be scandalized by the very idea, would sooner cut off their own legs with a hacksaw. But what if it was a technology that had been around for a hundred years? except for oddball religious cults like Christianity or Islam, I don't think there would be many left who wouldn't try it for a day or two, like teenagers sneaking their first beer or cigarette, if for no other reason. Terry Carr had reprinted a few of these stories in his Best of the Year collections, and one day he posed me a question. I like these stories, he said, but they all happen in a time when sex changing is as accepted as boarding a jet plane and flying to Miami. What I'd like to know is, how do we get from here to there? What was it like when this was a new technology? What would it do to society, and particularly to the family? Write me a story like that, he said. I did, and this is it. I sent it to him for publication in his anthology of original stories, Universe. He liked it, and handed it to his wife, Carol, for a second opinion. She read it, Terry told me, smiling from time to time. Then she came to the last line and let out a shriek. 
That last line is awful, she said. It completely undercuts everything he was saying about gender roles. In my defense, Terry hadn't gotten it either, but when Carol was through blistering his ears, he sure did. He pointed it out to me, and when I saw what she was talking about, I wanted to sink through the floor. I saw what she meant. It was more than awful. It was stupid. It was the work of five minutes to write a new last line, and Carol smiled again. Maybe you want to know what that original last line was. No way in hell. Options Cleo hated breakfast. Her energy level was lowest in the morning, but not so the children's. There was always some school crisis, something that had to be located at the last minute, some argument that had to be settled. This morning it was a bowl of cereal spilled in Lily's lap. Cleo hadn't seen it happen. Her attention had been diverted momentarily by Feather, her youngest. And, of course, it had to happen after Lily was dressed. Mom, this was the last outfit I had. Well, if you wouldn't use them so hard, it might last more than three days, and if you didn't— She stopped before she lost her temper. Just take it off and go as you are. But, Mom, nobody goes to school naked. Nobody. Give me some money and I'll stop at the store on— Cleo raised her voice, something she tried never to do. Child, I know there are kids in your class whose parents can't afford to buy clothes at all. All right, so the poor kids don't— That's enough. You're late already. Get going. Lily stalked from the room. Cleo heard the door slam. Through it all, Jules was an island of calm at the other end of the table, his nose in his news pad, sipping his second cup of coffee. Cleo glanced at her own bacon and eggs cooling on the plate, poured herself a first cup of coffee, then had to get up and help Paul find his other shoe. By then, Feather was wet again, so she put her on the table and peeled off the sopping diaper. "'Hey, listen to this,' Jules said. The city council today passed without objection an ordinance requiring— Jules, aren't you a little behind schedule? He glanced at his thumbnail. You're right. Thanks. He finished his coffee, folded his news pad, and tucked it under his arm, bent over to kiss her, then frowned. You really ought to eat more, honey, he said, indicating the untouched eggs. Eating for two, you know. Bye now. Goodbye, Cleo said through clenched teeth. And if I hear that eating for two business again, I'll— But he was gone. She had time to scorch her lip on the coffee, then was out the door, hurrying to catch the train. There were seats on the sun car, but of course Feather was with her, and the UV wasn't good for her tender skin. After a longing look at the passengers reclining with the dark cups strapped over their eyes, and a rueful glance down at her own pale skin, Cleo boarded the next car and found a seat by a large man wearing a hard hat. She settled down on the cushions, adjusted the straps on the carrier slung in front of her, and let Feather have a nipple. She unfolded her newspad and spread it out in her lap. Cute, the man said. How old is he? She, Cleo said, without looking up. Eleven days. And five hours and thirty-six minutes. She shifted in the seat pointedly turning her shoulder to him, and made a show of activating her news pad and scanning the day's contents. She did not glance up as the train left the underground tunnel and emerged on the gently rolling, airless plain of Mendeleev. There was little enough out there to interest her, considering she made the forty-minute commute to Hartman Crater twice a day. They had discussed moving to Hartman, but Jules liked living in King City near his work, and of course the kids would have missed all their school friends. There wasn't much in the news storage that morning. When the red light flashed, she queried for an update. The pad printed some routine city business. Three sentences into the story, she punched the reject key. There was an invasion centennial parade listed for nineteen hundred hours that evening. Parades bored her, and so did the centennial. If you've heard one speech about how liberation of Earth is just around the corner, if we all pull together, you've heard them all. Semantic content, zero. Nonsense quotient, high. She glanced wistfully at sports, noting that the J-Sector jump ball team was doing poorly without her in the intra-city tournament. Cleo's small stature and powerful legs had served her well as a starting sprint wing in her playing days. But it just didn't seem possible to make practices any more. 
As a last resort, she called up the articles, digests, and analysis listings, the newspad's Sunday supplement and op-ed department. A title caught her eye, and she punched it up. Changing. The Revolution in Sex Roles, or Who's on Top? Twenty years ago, when cheap and easy sex changes first became available to the general public, it was seen as the beginning of a revolution that would change the shape of human society in ways impossible to foresee. Sexual equality is one thing, the sociologists pointed out, but certain residual inequities, based on biological imperatives or on upbringing, depending on your politics, have proved impossible to weed out. Changing was going to end all that. Men and women would be able to see what it was like from the other side of the barrier that divides humanity. How could sex roles survive that? Ten years later, the answer is obvious. Changing had appealed only to a tiny minority. It was soon seen as a harmless aberration practiced by only one percent of the population. Everyone promptly forgot about the tumbling of barriers. But in the intervening ten years, a quieter revolution has been building. Almost unnoticed on the broad scale because it is an invisible phenomenon, how do you know the next woman you meet was not a man last week, changing has been gaining growing, matter-of-fact acceptance among the children of the generation that rejected it. The chances are now better than even that you know someone who has had at least one sex change. The chances are better than one out of fifteen that you yourself have changed. If you are under twenty, the chance is one in three. The article went on to describe the underground society which was springing up around changing. Changers tended to band together, frequenting their own tap rooms, staging their own social events, remaining aloof from the larger society which many of them saw as outmoded and irrelevant. Changers tended to marry other changers. They divided the childbearing equally, each preferring to mother only one child. The author viewed this tendency with alarm, since it went against the socially approved custom of large families. Changers reported that the time for that was the past, pointing out that Luna had been tamed long ago. They quoted statistics proving that at present rates of expansion, Luna's population would be in the billions in an amazingly short time. There were interviews with changers and psychological profiles. Cleo read that the males had originally been the heaviest users of the new technology, stating sexual reasons for their decision, and the change had often been permanent. Today the changer was slightly more likely to have been born female, and to give social reasons, the most common of which was pressure to bear children. But the modern changer committed him herself to neither role. The average time between changes in an individual was two years, and declining. Cleo read the whole article, then thought about using some of the reading references at the end. Not that much of it was really new to her. She had been aware of changing without thinking about it much. The idea had never attracted her, and Jules was against it. But for some reason it had struck a chord this morning. Feather had gone to sleep. Cleo carefully pulled the blanket down around the child's face, then wiped milk from her nipple. She folded a news pad and stowed it in her purse— then rested her chin on her palm and looked out the window for the rest of the trip. Cleo was chief on-site architect for the new Food Systems Incorporated plantation that was going down in Hartman. As such, she was in charge of three junior architects, five construction bosses, and an army of drafters and workers. It was a big project, the biggest Cleo had ever handled. She liked her work, but the best part had always been being there on the site when things were happening, actually supervising construction instead of running a desk. That had been difficult in the last months of carrying feather, but at least there were maternity pressure suits. It was even harder now. She had been through it all before with Lily and Paul. Everybody works. That had been the rule for a century since the invasion. There was no labor to spare for babysitters, so having children meant the mother or father must do the same job they had been doing before, but do it while taking care of the child. In practice, it was usually the mother, since she had the milk. Cleo had tried leaving Feather with one of the women in the office, but each had her own work to do, and not unreasonably felt Cleo should bear the burden of her own offspring. And Feather never seemed to respond well to another person. 
Cleo would return from her visit to the site to find the child had been crying the whole time, disrupting everyone's work. She had taken Feather in a crawler a few times, but it wasn't the same. That morning was taken up with a meeting. Cleo and the other section chiefs sat around the big table for three hours, discussing ways of dealing with the cost overrun, then broke for lunch only to return to the problem in the afternoon. Cleo's back was aching and she had a headache she couldn't shake, so Feather chose that day to be cranky. After ten minutes of increasingly hostile looks, Cleo had to retire to the booth with Leah Farnham, the accountant, and her three-year-old son, Eddie. The two of them followed the proceedings through earphones while trying to cope with their children and make their remarks through throat mics. Half the people at the conference table either had to turn around when she spoke or ignore her, and Cleo was hesitant to force them to that choice. As a result, she chose her remarks with extreme care. More often, she said nothing. There was something at the core of the world of business that refused to adjust to children in the boardroom, while appearing to make every effort to accommodate the working mother. Cleo brooded about it, not for the first time. But what did she want? Honestly, she could not see what else could be done. It certainly wasn't fair to disrupt the entire meeting with a crying baby. She wished she knew the answer. Those were her friends out there, yet her feeling of alienation was intense, staring through the glass wall that Eddie was smudging with his dirty fingers. Luckily, Feather was a perfect angel on the trip home. She gurgled and smiled toothlessly at a woman who had stopped to admire her, and Cleo warmed to the infant for the first time that day. She spent the trip playing games with her, surrounded by the approving smiles of other passengers. Jules, I read the most interesting article on the pad this morning. There, it was out anyway. She had decided the direct approach would be best. Hmm? It was about changing. It's getting more and more popular. Is that so? He did not look up from his book. Jules and Cleo were in the habit of sitting up in bed for a few hours after the children were asleep. They spurned the video programs that were designed to lull workers after a hard day, preferring to use the time to catch up on reading or to talk if either of them had anything to say. Over the last few years they had read more and talked less. Cleo reached over Feather's crib and got a packet of dope sticks. She flicked one to light with her thumbnail, drew on it, and exhaled a cloud of lavender smoke. She drew her legs up under her and leaned back against the wall. I just thought we might talk about it, that's all. Jules put his book down. All right, but what's to talk about? We're not into that. She shrugged and picked at a cuticle. I know. We did talk about it way back. I just wondered if you still felt the same, I guess. She offered him the stick, and he took a drag. As far as I know, I do, he said easily. It's not something I spend a great deal of thought on. What's the matter? He looked at her suspiciously. You weren't having any thoughts in that direction, were you? Well, no, not exactly, no. But you really ought to read the article. More people are doing it. I just thought we ought to be aware of it. Yeah, I've heard that, Jules conceded. He laced his hands behind his head. No way to tell unless you've worked with them and suddenly one day they've got a new set of equipment. He laughed. First time it was sort of hard for me to get used to. Now I hardly ever think about it. Me either. They don't cause any problem, Jules said with an air of finality. Live and let live. Yeah. Cleo smoked in silence for a time and let Jules get back to his reading, but she still felt uncomfortable. Jules? What is it now? Don't you ever wonder what it would be like? He sighed and closed his book, then turned to face her. I don't quite understand you tonight, he said. Well, maybe I don't either, but we could talk. Listen. Have you thought about what it would do to the kids? I mean, even if I was willing to seriously consider it, which I'm not. I talked to Lily about that. Just theoretically, you understand. She said she had two teachers who changed, and one of her best friends used to be a boy. There's quite a few kids at school who've changed. She takes it in stride. Yes, but she's older. What about Paul? What would it do to his concept of himself as a young man? I'll tell you, Cleo, in the back of my mind I keep thinking this business is a little sick. I feel it would have a bad effect on the children. 
Not according to Cleo. Cleo, let's not get into an argument. Number one, I have no intention of getting a change now or in the future. Two, if only one of us was changed, it would sure play hell with our sex life, wouldn't it? And three, I like you too much as you are. He leaned over and began to kiss her. She was more than a little annoyed, but said nothing as his kisses became more intense. It was a damnably effective way of shutting off debate, and she could not stay angry. She was responding in spite of herself, easily, naturally. It was as good as it always was with jewels. The ceiling, so familiar, once again became a calming blankness that absorbed her thoughts. No, she had no complaints about being female, no sexual dissatisfactions. It was nothing as simple as that. Afterwards she lay on her side with her legs drawn up, her knees together. She faced Jules, who absently stroked her leg with one hand. Her eyes were closed, but she was not sleepy. She was savoring the warmth she cherished so much after sex, the slipperiness between her legs, holding his semen inside. She felt the bed move as he shifted his weight. You did make it, didn't you? She opened one eye enough to squint at him. Of course I did. I always do. You know I never have any trouble in that direction. He relaxed back onto the pillow. I'm sorry for, well, for springing on you like that. It's okay. It was nice. I had just thought you might have been faking it. I'm not sure why I would think that. She opened the other eye and patted him gently on the cheek. Jules, I'd never be that protective of your poor ego. If you don't satisfy me, I promise you'll be the second to know. He chuckled, then turned on his side to kiss her. Good night, babe. Good night. She loved him. He loved her. Their sex life was good, with the slight mental reservation that he always seemed to initiate it, and she was happy with her body. So why was she still awake three hours later? Shopping took a few hours on the vid phone Saturday morning. Cleo bought the household necessities for delivery that afternoon, then left the house to do the shopping she fancied, going from store to store, looking at things she didn't really need. Feather was with jewels on Saturdays. She savored a quiet lunch alone at a table in the park plaza then found herself walking down Brazil Avenue in the heart of the medical district. On impulse, she stepped into the New Heredity Body Salon. It was only after she was inside that she admitted to herself she had spent most of the morning arranging for the impulse. She was on edge as she was taken down a hallway to a consulting room and had to force a smile for the handsome young man behind the desk. She sat, put her packages on the floor, and folded her hands in her lap. He asked what he could do for her. "'I'm not actually here for any work,' she said. "'I wanted to look into the costs and maybe learn a little more about the procedures involved in changing.' He nodded understandingly and got up. "'There's no charge for the initial consultation,' he said. "'We're happy to answer your questions. "'By the way, I'm Marion, spelled with an O this month.' He smiled at her and motioned for her to follow him. He stood her in front of a full-length mirror mounted on the wall. I know it's hard to make that first step. It was hard for me, and I do it for a living. So we've arranged this demonstration that won't cost you anything, either in money or worry. It's a non-threatening way to see some of what it's all about, but it might startle you a little, so be prepared. He touched a button in the wall beside the mirror, and Cleo saw her clothes fade away. She realized it was not really a mirror, but a holographic screen linked to a computer. The computer introduced changes in the image. In thirty seconds she faced a male stranger. There was no doubt the face was her own, but it was more angular, perhaps a little larger in its underlying bony structure. The skin on the stranger's jaw was rough, as if it needed shaving. The rest of the body was as she might expect, though overly muscled for her tastes. She did little more than glance at the penis. Somehow that didn't seem to matter so much. She spent more time studying the hair on the chest the tiny nipples and the ridges that had appeared on the hands and feet. The image mimicked her every movement. "'Why all the brawn?' she asked Marion. "'If you're trying to sell me on this, you've taken the wrong approach.' Marion punched some more buttons. "'I didn't choose this image,' he explained. 
The computer takes what it sees and extrapolates. You're more muscular than the average woman. You probably exercise. This is what a comparable amount of training would have produced with male hormones to fix nitrogen in the muscles. But we're not bound by that. The image lost about eight kilos of mass, mostly in the shoulders and thighs. Cleo felt a little more comfortable, but still missed the smoothness she was accustomed to seeing in her mirror. She turned from the display and went back to her chair. Marion sat across from her and folded his hands on the desk. Basically, what we do is produce a cloned body from one of your own cells. Through a process called Y-recumbent viral substitution, we remove one of your X chromosomes and replace it with a Y. The clone is forced to maturity in the usual way, which takes about six months. After that, it's just a simple non-rejection hazard brain transplant. You walk in as a woman and leave an hour later as a man. Easy as that. Cleo said nothing, wondering again what she was doing here. From there, we can modify the body. We can make you taller or shorter, rearrange your face, virtually anything you like. He raised his eyebrows then smiled ruefully and spread his hands. "'All right, Miss King,' he said. "'I'm not trying to pressure you. You'll need to think about it. In the meantime, there's a process that would cost you very little and might be just the thing to let you test the waters. Am I right in thinking your husband opposes this?' She nodded, and he looked sympathetic. "'Not uncommon, not uncommon at all,' he assured her. "'It brings out castration fears in men who didn't even suspect they had them.' Of course, we do nothing of the sort. His male body would be kept in a tank, ready for him to move back into whenever he wanted to. Cleo shifted in her chair. What was this process you were talking about? Just a bit of minor surgery. It can be done in ten minutes, and corrected in the same time before you even leave the office, if you find you don't care for it. It's a good way to get husbands thinking about changing. Sort of a signal you can send him. You've heard of the androgynous look— it's in all the fashion tapes. Many women, especially if they have large breasts, like you do, find it an interesting change. You say it's cheap and reversible? All our processes are reversible. Changing the size or shape of breasts is our most common body operation. Cleo sat on the examining table while the attendant gave her a quick physical. I don't know if Marion realized you're nursing, the woman said. Are you sure this is what you want? How the hell should I know, Cleo thought. She wished the feeling of confusion and uncertainty would pass. Just do it. Jules hated it. He didn't yell or slam doors or storm out of the house. That had never been his style. He voiced his objections coldly and quietly at the dinner table, after saying practically nothing since she walked in the door. I just would like to know why you thought you should do this without even talking to me about it. I don't demand that you ask me, just discuss it with me. Cleo felt miserable, but was determined not to let it show. She held Feather in her arm, the bottle in her other hand, and ignored the food cooling on her plate. She was hungry, but at least she was not eating for two. Jules, I'd ask you before I rearrange the furniture. We both own this apartment. I'd ask you before I put Lily or Paul in another school. We share the responsibility for their upbringing. But I don't ask you when I put on lipstick or cut my hair. It's my body. I like it, Mom, Lily said. You look like me. Cleo smiled at her, reached over and tousled her hair. What do you like? Paul asked, around a mouthful of food. See, said Cleo, it's not that important. I don't see how you can say that. And I said you didn't have to ask me. I just would. You should have. I should have known. It was an impulse, Jules. An impulse. An impulse. For the first time he raised his voice, and Cleo knew how upset he really was. Lily and Paul fell silent, and even Feather squirmed. But Cleo liked it. Oh, not forever and ever. As an interesting change. It gave her a feeling of freedom to be that much in control of her body, to be able to decide how large she wished her breasts to be. Did it have anything to do with changing? She really didn't think so. She didn't feel the least bit like a man. And what was a breast, anyway? It was anything from a nipple sitting flush with the rib cage to a mammoth hunk of fat and milk gland. Cleo realized Jules was suffering from the more-is-better syndrome, 
thinking of Cleo's action as the removal of her breasts, as if they had to be large to exist at all. What she had actually done was reduce their size. No more was said at the table, but Cleo knew it was for the children's sake. As soon as they got into bed, she could feel the tension again. I can't understand why you did it now. What about Feather? What about her? Well, do you expect me to nurse her? Cleo finally got angry. Damn it, that's exactly what I expect you to do. Don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. You think it's all fun and games, having to carry a child around all day because she needs the milk in your breasts? You never complained before. I— She stopped. He was right, of course. It amazed even Cleo that this had all come up so suddenly, but here it was, and she had to deal with it. They had to deal with it. That's because it isn't an awful thing. It's great to nourish another human being at your breast. I loved every minute of it with Lily. Sometimes it was a headache, having her there all the time, but it was worth it. The same with Paul. She sighed. The same with Feather, too, most of the time. You hardly think about it. Then why the revolt now, with no warning? It's not a revolt, honey. Do you see it as that? I just— I'd like you to try it. Take Feather for a few months. Take her to work like I do. Then you'd— You'd see a little of what I go through. She rolled on her side and playfully punched his arm, trying to lighten it in some way. You might even like it. It feels real good. He snorted. I'd feel silly. She jumped from the bed and paced toward the living room, then turned, more angry than ever. Silly? Nursing is silly? Breasts are silly? Then why the hell do you wonder why I did what I did? Being a man is what makes it silly, he retorted. It doesn't look right. I almost laugh every time I see a man with breasts. The hormones mess up your system, I heard, and that's not true. Not any more. You can lactate, and besides, it's my body, as you pointed out. I'll do with it what pleases me. She sat on the edge of the bed with her back to him. He reached out and stroked her, but she moved away. All right, she said. I was just suggesting it. I thought you might like to try it. I'm not going to nurse her. She goes on the bottle from now on. If that's the way it has to be, it is. I want you to start taking Feather to work with you. Since she's going to be a bottle baby, it hardly matters which of us cares for her. I think you owe it to me, since I carried the burden alone with Lily and Paul. All right. She got into bed and pulled the covers up around her, her back to him. She didn't want him to see how close she was to tears. But the feeling passed. The tension drained from her, and she felt good. She thought she had won a victory, and it was worth the cost. Jules would not stay angry at her. She fell asleep easily, but woke up several times during the night as Jules tossed and turned. He did adjust to it. It was impossible for him to say so all at once, but after a week without love-making, he admitted grudgingly that she looked good. He began to touch her in the mornings, and when they kissed after getting home from work, Jules had always admired her slim muscularity, her athlete's arms and legs. The slim chest looked so natural on her, it fit the rest of her so well that he began to wonder what all the fuss had been about. One night, while they were clearing the dinner dishes, Jules touched her nipples for the first time in a week. He asked her if it felt any different. There is very little feeling anywhere but the nipples, she pointed out. No matter how big a woman is, you know that. Yeah, I guess I do. She knew they would make love that night and determined it would be on her terms. She spent a long time in the bathroom, letting him get settled with his book, then came out and took it away. She got on top of him and pressed close, kissing and tickling his nipples with her fingers. She was aggressive and insistent. At first he seemed reluctant, but soon he was responding as she pressed her lips hard against his, forcing his head back into the pillow. "'I love you,' he said, and raised his head to kiss her nose. "'Are you ready?' "'I'm ready.' He put his arms around her and held her close, then rolled over and hovered above her. "'Jules! Jules! Stop it!' She squirmed onto her side, her legs held firmly together. "'What's wrong?' I want to be on top tonight. Oh, all right. He turned over again and reclined passively as she repositioned herself. Her heart was pounding. There had been no reason to think he would object. 
They had made love in any and all positions, but basically the exotic ones were a change of pace from the natural one with her on her back. Tonight she had wanted to feel in control. "'Open your legs, darling,' she said with a smile. He did, but didn't return the smile. She raised herself on her hands and knees and prepared for the tricky insertion. "'Cleo, what is it? This will take a little effort, but I think I can make it worth your while. So if you just—' "'Cleo, what the hell is the purpose of this?' She stopped dead and let her head sag between her shoulders. "'What's the matter? Are you feeling silly with your feet in the air?' "'Maybe. Is that what you wanted?' Jules, humiliating you was the farthest thing from my mind. Then what was on your mind? It's not like we've never done it this way before. It's only when you chose to do so. It's always your decision. It's not degrading to be on the bottom. Then why were you feeling silly? He didn't answer, and she wearily lifted herself away from him, sitting on her knees at his feet. She waited, but he didn't seem to want to talk about it. I've never complained about the position, she ventured. I don't have any complaints about it. It works pretty well. Still, he said nothing. All right. I wanted to see what it looked like from up there. I was tired of looking at the ceiling. I was curious. And that's why I felt silly. I never minded you being on top before, have I? But before, well, it's never been in the context of the last couple of weeks. I know what's on your mind. And you feel threatened by it, by the fact that I'm curious about changing, that I want to know what it's like to take charge. You know I can't and wouldn't, if I could, force a change on you. But your curiosity is wrecking our marriage. She felt like crying again, but didn't let it show except for a trembling of the lower lip. She didn't want him to try and soothe her. That was all too likely to work, and she would find herself on her back with her legs in the air. She looked down at the bed and nodded slowly, then got up. She went to the mirror and took the brush, began running it through her hair. What are you doing now? Can't we talk about this? I don't feel much like talking right now. She leaned forward and examined her face as she brushed, then dabbed at the corners of her eyes with a tissue. I'm going out. I'm still curious. He said nothing as she started for the door. I may be a little late. The place was called Oophyte. The capital O had a plus sign hanging from it and an arrow in the upper right side. The sign was built so that the symbols revolved. One moment the plus was inside and the arrow out, the next moment the reverse. Cleo moved in a pleasant haze across the crowded dance floor, pausing now and then to draw on her dope stick. The air in the room was thick with lavender smoke, illuminated by flashing blue lights. She danced when the mood took her. The music was so loud that she didn't have to think about it. The noise gripped her bones, animated her arms and legs. She glided through a forest of naked skin, feeling the occasional roughness of a paper suit and, rarely, expensive cotton clothing. It was like moving underwater, like wading through molasses. She saw him across the floor and began moving in his direction. He took no notice of her for some time, though she danced right in front of him. Few of the dancers had partners in more than the transitory sense. Some were celebrating life, others were displaying themselves— but all were looking for partners, so eventually he realized she had been there an unusual length of time. He was easily as stoned as she was. She told him what she wanted. Sure. Where do you want to go? Your place? She took him down the hall and back and touched her credit bracelet to the lock on one of the doors. The room was simple but clean. He looked a lot like her phantom twin in the mirror, she noted, with one part of her mind. It was probably why she had chosen him. She embraced him and lowered him gently to the bed. "'Do you want to exchange names?' he asked. The grin on his face kept getting sillier as she toyed with him. "'I don't care. Mostly I think I want to use you.' "'Use away. My name's Saffron. I'm Cleopatra. Would you get on your back, please?' He did, and they did. It was hot in the little room, but neither of them minded it. It was healthy exertion. The physical sensations were great— and when Cleo was through, she had learned nothing. She collapsed on top of him. He did not seem surprised when tears began falling on his shoulder. I'm sorry, she said, sitting up and getting ready to leave. Don't go, he said, 
putting his hand on her shoulder. Now that you've got that out of your system, maybe we can make love. She didn't want to smile, but she had to. Then she was crying harder, putting her face to his chest and feeling the warmth of his arms around her and the hair tickling her nose. She realized what she was doing and tried to pull away. For God's sake, don't be ashamed that you need someone to cry on. It's weak. I, I just didn't want to be weak. We're all weak. She gave up struggling and nestled there until the tears stopped. She sniffed, wiped her nose, and faced him. What's it like? Can you tell me? She was about to explain what she meant, but he seemed to understand. It's like nothing special. You were born female, weren't you? I mean, I thought I might be able to tell. It's no longer important how I was born. I've been both. It's still me on the inside. You understand? I'm not sure I do. They were quiet for a long time. Cleo thought of a thousand things to say, questions to ask, but could do nothing. You've been coming to a decision, haven't you? He said at last. Are you any closer after tonight? I'm not sure. It's not going to solve any problems, you know. It might even create some. She pulled away from him and got up. She shook her hair and wished for a comb. Thank you, Cleopatra, he said. Oh, uh, thank you. She had forgotten his name. She smiled again to cover her embarrassment and shut the door behind her. Hello? Yes, this is Cleopatra King. I had a consultation with one of your staff. I believe it was ten days ago. Yes, Miss King, I have your file. What can I do for you? She took a deep breath. I want you to start the clone. I left a tissue sample. Very well, Miss King. Did you have any instructions concerning the chromosome donor? Do you need consent? Not as long as there's a sample in the bank. Use my husband, Jules Lorrain. Security number 4454390. Very good. We'll be in contact with you. Cleo hung up the phone and rested her forehead against the cool metal. She never should get this stoned, she realized. What had she done? But it was not final. It would be six months before she had to decide if she would ever use the clone. Damn, Jules! Why did he have to make such a big thing of it? Jules did not make a big thing of it when she told him what she had done. He took it quietly and calmly, as if he had been expecting it. You know I won't follow you in this. I know you feel that way. I'm interested to see if you change your mind. Don't count on it. I want to see if you change yours. I haven't made up my mind, but I'm giving myself the option. All I ask is that you bear in mind what this could do to our relationship. I love you, Cleo. I don't think that will ever change. But if you walk into this house as a man, I don't think I'll be able to see you as the person I've always loved. You could if you were a woman. But I won't be and I'll be the same person I always was. What would she be? What the hell was wrong? What had Jules ever done that he should deserve this? She made up her mind never to go through with it, and they made love that night, and it was very, very good. But somehow she never got around to calling the vivarium and telling them to abort the clone. She made the decision not to go through with it a dozen times over the next six months, and never had the clone destroyed. Their relationship in bed became uneasy as time passed. At first it was good. Jules made no objections when she initiated sex and was willing to do it any way she preferred. Once that was accomplished, she no longer cared whether she was on top or underneath. The important thing had been having the option of making love when she wanted to, the way she wanted to. That's what this is all about, she told him one night, in a moment of clarity, when everything seemed to make sense, except his refusal to see things from her side. It's the option I want. I'm not unhappy being a female. I don't like the feeling that there's anything I can't be. I want to know how much of me is hormones, how much is genetics, how much is upbringing. I want to know if I feel more secure being aggressive as a man, because I don't most of the time as a woman. Or do men feel the same insecurities I feel? Would Cleo, the man, feel free to cry? I don't know any of those things. But you said it yourself. You'd still be the same person. They began to drift apart in small ways. 
A few weeks after her outing to Oophite, she returned home one Sunday afternoon to find him in bed with a woman. It was not like him to do it like that. Their custom had been to bring lovers home and introduce them, to keep it friendly and open. Cleo was amused because she saw it as his way of getting back at her for her trip to the encounter bar. So she was the perfect hostess, joining them in bed, which seemed to disconcert Jules. The woman's name was Harriet, and Cleo found herself liking her. She was a changer, something Jules had not known, or he certainly would not have chosen her to make Cleo feel bad. Harriet was uncomfortable when she realized why she was there. Cleo managed to put her at ease by making love to her, something that surprised Cleo a little and Jules considerably, since she had never done it before. Cleo enjoyed it. She found Harriet's smooth body to be a whole new world, and she felt she had neatly turned the tables on Jules, making him confront once more the idea of his wife in the man's role. The worst part was the children. They had discussed the possible impending change with Lily and Paul. Lily could not see what all the fuss was about. It was a part of her life, something that was all around her, which she took for granted as something she herself would do when she was old enough. But when she began picking up the concern from her father, she drew subtly closer to her mother. Cleo was tremendously relieved. She didn't think she could have held to it in the face of Lily's displeasure. Lily was her firstborn, and though she hated to admit it and did her best not to play favorites, her darling. She had taken a year's leave from her job at appalling expense to the household budget so she could devote all her time to her infant daughter. She often wished she could somehow return to those simpler days, when motherhood had been her whole life. Feather, of course, was not consulted. Jules had assumed the responsibility for her nurture without complaint and seemed to be enjoying it. It was fine with Cleo, though it maddened her that he was so willing about taking over the mothering role without being willing to try it as a female. Cleo loved Feather as much as the other two, but sometimes had trouble recalling why they had decided to have her. She felt she had gotten a procreative impulse out of her system with Paul, and yet there Feather was. Paul was the problem. Things could get tense when Paul expressed doubts about how he would feel if his mother were to become a man. Jules's face would darken, and he might not speak for days. When he did speak, often in the middle of the night when neither of them could sleep, it would be in a verbal explosion that was as close to violence as she had ever seen him. It frightened her, because she was by no means sure of herself when it came to Paul. Would it hurt him? Jules spoke of gender identity crises, of the need for stable role models, and finally, in naked honesty, of the fear that his son would grow up to be somehow less than a man. Cleo didn't know, but cried herself to sleep over it many nights. They had read articles about it and found that psychologists were divided. Traditionalists made much of the importance of sex roles, while changers felt sex roles were important only to those who were trapped in them. With the breaking of the sexual barrier, the concept of roles vanished. The day finally came when the clone was ready. Cleo still did not know what she should do. Are you feeling comfortable now? Just nod if you can't talk. What? Relax. It's all over. You'll be feeling like walking in a few minutes. We'll have someone take you home. You may feel drunk for a while, but there's no drugs in your system. What happened? It's over. Just relax. Cleo did, curling up in a ball. Eventually, he began to laugh. Drunk was not the word for it. He sprawled on the bed, trying on pronouns for size. It was all so funny. He was on his back, with his hands in his lap. He giggled and rolled back and forth, over and over, fell on the floor in hysterics. He raised his head. Is that you, Jules? Yes, it's me. He helped Cleo back onto the bed, then sat on the edge, not too near, but not unreachably far away. How do you feel? He snorted. Drunker a skunk. He narrowed his eyes, forced them to focus on Jules. You must call me Leo now. Cleo's a woman's name. You shouldn't have called me Cleo then. All right. I didn't call you Cleo, though. You didn't? Are you sure? I'm very sure it's something I wouldn't have said. Oh, okay. 
He lifted his head and looked confused for a moment. You know what? I'm going to be sick. Leo felt much better an hour later. He sat in the living room with Jules, both of them on the big pillows that were the only furniture. They spoke of inconsequential matters for a time, punctuated by long silences. Leo was no more used to the sound of his new voice than Jules was. Well, Jules said, finally, slapping his hands on his knees and standing up, I really don't know what your plans are from here. Did you want to go out tonight? Find a woman? See what it's like? Leo shook his head. I tried that out as soon as I got home, he said. The male orgasm, I mean. What was it like? He laughed. Certainly you know that by now. No, I meant after being a woman. I know what you mean, he shrugged. The erection is interesting, so much larger than what I'm used to. Otherwise, he frowned for a moment. A lot the same, some different, more localized, messier. Um, Jules looked away, studying the electric fireplace as if seeing it for the first time. Had you planned to move out? It isn't necessary, you know. We could move people around. I can go in with Paul, or we could move him in with me and— in our old room. You could have his. He turned away from Leo and put his hand to his face. Leo ached to get up and comfort him, but felt it would be exactly the wrong thing to do. He let Jules get himself under control. If you'll have me, I'd like to continue sleeping with you. Jules said nothing and didn't turn around. Jules, I'm perfectly willing to do whatever will make you most comfortable. There doesn't have to be any sex, or I'd be happy to do what I used to do when I was in late pregnancy. You wouldn't have to do anything at all. No sex, he said. Fine, fine. Jules, I'm getting awfully tired. Are you ready to sleep? There was a long pause, then he turned and nodded. They lay quietly, side by side, not touching. The lights were out. Leo could barely see the outline of Jules' body. After a long time, Jules turned on his side. Cleo, are you in there? Do you still love me? I'm here, she said. I love you. I always will. Jules jumped when Leo touched him, but made no objection. He began to cry, and Leo held him close. They fell asleep in each other's arms. The oophyte was as full and noisy as ever. It gave Leo a headache. He did not like the place any more than Cleo had, but it was the only place he knew to find sex partners quickly and easily, with no emotional entanglements and no long process of seduction. Everyone there was available. All one needed to do was ask. They used each other for sexual calisthenics just one step removed from masturbation, cheerfully admitted the fact, and took the position that if you didn't approve, what were you doing there? There were plenty of other places for romance and relationships. Leo didn't normally approve of it, not for himself, though he cared not at all what other people did for amusement. He preferred to know someone he bedded. But he was here tonight to learn. He felt he needed the practice. He did not buy the argument that he would know just what to do because he had been a woman and knew what they liked. He needed to know how people reacted to him as a male. Things went well. He approached three women and was accepted each time. The first was a mess. So that's what they meant by too soon, and she was rather indignant about it until he explained his situation. After that she was helpful and supportive. He was about to leave when he was propositioned by a woman who said her name was Lynx. He was tired, but decided to go with her. Ten frustrating minutes later she sat up and moved away from him. What are you here for, if that's all the interest you can muster? And don't tell me it's my fault. I'm sorry, he said. I forgot. I thought I could. Well, I didn't realize I had to be really interested before I could perform. Perform? That's a funny way to put it. I'm sorry. He told her what the problem was, how many times he had made love in the last two hours. She sat on the edge of the bed and ran her hands through her hair, frustrated and irritable. Well, it's not the end of the world. There's plenty more out there. But you could give a girl a warning— you didn't have to say yes back there. I know. It's my fault. I'll have to learn to judge my capacity, I guess. It's just that I'm used to being able to, 
even if I'm not particularly... Blinks laughed. What am I saying? Listen to me. Honey, I used to have the same problem myself. Weeks of not getting it up. And I know it hurts. Well, Leo said, I know what you're feeling like, too. It's no fun. Blinks shrugged. In other circumstances, yeah. But like I said, the woods are full of them tonight. I won't have any problem. She put her hand on his cheek and pouted at him. Hey, I didn't hurt your poor male ego, did I? Leo thought about it, probed around for bruises, and found none. No. She laughed. I didn't think so, because you don't have one. Enjoy it, Leo. A male ego is something that has to be grown carefully when you're young. People have to keep pointing out what you have to do to be a man so you can recognize failure when you can't perform. How come you use that word? I don't know. I guess I was just thinking of it that way. Trying to be a, quote, man, unquote. Leo, you don't have enough emotional investment in it. And you're lucky. It took me over a year to shake mine. Don't be a man. Be a male human instead. The switchover's a lot easier that way. I'm not sure what you mean. She patted his knee. Trust me. Do you see me getting all upset because I wasn't sexy enough to turn you on or some such garbage? No, I wasn't brought up to worry that way. But reverse it. If I'd done to you what you just did to me, wouldn't something like that have occurred to you? I think it would, though I've always been pretty secure in that area. The most secure of us are whimpering children beneath it, at least some of the time. You understand that I got upset because you said yes when you weren't ready? And that's all I was upset about? It was impolite, Leo. A male human shouldn't do that to a female human. With a man and a woman, it's different. The poor fellow's got a lot of junk in his head, and so does the woman, so they shouldn't be held responsible for the tricks their egos play on them. Leo laughed. I don't know if you're making sense at all, but I like the sound of it. Male human. Maybe I'll see the difference one day. Some of the expected problems never developed. Paul barely noticed the change. Leo had prepared himself for a traumatic struggle with his son, and it never came. If it changed Paul's life at all, it was in the fact that he could now refer to his maternal parent as Leo instead of mother. Strangely enough, it was Lily who had the most trouble at first. Leo was hurt by it, tried not to show it, and did everything he could to let her adjust gradually. Finally, she came to him one day about a week after the change. She said she had been silly and wanted to know if she could get a change, too, since one of her best friends was getting one. Leo talked her into remaining female until after the onset of puberty. He told her he thought she might enjoy it. Leo and Jules circled each other like two tigers in a cage, unsure if a fight was necessary, but ready to start clawing out eyes if it came to it. Leo didn't like the analogy. If he had still been a female tiger, he would have felt sure of the outcome. But he had no wish to engage in a dominance struggle with Jules. They shared an apartment, a family, and a bed. They were elaborately polite, but touched each other only rarely, and Leo always felt he should apologize when they did. Jules would not meet his eyes. Their gazes would touch, then rebound like two cork balls with identical static charges. But eventually Jules accepted Leo. He was that guy who's always around, in Jules' mind. Leo didn't care for that, but saw it as progress. In a few more days, Jules began to discover that he liked Leo. They began to share things, to talk more. The subject of their previous relationship was taboo for a while. It was as if Jules wanted to know Leo from scratch, not acknowledging there had ever been a Cleo who had once been his wife. It was not that simple. Leo would not let it be. Jules sometimes sounded like he was mourning the passing of a loved one when he hesitantly began talking about the hurt inside him. He was able to talk freely to Leo, and it was in a slightly different manner from the way he had talked to Cleo. He poured out his soul. It was astonishing to Leo that there were so many bruises on it, so many defenses and insecurities. There was buried hostility which Jules had never felt free to tell a woman. Leo let him go on, but when Jules started a sentence with, I could never tell this to Cleo, or now that she's gone, 
Leo would go to him, take his hand, and force him to look. I'm Cleo, he would say. I'm right here, and I love you. They started doing things together. Jules took him to places Cleo had never been. They went out drinking together and had a wonderful time getting sliced. Before, it had always been dinner with a few drinks or dope sticks, then a show or concert. Now they might come home at 0200, harmonizing loud enough to get thrown in jail. Jules admitted he hadn't had so much fun since his college days. Socializing was a problem. Few of their old friends were changers, and neither of them wanted to face the complications of going to a party as a couple. They couldn't make friends among changers because Jules correctly saw he would be seen as an outsider. So they saw a lot of men. Leo had thought he knew all of Jules' close friends, but found he had been wrong. He saw a side of Jules he had never seen before, more relaxed in ways, some of his guardedness gone, but with other defenses in place. Leo sometimes felt like a spy, looking in on a stratum of society he had always known was there, but he had never been able to penetrate. If Cleo had walked into the group, its structure would have changed subtly. She would have created a new milieu by her presence, like light destroying the atom it was meant to observe. After his initial outing to the oophyte, Leo remained celibate for a long time. He did not want to have sex casually. He wanted to love Jules. As far as he knew, Jules was abstaining, too. But they found an acceptable alternative in double dating. They shopped around together for a while, taking out different women and having a lot of fun without getting into sex, until each settled on a woman he could have a relationship with. Jules was with Diane, a woman he had known at work for many years. Leo went out with Harriet. The four of them had great times together. Leo loved being a pal to Jules, but would not let it remain simply that. He took to reminding Jules that he could do this with Cleo, too. What Leo wanted to emphasize was that he could be a companion, a buddy, a confidant, no matter which sex he was. He wanted to combine the best of being a woman and being a man, be both things for Jules, fulfill all his needs. But it hurt to think that Jules would not do the same for him. Well, hello, Leo. I didn't expect to see you today. Can I come in, Harriet? She held the door open for him. Can I get you anything? Oh, yeah, before you go any further, that Harriet business is finished. I changed my name today. It's Jewel from now on. That's spelled J-O-U-L-E. Okay, Jewel. Nothing for me, thanks. He sat on her couch. Leo was not surprised at the new name. Changers had a tendency to get away from name names. Some did as Cleo had done by choosing a gender equivalent or a similar sound. Others ignored gender connotations and used the one they had always used. But most eventually chose a neutral word, according to personal preference. Jules. Julia, he muttered. What was that? Jules' brow wrinkled slightly. Did you come here for mothering? Things going badly? Leo slumped down and contemplated his folded hands. I don't know. I guess I'm depressed. How long has it been now? Five months? I've learned a lot, but I'm not sure just what it is. I feel like I've grown. I see the world. Well, I see things differently, yes. But I'm still basically the same person. In the sense that you're the same person at thirty-three as you were at ten? Leo squirmed. Okay, yeah, I've changed. But it's not any kind of reversal. Nothing turned topsy-turvy. It's an expansion. It's not a new viewpoint. It's like filling something up, moving out into unused spaces, becoming— His hands groped in the air, then fell back into his lap. It's like a completion. Jewel smiled. And you're disappointed? What more could you ask? Leo didn't want to get into that just yet. Listen to this and see if you agree. I always saw male and female, whatever that is, and I don't know if the two really exist other than physically and don't think it's important anyway. I saw those qualities as separate. Later I thought of them like Siamese twins in everybody's head. But the twins were usually fighting, trying to cut each other off. One would beat the other down, maim it, throw it in a cell, and never feed it. But they were always connected, and the beaten-down one would make the winner pay for the victory. 
so I wanted to try and patch things up between them. I thought I'd just introduce them to each other and try to referee, but they got along a lot better than I expected. In fact, they turned into one whole person and found they could be very happy together. I can't tell them apart anymore. Does that make any sense? Jewel moved over to sit beside him. It's a good analogy, in its way. I feel something like that, but I don't think about it any more. So what's the problem? You just told me you feel whole now. Leo's face controlled. Yes, I do. And if I am, what does that make Jules? He began to cry, and Jewel let him get it out, just holding his hand. She thought he'd better face it alone this time. When he had calmed down, she began to speak quietly. Leo, Jules is happy as he is. I think he could be much happier, but there's no way for us to show him that without having him do something he fears so much. It's possible that he will do it some day, after more time to get used to it, and it's possible that he'll hate it and run screaming back to his manhood. Sometimes the maimed twin can't be rehabilitated. She sighed heavily and got up to pace the room. There's going to be a lot of this in the coming years, she said. A lot of broken hearts. We're not really very much like them, you know. We get along better. We're not angels, but we may be the most civilized, considerate group the race has yet produced. There are fools and bastards among us, just like the one sexers. But I think we tend to be a little less foolish and a little less cruel. I think changing is here to stay. And what you've got to realize is that you're lucky, and so is Jules. It could have been much worse. I know of several broken homes just among my own friends. There's going to be many more before society has assimilated this. But your love for Jules and his for you has held you together. He's made a tremendous adjustment, maybe as big as the one you made. He likes you, in either sex. Okay, so you don't make love to him as Leo. You may never reach that point. We did. Last night. Leo shifted on the couch. I, I got mad. I told him if he wanted to see Cleo, he had to learn to relate to me because I'm me, damn it. I think that might have been a mistake. Leo looked away from her. I'm starting to think so, too. But I think the two of you can patch it up, if there's any damage. You've come through a lot together. I didn't mean to force anything on him. I just got mad. And maybe you should have. It might have been just the thing. You'll have to wait and see. Leo wiped his eyes and stood up. Thanks, Herr— Sorry, Jewel. You've helped me. I— uh, I may not be seeing you as often for a while. I understand. Let's stay friends, okay? She kissed him, and he hurried away. She was sitting on a pillow facing the door when he came home from work, her legs crossed, elbows resting on her knee with a dope stick in her hand. She smiled at him. Well, you're home early. What happened? I stayed home from work. She nearly choked, trying not to laugh. He threw his coat to the closet and hurried into the kitchen. She heard something being stirred, then the sound of glass shattering. He burst through the doorway. Cleo! Darling, you look so handsome with your mouth hanging open. He shut it, but still seemed unable to move. She went to him feeling tingling excitement in her loins like the return of an old friend. She put her arms around him, and he nearly crushed her. She loved it. He drew back slightly and couldn't seem to get enough of her face, his eyes roaming every detail. How long will you stay this way? he asked. Do you have any idea? I don't know. Why? He smiled, a little sheepishly. I hope you won't take this wrong. I am so happy to see you. Maybe I shouldn't say it. But no, I think I'd better. I like Leo. I think I'll miss him a little. She nodded. I'm not hurt. How could I be? She drew away and led him to a pillow. Sit down, Jules. We have to have a talk. His knees gave way under him, and he sat, looking up expectantly. Leo isn't gone, and don't you ever think that for a minute. He's right here. She thumped her chest and looked at him defiantly. He'll always be here. He'll never go away. I'm sorry, Cleo. I— No, don't talk yet. It was my own fault, but I didn't know any better. I never should have called myself Leo. It gave you an easy out. You didn't have to face Cleo being a male. I'm changing all that. My name is Nile. N-I-L-E. 
I won't answer to anything else. All right. It's a nice name. I thought of calling myself Lion, for Leo the Lion, but I decided to be who I always was, the Queen of the Nile, Cleopatra, for old time's sake. He said nothing, but his eyes showed his appreciation. What you have to understand is that they're both gone, in a sense. You'll never be with Cleo again. I look like her now. I resemble her inside, too, like an adult resembles the child. I have a tremendous amount in common with what she was, but I'm not her. He nodded. She sat beside him and took his hand. Jules, this isn't going to be easy. There are things I want to do, people I want to meet. We're not going to be able to share the same friends. We could drift apart because of it. I'm going to have to fight resentment because you'll be holding me back. You won't let me explore your female side like I want to. You're going to resent me because I'll be trying to force you into something you think is wrong for you. But I want to try and make it work. He let out his breath. God, Cl— Nile, I've never been so scared in my life. I thought you were leading up to leaving me. She squeezed his hand. Not if I can help it. I want each of us to try and accept the other as they are. For me, that includes being male whenever I feel like it. It's all the same to me, but I know it's going to be hard for you. They embraced, and Jules wiped his tears on her shoulder, then faced her again. I'll do anything and everything in my power up to— She put her finger to her lips. I know. I accept you that way. But I'll keep trying to convince you. Introduction to Just Another Perfect Day The next two stories are linked, in a way, but to explain the link here would tell you more than you should know about this one, so my comments about both stories will follow. Just Another Perfect Day Don't worry. Everything is under control. I know how you're feeling. You wake up alone in a strange room. You get up. You look around. You soon discover that both doors are locked from the outside. It's enough to unsettle anybody, especially when you try and try and try to recall how you got here and you just can't do it. But beyond that, there's this feeling. I know you're feeling it right now. I know a lot of things, and I'll reveal them all as we go along. One of the things I know is this. If you will sit down, put this message back on the table where you found it, and take slow, deep breaths while counting to one hundred, you'll feel a lot better. I promise you will. Do that now. See what I mean? You do feel a lot better. That feeling won't last for long, I'm sorry to say. I wish there was an easier way to do this, but there isn't, and believe me, many ways have been tried. So, here we go. This is not 1986. You are not twenty-five years old. The date is January, crossed out, February, crossed out, March, crossed out, April, crossed out, May, crossed out, June, one, crossed out, two, crossed out, three, crossed out, four, crossed out, five, crossed out, six, crossed out, seven, crossed out, eight, crossed out, nine, crossed out, Ten crossed out, eleven crossed out, twelve, two thousand six crossed out, two thousand seven crossed out, two thousand eight. A lot of things have happened in twenty crossed out, twenty one crossed out, twenty two years, and I'll tell you all you need to know about that in good time. For now, don't worry. Slow, deep breaths. Close your eyes. Count to a hundred. You'll feel better. I promise. If you'll get up now, you'll find that the bathroom door will open. There's a mirror in there. Take a look in it. Get to know the 45 crossed out, 46 crossed out, 47-year-old who will be in there looking back at you. And don't worry. Take deep breaths and so forth. I'll tell you more when you get back. Well, I know how rough that was. I know you're trembling. I know you're feeling confusion, fear, anger, a thousand emotions. And I know you have a thousand questions. They will all be answered, every one of them, at the proper time. Here are some ground rules. 
I will never lie to you. You can't imagine how much care and anguish has gone into the composition of this letter. For now you must take my word that things will be revealed to you in the most useful order and in the easiest way that can be devised. You must appreciate that not all your questions can be answered at once. It may be harder for you to accept that some questions cannot be answered at all until a proper background has been prepared. These answers would mean nothing to you at this point. You would like someone, anyone, to be with you right now so you could ask these questions. That has been tried, and the results were needlessly chaotic and confusing. Trust me, this is the best way. And why should you trust me? For a very good reason. I am you. You wrote, in a manner of speaking, every word in this letter, to help yourself through this agonizing moment. Deep breaths, please. Stay seated. It helps a little. And don't worry. So now we're past bombshell number two. There are more to come, but they will be easier to take, simply because your capacity to be surprised is just about at its peak right now. A certain numbness will set in. You should be thankful for that. And now back to your questions. Top of the list. What happened? Briefly, and it must be brief, more on that later. In 1989 you had an accident. It involved a motorcycle which you don't remember owning because you didn't buy it until 1988, and a city bus. You had a difference of opinion concerning the right-of-way, and the bus won. Feel your scalp with your fingertips. Don't be queasy. It healed long ago, as much as it's going to. Under those great knots of scar tissue are the useless results of the labors of the best neurosurgeons in the country. In the end, they just had to scoop out a lot of gray matter and close you back up, shaking their heads sagely and opining that you would probably feel right at home under glass on a salad bar. But you fooled him. You woke up, and there was much rejoicing, even though you couldn't remember anything after the summer of 86. You were conscious a few hours, long enough for the doctors to determine that your intelligence didn't seem to be impaired— you could talk, read, speak, see, hear. Then you went back to sleep. The next day you woke up and couldn't remember anything after the summer of 86. No one was too worried. They told you again what had happened. You were awake most of the day, and again you fell asleep. The next day you woke up and couldn't remember anything after the summer of 86. Some consternation was expressed. The next day you woke up and couldn't remember anything after the summer of 86. Professorial heads were scratched, seven-syllable Latin words intoned, and deep mumbles were mumbled. The next day you woke up and couldn't remember anything after the summer of 86. And the next day. And the next day. And the day after that. This morning you woke up and couldn't remember anything after the summer of 86. And I know this is getting old, but I had to make the point in this way, because it is 2006, crossed out, 2007, crossed out, 2008, and we've begun to think a pattern is established. No, no, don't breathe deeply. Don't count to 100. Face this one head on. It'll be good for you. Back under control? I knew you could do it. What you have is called progressive narcocataleptic amnesiac syndrome. P-N-C-A-S, or Pincus in conversation, and you should be proud of yourself, because they made up the term to describe your condition, and at least a half-dozen papers have been written proving it can't happen. What seems to happen, in spite of the papers, is that you store and retrieve memories just fine as long as you have a continuous thread of consciousness, but the sleep center somehow activates an erase mechanism in your head, so that all you experienced during the day is lost to you when you wake up again. The old memories are intact and vivid. The new ones are ephemeral, like they were recorded on a continuous tape loop. Most amnesias of this type behave rather differently. Retrograde amnesia is seen fairly frequently, whereby you gradually lose even the old memories and become as an infant. And progressive amnesias are well known, but those poor people can't remember what happened to them as little as five minutes ago. Try to imagine what life would be like in those circumstances before you start crying in your beer. Yeah, great, I hear you whine. And what's so great about this? Well, nothing at first glance. 
I'll certainly be the last one to argue about that. My own reawakening is too fresh in my mind, having happened only fifteen hours ago. And in a sense I will soon be dead, snatched back from this mayfly existence by the greedy arms of Morpheus. When I sleep tonight, most of what I feel makes me, me, will vanish. I will awake, an older and less wise man, to confusion. We'll read this letter, we'll breathe deeply, count to one hundred, stare into the mirror at a stranger. I will be you. And yet, now, as I scan rapidly through this letter for the second time today, I said I wrote it, but only in a sense, it was written by a thousand mayflies, they are asking me if there is anything I wish to change. If I want to change, Marion will see that it is made. Is there anything I would like to do differently tomorrow? Is there something I want to tell you, my successor in this body, to be aware of, to disbelieve? Are there any warnings I would issue? The answer is no. I will let this letter stand in its entirety. There are things still for you to learn that will convince you against all common sense that you have a wonderful life, day, ahead of you. But you need a rest. You need time to think. Do this for me. Go back to the date. Mark out the last number and write in the next. If it's a new month, change that, too. Now you will find the other door will open. Please go into the next room, where you will find breakfast and an envelope containing the next part of this letter. Don't open it yet. Eat your breakfast. Think it over. But don't take too long. Your time is short, and you won't want to waste it. That was refreshing, wasn't it? It shouldn't surprise you that all your favorite breakfast foods were on the table. You eat the same meal every morning and never get tired of it. And I'm sorry if that statement took some of the pleasure out of the meal, but it is necessary for me to keep reminding you of your circumstances to prevent a cycle of denial getting started. Here is the thing you must bear in mind. Today is the rest of your life. Because that life will be so short, it is essential that you waste none of it. In this letter I have sometimes stated the obvious, written out conclusions you have already reached, in a sense wasted your time. Each time it was done, and each time it will yet be done in the rest of this letter, was for a purpose. Points must be driven home, sometimes brutally, sometimes repetitiously. I promise you this sort of thing will be kept to an absolute minimum. So here come a few paragraphs that might be a waste of time, but really aren't, as they dispose neatly of several thousand of the most burning questions in your mind. The questions can be summed up as, what has happened in twenty years? The answer is, you don't care. You can't afford to care. Even a brief synopsis of recent events would take hours to read and would be the sheerest foolishness. You don't care who the president is. The price of gasoline doesn't concern you, nor does the victor in the 98 World Series. Why learn this trivia when you would only have to relearn it tomorrow? You don't care which books and movies are currently popular. You have read your last book, seen your last movie. Luckily, you are an orphan with no siblings or other close relatives. It is lucky. Think about it. The girl you were going with at the time of your accident has forgotten all about you, and you don't care because you didn't love her. There are things that have happened which you need to know about. I'll speak of them very soon. In the meantime, how do you like the room? Not at all like a hospital, is it? Comfortable and pleasant. Yet it has no windows, and the only other door was locked when you tried it. Try it again. It will open now. And remember, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. You will have stopped crying by now. I know you desperately need someone to talk to, a human face to look into. You will have that very soon now. But for another few minutes, I still must reach out to you from your recent past. Incidentally, the reason the breathing exercises and the counting are so effective is a post-hypnotic suggestion left in your mind. When you see the words, don't worry, it relaxes you. It seems that some part of your mind retains shadows of memory that you can't reach, which may also account for why you believe all this apparent rubbish. How the tears dry? It did the same thing to me. Even seeing my own face aged in the mirror didn't affect me like seeing the view from my windows. Then it became real. 
You are on one of the top floors of the Chrysler Building. Your view to the north included many, many buildings that were not there in 1986, and jumbled among them were many familiar buildings, distinctive as fingerprints. This is New York, and it is a new century, and that view is impossible to deny and as real as a fist. That's why you wept. Not too many more bombshells to go now, but the next one is a doozy. Let's creep up on it, shall we? You've already looked at the three photographs on the table beside your breakfast. Consider them now in order. The big, bluff, hearty-looking fellow is Ian McIntyre, who you'll meet in a few minutes. He will be your counselor, companion today, and he is the head of a very important project in which you are involved. It's impossible not to like him, though you, like me, will try to resist it first. But he is too wise to push it, and you've always liked people anyway. Besides, he has a lot of experience in winning your friendship, having done so every day for eight years. On to the second picture. Looks almost human, doesn't he? If the offspring of Gumby and E.T. could be considered human. He is humanoid. Two eyes, nose, mouth, two arms, and two legs, and that goofy grin. The green skin you'll get used to quickly enough. What he is, is a Martian. See, fifteen years ago, the Martians landed and took over the planet Earth. We still don't know what they plan to do with it, but some of the theories are not good news for Homo sapiens. Don't worry. Take a few deep breaths. I'll wait. That last thought is unworthy of you and unjust. I would not waste your time with a practical joke. You must realize I can back up what I say. To illustrate, I want you to go to the south windows of your apartment. Go through the billiard room into the spa, turn left at the gym, and open the door beside the Picasso, the one that didn't open before. You'll find yourself in an area with a view of the Narrows, and I'm sure I won't need to direct you beyond that. Take a look, and come right back. All right, you just had to prove you could do things your own way, didn't you? I don't care that you brought the letter with you, but your having done so provides one last bit of proof that I know you pretty well, doesn't it? Now, back to the bloody Martians. It's amazing how on target Steven Spielberg was, isn't it? That way that ship floats out there, and it's bigger than the mother ship in Close Encounters. That sucker is over thirty miles across. At its lowest point it is two miles in the air. The upper parts reach into space. It has floated out there for fifteen years and not budged one inch. People call it the saucer. There are fifteen others just like it, hovering near other major cities. And you think you have detected a flaw, don't you? How would you have seen it, you ask, if it had been a cloudy day? If it had been just a normal New York smoggy day, for that matter? Then you'd be reading this, scratching your head, wondering what the hell I'm talking about. The answer will illustrate everyone's concern. There are no more cloudy days in New York. The Martians don't seem to like rain, so they don't let it happen here. As for the smog, they told us to stop it, and we did. Wouldn't you, with that thing floating out there? About the name, Martians. We first detected their ships in the neighborhood of Mars. I know you'd have found it easier to swallow in a perverse way had I told you they came from Alpha Centauri or the Andromeda Galaxy or the planet Tralfamador, but people got to calling them Martians because that's what they were called on television. We don't think they're really from Mars. We don't know where they're from, but it's probably not from around here. And by that I mean not just another galaxy, but another universe. We think our own universe exists sort of as a shadow to them. This will be hard to explain. Take it slowly. Do you remember Flatland and Mr. A Square? He lived in a two-dimensional universe. There was no up or down, just right and left, forward and backward. He could not conceive the notion of up or down. Mr. Square was visited by a three-dimensional being, a sphere, who drifted down through the world of Flatland. Square perceived the sphere as a circle that gradually grew and then shrank. All he could see at any one moment was a cross-section of the sphere, while the sphere, godlike, could look down into Mr. Square's world, even touch inside Square's body without going through the skin. 
It was all just an interesting intellectual exercise, until the Martians arrived. Now we think they're like the Sphere, and we are Mr. Square. They live in another dimension, and they don't perceive time and space like we do. An example. You saw they appeared humanoid. We don't think they really are. We think they simply allow us to see a portion of their bodies which they project into our three-dimensional world and cause to appear humanoid. Their real shape must be vastly complex. Consider your hand. If you thrust your fingers into flatland, Mr. Square would see four circles and not imagine them to be connected. If you put your hand in further, he would see the circles merge into an oblong. Or an even better analogy is the shadow play. By suitably entwining your two hands in front of a light, you can cast a shadow on a wall that resembles a bird, or a bull, or an elephant, or even a man. What we see of the Martians is no more real than a Kermit the Frog hand puppet. The ship is the same way. We see merely a three-dimensional cross-section of a much larger and more complex structure. At least we think so. Communication with the Martians is very frustrating, nearly impossible. They are so foreign to us. They never tell us anything that makes sense, never say the same thing twice. We assume it would make sense if we could think the way they do. And it is important. They are very powerful. Weather control is just a parlor trick. When they invaded, they invaded all at once. And I hope I can explain this to you, as I am far from sure I understand it myself, after a full day with Martians. They invaded fifteen years ago, but they also invaded in 1854, and in 1520, and several other times in the past. The past seems to be merely another direction to them, like up or down. You'll be shown books, old books, with woodcuts and drawings, and contemporary accounts of how the Martians arrived, what they did when they left, and don't be concerned that you don't remember these momentous events from your high school history class, because no one else does either. Do you begin to understand? It seems that from the moment they arrived here in the late part of the twentieth century, they changed the past so that they had already arrived several times before. We have the history books to prove that they did. The fact that no one remembers these stories, being in the history books before they arrived this time, must be seen as an object lesson. One assumes they could have changed our memories of events as easily as the events themselves. That they did not do so means they meant us to be impressed. Had they changed both the events and our memories of them, no one would be the wiser. We would all assume history had always been that way, because that's the way we remembered it. The whole idea of history books must be a tremendous joke to them, since they don't experience time consecutively. Had enough? There's more. They can do more than add things to our history. They can take things away. Things like the World Trade Center. That's right, go look for it. It's not out there. And we didn't tear it down. It never existed in this world except in our memories. It's like a big shared illusion. Other things have turned up missing as well. Things like Knoxville, Tennessee, Lake Huron, the presidency of William McKinley, the Presbyterian Church, the rhinoceros, including the fossil record of its ancestors, Jack the Ripper, and all the literary works written about him, the letter Q, and Ecuador. Presbyterians still remember their faith and have built new churches to replace the ones that were never built. Who needed the goddamn rhino, anyway? Another man served McKinley's term and was also assassinated. Seeing book after book where K.W. replaces Q is only amusing and very K.W.E.E.R. queer. But the people of Knoxville, and a dozen other towns around the world, never existed. They are still trying to sort out the real estate around where Lake Huron used to be, and you can search the world's atlases in vain for any sight of Ecuador. The best wisdom is that the Martians could do even more if they wanted to, such as wiping out the element oxygen, the charge on the electron, or, of course, the planet Earth. They invaded, and they won quite easily and their weapon is very much like an editor's blue pencil. Rather than destroy our world, they rewrite it.
So what does all this have to do with me? I hear you cry. Why couldn't I have lived out my one day on earth without worrying about this? Well, who do you think is paying for this fabulous apartment? The grateful taxpayers, that's who. You didn't think you'd get original Picassos on the walls if you were nothing more than a brain-damaged geek, did you? And why are the taxpayers grateful? Because anything that keeps the Martians happy keeps the taxpayers happy. The Martians scare hell out of everyone, and you are their fair-haired boy. Why? Because you don't experience time like the rest of humanity does. You start fresh every day. You haven't had fifteen years to think about the Martians. You haven't developed any prejudice toward them or their way of thinking. Maybe. Most of that could be bullshit. We don't know if prejudice has anything to do with it. But you do see time differently. The fact is, the best mathematicians and physicists in the world have tried to deal with the Martians, and the Martians aren't interested. Every day they come to talk to you. Most days nothing is accomplished. They spend an hour, then go wherever it is they go, in whatever manner they do it. One day out of a hundred you get an insight. Everything I've told you so far is the result of those insights being compiled, along with the work of others. There are a few hundred of you around the world. No other man or woman has your peculiar affliction. All are what most people would call mentally limited. There are the progressive amnesiacs I mentioned earlier. There are people with split brain disorders, people with almost unbelievable perceptual aberrations, such as the woman who has lost the concept of right. Left is the only direction that exists in her brain. The Martians spend time with these people, people like you. So we tentatively conclude this about the Martians. They want to teach us something. It is painfully obvious they could have destroyed us any time they wished to do so. They have enslaved us in the sense that we are pathetically eager to do anything we even suspect they might want us to do. But they don't seem to want to do anything with us. They've made no move to breed us for meat animals conscript us into slave labor camps or rape our women. They have simply arrived, demonstrated their powers, and started talking to people like you. No one knows if we can learn what they are trying to teach us, but it behooves us to try, wouldn't you think? Again you say, why me? Or even more to the point, why should I care? I know your bitterness, and I understand it. Why should you spend even an hour of your precious time on problems you don't really care about, when it would be much easier and more satisfying spending your sixteen hours of awareness gnawing on yourself, wallowing in self-pity, and in general being a one-man soap opera? There are two reasons. One, you were never that kind of person. You've just about exhausted your store of self-pity during the process of reading this letter. If you have only one day— Though it hurts like hell, so be it. You will spend that day doing something useful. Reason number two. You've been looking at the third picture off and on since you first picked it up, haven't you? Come on, you can't lie to me. She's very pretty, isn't she? And that thought is unworthy of you since you know where this letter is coming from. She would not be offered to you as a bribe. The project managers know you well enough to avoid offering you a piece of ass to get your cooperation. Her name is Marion. Let us speak of love for a moment. You were in love once before. You remember how it was, if you'll allow yourself. You remember the pain. But that came later, didn't it, when she rejected you. Do you remember what it felt like the day you fell in love? Think back. You can get it. The simple fact is, it's why the world spins. Just the possibility of love has kept you going in the three years since Karen left you. Well, let me tell you, Marion is in love with you, and before the day is over you will be in love with her. You can believe that or not, as you choose, but I, at the end of my life here this day, can take as one of my few consolations that I, you, will have, tomorrow, today, the exquisite pleasure of falling in love with Marion. I envy you, you skeptical bastard. And since it's just you and me, I'll add this. Even with a girl you don't love, the first time is always pretty damn interesting, isn't it? For you, it's always the first time. 
except when it's the second time just before sleep, which Marion seems to be suggesting this very moment. As usual, I have anticipated all your objections. You think it might be tough for her? You think she's suffering? Okay. Admitted, the first few hours are what you might call repetitive for her. You gotta figure she's bored by now at your invariant behavior when you first wake up. But it is a cross she bears willingly for the pleasure of your company during the rest of the day. She is a healthy, energetic girl, one who is aware that no woman ever had such an attentive, energetic lover. She loves a man who is endlessly fascinated by her, body and soul, who sees her with new eyes each and every day. She loves your perpetual enthusiasm, your renewable infatuation. There isn't time to fall out of love. Anything more I could say would be wasting your time, and believe me, when you see what today is going to be like, you'd hate me for it. We could wish things were different. It is not fair that we have only one day. I, who am at the end of it, can feel the pain you only sense. I have my wonderful memories, which will soon be gone, and I have Marion for a few more minutes. But I swear to you I feel like an old, old man who has lived a full life, who has no regrets for anything he ever did, who accomplished something in his life, who loved and was loved in return. Can many normal people die saying that? In just a few seconds, that one last locked door will open, and your new life and future love will come through it. I guarantee it will be interesting. I love you, and I now leave you. Have a nice day. Introduction to In Fading Suns and Dying Moons the previous story and the one following have a common element that you will spot very quickly. The element is so much in common that I have to be thankful one can't be accused of plagiarizing oneself. Just Another Perfect Day was written more or less during a drive from Seattle to Portland. I do a lot of my best writing while driving. If it was possible to drive and type at the same time, my life would be greatly simplified. As it is, I try to make strings of ideas linked together so that when I get home, I can type them out as rapidly as possible. Pull on the string, and the next idea, or story point, or bit of dialogue, comes tumbling out of the old idea box. And if that worked more than about twenty percent of the time, my life would be simpler still. The inspiration was a book by Dr. Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. In it, Sachs describes some of the more fascinating and horrible things that can happen to a human being when his or her brain is damaged. One of the most basic is amnesia, but not the type used so often in Hollywood screenplays where the victim can't remember anything of his life, including his own name. Apparently, that sort of amnesia is fairly rare, except temporarily. More common, and in some ways more terrifying, is amnesia that affects the short-term memory— you remember things up to a point, and from then on are unable to change new experiences into memories. Such a person can live in a perpetual state of astonishment, becoming aware of himself a hundred times a day, trying to figure out why it's not 1948 anymore and where all the time went. In such a situation, the only mercy I can see is that he will soon forget how horrible his life has become. An excellent movie, Memento, was recently made about a man with this type of amnesia. Now, fast forward some years. I got an email from Janice Ian. She said I probably didn't know who she was and introduced herself as a semi-famous singer-songwriter. While I probably would not have known who she was if I'd been catatonic during the late 1960s, her best-known hits were Society's Child, when she was 15, and at seventeen, but she has been writing and performing wonderful music ever since then. It turns out she is a science fiction reader, likes my work, and had one of the better ideas for an anthology I had ever heard. She wanted to commission stories from various writers that would be based on lyrics from her work. I'm not usually very good at writing a story to order, but I didn't want to miss being in this book, and there was an idea I had been kicking around for a while. I wondered if it could be made to fit. So I turned to the song lyrics she had sent me, and these words leaped out at me from page one. 
in fading suns and dying moons. Well, if that isn't a science fiction title, I don't know what is. Even better, it fit nicely with my idea, without any cutting and splicing at all. Once again, this idea had to do with beings from a different dimension and how we might interact with them. Once again, the fastest way to acquaint the reader with the concept of a fourth dimension was to use the book Flatland, since the author had already covered just about everything one needed to know about higher and lower dimensions. One might ask if I found this a bit derivative, even repetitive. Well, I didn't find it repetitive at all, for a simple reason. I forgot. No, I do not suffer from retrograde amnesia, like the man in the previous story. My only excuse is that I seldom go back and reread my stories after they've seen publication, unless they are being collected as they are here. Let me tell you, when I read the references to Flatland in Just Another Perfect Day, I broke out in a cold sweat. It is every writer's nightmare. What if I'd unconsciously stolen from somebody else? However, I still like both stories, and I think they are different enough from each other that they can stand together or alone, whichever one prefers. One more thing I didn't remember. I don't put much stock in the idea of science fiction writers predicting the future, though some readers evidently expect it of us. I am familiar with the list of technological predictions that have come true, from nuclear submarines to synchronous orbit satellites, and that's all great. But it's not why a writer writes stories, at least none of the writers I know. Somehow more disturbing is when life imitates art. Tom Clancy must have felt a shiver when the aircraft were used as human-guided missiles, if you can call them human, on September 11, 2001 something he had put into one of his novels, except the plane was flown into the Capitol building during a joint session of Congress. But, of course, anybody who thought about it, and who understood there were no limits to the crimes some fanatic monsters are willing to commit, could have foreseen that much. I in no way claim any degree of prescience for the mention of a vanished World Trade Center in just another perfect day. In fact, I'd forgotten it was even in there and discovering it again made my skin crawl. I even thought of taking the reference out for this publication, as some filmmakers doctored shots that included the Twin Towers in the weeks and months following 9-11. It still hurts to even think of those images, and I'm sure it will continue to for the rest of my life, but we just have to keep remembering. After all, some of the perpetrators are still alive, a condition I hope is soon remedied. Author's Note Reading the galleys for this book, I just had to mention one more odd coincidence that has happened since I wrote these introductions. A man named George Wing wrote a movie called Fifty First Dates, and it was produced and released a few weeks ago, starring Jim Carrey. It's about a woman who loses her recent memory every time she goes to sleep. She eventually keeps a diary to bring her up to date on the last few years. My story was written in 1989. Should I sue? Nah. I remember David Gerald telling of a terrible moment he had concerning his Star Trek episode, The Trouble with Tribbles. In that story, a few cute little furry critters bred until they had overrun the Enterprise. Somebody pointed out that Robert Heinlein had written a novel, The Rolling Stones, in which cute little furry critters called flat cats bred until they had, you guessed it, in a cold sweat, David contacted Heinlein, who, being the gentleman he always was, pointed out that he had stolen the idea from Ellis Parker Butler, who wrote a story called Pigs is Pigs, later made into a wonderful Walt Disney short, which described a pair of guinea pigs and their offspring overrunning a train station in Scotland, and that Butler probably stole it from Noah. And though it pains me to admit it, I saw the movie— and George Wing made better use of the idea than I did. In Fading Suns and Dying Moons The first time they came through the neighborhood, there really wasn't much neighborhood to speak of. Widely dispersed hydrogen molecules, only two or three per cubic meter, traces of heavier elements from long-ago supernovae. The usual assortment of dust particles at a density of one particle every cubic mile or so. The dust was mostly ammonia, methane, and water ice, with some more complex molecules like benzene. 
Here and there these thin ingredients were pushed into eddies by light pressure from neighboring stars. Somehow they set forces in motion. I picture it as a cosmic finger stirring the mix, out in the interstellar wastes where space is really flat, in the Einsteinian sense, making a whirlpool in the unimaginable cold. Then they went away. Four billion years later they returned. Things were brewing nicely. The space debris had congealed into a big, burning central mass and a series of rocky or gaseous globes, all sterile, in orbit around it. They made a few adjustments and planted their seeds and saw that it was good. They left a small observer recorder behind, along with a thing that would call them when everything was ripe. Then they went away again. A billion years later the timer went off and they came back. I had a position at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, but of course I had not gone to work that day. I was sitting at home watching the news, as frightened as anyone else. Martial law had been declared a few hours earlier. Things had been getting chaotic. I'd heard gunfire from the streets outside. Someone pounded on my door. United States Army, someone shouted. Open the door immediately. I went to the door, which had four locks on it. How do I know you're not a looter? I shouted. Sir, I am authorized to break your door down. Open the door or stand clear. I put my eye to the old-fashioned peephole. They were certainly dressed like soldiers. One of them raised his rifle and slammed the butt down on my doorknob. I shouted that I would let them in, and in a few seconds I had all the locks open. Six men in full combat gear hustled into my kitchen. They split up and quickly explored all three rooms of the apartment, shouting out, All clear! in brisk military voices. One man, a bit older than the rest, stood facing me with a clipboard in his hand. Sir, are you Dr. Andrew Richard Lewis? There's been some mistake, I said. I'm not a medical doctor. Sir, are you Dr. Yes, yes, I'm Andy Lewis. What can I do for you? Sir, I am Captain Edgar, and I am ordered to induct you into the United States Army Special Invasion Corps, effective immediately, at the rank of second lieutenant. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I knew from the news that this was now legal, and I had the choice of enlisting or facing a long prison term. I raised my hand, and in no time at all I was a soldier. Lieutenant, your orders are to come with me. You have fifteen minutes to pack what essentials you may need, such as prescription medicine and personal items. My men will help you assemble your gear. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. You may bring any items relating to your specialty, laptop computer, reference books. He paused, apparently unable to imagine what a man like me would want to bring along to do battle with space aliens. Captain, do you know what my specialty is? My understanding is that you are a bug specialist. An entomologist, Captain, not an exterminator. Could you give me any clue as to why I'm needed? For the first time he looked less than totally self-assured. Lieutenant, all I know is they're collecting butterflies. They hustled me to a helicopter. We flew low over Manhattan. Every street was gridlocked. All the bridges were completely jammed with mostly abandoned cars. I was taken to an air base in New Jersey and hurried on to a military jet transport that stood idling on the runway. There were a few others already on board. I knew most of them. Entomology is not a crowded field. The plane took off at once. There was a colonel aboard whose job was to brief us on our mission and on what was thus far known about the aliens. Not much was really known that I hadn't already seen on television. They had appeared simultaneously on sea coasts worldwide. One moment there was nothing, the next moment there was a line of aliens as far as the eye could see. In the Western Hemisphere, the line stretched from Point Barrow in Alaska to Tierra del Fuego in Chile. Africa was lined from Tunis to the Cape of Good Hope. So were the western shores of Europe, from Norway to Gibraltar. Australia, Japan, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and every other island thus far contacted reported the same thing. A solid line of aliens appearing in the west, moving east. Aliens? No one knew what else to call them. They were clearly not of planet Earth, though if you ran into a single one there would be little reason to think them very odd. 
just millions and millions of perfectly ordinary people dressed in white coveralls, blue baseball caps, and brown boots, within arm's reach of each other, walking slowly toward the east. Within a few hours of their appearance, someone on the news had started calling it the line, and the creatures who were in it, linemen. From the pictures on the television they appeared rather average and androgynous. "'They're not human,' the colonel said. "'Those coveralls. It looks like they don't come off. The hats, either. You get close enough, you can see it's all part of their skin.' "'Protective coloration,' said Watkins, a colleague of mine from the museum. "'Many insects adapt colors or shapes to blend with their environment.' "'But what's the point of blending in?' I asked, "'if you are made so conspicuous by your actions. "'Perhaps the fitting in is simply to look more like us. "'It seems unlikely, doesn't it, "'that evolution would have made them look like janitors?' "'Somebody piped up. "'The colonel was frowning at us. "'You think they're insects?' "'Not by any definition I've ever heard,' Watkins said. "'Of course, other animals adapt to their surroundings, too. "'Arctic foxes in winter coats, tigers with their stripes.' Chameleons. The colonel mulled this for a moment, then resumed his pacing. Whatever they are, bullets don't bother them. There have been many instances of civilians shooting at the aliens. Soldiers, too, I thought. I'd seen film of it on television, a National Guard unit in Oregon cutting loose with their rifles. The aliens hadn't reacted at all, not visibly, until all the troops and all their weapons just vanished without the least bit of fuss and the line moved on. We landed at a disused-looking airstrip somewhere in northern California. We were taken to a big motel, which the Army had taken over. In no time I was hustled aboard a large Coast Guard helicopter with a group of soldiers, a squad, a platoon, led by a young lieutenant who looked even more terrified than I felt. On the way to the line I learned that his name was Evans and that he was in the National Guard. It had been made clear to me that I was in charge of the overall mission, and Evans was in charge of the soldiers. Evans said his orders were to protect me. How he was to protect me from aliens who were immune to his weapons hadn't been spelled out. My own orders were equally vague. I was to land close behind the line, catch up, and find out everything I could. They speak better English than I do, the colonel had said. We must know their intentions. Above all, you must find out why they're collecting— and here his composure almost broke down, but he took a deep breath and steadied himself. Collecting butterflies, he finished. We passed over the line at a few hundred feet. Directly below us individual aliens could be made out, blue hats and white shoulders. But off to the north and south it quickly blurred into a solid white line, vanishing in the distance, as if one of those devices that make chalk lines on football fields had gone mad. Evans and I watched it. None of the linemen looked up at the noise. They were walking slowly, all of them, never getting more than a few feet apart. The terrain was grassy, rolling hills, dotted here and there with clumps of trees. No man-made structures were in sight. The pilot put us down a hundred yards behind the line. "'I want you to keep your men at least fifty yards away from me,' I told Evans. "'Are those guns loaded? Do they have those safety things on them? Good.' Please keep them on. I'm almost as afraid of being shot by one of those guys as I am of whatever they are. And I started off, alone, toward the line. How does one address a line of marching alien creatures? Take me to your leader, seemed a bit peremptory. Hey, bro, what's happening? Perhaps overly familiar. In the end, after following for fifteen minutes, at a distance of about ten yards, I had settled on... Excuse me. So I moved closer and cleared my throat. Turns out that was enough. One of the linemen stopped walking and turned to me. This close one could see that his features were rudimentary. His head was like a mannequin's or a wig stand. A nose, hollows for eyes, bulges for cheeks. All the rest seemed to be painted on. I could only stand there idiotically for a moment. I noticed a peculiar thing. There was no gap in the line. I suddenly remembered why it was me and not some diplomat standing there. "'Why are you collecting butterflies?' I asked. "'Why not?' he said, and I figured it was going to be a long, long day. "'You should have no trouble understanding,' he said. 
Butterflies are the most beautiful things on your planet, aren't they? I've always thought so. Wondering, did he know I was a lepidopterist? There you are. Now he began to move. The line was about twenty yards away, and through our whole conversation, he never let it get more distant than that. We walked at a leisurely one mile per hour. Okay, I told myself. Try to keep it to butterflies. Leave it to the military types to get to the tough questions. When do you start kidnapping our children, raping our women, and frying us for lunch? What are you doing with them? Harvesting them. He extended a hand toward the line, and, as if summoned, a lovely specimen of Adelpha bredoii fluttered toward him. He did something with his fingers, and a pale blue sphere formed around the butterfly. "'Isn't it lovely?' he asked, and I moved in for a closer look. He seemed to treasure these wonderful creatures I'd spent my life studying. He made another gesture, and the blue ball with the Adelpha disappeared. "'What happens to them?' I asked him. "'There is a collector,' he said. "'A lepidopterist? "'No, it's a storage device. "'You can't see it because it is off to one side.' Off to one side of what, I wondered, but didn't ask. And what happens to them in the collector? They are put in storage in a place where time does not move, where time does not pass, where they do not move through time as they do here. He paused for a few seconds. It is difficult to explain. Off to one side, I suggested. Exactly. Excellent. Off to one side of time. You've got it. I had nothing, actually, but I plowed on. What will become of them? We are building a place. Our leader wishes it to be a very special place. Therefore, we are making it of these beautiful creatures. Of butterfly wings? They will not be harmed. We know ways of making walls in a manner that will allow them to fly freely. I wished someone had given me a list of questions. How did you get here? How long will you stay? A certain length of time, not a great length by your standards. What about your standards? By our standards, no time at all. As to how we got here, have you read a book entitled Flatland? I'm afraid not. Pity, he said, and turned away and vanished. Our operation in Northern California was not the only group trying desperately to find out more about the linemen, of course. There were lines on every continent, and soon they would be present in every nation. They had covered many small Pacific islands in only a day, and when they reached the eastern shores they simply vanished, as my guide had. News media were doing their best to pool information. I believe I got a lot of those facts before the general population, since I had been shanghaied into the forefront— but our information was often as garbled and inaccurate as what the rest of the world was getting. The military was scrambling around in the dark, just like everyone else. But we learned some things. They were collecting moths as well as butterflies, from the drabbest specimen to the most gloriously colored, the entire order Lepidoptera. They could appear and vanish at will. It was impossible to get a count of them. Whenever one stopped to commune with the natives as mine had, the line remained solid, with no gaps. When they were through talking to you, they simply went where the Cheshire cat went, leaving behind not even a grin. Wherever they appeared, they spoke the local language, fluently and idiomatically. This was even true in isolated villages in China or Turkey or Nigeria, where some dialects were used by only a few hundred people. They didn't seem to weigh anything at all. Moving through forests, the line became more of a wall, linemen appearing in literally every tree on every limb, walking on branches obviously too thin to bear their weight and not even causing them to bend. When the tree had been combed for butterflies, the crews vanished and appeared in another tree. Walls meant nothing to them. In cities and towns nothing was missed, not even closed bank vaults, attic spaces, closets. They didn't come through the door, they simply appeared in a room and searched it. If you were on the toilet, that was just too bad. Any time they were asked about where they came from, they mentioned that book, Flatland. Within hours, the book was available on hundreds of websites, 
Downloads ran to the millions. The full title of the book was Flatland, a Romance of Many Dimensions. It was supposedly written by one Mr. A. Square, a resident of Flatland, but its actual author was Edwin Abbott, a nineteenth-century cleric and amateur mathematician. A copy was waiting for me when we got back to camp after that first frustrating day. The book is an allegory and a satire, but also an ingenious way to explain the concept of multidimensional worlds to the layman like me. Mr. Square lives in a world of only two dimensions. For him there is no such thing as up or down, only forward, backward, and side to side. It is impossible for us to really see, from Square's point of view, a single line that extends all around him, with nothing above it or below it. Nothing. Not empty space. Not a black or white void. Nothing. But humans, being three-dimensional, can stand outside Flatland, look up or down at it, see its inhabitants from an angle they can never have. In fact, we could see inside them, examine their internal organs, reach down and touch a Flatlander heart or brain with our fingers. In the course of the book, Mr. Square is visited by a being from the third dimension, a sphere. He can move from one place to another without apparently traversing the space between point A and point B. There was also discussion of the possibilities of even higher dimensions, worlds as inscrutable to us as the 3D world was to Mr. Square. I'm no mathematician, but it didn't take an Einstein to infer that the line and the lineman came from one of those theoretical higher planes. The people running the show were not Einstein either, but when they needed expertise, they knew where to go to draft it. Our mathematician's name was Larry Ward. He looked as baffled as I must have looked the day before, and he got no more time to adjust to his new situation than I did. We were all hustled aboard another helicopter and hurried out to the line. I filled him in as best I could on the way out. Again, as soon as we approached the line, a spokesman appeared. He asked us if we'd read the book, though I suspect he already knew we had. It was a creepy feeling to realize he, or something like him, could have been standing, or existing, in some direction I couldn't imagine, only inches away from me in my motel bedroom, looking at me read the book, just as the sphere looked down on Mr. A. Square. A flat white plane appeared in the air between us, and geometrical shapes and equations began drawing themselves on it. It just hung there, unsupported. Larry wasn't too flustered by it, nor was I. Against the background of the line, an anti-gravity blackboard seemed almost mundane. The lineman began talking to Larry, and I caught maybe one word in three. Larry seemed to have little trouble with it at first, but after an hour he was sweating, frowning, clearly getting out of his depth. By that time I was feeling quite superfluous and it was even worse for Lieutenant Evans and his men. We were reduced to following Larry and the line at its glacial but relentless pace. Some of the men took to slipping between the gaps in the line to get in front, then doing all sorts of stupid antics to get a reaction, like tourists trying to rattle the guards at the Tower of London. The linemen took absolutely no notice. Evans didn't seem to care. I suspected he was badly hung over. Look at this, Dr. Lewis. I turned around and saw that a lineman had appeared behind me in that disconcerting way they had. He had a pale blue sphere cupped in his hands, and in it was a lovely specimen of Papilio zelicaean, the Anus Swallowtail, with one blue wing and one orange wing. A genandromorph, I said, immediately, with the spooky feeling that I was back in the lecture hall, an anomaly that sometimes arises during gametogenesis. One side is male and the other is female. How extraordinary! Our leader will be happy to have this creature existing in his palace. I had no idea how far to believe him. I had been told that at least a dozen motives had been put forward by line spokesmen to various exploratory groups as the rationale for the butterfly harvest. A group in Mexico had been told some substance was to be extracted, harmlessly, so they said, from the specimens. In France, a lepidopterist swore a lineman told her the captives were to be given to fourth-dimension children as pets. It didn't seem all the stories could be true, or maybe they could. Step one in dealing with the lineman was to bear in mind that our minds could not contain many concepts that, to them, 
were as basic as up and down to us. We had to assume they were speaking baby talk to us. But for an hour we talked butterflies, as Larry got more and more bogged down in a sea of equations, and the troops got progressively more bored. The creature knew the names of every lepidopteran we encountered that afternoon, something I could not claim. That fact had never made me feel inadequate before. There were around 170,000 species of moth and butterfly so far catalogued, including several thousand in dispute. Nobody could be expected to know them all. But I was sure the linemen did. Remember, every book in every library was available to them, and they did not have to open them to read them. And time, which I had been told was the fourth dimension, but now learned was only a fourth dimension, almost surely did not pass for them in the same way as it passed for us. Larry told me later that a billion years was not a formidable distance for them. They were masters of space, masters of time, and who knew what else? The only emotion any of them had ever expressed was delight at the beauty of the butterflies. They showed no anger or annoyance when shot at with rifles. The bullets went through them harmlessly. Even when assaulted with bombs or artillery rounds, they didn't register any emotion. They simply made the assailants and weapons disappear. It was surmised by those in charge, whoever they were, that these big noisy displays were dealt with only because they harmed butterflies. The troops had been warned, but there's always some clown. So when an Antheria polyphemus fluttered into the air in front of a private named Paulson, he reached out and grabbed it in his fist, or tried to. While his hand was still an inch away, he vanished. I don't think any of us quite credited our senses at first. I didn't, and I'd been looking right at him, wondering if I should say something. There was nothing but the polyphemus moth fluttering in the sunshine. But soon enough there were angry shouts. Many of the soldiers unslung their rifles and pointed them at the line. Evans was frantically shouting at them, but now they were angry and frustrated. Several rounds were fired. Larry and I hit the deck as a machine gun started chattering. Looking up carefully, I saw Evans punch the machine gunner and grab the weapon. The firing stopped. There was a moment of stunned silence. I got to my knees and looked at the line. Larry was okay, but the blackboard was gone, and the line moved placidly on. I thought it was all over, and then the screaming began close behind me. I nearly wet myself and turned around quickly. Paulson was behind me, on his knees, hands pressed to his face, screaming his lungs out. But he was changed. His hair was all white, and he'd grown a white beard. He looked thirty years older, maybe forty. I knelt beside him, unsure what to do. His eyes were full of madness, and the name patch, sewn on the front of his shirt, now read, Backward N, Backward O, Backward S, Backward L, Backward U, Backward A, Backward P. They reversed him, Larry said. He couldn't stop pacing. Myself, I'd settled into a fatalistic calm. In the face of what the lineman could do, it seemed pointless to worry much. If I did something to piss them off, then I'd worry. Our Northern California headquarters had completely filled the big Holiday Inn. The Army had taken over the whole thing, this bizarre operation gradually getting the incrustation of barnacles any government operation soon acquires, literally hundreds of people bustling about as if they had something important to do. For the life of me, I couldn't see how any of us were needed, except for Larry and a helicopter pilot to get him to the line and back. It seemed obvious that any answers we got would come from him or someone like him. They certainly wouldn't come from the troops, the tanks, the nuclear missiles, I'm sure, were targeted on the line and certainly not from me. But they kept me on, probably because they hadn't yet evolved a procedure to send anybody home. I didn't mind. I could be terrified here just as well as in New York. In the meantime, I was bunking with Larry, who now reached into his pocket and produced a penny. He looked at it and tossed it to me. I grabbed that when they were going through his pockets, he said. I looked at it. As I expected, Lincoln was looking to the left and all the inscriptions were reversed. How can they do that? I asked. He looked confused for a moment, 
then grabbed a sheet of motel stationery and attacked it with one of the pens in his pocket. I looked over his shoulder as he made a sketch of a man, writing L by one hand and R by the other. Then he folded the sheet without creasing it, touching the stick figure to the opposite surface. Flat land doesn't have to be flat, he said. He traced the stick man onto the new surface, and I saw it was now reversed. Flatlanders can move through the third dimension without knowing they're doing it. They slide around this curve in their universe. Or a third-dimensional being can lift them up here and set them down here. They've moved without traveling the distance between the two points. We both studied the drawing solemnly for a moment. How is Paulson? I asked. Catatonic. Reversed. He's left-handed now. His appendectomy scar is on the left. The tattoo on his left shoulder is on the right now. He looked older. Who can say? Some are saying he was scared gray. I'm pretty sure he saw things the human eye just isn't meant to see. But I think he's actually older, too. The doctors are still looking him over. It wouldn't be hard for a fourth-dimensional creature to do. Age him many years in seconds. But why? They didn't hire me to find out why. I'm having enough trouble understanding the how. I figure the why is your department. He looked at me, but I didn't have anything helpful to offer. But I had a question. How is it they're shaped like men? Coincidence, he said, and shook his head. I don't even know if they is the right pronoun. There might be just one of them, and I don't think it looks anything like us. He saw my confusion and groped again for an explanation. He picked up another piece of paper, set it on the desk, drew a square on it, put the fingertips of his hand to the paper. A flatlander, Mr. Square, perceives this as five separate entities. See, I can surround him with what he'd see as five circles. Now imagine my hand moving down through the plane of the paper. Four circles soon join together into an elliptical shape. Then the fifth one joins, too, and he sees a cross-section of my wrist, another circle. Now extend that. He looked thoughtful, then pulled a comb from his back pocket and touched the teeth to the paper surface. The comb moves through the plane, and each tooth becomes a little circle. I draw the comb through Flatland. Mr. Square sees a row of circles coming toward him. It was making my head hurt, but I thought I grasped it. So they, or it, or whatever, is combing the planet, combing out all the butterflies, like a fine-tooth comb going through hair, pulling out, what do you call them, lice eggs? Nits. I realized I was scratching my head. I stopped. But these aren't circles. They're solid. They look like people. If they're solid, why don't they break tree branches when they go out on them? He grabbed the gooseneck lamp on the desk and pointed the light at the wall. Then he laced his hands together. You see it? On the wall? This isn't the best light. Then I did see it. He was making a shadow image of a flying bird. Larry was on a roll. He whipped a grease pencil from his pocket and drew a square on the beige wall above the desk. He made the shadow bird again. Mr. Square sees a pretty complex shape, but he doesn't know the half of it. Look at my hands, just my hands. Do you see a bird? No, I admitted. That's because only one of many possible cross-sections resembles a bird. He made a dog's head and a monkey. He'd done this before, probably in a lecture hall. What I'm saying— Whatever it's using, hands, fingers, whatever shapes its actual body can assume in four space, all we'd ever see is a three-dimensional cross-section of it. And that cross-section looks like a man? Could be. But his hands were on his hips now, regarding the square he'd drawn on the wall. How can I be sure? I can't. The guys running this show, they want answers, and all we can offer them is possibilities. By the end of the next day, he couldn't even offer them that. I could see he was having tough sledding right from the first. The floating blackboard covered itself with equations again, and the instructor, tutor, translator stood patiently beside it, waiting for Larry to get it. And increasingly, he was not. The troops had been kept back, almost a quarter mile behind the line. They were on their best behavior, as that day there was some brass with them, 
I could see them back there holding binoculars, a few generals and admirals and such. Since no one had told me to do differently, I stayed up at the line near Larry. I wasn't sure why. I was no longer very afraid of the linemen, though the camp had been awash in awful rumors that morning. It was said that Paulson was not the first man to be returned in a reversed state, but it had been hushed up to prevent panic. I could believe it. The initial panics and riots had died down quite a bit, we'd been told, but millions around the globe were still fleeing before the advancing line. In some places, feeding these migrant masses was getting to be a problem, and in some places the moving mob had solved the problem by looting every town they passed through. Some said that Paulson was not the worst that could happen. It was whispered that men had been vanished by the line and returned everted, turned inside out, and still alive, though not for long. Larry wouldn't deny it was possible. But today Larry wasn't saying much of anything. I watched him for a while, sweating in the sun, writing on the blackboard with a grease pencil, wiping it out, writing again, watching the linemen patiently writing new stuff in symbols that might as well have been Swahili. Then I remembered I had thought of something to ask the night before, lying there listening to Larry snoring in the other king-size bed. "'Excuse me,' I said, and instantly a lineman was standing beside me. "'The same one?' I knew the question had little meaning. Before I asked, why butterflies? You said, because they are beautiful. The most beautiful things on your planet, he corrected. Right, but isn't there a second best? Isn't there anything else, anything at all that you're interested in? I floundered, trying to think of something else that might be worth collecting, to an aesthetic sense I could not possibly imagine. Scarab beetles, I said, sticking to entomology. Some of them are fabulously beautiful, to humans anyway. They are quite beautiful, he agreed. However, we do not collect them. Our reasons would be difficult to explain. A diplomatic way of saying humans were blind, deaf, and ignorant, I supposed. But yes, in a sense, things are grown on other planets in this solar system, too. We are harvesting them now, in a temporal way of speaking. Well, this was new. Maybe I could justify my presence here in some small way after all. Maybe I'd finally asked an intelligent question. Can you tell me about them? Certainly. Deep in the atmospheres of your four gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, beautiful beings have evolved that our leader treasures. On Mercury, creatures of quicksilver inhabit deep caves near the poles, these are being gathered as well, and there are life forms we admire that thrive on very cold planets. Gathering cryogenic butterflies on Pluto? Since he showed me no visual aids, the image would do until something better came along. The lineman didn't elaborate beyond that, and I couldn't think of another question that might be useful. I reported what I had learned at the end of the day. None of the team of expert analysts could think of a reason why this should concern us, but they assured me my findings would be bucked up the chain of command. Nothing ever came of it. The next day they said I could go home, and I was hustled out of California almost as fast as I'd arrived. On my way I met Larry, who looked haunted. We shook hands. Funny thing, he said. All our answers over thousands of years, myths, gods, philosophers. What's it all about? Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where do we go? What are we supposed to do while we're here? What's the meaning of life? So now we find out, and it was never about us at all. The meaning of life is butterflies. He gave me a lopsided grin. But you knew that all along, didn't you? Of all the people on the planet, I and a handful of others could make the case that we were most directly affected. Sure, lives were uprooted. Many people died before order was restored. But the linemen were as unobtrusive as they could possibly be, given their mind-numbing task, and things eventually got back to a semblance of normal. Some people lost their religious faith, but even more rejected out of hand the proposition that there was no God but the line. So the holy men of the world registered a net gain. But Lepidopterists, let's face it, we were out of a job. I spent my days haunting the dusty back rooms and narrow corridors of the museum, 
opening cases and drawers, some of which might not have been disturbed for decades. I would stare for hours at the thousands and thousands of preserved moths and butterflies, trying to connect with the childhood fascination that had led to my choice of career. I remembered expeditions to remote corners of the world, miserable, mosquito-bitten, and exhilarated at the same time. I recalled conversations, arguments about this or that taxonomic point. I tried to relive my elation at my first new species, Hypolimnes lewisii. All ashes now. They didn't even look very pretty any more. On the twenty-eighth day of the invasion, a second line appeared on the world's western coasts. By then, the North American line stretched from a point far on the Canadian north through Saskatchewan, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico, reaching the Gulf of Mexico somewhere south of Corpus Christi, Texas. The second line began marching east, finding very few butterflies, but not seeming to mind. It is not in the nature of the governmental mind to simply do nothing when faced with a situation, but most people agreed there was little or nothing to be done. To save face, the military maintained a presence following the line, but they knew better than to do anything. On the fifty-sixth day, the third line appeared. Lunar cycle? It appeared so. A famous mathematician claimed he had found an equation describing the Earth-Moon orbital pair in six dimensions. Or was it seven? No one cared very much. When the first line reached New York, I was in the specimen halls, looking at moths under glass. A handful of linemen appeared, took a quick look around. One looked over my shoulder at the displays for a moment. Then they all went away, in their multidimensional way. And there it is. I don't recall who it was that first suggested we write it all down, nor can I recall the reason put forward. Like most literate people of the earth, though, I dutifully sat down and wrote my story. I understand many are writing entire biographies, possibly an attempt to shout out, I was here, to an indifferent universe. I have limited myself to events from day one to the present. Perhaps someone else will come by, some distant day, and read these accounts. Yes, and perhaps the moon is made of green butterflies. It turned out that my question that last day of my military career was the key question, but I didn't realize I had been given the answer. The lineman never said they were growing creatures on Pluto. He said there were things they grew on cold planets. After one year of combing the earth, the lineman went away as quickly as they appeared. On the way out, they switched off the light. It was night in New York. From the other side of the planet the reports came in quickly, and I climbed up to the roof of my building. The moon, which should have been nearing full phase, was a pale ghost, and soon became nothing but a black hole in the sky. Another tenant had brought a small TV. An obviously frightened astronomer and a confused news anchor were counting seconds. When they reached zero, a bit over twenty minutes after the events at the Antipodes, Mars began to dim. In thirty seconds, it was invisible. He never mentioned Pluto as their cold planet nursery. In an hour, Jupiter's light failed, then Saturn. When the sun came up in America that day, it looked like a charcoal briquette, red flickerings here and there, and soon not even that. When the clocks and church bells struck noon, the sun was gone. Presently, it began to get cold. Introduction to The Flying Dutchman I took my first flight on an airplane shortly after I dropped out of Michigan State. Well, technically, flunked out. I stopped going to classes. I was very depressed. The plane was a Delta Airlines Convair CV-880, a not-too-successful rival to the 707 and DC-8. Only sixty-five were made. It flew me from Detroit to Atlanta, where I boarded another 880 for a flight to Houston. My last six years in Texas were spent only about a mile from the mid-county airport, which served not just tiny Nederland, but Beaumont, Port Arthur, and Orange, so it was fairly busy, though too small then for jetliners. I was so aviation crazy that my idea of a great time was to park at the end of the runway and watch the planes land and take off. It was there that our high school band greeted Lyndon Johnson, and we played Hail Columbia, 
the official song of the vice presidency. My idea of a really great time was to go to Houston Hobby Airport and stand out on the observation platform watching the big jets. You could do that back then. It should have been an exciting trip, and I enjoyed it, gawked like a rube from a small town in Texas, but I was exhausted emotionally and physically. It had been a hard night. The Selective Service System, ever vigilant in its hunt for raw meat to feed Lyndon's war, had already revoked my 2S status and ordered me to report to Detroit for my pre-induction physical. I was now the dreaded 1A. The only way I could make it was to hitchhike from East Lansing to Detroit, spend the night in the bus station, and report bright and early in the morning. Inside I was processed like prize pork, and despite my debilitated condition, pronounced a fit target for Viet Cong landmines and bullets. Then I hitched to the airport and spent the night on the floor there. It was a pretty bedraggled nineteen-year-old who finally stepped aboard that CV-880. That began a six-year battle with the SSS that I won, largely by attrition. I didn't have any particular secret. I just sort of bureaucratted them to a standstill. Example. My draft board was in Michigan, but my only address was in Texas. All notices had to shuffle between the two destinations before my mother could forward them to me. Another example. I found out that every decision they made could be appealed, and all that paperwork had to shuffle around, too. Years were eaten up that way. Most ridiculous example. I was ordered to report to the Oakland Induction Center for the big one, the one step forward that would send me into basic training. A man outside the center told me the commanding officer of the place was so insanely angry at the goddamn pinko peaceniks demonstrating outside that if you took anti-draft literature inside, you would be ordered to surrender it, before you were in the army, before they had the authority to order you to do a damn thing. I took it in, was told to surrender it, and then was sat down at a table in order to sign twenty different forms, surrounded by gorillas who looked like they would like to do nothing more than wring my scrawny hippie neck. I signed nothing, didn't surrender the literature, and was told to go away, that the district attorney would be contacting me. No one ever did. That ate up a year right there. At one point FBI agents showed up at my parents' home and eventually at mine. They questioned me and went away. I went to Canada to see if I wanted to live up there, dodging the draft. Canada is a fine country. I love it. But the idea of never being able to go home was too much to bear. I sort of knew that if I was sent to Nam, there was an excellent chance of going home in a body bag or minus my legs and testicles. But I admit that didn't scare me too much. I was young. I thought I was immortal. I also thought I could find a way to finagle my way into being the best damn clerk typist or chaplain's assistant stationed in Germany in this man's army. But I kept resisting because I'd read Catch-22 and knew I could never survive one aspect of the military. Officers. I knew I was destined to be a private, and I don't take orders well. So I fought. My main weapon was being the sole means of support for my wife, who was in a wheelchair. I lost every appeal I ever made. I don't even remember how many there were. But then one day, the war was over, and I never broke the law. I have no regrets about any of this. I respected and still respect those who went, who died, who were maimed mentally and physically. I never spat at soldiers, never called them baby killers. Call me a draft dodger if you like. I can handle it. I don't really know where this story came from. Even after 9-11, air travel is not quite this inconvenient, though I'm planning to take the train the next time I take a trip. I don't like having my shoes searched. I think I was simply tinkering with the notion that hell might not be guys with pitchforks hurting people into pools of molten brimstone, that there might actually be worse things. The Flying Dutchman it was dark when the plane reached O'Hare, three hours late. Snow swirled in white tornadoes over the frozen field. The plowing crews had kept just one runway clear. Planes were stacked up back to New Jersey. Flights were being diverted to St. Louis, Cleveland, Dayton, and other places people didn't really want to go when they intended to go there. 
The 727 hit the icy tarmac like a fat lady on skates, slewed to the left, then straightened out as the nose came down and the thrust reversers engaged. Then the plane taxied for thirty minutes. When the jetway finally reached them and the fastened seatbelts sign went off, Peter Mares stood up. He was immediately bumped back into his seat by a large man across the aisle. Somebody stepped on his foot. He struggled to his feet again, reached for his carry-on bag under the seat. When he jerked on the handle, it snagged on something. He pushed at it with his foot, being jostled from behind and almost falling into the man from seat B, waiting for Mares to get out. He yanked again and heard a sound that meant there was a new deep scratch on the expensive leather. He looked up in time to have a filthy duffel bag fall from the overhead compartment into his face. A filthier hand appeared and yanked on the canvas strap, and the bag vanished into the press of bodies. Mares glimpsed a ragged man with a beard. How had such a man got aboard an airplane, he wondered. Could you buy airline tickets with food stamps? Retrieving his briefcase and his laptop computer, he slung everything over his shoulders. It was another ten minutes of shuffling before he reached the closet at the front of the plane where a harried flight attendant was helping people reclaim their garment bags. He found his, grabbed it, and slung it over his shoulder. Then he waddled sideways toward the door and the jetway. On the way out, he barked his shin against a folded golf cart leaning against the exit door. Then he was trudging up the jetway into O'Hare. O'Hare. O-R-D. On a snowy night with one runway operating, an inner circle of hell. Mares shuffled down the concourse with several million other lost souls, all looking to make a connection. Those who had abandoned all hope, at least for the night, slumped in chairs or against walls, or just stood asleep on their feet. At O'Hare, connections were made not on shadowy street corners, cash for tiny baggies, but at the ends of infinite queues, shaped, twisted, and redoubled by yellow canvas bands strung between stainless steel poles, under lights as warm and homey as an operating theater. Mares found the right line and stood at the end of it. In ten minutes, he shoved his garment bag, his carry-on, his briefcase, and his laptop forward three feet with the tip of his shoe. Ten minutes later, he did it again. He was hungry. When he reached the ticket counter, the agent told him he had missed his connecting flight for home, and that there would be no more flights that night. However, she said, frowning at her computer screen, I have one seat available on a flight to Atlanta. You ought to be able to make a connection from there in the morning. She looked up at him and smiled. Mayers took the rewritten ticket. The departure gate was a good three miles from where he stood. He shouldered his burdens and went off in search of food. Everything was closed except one snack bar near his gate. Airport unions were on strike. The menu on the wall had been covered with a sheet of butcher paper, hand-lettered. Hot dogs, four dollars. Cokes, two dollars. No coffee. Behind the counter were two harried workers, a fiftyish woman with gray wisps of hair straggling from her paper cap, and a Hispanic man in his twenties with mustard and ketchup stains all over his apron. When Maris was still a good distance away, the counterman suddenly threw down his hot dog tongs, snatched the hat from his head, and crumpled it into a ball. I'm through with this shit, he shouted. I quit. No mas. He continued to scream in Spanish as he ran through a door in the back. The woman was shouting his name, which was Eduardo, but the man paid no attention. He hit the red emergency bar on a fire door, and an alarm sounded as he scrambled downstairs outside. Mares could see a little through the glass. The Hispanic man was short and stocky, but a good runner. He charged away from the building. From somewhere beneath, two uniformed security guards charged out, guns in their hands. Eduardo was nowhere to be seen. The guards kept going. There was a flash of light. Gunfire? There was too much noise from jet engines for Mares to be sure. He shivered and turned back toward the snack counter. He was still ten people back in line when they announced his flight to Atlanta. He was three back when they made the second announcement. The gray-haired woman, still distracted by the flight of Eduardo, slapped a hot dog into his hand and spilled a third of his coke on the counter as another call came over the public address. Mayers hurried to a stand-up counter. There were no onions, no relish. 
He squeezed some mustard out of a plastic packet, half of it squirting cleverly onto his tan overcoat. Cursing, dabbing at the mustard, Mares took a bite. It was lukewarm on one end, cold on the other. Gulping coke and choking down cold weenie and stale bun, Mares hurried to the boarding area, down the jetway, and into the 727. Most of the passengers were seated, except a few struggling with crammed overhead compartments. He sidled down to seat 28B. In 28C was a woman who had to be 300 pounds, most of it in the hips. In 28A was a man who was more like 350, his face shiny with sweat. Mares looked around desperately, but he already knew this was the last, the absolute last seat on the plane. The woman glared at him as she stood. Mares got his carry-on under the seat, then popped the overhead rack. There was about enough space to store a wallet. The next one was just as full. A flight attendant took his briefcase and laptop and hurried away. He wedged himself into the seat. The lady wedged herself into hers. He felt his ribs compressing. From his right came gusts of a sickening lilac perfume. From the left, waves of stale terror. "'My first flight,' the fat man confided. "'Oh, really?' Mayers said. "'I'm real scared.' "'No need to be.' The fat lady scrambled in her purse for a box of tissue, then blew her nose loud enough to frighten a walrus. She crumpled the noisome tissue and dropped it on Mare's shoe. They were pushed back. They taxied. They waited two hours and taxied some more. They were de-iced and waited another hour, all of which took much longer than it takes to tell about it. Then they were in the air. The fat man promptly threw up into the little white bag. Atlanta. ATL. They landed under a thick pall of black smoke. Somewhere to the west, a large part of Georgia was tender, dry, and burning. Hartsfield International sweltered in hundred-degree heat, and soot swirled across the runways. It was dark as night. The fat man had filled barf bags all through the flight. In spite of this, he had eaten like a starving hyena. Mares had been unable to eat. He could barely get his hands to his mouth. He had stared at the meal on his tray table, as immobilized as if bound to his seat, until the stewardess took it away. Just before they reached the gate, the flight attendant arrived for the fat man's latest delivery. Mares eyed the bulging bottom of the bag in horror as it passed over his lap, but it didn't break. The heat slammed him as he left the plane. It didn't abate when he entered the terminal. The air was thick, hot syrup. The forest fires had downed power lines, and the air conditioning was off. So were the lights. So were the computers and telephones. Somehow the ticketing staff were still working, though Mares couldn't imagine how. He joined the endless line and began shuffling forward. He shuffled for five hours. At the end of that time, when he was nearing starvation, the agent told him he hadn't a hope of a connection to his home. But he could put Mares on a flight to Dallas-Fort Worth, where his chances would be better— the flight would leave in nine hours. Mares roamed the oven-like interior of the airport. None of the restaurants and snack bars were open. With no refrigeration and no electricity to run the stoves, there was no point. The bars were open and serving warm beer, but had not so much as a pretzel. People sat wilted in their chairs, stunned by the heat, looking out over the ashen landscape. A nuclear holocaust might look a lot like this, Mares thought. A few profiteers were selling ice water at five dollars a bottle. The lines were enormous. Mares found a clear space against a wall and sat down on his luggage. When he leaned forward, sweat dripped off his nose. He heard a commotion and saw a man approaching with boxes on a hand truck. He was the Pied Piper of Atlanta, trailed by a mob of jostling people. He stopped at an empty vending machine. When he opened the front, someone in the crowd started pulling at a box. Someone else grabbed the other end. The box burst and spilled Snickers bars on the floor. In moments, all the boxes had been torn open. When the tide ebbed away, the delivery man sat on the floor, feeling himself cautiously. Amazed, he hadn't been ripped to shreds. He got up and wandered away. Mares had snagged a bag of peanuts and the three musketeers. He ate every bite, then made himself as comfortable as possible against the wall and nodded off. 
A lost soul was screaming. Mares opened his eyes, found himself curled up over his possessions, a rope of drool coming from his mouth. He wiped it away and sat up. Across the concourse, a man in the remains of a suit and tie had gone berserk. Air, he shrieked. I gotta have air. His shirt was torn at the neck, his coat on the floor. He swung a fire axe at a plate glass window. The axe bounced off, and he swung it again, shattering the glass. He leaned out the window and tried to breathe the smoke outside. He shouted again and began struggling with his pants. His hands were spouting blood, deeply slashed on the jagged sill, but he didn't seem to notice. Off he ran, naked but for his pants trailing from one ankle and a blue silk tie like a noose around his neck. Half a dozen security guards converged on him. They hit the man with their nightsticks and sprayed pepper in his face. They zapped him with tasers until he flopped around like a fish, slick with his own blood. Then they cuffed and hog-tied him and carried him away. The flight to Dallas was another 727. Half the passengers were under ten years old, in Atlanta for a peewee beauty contest. The boys were in tuxedos and the girls in evening gowns, or what was left of them after twenty-four hours living rough at the airport with no luggage. Some of them were cranky, and some were playful, and all were spoiled rotten. So they either sat in their seats and screamed, or turned the aisle into a rough-and-tumble racetrack. Supervision consisted of the occasional fistfight between fathers when a child's nose was bloodied. Mares had a window seat, next to a father who spent the whole flight carping about the judging. His son had not made the finals. The son, who Mares felt should have been left out for wolves to devour along with the afterbirth, sat on the aisle and spent his time tripping running children. There was no meal. The catering services had been just as crippled as the snack bars at the airport. Mares was given a pack of salted peanuts. Dallas-Fort Worth, DFW it had been raining forty days and forty nights when the 727 landed. The runways were invisible under sheets of water. The mud between the taxiways was so deep and thick it swallowed jetliners like mammoths in a tar pit. Mares saw three planes mired to the wingtips. Passengers were deplaning into knee-deep muck, slogging toward buses unable to get any closer lest they sink and never be seen again. The airport was almost empty. DFW was operating in spite of the weather, but flights were not arriving from other major hubs. Mares made it to the ticket counter, where the small line moved at glacial speed, because only one agent had made it through the floods. When his turn came, he was told all flights to his home had been cancelled, but he could board a flight to Denver in six hours, where a connection could be made. It was on another airline, so he would have to take the automated tram to another terminal. On the way to the tram, he stopped at a phone booth. There was no dial tone. The one next to it was dead, too. All the public telephones in the airport were dead. The flood had washed them out. He knew his wife must be very worried by now. There had been no time for a call from O'Hare, and Atlanta and now Dallas were cut off. But surely the situation would be on the news. She would know he was stranded somewhere. It would be great to get back home to Annie. Annie and his two lovely daughters, Kimberly and... He stopped walking, seized by panic. His heart was hammering. He couldn't recall the name of his youngest daughter. The airport was spinning around him, about to fly into a million pieces. Megan! Her name was Megan! God, I must be punchy, he thought. Well, who wouldn't be? The hunger had made him lightheaded. He breathed deeply and moved off toward the tram. The door had closed behind him before he noticed the man lying on the floor at the other end of the car. There was no one else on board. The man was curled up in a pool of vomit and spilled purple wine. He wore a filthy short jacket and had a canvas duffel bag at his feet. He looked like the man Mares had seen on arrival in Chicago, though that hardly seemed likely. The tram had made a few automated announcements, then pulled away from the concourse and out into the rain. It was pitch black. The rain pounded on the roof. There were flashes of distant lightning and a high, whistling wind. The tram pulled into the next concourse, and the doors opened. Three security guards in khaki uniforms stormed aboard. Without warning, one of them kicked the sleeping vagrant in the face. The man cried out, and the guards began battering him with their batons and boots. 
Blood and rotten teeth fountained from the man's mouth and nose. Peter Mares sat very still, his feet and knees drawn together protectively. One of the security men took a handful of the screaming man's hair, and another grabbed the seat of his pants, and they dragged him through the rear door of the tram and onto the platform. The third looked over at Mares. He smiled, touched the brim of his hat with his nightstick, and followed the others. The door closed, and the tram moved away. Mares could see the three still beating the man as the car moved out into the night. Just short of the next concourse, the lights flickered and went out, and the tram car stopped. Rain hammered down relentlessly. It gushed in rivers over the windows. Mares got up and paced his end of the car. He was careful not to walk as far as the stain of wine, urine, and blood at the other end, which looked black in the light of distant street lamps. He thought about what he had seen and about his family waiting for him back home. He had never wanted so badly to get home. After a few hours, the lights came back on, and the tram delivered him to the right concourse. He had to hurry to make the flight on time. This time he was on a wide-bodied aircraft, a DC-10. There were not many passengers. He was assigned an aisle seat. The takeoff was a little bumpy, but once at altitude the plane rode smooth as a Cadillac on a showroom floor. This late at night he was given a box containing a tuna sandwich, a package of cookies, and some grapes. He ate it all and was grateful. By the window was an old man wearing an overcoat and a fedora. All those lights down there, the old man said, gesturing toward the window. All those little towns, little lives. Makes you wonder, huh? About what? Mayor said. You don't feel a part of the world when you're up here, the man said. Those people down there, going about their lives, us up here, disconnected. They look up, see a few flashing lights. That's us. Mares had no idea what the codger was getting at, but he nodded. Used to be the same feeling in my day. Trains back then, night trains. When you're traveling, you're out of your life, going from somewhere to somewhere else, not really knowing where you are. You could lie there in your berth and look out the window at the night. Moonlight, starlight, hear the crossing signals as you pass them, see the trucks waiting. Who was driving them? More lost souls. He fell silent, looking out at the lights below. Mares hoped that was the end of it. I always wear a hat now, the old man went on. Had a little haberdasher shop in Oklahoma City. Opened it right after the war. Not far from where that building blew up. Got into the haberdashery business just in time for men to stop wearing hats. He chuckled. One day it's 1949, everybody wears hats. Then it's 1950. Suddenly all the hats are gone. Some say it was Eisenhower. I didn't wear hats much. Well, I did okay. Sold a lot of cufflinks, men's hosiery, silk handkerchiefs. Now I travel, mostly at night. Mares smiled pleasantly and nodded. You ever feel that way? Cut off? Trapped in something you don't understand? He didn't give Mares time to answer. I recall the first time I thought of it. Got my discharge in New Jersey, nineteen and forty-six. I took the train under the river. Came out where that World Trade Center is now. Say, they bombed that, too, didn't they? Anyway, I thought I'd see Times Square. I went to the subway token booth, not much bigger than a phone booth, and there's this little gnome in there. Dirty window, bars in front, a dip in the wooden counter so money could slide under the window, back and forth, money in, tokens out. It looked like that dip had been worn in the wood, over the years, over the centuries, like a glacier cutting through solid rock. I slid over my nickel, and he slid back a token, and I asked him how to get to Times Square. He mumbled something. I had to ask him to repeat it, and he mumbled again. This time I got it, and I took my token. All that time he never looked at me, never looked up from that worn dip in the wood. I watched him for a while, and he never looked up. He answered more questions, and I thought he probably knew the route and schedule of every train in that system, where to get off, where to transfer. And I got the funniest thought. I was convinced he never left that booth, that he was a prisoner in there, a creature of the night, a troll down in the underground darkness where it was never daytime that he'd long ago resigned himself to his lot, which was to sell tokens. The old man fell quiet, 
looking out the window and nodding to himself. Well, Mayor said reluctantly, the night shift comes to an end, you know. It does? Sure. The sun comes up. Somebody comes to relieve the guy. He goes home to his wife and children. Used to, maybe, the old man said. Used to. Now he's trapped. Something happened. I don't know what. And he came loose from our world where the sun eventually does come up. But does it have to? Well, of course it does. Does it? Seems to me it's been a long time since I've seen the sun. Seems I've been on this airplane ever so long, and I have no way of telling that it's actually getting anywhere. Maybe it isn't. Maybe the plane will never land. It'll just keep on its way from somewhere to somewhere else, just like that train a long time ago. Maris didn't like the conversation. He was about to say something to the old man when he was touched lightly on the shoulder. He looked up to see a stewardess leaning toward him. Sir, the captain would like to speak to you in the cockpit. For a moment the words simply didn't register. Captain? Cockpit? Sir, if you just come this way. Mayers got up, glanced at the old man, who smiled and waved. At first he could see little in the darkened cockpit. In front of the plane was clear night, stars, the twinkling lights of small towns. Then he saw the empty flight engineer's seat to his right. As he moved forward, he kicked empty cans. The cabin smelled of beer and cigar smoke. The captain turned around and gestured. "'Clear the crap off that and sit down,' he said, around the cigar clamped in his teeth. Mares moved a pizza box with stale crusts off the co-pilot's chair and slid into it. The pilot unfastened his harness and got up. "'If I don't take a crap in thirty seconds, I'm going to do it in my drawers,' he said, and started toward the rear. "'Just hold her steady.' "'Hey, wait a goddamn minute. "'You got a problem with that? "'Problem? "'I don't know how to fly an airplane. "'What's to know?' "'The pilot was dancing up and down, "'but pointed to the instruments. "'That's your compass. "'Keep her right where she is, three one zero. "'This here's her altimeter. thirty-two thousand feet. "'But don't you have an autopilot?' "'Packed it in weeks ago,' the pilot muttered, "'and banged hard with his fist on an area "'with dials that weren't lit up. Bastard. Look, I really gotta go. And Mares was alone in the cockpit. He had a wild notion to just get up, pretend this never happened, return to his seat. Surely the pilot would come back. It had to be some sort of joke. The plane seemed level and steady. He touched the column lightly, felt the plane nose down the tiniest bit, saw the altimeter move slowly. He pulled, and the big bird settled back at thirty-two thousand. He quickly learned the biggest problem a pilot faced on a long night flight. Boredom. There was nothing to do but glance at the two dials from time to time. His mind wandered back to what the old man had been saying. And it just didn't add up. Well, of course the plane was getting somewhere. He could see the lights moving beneath him. Those brighter lights at the horizon. Could that be Denver? As for the sun not rising, that was just ridiculous. The world turned. One moment followed another. Eventually it was day. The pilot came back in a cloud of cigar smoke. He reached into an open cooler near his seat and got out a can of beer, popped the top, and drained it in one gulp. He belched, crushed the can, and tossed it over his shoulder. "'Looks like I fucked up,' he said, with no apparent concern. "'Sent for the wrong guy. Sorry about that, partner.' He laughed. "'What do you mean?' "'Thought you was in the know.' Looks like it was that old guy. Somebody wrote down the wrong seat number. Who's running this fucking airline, anyway? Mares would have liked to know the same thing. Don't you have a co-pilot? What do you mean, in the know? Co-pilot had him a little accident. Night cops. They broke his fucking arm for him. He's in the hospital. The man shuddered. Could be three, four months yet till he gets out. For a broken arm? The pilot gave him a tired look. He jerked his thumb back toward the cabin. Screw, why don't you? Get out of here. You'll get it, one of these days. Mares stared at him, then got up. He's dead anyway, the pilot said. Who's dead? The pilot ignored him. Mares made his way down the aisle. The old man seemed asleep. His eyes were slightly open, and so was his mouth. Mares reached over and lightly touched the old man's hand. It was cold. 
A big fly with a metallic blue back crawled out of the old man's nostril and stood there, rubbing its hideous forelegs together. Mares was out of his seat like a shot. He hurried five rows forward and collapsed into an empty seat. He was breathing hard. He couldn't work up any spit. Later he saw the stewardess put a blue blanket over the old man. Denver. D-E-N. Tonight it made Chicago seem like Bermuda. The sky was hard and fuming as dry ice, and the color of a hollow-point bullet. Temperature a few degrees below zero, but add in the wind chill, and it was cold enough to freeze rubber to the runway. The huge plate-glass windows rattled and bulged as Mares lurched down the concourse, his luggage caroming off his hips, ribs, and knees. A chill reached right through the floor and swept around his feet. He hurried into the men's room and set his bags down on the floor. He ran water in the sink and splashed it on his face. The room echoed with each drop of water. He couldn't bear to look at himself in the mirror. He had to find the airline ticket counter, had to get his boarding pass, needed to find the gate, board the plane, make his connection. He had to get home. Something told him to get out. Get out now. Leave everything. Go. He walked quickly through the nearly deserted departure area, slammed through the doors and out onto the frozen sidewalk. He hurried to the front of a row of taxis. It was an old yellow checker, a big, boxy, friendly sort of car. He got in the back. Where to, Mac? Downtown, a good hotel. You got it. The cab driver put his car in gear and carefully pulled out onto the packed snow and ice. Soon they were moving down the wide road away from the airport. Mares looked out the back window. The Denver airport was like a cubist prairie schooner, a big, horribly expensive tent to house modern transients. "'One ugly mother, ain't she?' the cabbie said. Mares saw the cab driver in profile as the man looked in the rearview mirror. Bushy eyebrows under an old-fashioned yellow checker cab hat with a shiny black brim. A wide face, chin covered with stubble, big hands on the wheel. The name on the cab medallion was V. K-R-Z-Y-W-C-Z, -Z, a New York medallion. Criswas, the man provided. Virgil Criswas. Us Polacks, we sold all our vowels to the frogs. Now we use all the consonants the Russians didn't have no use for. He chuckled. Aren't you a little far from home? Mares ventured. Let me tell you a little story, Criswas said. Once upon a time, a thousand years ago, for all I know, I was taking this fair in from LaGuardia to the Marriott Times Square. I figure that time of night, the Triborough, down the Roosevelt, there you are. But this guy'd looked at a map. It's got to be the BQE, then the Midtown Tunnel. Okay, I says, it's your money. And what do you know, we make pretty good time. Only, coming out of the tunnel, what do I see? Not the Empire State, but that fucking bitch of a terminal building. I'm in Denver. I never been to Denver. So I looks back over my shoulder. Criswas suited the action to his words, and Mares got a whiff of truly terrible breath. And no tunnel. Just a lot of cars honking at me, me being stopped in my tracks. And that's the way it's been ever since. Criswas accelerated through a yellow light and up onto an icy freeway. Mares saw a green sign indicating downtown. Straight ahead, just above the horizon, was a full moon. Traffic was light, not surprising, since the roadway was frozen hard. It didn't bother the cabbie, and the old checker was steady as a rock. "'So you decided to stay out here?' Mares asked. "'Decided didn't have nothing to do with it. You figure I went on a bender, drove here in a blackout, something like that?' Criswas looked over his shoulder at Mares. In a sweep of street-lamp light, Mares saw the left side of the driver's face was black and swollen. His left eye was shut. There was a long, scabbed-over wound on his cheek, a slash that had not been stitched. "'Well, suit yourself. Fact is, none of these roads go to New York. And believe me, buddy, I've tried them all.' Mares didn't know what to make of that statement. "'What happened to your face?' he asked. "'This? Had a little run-in with the night cops. A headlight out, would you believe it? I got lucky. One whack upside the head, and they let me go. Hell, I've had a lot worse.' A lot worse. Hadn't the pilot said something about night cops? They had sent his co-pilot to the hospital. Something was very wrong here. What do you mean, these roads don't go to New York? 
It's an interstate highway. They all connect. You're trying to make sense, Criswaz said. You'd better learn to stop that. What are you trying to tell me? Mares asked, feeling his frustration rise. What's going on? You mean, are we in the fucking twilight zone or something? Criswaz looked at Mares again, then back to the road, shaking his head. You got me, pal. I think we're in Denver, all right. Only it's like Denver is all twisted up or something. We're in hell, a voice said over the radio. Ah, shut the fuck up, Moskovitz, you stupid kike. It's the only thing that makes sense, the voice of Moskovitz said. It don't make no damn sense to me, Kriswaz shouted into his mic. Look around you. You see any guys with pitchforks? Horns? You seen any burning pits full of... full of... Brimstone? Mares suggested. There you go. Brimstone, he gestured with the mic. Moskovitz, my dispatcher, he explained to Mares. You seen any lost souls screaming? I've heard plenty of screaming souls of the radio, Moskovitz said. I scream sometimes myself, and I sure as shit am lost. Listen to him, Chris was, said with a chuckle. I gotta listen to this shit every night. Why do you think it's gotta be guys with horns? Moskovitz went on. That guy, that Dante, you think everything he said was right? Moskovitz reads books, the cabbie said over his shoulder. Why do you figure hell has to stay the same? You think they don't remodel? Look how many people there are today. Where are they going to put them? In the new suburbs, that's where. Hell used to have boats and horse wagons. Now it's got jet airplanes and cabs. And night cops and hospitals, don't forget that. Shut your mouth, you dumb hunky, Moskovitz shouted. You know I don't want nobody to talk about that over my radio. Sorry, sorry. Kriswas smirked over his shoulder and shrugged. Hey, what can you do? Mares smiled back weakly. It don't make sense any other way, Moskovitz went on. My life is hell. Your life is hell. Everybody you get in that freaking cab is living in hell. We died and gone to hell. Kriswas was furious again. Died, is it? You remember dying, huh, Moskovitz? You sit in that stinking office living on pizza and seven-up. Nothing happens for months in that shithole. You'd think you'd notice a thing like dying. Heart attack, Moskowitz shouted back. I must have had a heart attack, and I floated out of my body, and they put me here, right where I was before, only now it's forever, and now I can't leave. Either it's hell or limbo. Ah, limbo up a rope. What's a Jew know about limbo? Or hell? He switched off the radio, glanced again at Mears. I think he means purgatory. You want to know from hell, you ask a Catholic Polak. We know hell. Mares had finally had enough. I think you're both crazy, he said defiantly. Yeah, Criswaz agreed. We ought to be. We've been here long enough. He studied Mares in his mirror. But you don't know, buddy. I could tell soon as you got in my cab. You're one of those airplane pukes. Round and round you go, schlepping your Gucci suitcases. Cost what I make in a month. In and out of airports, off planes, onto planes. Round and round and you think things are still making sense. You still think tomorrow comes after today, and all roads go everywhere. You think that cause the sun went down, it's going to come up again. You think two plus two is always going to equal three. Four, Mayor said. Huh? Two plus two equals four. Well, pal, two plus two, sometimes it equals. You can't get there from here. Sometimes two plus two equals a kick in the balls and a nightstick upside the head and a tunnel that don't go to Manhattan no more. Don't ask me why, cause I don't know. If this is hell, then I guess we was bad, right? But I'm not that bad a guy. I went to mass. I didn't commit no crimes. But here I am. I got no home but this cab. I eat out of drive throughs and I piss in beer bottles. I slipped off a something somewhere as I fell out of the world where you could go home after your shift. I turned into one of the night people like you. Mares was not going to protest that he wasn't one of the night people, whatever they were. He was a little afraid of the mad cabbie. But he couldn't follow the logic of it, and that made him stubborn. So, we're in a different world, that's what you're saying? Nah, we're still in a world. We're right here. We've always been here. Night people. Only nobody don't notice us, that we're in a box. The hooker on the stroll. 
They think she goes home when the sun comes up with her pimp and the purple caddy. Only they don't never go home. The street they're on, it don't lead home. That lonely DJ you hear on the radio, the subway motorman, it's night there all the time. The guy driving the long-haul truck, janitors, night watchmen. All of them? How do I know all of them? I'm going to drive my cab in an office building, ask the cleaning crew, Hey, you're stuck in purgatory like me? Not me. Yeah, you airplane pukes. Most of us, we know. Oh, some of them, they gone bug-fuck. Nothing left of them but eyeballs like gopher holes. But you've been here long enough, you stop thinking you're going to find that tunnel back home, you know? Except you passengers. Like they says in the program, in... Denial. In denial. You said it. Look ahead there. Mares looked out the windshield, and there it was, just below the yellow moon, the sprawling canopy of the Denver airport, like some exotic poison rainforest caterpillar. He stared at it as the cab eased down an off-ramp. Always a full moon in Denver, Criswas cackled. Makes it nice for the werewolves, and all roads lead to the airport, which is bad news for airplane pukes. Mares threw open the cab door and spilled out onto the frozen roadway. He scrambled to his feet, hearing the shouts of the driver. He clambered up an embankment and onto the freeway, where he dodged six lanes of traffic and tumbled down the other side. There were a lot of closed businesses there, warehouses, car lots, and one that was open, a Circle K market. He ran toward it, certain it would vanish like a mirage. But when he hit the door, it was wonderfully prosaic and solid. Inside, it was warm. Two clerks, a tall black youth and a teenage white girl, stood behind the counter. He paced up and down the abbreviated aisles, hoping he looked like someone who belonged there. When he heard the door security buzzer, he picked up a box of cereal and pretended to study it. He saw two police officers walk past the counter. They've come for me, he thought. But the cops walked toward the back of the store. One opened the beer cooler, while the other took a box and loaded it with doughnuts. Both officers passed within ten feet of him. One had two six-packs of Coors, hooked in a black-gloved hand, and he cradled a huge black weapon that had a shotgun bore, but a fat round magazine like a Tommy gun. The other wore two automatic pistols on her belt. She glanced at Mayers and gave him a smile, both insolent and sexual. She wore bright red lipstick. They strolled past the clerks, who were very busy with other things, things that put their backs to the police officers. They went out the door. There was a moment of silence, then a huge explosion. Mayor saw a plate-glass window shatter. Beyond it, the male cop was firing his shotgun into the store as fast as he could pump it. His partner had a gun in each hand. He hit the floor in a snowstorm of cornflakes and shredded toilet paper, both cops were emptying their weapons, and they had a lot of ammunition. But finally it was over. In the silence he heard the police laughing, then opening their car doors. He got to his knees and peeked over the ruined display counter. The patrol car was backing out. He caught a glimpse of the woman drinking from a beer can as the cruiser pulled out on the road. In a second a yellow checker cab pulled into the lot, the battered face of Criswas behind the wheel. He saw mares and motioned frantically. Shattered glass and raisin bran crunched under his feet as Mares walked down the aisle. Behind the counter the black man was crouched down near the safe. The girl was lying on her back in a pool of blood, holding her gut and moaning. Mares hesitated. Then Criswas leaned on the horn. He turned his back on the girl and pushed out through the aluminum door frame, empty now of glass. Criswas took it slow and careful out of the lot. Parked off to the left was the police car. Headlights turned off, facing them. Mares couldn't breathe, but Criswas turned the other way and the police car did not move. They'll be pigging out on beer and sinkers for a while, the cabbie said. That girl, she... She'll be all right. Criswas pointed ahead at flashing red lights. In a moment an ambulance rushed by in the other direction. He hunched down in his seat until it had gone by. Eventually... What is it with the hospital? Mayers asked. Moscovitz didn't even— Hospitals is where you get hurt, Criswaz said. There's diseases in hospitals. Your wounds, they get infected. They give you the wrong pills, make you puke your guts up. All kinds of things can go wrong. Then you hear about the experiments. He shook his head. 
Better to stay out. Them night doctors and night nurses, they ain't human. Mayors asked, but Criswas would say no more about experiments. The cab pulled up to the terminal building and Mayors got out. He ran. They fired at him, but he kept running. They chased him, but he was pretty sure now they had lost him. He was out on the runways. A fog had moved in. The terminal was no longer visible. This was no place for a human being, even on a summer night. He kept moving, avoiding the lumbering, shrieking silver whales that taxied through the darkness. He stopped by a low, poisonous blue strobe light that drove cold ice picks into his eyeballs every time it flashed. He had no idea where he was, no idea where to go. Help me. It was more whimper than word. It came from just beyond the range of the light. For the love of God! Something was crawling toward him. It moved slowly into the light, a human figure, pulling itself along with bloody hands. Mares fell back a step. Please help me. It was Eduardo from the O'Hare snack bar. His white shirt was a few blood-soaked scraps, black in the alien light. His pants were gone. One of his legs was gone, too, torn off. Shattered white thigh bone protruded. Mares became aware of others. Like beasts hovering beyond the range of the campfire, figures were suggested by a blue steel glint, a patch of pale cheek. They were darkened patches against the black of night. They wore fighter pilot black visors, black helmets, terminator sunglasses. Shiny black boots, belts, and jackets creaked like motorcycle cops. Somewhere out there were ranks of black Harleys, he was sure of it. He smelled gun oil and old leather. There were other shapes, other beasts. These were black, too, with fangs, snarling blue in the night. They strained at their leashes, silently. Mares began to back away. If he didn't make a sudden movement, they might not come after him. Perhaps they hadn't even seen him. Soon the shapes were swallowed back into the fog. Not once had he seen a distinct human figure. Something brushed against his leg. He did not look down, but kept backing. Dark areas on the ground, seen peripherally, resembled body parts, but they were moving. He heard a distant siren, saw flashing red and blue lights. A boxy white ambulance pulled up, a big orange stripe on its side with the words, Emergency Rescue. The rear doors flew open. The light inside was dim and reddish. The angle was wrong for mares to see very far inside. A black cloud of flies exploded into the air. He could hear them buzzing. A thick black fluid seeped over the floor and ran over the bumper to pool on the frozen ground, steaming. Mares understood that in white light the stuff would be dark and red. From the far side of the ambulance men and women appeared, clad in crisp whites or baggy surgical blues. They all wore gauze masks. The masks, their rubber-gloved hands, and their clothing were all spattered with gore. None of them had horns or carried pitchforks. Their attitude was efficient and workmanlike. The doctors and nurses lifted Eduardo and tossed him into the open ambulance doors like a sack of laundry. One nurse loomed out of the fog with Eduardo's leg. The leg was twitching. She tossed it after Eduardo. Mares was going backward at a walking pace now. A man in blue surgical scrubs looked in his direction. All the rest did, too. He turned and ran. The world began to spin again, and this time it did not stop. He felt himself flying apart, and when he came back together, not everything fit in just the same way it had before. He felt much better. He was smiling. He had found the terminal building again. He stood there on the sidewalk for a moment, getting his breathing under control. A big man with a battered face stood leaning against a taxi painted bright yellow with a checkerboard stripe down the side. The man held up a thumb. When Mares stared at him blankly, the cabbie switched to his middle finger and muttered something about airplane pukes. Mares brushed snow and ice from his overcoat and ran his hands through his unruly hair. He entered the terminal. Inside were Christmas lights, tinsel and holly. It was jammed with a sea of humanity, few of them showing any Christmas spirit. He glanced to his left, and there was his luggage, sitting neatly against the wall. Mares hefted his possessions. Someone had put a strip of silver duct tape over the gash in his carry-on. Mares was still smiling after three hours in line. The harried ticket agent smiled back at him and told him there was no chance of reaching his home that night. 
You won't get home for Christmas morning, she said, but I can get you on a flight to Chicago that's leaving in a few minutes. That'll be fine, Mayor said, smiling. She wrote out the ticket. Happy holidays, she said. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mayor said. They were already announcing his flight. To Chicago, with stops at Amarillo, Oklahoma City, Topeka, Omaha, Rapid City, Fargo, Duluth, and Des Moines. Christmas, Mayors thought, everyone trying to go somewhere at once. Pity the poor business traveler caught in the middle of it, puddle jumping through most of the medium-sized cities on the Great Plains. It sounded like air travel hell. But he took heart. Soon he would be home with his family, home with his sweet wife and his lovely children. He was sure he'd think of their names in a moment. He shouldered his burdens like Marley's ghost, shouldered the chains he had forged in life, and shuffled along with the slow crowd toward his boarding gate. He would be home in no time, no time at all. Introduction to Good Intentions I'm proud of this story for two reasons. One is that the editor at Playboy told me she never thought she'd buy a Deal with the Devil story. Every editor in the world has rejected a hundred Deal with the Devil stories. Along with Adam and Eve stories, the last man and woman on earth after a war, epidemic, whatever, turn out to be named, Adam and Eve, they are universally dreaded. Well, I never expected to write a Deal with the Devil story either, but when you get an idea that feels the least bit original, you have to go with it. The other thing I'm proud of is selling it to Playboy. For most freelance writers, a sale to Playboy is a sort of holy grail. This doesn't have a lot to do with whether one loves or hates the magazine itself. The attraction is very simple. I was paid $5,000 for this story. I normally wouldn't reveal that figure, but I do have a point here. There may be writers out there who would not publish in Playboy for political reasons, but I don't know any. When the story was to appear, I went downtown to Powell's Books. This store is one of the many reasons to live in beautiful Portland, Oregon. It is by far the largest bookstore I have ever seen, and maybe the largest in the English-speaking world. They carry new and used books on the same shelves, and magazines, talking books, whatever you want in literature, they've got it at Powell's. Except Playboy. I was shocked. Frankly, it never occurred to me that the store wouldn't carry it. When I was young in Port Arthur, Texas, certain magazines were kept either behind the counter or under the counter in the shady bookstores and newsstands that carried them at all. Among them were things like Sunshine and Health, a black-and-white nudist magazine that provided me and my friends some much-needed education. Our first basic understanding of female anatomy in those pre-sex education days. Playboy was behind the counter. During the sixties, all those magazines and many more we couldn't even have imagined in 1958 came out into the open. They called it the sexual revolution. Now in many places all those magazines have gone back under the counter. Why? Because some people find some or all of their content objectionable. In the case of Playboy, it is the photographs of nude women. I'm not going to indulge in a diatribe about political correctness here, though I believe it is one of the more noisome scourges of our age. It just seems ironic how things have come full circle. It used to be that if caught with a copy of Playboy, one would scoff and say, Oh, I just buy it for the writing. Yeah, right. But it could be true. The list of serious fiction writers and essayists and political commentators who have contributed to this magazine over the years would run on for many pages. One science fiction writer contributor who comes to mind is Ursula K. Le Guin. I don't feel the need to apologize for being in her company. And besides, they pay obscenely well. Good Intentions Joseph Hardy sat in the ruins of his congressional campaign early in the morning of the first Wednesday in November and wondered if there was anything more humiliating than having tens of thousands of people reject you and all you stood for. Almost a year of kissing babies, eating rubber chicken, and guzzling untold carloads of Maalox, ten thousand doors knocked on, a hundred thousand hands shaken, a marriage in trouble, and it had all come to this. A man alone in a big empty hall, littered with squashed cigarette butts, red, white, and blue bunting drooping to the floor. 
Vote for hardy signs nailed to wooden laths lay stacked like Confederate rifles at Appomattox. In one corner, two dozen bottles of cheap California champagne sat unopened in galvanized tubs full of melting ice. On to this stage of dashed hopes, as he had so many times before, strode the devil. Hardy knew at once that this was Satan, though he looked not at all remarkable, and though the only commotion created by his appearance was among the caucus of exhausted balloons that squabbled briefly along the floor in his wake. Satan stopped a few feet from where Hardy sat, regarded him silently for a time, and then nodded slowly. "'Well, Joe,' he said quietly, "'what do you say?' You've got to be kidding. The devil simply shook his head and waited. I never wanted this job in the first place. They talked me into it. They said Haggerty was getting too old. It didn't matter if he carried this district with seventy percent two years ago. We need a young face. That's what we need, Joe, a young face. That face smiled at the devil and Joseph Hardy from a hundred campaign posters taped to the walls. It was a good-looking face, stopping short of Kennedy-esque. There was intelligence in it, mercifully not quite Stevensonian. Hardy wore horn-rimmed glasses befitting a college economics professor, which is what he was. He had good teeth. "'You can't lie to me, Joe,' Satan said. "'Yesterday you wanted it. We all saw your face when the early returns put you ahead. You wanted it more than you've ever wanted anything.' Hardy put his face into his hands and rubbed it for a long time. Then he looked up, exhausted. Talk to me, he said. The sun was coming up when they reached the final terms. I won't compromise any of my ideas, Hardy said. That's why I finally said yes. I think I can make a difference. It won't be a problem, Satan said calmly. I'm serious. No swaying with the winds. I don't care what the polls say. I won't alter a stand just to get votes. You won't have to. And no fat cats, no special interests. I want to limit campaign contributions to one hundred dollars, like Jerry Brown. Done. No negative advertising, no character assassination, no mudslinging, no Willie Horton. You're taking all the fun out of— All right, all right, done. And I get— A congressional seat in two years, in six, the presidency. Satan waited, asking without words if there were any more points to discuss. Then he went to the phone bank across the room. He punched in his AT&T credit card number and spoke briefly to the party at the other end. In a moment the fax machine began to hum, and he pulled out three pages of a contract. Taking out a ballpoint pen, he bent over a table and began marking up the boilerplate. Hardy read it twice, folded it, put it into his pocket. "'I'll run this past my lawyer,' he said, "'but I think we've got a deal.' I'll see you in his office tomorrow at three, said the devil. And in the meantime, he held out his hand. Hardy hesitated only a moment, then shook it. The devil's hand was warm and dry and firm. He'd been afraid it would be clammy. He hated that. What should I call you? Hardy asked. Nick will do just fine. I don't care much for his immortal soul, said the attorney, a worthy named Cheatham. And what's this about until the end of time? The customary term would be in perpetuity. It means eternally, Nick said, forever. Um, yes, yes, Cheatham frowned. Frankly, it seems like a long time. These are my standard terms. The duration is long, granted, but the reward is huge, and the payment... Frankly, sir, most courts would see it as trivial. It being difficult to establish a market value for an immortal soul, Cheatham said, nodding, I see your point. But look here. To be disposed of in whatever manner pleases the party of the first part. He looked howlishly over to Hardy. It's all very vague, Joseph. Let it stand, Mr. Cheatham. Very well, very well. But I still don't think that I can sign off on the time element here. A little palpitation of sparks appeared around Nick's eyebrows, unseen by the lawyer, who was studying the ceiling as if the solution to the impasse might be written there. And perhaps it was, for he soon looked down and said portentously, "'Why don't we make it a thousand years?' Nick laughed. "'I ask for eternity, and you offer a thousand? he said. Then he leaned forward. "'A billion years, my final offer.' 
They settled on 250,000 years, and Cheatham seemed satisfied. I imagine you'll want to show these amendments to your own attorneys, he said. No need, said Nick, hooking his thumbs in his vest. Harvard Law, class of 1735. While a secretary was preparing clean copies, a bottle of brandy was produced. Cheatham asked Nick what eventuality had led him to read for the law. The legal fees were eating me alive, Nick admitted. I saw which way the wind was blowing, and I can't tell you how handy it's been. Hardy took a stiff drink when the copies arrived and hardly hesitated before he signed. Nick bent over Cheatham's desk, then looked up at Hardy with a gleam in his eye. Don't worry, Joe, he said. I know ways of making a hundred thousand years seem like an eternity. He signed each of the three copies, then straightened and said, We should get started. How does tomorrow sound? Let's have lunch. They met at a Chinese place for dim sum. They each stacked half a dozen of the little plates brought to the table by girls pushing carts and finished half a pot of tea. I suppose you've been wondering how we'll go about this, Nick said. I've thought of nothing else. Simplest thing in the world. Nick produced a small bottle with a glass stopper and set it on the table. Concentrated charisma. Hardy picked it up, looked at it, pulled the stopper, and sniffed. Try not to spill it, Nick said. Pretend it's thousand-dollar an ounce perfume. Just dab some on your face once a day. Hardy applied some and felt nothing. Bit of a letdown, he muttered. Wait for it, Nick said, folding his arms. The stuff's hard to come by. I collect it where I can find it. Baptist revival meetings are good. Sometimes the stuff drips off the tent walls. You can find a bit around used car lots, salesmen's conventions, get-rich-quick real estate seminars, and, of course, every year I get a lot of the stuff at the Oscar ceremonies. He shrugged. I have to be out there anyway, so what the heck? I thought I recognized you, someone said, and Hardy looked up to see the two waitresses had converged on the table. They had been serving Joe and Nick for half an hour without incident. Joseph Hardy, said the other, putting her hand to her mouth. I voted for you, Joe. You and about three more, Hardy said. The waitresses laughed more than the feeble joke deserved. I didn't vote, the first one admitted, but if you run again, I sure will. Here, take this. It's on the house. It was some sort of meat-stuffed dumplings. Soon a buzz spread through the restaurant. The owner came by and tore up the check, and people began to ask for autographs. Nick sat back and watched. Then, during a lull, reached over and touched Hardy's sleeve. Tough being in the public eye, eh? What's that? Oh, Nick, sure. Why don't you try one of these dumplings with the spicy mustard? Far too hot for me, I'm afraid, Joseph. I'll be going now. You won't see me for another five years. Look for me at primary time. What's that? Hardy signed another napkin and glanced up. Oh, sure, primary time. Uh, is there anything else I should know, anything I need to do? Just stick to your principles. I'll take care of the rest. He frowned slightly, taking one more look at his candidate. Next time be plain old Joe, and get a haircut. See if you can find Dan Quayle's barber. The next five years passed like a montage in a Frank Capra film based on a Horatio Alger novel. Joseph, call me Joe Hardy, returned to the campus, and immediately his classes began to fill up. Within a term, the administration had twice moved him to a larger hall. The students loved his lectures and said he managed to make economics interesting for the first time ever. Applause was common. Strangers approached him on the street to pump his hand— Reporters asked his comments on political issues. The camera loved him, they said. Radio talk show hosts clamored for him to be interviewed and to field questions from callers. He had a folksy common touch that showed to good advantage on the local nightline knockoff, where his face became familiar to everyone in the state. Even his marriage improved. At the proper time, he announced his candidacy for Congress. Party bigwigs couldn't have been happier. Although his opponent outspent him three to one, the election was never in doubt. Joe Hardy led in the polls from the first, and the only question come election day was the margin of his victory. He was sent to Washington with a stunning mandate and very little political baggage. In D.C. he did a passable imitation of Jimmy Stewart for a few weeks, 
stumbling a few times, making a few mistakes as he got his office organized. But he was neither stupid nor innocent, and soon was offering bills and fending off political action committees, as if he'd done it all his life. His reputation as a straight shooter was quickly established. It could have been a handicap, but Joe Hardy knew when to compromise to get things done and when to stand fast on a matter of principle. He was a man you could do business with, but you couldn't buy him. He earned the respect of most of his colleagues, grudging at first, genuine soon after. There was jealousy, of course, from both parties. It wasn't every freshman congressman who had Ted Koppel calling every other week to ask him to debate George Will or Ted Kennedy. Few new faces rated a twenty-minute profile on Primetime Live. Hardy had an uncanny knack for picking up free exposure worth millions in a re-election campaign. He was returned for a second term by an even larger margin. No one was surprised when he threw his hat into the ring for the upcoming presidential race. Even a Capra movie must have trouble along the way, and some was brewing. Dark forces were gathering inside the Beltway, powerful forces stirring within think tanks, public relations firms, advertising agencies. Campaign committees representing his rivals from both parties began to circle Joe Hardy, sniffing for blood. Soon after his name started coming up as a presidential hopeful, his opponents began their research. It went from his birth to his last vote on the House floor. It was quickly established that he was not an escaped mass murderer, a homosexual, an IRA terrorist, or a communist spy. Still, the private detectives reading his grade school reports and interviewing every friend Hardy ever had were not discouraged. There were persistent rumors, whispered here and there, of something really big, some knockout punch, something to blow Joe Hardy out of the race before it had really begun. The peepers vowed to find it, whatever it was, if they had to track leads straight through hell. Which is exactly where the trail led them. One by one they had returned, battered, scorched, empty-handed, until one day a tall, thin, pimply fellow walked into the offices of the elect Peckham Committee and put a smoking document on the chairman's desk. It wasn't that tough, the hacker said smugly. Old Scratch could use better security software. I was in and out of his hard disks before anybody knew what was happening. Joe Hardy in pact with Lucifer, screamed the headline of the Manchester Union leader, two weeks before the New Hampshire primary. Next to the damning article was another, quoting a CBS Wall Street Journal poll conducted minutes after the announcement. Joe's standing had plummeted. He now stood only two percentage points above the chief rival for his party's nomination, Senator Peckham. Nick found Joe secluded in his office. Joe leaped to his feet. "'How could you do this to me?' he screamed. "'Calm down, Joe. Just calm down. All is not lost. The deal was supposed to be confidential. I know, Joe, and I couldn't be sorrier. I've hired a new security consultant, but the cat's out of the bag,' he said. "'So stuff him back in. You're—well, you know who you are. Can't you do that?' "'Unfortunately, my powers have limitations, Joe. I can't change what's already happened. As for that cat, however—' And now he smiled. I've always preferred to skin it, and I know more than one way. Tonight, Jay's guests are from Beverly Hills 90210, Jason Priestley, Congressman Joe Hardy, and special guest, Satan, Prince of Darkness. And now, Jay Leno. It was rough at first, as they'd known it would be. Leno skewered them during the monologue. But when Joe and Nick were finally seated, the tide began to turn. The two of them seemed relaxed, not at all ashamed or defensive, and, well, interesting. The audience wasn't on their side yet, but they were willing to listen. So, when the talk turned serious, Joe offered information about something that hadn't got much play in the press, the terms of the contract. "'If I had it to do all over,' Joe said with a pensive frown, "'would I?' "'I really don't know, Jay.' But you read it yourself. Of all the candidates in this race, I am the only one guaranteed not to stoop to attack advertising. You saw it there in black and white. I won't abandon a stand I've taken for a cheap political motive. There'll be no flip-flopping on the issues from Joe Hardy. I won't say one thing in Boston and something else in Atlanta. I want to be your president, and I want to do it solely with the small contributions of the working class and the middle class of this great country. I can't do otherwise. 
It's in my contract. And if he were to break it, Nick said with a devilish grin, I'd be sure to give him hell. The next day, on the Joan Rivers show, Nick tackled the question of his role as the great adversary with a casual wave of his hand. That's been blown way out of proportion, he said. Remember, he and I used to be good friends. We had a falling out, it's true, but he did create me, and I'm part of his plan. You might say I'm just doing my job. The grin on his face as he said this was infectious. To Arsenio, Nick said, I have to say this Lord of Evil business is mostly a bad rap, my friend. Darkness, yes, but that can be cool. Discussing his methods with Regis and Kathy Lee, Nick said, We both move in mysterious ways, God and me. It's true I am out to get your soul, and I do send it to hell, but have you been there lately? That's exactly where Dan Rather went with the television crew. He reported back with footage that suggested a medium-security federal prison. We saw no fire and brimstone, Rather said, wearing his Afghan war safari jacket. Make of that what you will. We were not given free run of the facilities. Still, all in all, Manuel Noriega doesn't have it much better than what we were shown. Geraldo sneaked to the outskirts of Hades shortly afterward, was roughed up by succubi, and was ejected. He claimed to have been sucker-punched by the head succubus, but she denied everything and had a lurid videotape to back her story. When it aired the tape, a current affair drew an enormous audience rating. Oprah claimed to be worried by something. Could one love God and still deal with Satan? Nick convulsed her audience by retorting, Me and God? It's true we don't double date. Think of us as Siskel and Ebert. Slowly, Joe edged back up in the polls as voters adjusted to the new playing field. Many seemed to feel they'd faced considerably worse choices most election years. On primary day, New Hampshireman slogged through a snowstorm to give Hardy 38 percent of the vote, ten points more than his nearest rival. The nearest rival was Senator Peter Peckham, and upon viewing the exit polls, Peckham slammed his fist onto his desk and growled to his assembled campaign staff, "'That's enough of that crap. You're all fired.' He was on the telephone before the last of them had scampered through the door. Within the hour, he had spoken to Phillips Petroleum, General Motors, Matsushita, Dow Chemical, McDonnell Douglas, Toshiba, and was working his way through the Fortune 500. The message was the same. I need lots of money, and I need it now. Send it, and I'm your boy. It was very much like a stock offering. By midnight, he was a wholly owned subsidiary, and the money was pouring into offshore laundries from Bemini to the Cayman Islands. His last act before retiring for the night was to hire a new campaign manager, a man by the name of Yerkimov, famous for engineering the re-election of an 82-year-old senator from a southern Tidewater state shortly after that worthy's conviction on a charge of statutory rape. Yerkimov hired the advertising firm of Mayard and Shyskov, the charity Crackerjack Public Relations Agency, a top pollster, a speechwriter, and a political psychologist. By the time the sun set on the ruins of New Hampshire, the revivified Peckham campaign had come out of its corner swinging. "'Let me show you something, Joe,' Nick said, pressing a button on a VCR remote control. On the screen, in grainy black and white, Japanese torpedo bombers swooped over Pearl Harbor. The Arizona exploded and sank. Hordes of troops raised rising sun flags and shouted, Banzai! and a deep, concerned voice said, The Matsushita Company likes Senator Peckham. Sony likes him, too, and so does Toshiba. If they didn't, they wouldn't be fondling millions into his campaign through their fat-cat lobbyists and special-interest political action committees. Joe Hardy stands for the American worker. Who will you vote for? Joe Hardy or the senator from Toyota? Are you out of your mind? Hardy gasped, leaping from his seat. Just thought I'd run it past you. Why don't you show the bomb falling on Hiroshima, too? Maybe I could take credit for that. Actually, the next one... Nick tapped another video cassette box thoughtfully against his chin. No, never. The agreement was no attack ads. I wouldn't call this precisely an attack ad, Nick wheedled. We do know it's true about the Japanese contributions. Peckham is sold out to every... That's his problem. 
No one will own me when I'm president, and I'll do it without stooping to— He noticed the look on Nick's face. What's the matter? Is something wrong? Wrong? No, nothing. Nick sighed deeply. I don't like those new numbers from Florida, that's all. It wasn't just Florida. Hardy's support was eroding in Massachusetts, Tennessee, Delaware, across the board in the upcoming Super Tuesday primaries and caucuses. He had held his early strength in Maine and South Dakota, but by the time Super Tuesday rolled around, he'd slipped an average of three points in the eight early March races. Peckham, written off by many pundits in February, was being called a slugger, a man with staying power, not afraid to take off the gloves and mix it up at the line of scrimmage, coming up on the rail. These things don't happen spontaneously. Voters in the twelve Super Tuesday states were being surveyed, pamphleted, focus-grouped, phone-banked, and sound-bitten more thoroughly than in any previous election. All over the South, people sat in conference rooms and theaters to have their sweat glands, heartbeats, blood pressure, and breathing rates monitored as they listened to trial speeches or discussed the issues. Computer-guided laser beams were being bounced off eyeballs as test groups watched new commercials. Semanticists and programmers had developed an all-purpose speech that could, within two seconds, be tailored not only to small constituencies in a particular state, but also to individual zip codes within the state. Peckham could promise one thing at 9 a.m. at the Masonic Lodge and something completely different two miles across town at 10. The usual hot-button issues had been identified and Hardy's weaknesses in each category carefully plotted. He had once said that school prayer might make Islamic or Buddhist students uncomfortable. By the time Mayard and Shyskopf were through with it, Hardy sounded like a goddamned atheist. Once Joe had opined that burning the flag might be protected by the First Amendment. The charity Cracker Jack Agency soon had him using Old Glory for toilet paper. But the best purchase Yerkimov made turned out to be Peckham's speechwriter. He came up with a catchphrase widely viewed as the best since Read My Lips. It quickly became a chant at Peckham rallies and spread rapidly through society, and it went like this. To hell with that! Do you want the man who stands for higher taxes and being soft on criminals? To hell with that! The man who wants to keep this great country headed down the road to mediocrity, who sends your tax dollars overseas whenever his liberal friends tell him to, who doesn't give a damn about the jobs of working men and women in America. To hell with that! Who wants to close the military base in this fair city, shut the sawmills, cancel the weapons systems, kowtow to the Japanese, truckle to the Arabs, deny you the right to pray? The man who says I can't get elected because he's made a deal with the devil? To hell with that! To hell with that! To hell with that! Elect Peckham was outspending vote for Hardy fifty to one, but the crowning blow was yet to come. It was the charisma, Joe whined when the story broke. Charisma my forked tail, Nick steamed, pacing the floor. Charisma my aching horns, it was your not keeping your pants zipped. Nick was not being completely fair. One of the hazards of charisma use, discovered by many a politician before Joe Hardy, was the bimbo factor. It attracted bimbos as sugar brings flies, and in the first heady days Joe had succumbed to the charms of several. Several? Ha! Nick huffed. Okay, okay, let's call it a few score. Of that number, Peckham's troops had found four willing to tell their stories. Worse, two of them had proof. Far, far worse, Mrs. Hardy did the unthinkable. After a short, sharp meeting with Joe, she filed for divorce and flew off to the Bahamas. "'So what are we going to do now?' Hardy asked. "'We have a little money,' Nick mused. "'Not what we should have, but some. "'Of course, I'll need your permission.' He pulled a video cassette from his pocket and put it on the table between them. The Pearl Harbor ad started running on Saturday, along with three others of equal virtue. Hardy applied a triple dose of charisma and appeared with Nick on Meet the Press on Sunday. By Monday, the polls had begun a ponderous swing in his favor. Super Tuesday found him winning by small margins in seven states, losing in three, with Texas and Florida too close to call. Old Scratch sat in the ruins of a presidential campaign early in the morning of the second Wednesday in March and wondered if God was laughing. 
Joe Hardy entered the room, along with a burst of noise from Hardy Faithfuls, parting into the night in the next room. Joe held a bottle of Dom Perignon and a glass, and he staggered slightly. His shoulders were littered with confetti and draped with ticker tape. His hair was unruly. So, he said, burping, on to Illinois? It's over, Joe, Nick said. What do you mean it's over? We won. What a pathetic thing his man had become, Nick marveled. He'd been a lot easier to take back in the days before the contact lenses, before the new barber, back in the days of cheap California champagne. Now he was more of a soundbite than a man. Hardy must have known this at some level, or he wouldn't be drunk so much. You call that a win? Nick handed Joe a long sheet of teletype paper. Key sentences and words had been highlighted with a yellow marker. Did you catch the NBC special? Did you hear what John Chancellor had to say? I was... Those are tomorrow's columns you've got in your hands. They're saying the secret word, Joe, the one they've been hinting at for weeks. Unelectable. And the duck comes down, but you don't win a hundred dollars. We didn't do so bad, and you didn't win anything. Nick cupped his hand to his ear. Hear that sound, Joe? That's the sound of the press corps beating a retreat. A dozen of them have already left to cover Peckham. By morning, the bus will be half full. By next week, who knows? Hardy was leafing through the teletypes with a baffled expression. That's right, Nick said. Read it and weep. Look at what Evans and Novak are saying, and get a load of that Royco column. The senator from Toyota versus the Congress critter from hell. When you've got the time, play that tape over there. See what Letterman had to say about you a few hours ago. With spin like that, we're sunk. But we won, damn it. By three points in two states, and we lost two we were supposed to win. But we're still ahead. That matters only in the general election. What matters in the primaries is fulfilling predictions, sustaining momentum. Joe, if the polls have you at seventy percent and you get sixty-five, you lose. Just ask Lyndon Johnson. I did ten minutes ago. You spoke with— Well, where did you think he would end up? He said to throw in the towel, and I haven't even told you the worst of it yet. There's worse? Exit polls. That's what this is all about these days. A month ago the voters saw you as an attractive outsider. Now your rate is just another politician. Your approval rating has dropped below twenty percent. It was that damn ad, Joe accused, the Pearl Harbor ad. Actually, no, they liked that. The voters say they hate a negative campaign, but they really get a charge out of it. Running that ad made you look scrappy, like you won't take Peckham's allegations lying down. Then we'll just have to hit him harder, Joe said, tossing the papers aside and slapping his fist into his palm. Let's run more of those ads, lots more. Let's punch that bastard Peckham where it hurts. We're broke, Joe, Nick said. We can't afford the airtime. The campaign's in debt almost a million dollars. The only reason we could borrow that much is some ex-SNL people owed me some corporate money. Well, let's accept larger contributions. I won't hold you to the letter of the contract. Maybe we could even get some corporate money. Great. You think people are lining up to give you money after a showing like today? Wise up. Then make some money. Snap your fingers. Make a pile of it appear right here. Joe pounded the table, getting angry. Get thee behind me, politician. What, are you crazy? With the Federal Elections Commission breathing down our necks and the IRS snooping around? But you're the devil, goddammit. Why should you be afraid of internal revenue? Obviously, you've never been audited, Nick said, shivering. Peckham gets away with it, Joe sniffed after a long silence. Peckham's organized, Joe. It takes time to put together a money laundry like that. He's insulated. He's got plausible deniability. Nick stood and rubbed his face, then looked at Joe Hardy, standing with his shoulders slumped. Go home, Joe. Get some rest. It's over. Joe nodded and turned to go, then looked back over his shoulder. What about my soul? You're free to keep what's left of it. Satan had never been quite so depressed. For a century he'd been feeling as if he were falling behind. He kept trying to adapt, did everything he could think of to modernize his operation. Then they did something new. Hitler, the H-bomb, global warming, toxic wastes, the ozone layer, deforestation, 
AIDS, heavy metal, rock and roll, Jim and Tammy Baker. I wish I'd thought of that, he'd say to himself, then scramble to catch up. And now this. It was not the first time he'd lost a soul in contention, though his batting average was high. But it darn sure was the first time he had lost one through being unable to fulfill his own side of the bargain. It was one heck of a note. In today's political world, if you weren't willing to lie, cheat, and be bought, it looked as if not even the devil himself could get you elected. He had decided to catch the next shuttle to Hades, flog a few centers, try to cheer himself up, when his beeper went off. He glanced at the number in the liquid crystal display, got out his cellular phone, and dialed. Yeah, what is it, Asterith? He listened, then sighed, and said, All right, put him through. After a short pause, Son of Chaos here, what can I do for you? Sure, I know who you are. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He sat up a little straighter. Talk to me, he said. Yerkimoff and Associates had the top floor of a twenty-story tower of black glass that dominated a sterile Edge City office complex in Bethesda, with all the warmth of the slab gizmo in 2001. Nick's heels echoed on black marble as he was whisked from the limo through a stainless steel lobby and into a brushed aluminum private elevator that deposited him before the glass desk of Yerkimoff's receptionist. She'd been kicked out of the Miss America pageant. The judges thought she was too pretty. Why can't I get help like that? Nick wondered as she ushered him into the vast corner office with the million-dollar view of the Potomac and suburban Virginia. It was freezing cold. Yerkimoff was a fat little man with a bald head and rolled-up sleeves and sweat trickling down his neck. Sitting behind a big clean desk, he was almost obscured in a cloud of blue smoke. He leaned out of the cloud and thrust a chubby index finger at Nick. Reason I called, he said, brandishing a sheaf of computer printouts. I was going through some polling data, and I came across a little blip here when I ran Hardy versus Peckham. He chuckled. Sort of a Ross Perot factor. Thing is, you tested higher than either of them. How interesting. I thought you might think so. The numbers from the Oprah show got my staff sitting up and howling at the moon. You do quite well across all the demographic lines. Young ones like that whiff of anarchy. Boomers find you trustworthy, fatherly. Women enjoy the head of danger. He got up and walked to the windows, puffing on his cigar. He looked over his shoulder. Got any money? People owe me favors. I can raise some. Yerkimoff nodded. Of course I can see a certain amount of trouble with the whole Prince of Darkness issue. Fly God, Corrupter, Father of Lies, some of the nicknames you've picked up over the years. I prefer plain old Nick, said Lucifer. Sure, sure, and it plays better, too. And you've made a start on diffusing that. With the right spin. Do you see where I'm going here? I think I have the direction. Not so sure about the motivation. Yerkimoff shrugged. My business is seeing the writing on the wall. If I head Peckham's re-election committee, I'll have to learn Japanese and see him only on visiting days. There's things even I can't make look good. Besides, I like to back a horse, I understand. He went over and sat on the edge of his desk. Potential problem. What's your citizenship? I have a United States passport. Not good enough if we're going all the way. Got to be a natural-born citizen. Nick thought it over. Hades is vast. I believe I could convince any court in the world that when I was cast down I came to rest beneath New Jersey. That would explain a lot. Where do you live? I maintain a condo in Dallas for tax purposes. Then here it is. Governor of Texas, 94. Six years later. The millennium, Nick whispered and the banked fires in his eyes blazed briefly. When he looked down, he saw that Yerkimoff had extended his hand. Nick took it. Yerkimoff's hand was clammy, his grip flaccid. Nick hated that. He swallowed hard and pretended he didn't mind. Hell, it was a small price to pay for the White House. Author's Note I admit I made a teeny change here. I originally had Yerkimoff... Offer Nick the junior senatorship from Texas in 94. Looking back, this seems more appropriate. They say Satan can take many forms. You don't suppose... 
Probably not. I think Nick would have made a better president. Introduction to The Bellman The second most asked question, as any writer will know, is, how do you go about getting an agent? The answer is fairly simple, like the answer to the old question, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. Write stories, send them out, endure the rejection when it comes. When you have a few stories in print, there are agents out there who will take you on. If you're not good enough to sell, no agent can help you. Before that, few serious agents will look at your work. They don't have the time. There are agents who will read your stuff for a fee, and maybe send them out to magazines, but don't count on it. And don't count on their advice. If you need opinions and helpful criticism, workshops are a better place to get them. Again, I was lucky. I hadn't even considered getting an agent. I sold some stories, started attracting some attention, and one day got a letter from Kirby McCauley asking if I was looking for representation. I wasn't, and was a little dubious of someone who seemed to be beating the bushes for clients. But I asked some of my new friends and was told Kirby was very good with a wonderful client list. He could hustle my works in foreign markets, which have been a significant source of income over the years, and had an affiliation with an agency in Hollywood. I went to New York, met him, and instantly liked him, and we shook hands. That has been the basis of a relationship that has lasted about twenty-eight years now. I can't begin to say how valuable Kirby has been to me, as agent and friend. He takes care of all the negotiating and business stuff that gives me a blinding headache. He has been there countless times to help me over a bad patch, as a writer's income tends to be sporadic, big chunks and then nothing for a long time. I have made a living at this business for thirty years now, but I won't pretend it hasn't been dicey at times. But it's the only life for me. As Sergeant Pepper said, we're getting very near the end. Here's a story from a time capsule. I wrote The Bellman back in the late seventies after Harlan Ellison asked me to contribute to an anthology. I'm sure many of you were not even born when the first Dangerous Visions book was published, to universal acclaim. It was followed soon after by Again Dangerous Visions, and was to conclude, logically enough, with The Last Dangerous Visions. And then something happened. I don't know exactly what it was. It was probably a series of things. But for some reason Harlan and the original publisher parted company. Ever since then, well over twenty years now, Harlan has been wandering in the publishing wilderness, and so far even his considerable powers of persuasion have been unable to get the book in print. Did I say book? The last I heard, TLDV, was to be three thick volumes, with a cover price around one hundred dollars. I don't know if those are nineteen seventy-eight dollars. Being Harlan, he was able to hang on to this story, and many others, by other writers, long past the expiration of his rights to it. Half a dozen times in the past two decades, times when I really needed the money, I have reluctantly gone to him and said I really have to sell the bellman. It's been years, Harlan. Be fair. Each time he convinced me to hang tough. No browbeating, no threats, never an angry word. It's just that when Harlan gets to talking about TLDV, his passion is infectious. You end up wanting to let him keep the story for just one more year. I still do want that. I still hope to see TLDV in hardcovers one day soon. But by then, The Bellman will no longer be unpublished fiction because I finally decided I couldn't wait any longer. Do I feel guilty? Yes, a bit. But I'm not the only one, and even if all the stories in it are not new on that fine publication day, I'm sure the book will be the blockbuster of the twenty-first century. The whole Dangerous Visions concept was a simple one. Harlan wanted stories you couldn't sell elsewhere, stories that were too controversial for the conventional magazines and book publishers. Dangerous stories. Many of the stories in the first two volumes did seem daring at the time. But the most dangerous stuff in the books was probably the introductions and afterwards Harlan wrote for each story. Taken together, it seemed there was almost as much wordage by the outspoken editor as by the collected authors, which is as it should be, since no one I know can churn up your guts as effectively as Harlan Ellison. I don't really know if this story is dangerous. It no longer looks as radical as it did when I wrote it, but so very, very much has happened since then. We're in a new millennium, 
and in many ways it is more wonderful and terrible than any of us poor SF prophets imagined it. You decide. The Bellman The woman stumbled down the long corridor, too tired to run. She was tall, her feet were bare, and her clothes were torn. She was far advanced in pregnancy. Through a haze of pain she saw a familiar blue light. Airlock. There was no place left to go. She opened the door and stepped inside, shut it behind her. She faced the outer door, the one that led to vacuum. Quickly she undogged the four levers that secured it. Overhead a warning tone began to sound quietly, rhythmically. The outer door was now held shut by the air pressure inside the lock, and the inner door could not be opened until the outer latches were secured. She heard noises from the corridor, but knew she was safe. Any attempt to force the outer door would set off enough alarms to bring the police and air department. It was not until her ears popped that she realized her mistake. She started to scream, but it quickly died away with the last rush of air from her lungs. She continued to beat soundlessly on the metal walls for a time until blood flowed from her mouth and nose. The blood bubbled. As her eyes began to freeze, the outer door swung upward and she looked out on the lunar landscape. It was white and lovely in the sunlight, like the frost that soon coated her body. Lieutenant Anna Louise Box seated herself in the diagnostic chair, leaned back and put her feet in the stirrups. Dr. Erickson began inserting things into her. She looked away, studying the people in the waiting room through the glass wall to her left. She couldn't feel anything, which in itself was a disturbing sensation, but she didn't like the thought of all that hardware so close to her child. He turned on the scanner and she faced the screen on her other side. Even after so long she was not used to the sight of the inner walls of her uterus, the placenta, and the fetus. Everything seemed to throb, engorged with blood. It made her feel heavy, as though her hands and feet were too massive to lift, a different sensation entirely from the familiar heaviness of her breasts and belly. And the child. Incredible that it could be hers. It didn't look like her at all, just a standard squinch-faced pink and puckered little ball. One tiny fist opened and shut, a leg kicked, and she felt the movement. Do you have a name for her yet? the doctor asked. Joanna. She was sure he had asked that last week. He must be making conversation, she decided. It was unlikely he even recalled Bach's name. Nice, he said, distractedly, punching a note into his clipboard terminal. Uh, I think we can work you in on Monday, three weeks from now. That's two days before optimum, but the next free slot is six days after. Would that be convenient? You should be here at O oh, three hundred hours. Bach sighed. I told you last time I'm not coming in for the delivery. I'll take care of that myself. Now, uh, he glanced at his terminal. Anna, you know we don't recommend that. I know it's getting popular, but it's Miss Bach to you, and I heard that speech last time, and I've read the statistics. I know it's no more dangerous to have the kid by myself than it is in this damn fishbowl. So would you give me the goddamn midwife and let me get out of here? My lunch break is almost over. He started to say something, but Bach widened her eyes slightly and her nostrils flared. Few people gave her any trouble when she looked at them like that, especially when she was wearing her sidearm. Erickson reached around her and fumbled in the hair at the nape of her neck. He found the terminal and removed the tiny midwife she had worn for the last six months. It was gold and about the size of a pea. Its function was neural and hormonal regulation. Wearing it, she had been able to avoid morning sickness, hot flashes, and the possibility of miscarriage from the exertions of her job. Erickson put it in a small plastic box and took out another that looked just like it. "'This is the delivery midwife,' he said, plugging it in. "'It'll start labor at the right time, which in your case is the ninth of next month.' He smiled, once again trying for a bedside manner. "'That will make your daughter an Aquarius.' I don't believe in astrology. I see. Well, keep the midwife in at all times. When your time comes, it will reroute your nerve impulses away from the pain centers in the brain. You'll experience the contractions in their full intensity, you see, but you won't perceive it as pain, which I'm told makes all the difference. Of course, I wouldn't know. 
No, I suppose you wouldn't. Is there anything else I need to know, or can I go now? I wish you'd reconsider, he said peevishly. You really should come into the natatorium. I must confess, I can't understand why so many women are choosing to go it alone these days. Bach glanced around at the bright lights over the horde of women in the waiting room, the dozens sitting in examination alcoves, the glint of metal and the people in white coats rushing around with frowns on their faces. With each visit to this place, the idea of her own bed, a pile of blankets, and a single candle looked better. Beats me, she said. There was a jam on the Leistrasse feeder line just before the carousel. Bach had to stand for fifteen minutes wedged in a tight mass of bodies trying to protect her belly, listening to the shouts and screams ahead where the real crush was, feeling the sweat crickling down her sides. Someone near her was wearing shoes and managed to step on her foot twice. She arrived at the precinct station twenty minutes late, hurried through the rows of desks in the command center and shut the door of her tiny office behind her. She had to turn sideways to get behind her desk, but she didn't mind that. Anything was worth it for that blessed door. She had no sooner settled in her chair than she noticed a handwritten note on her desk, directing her to briefing room 330 at 1400 hours. She had five minutes. One look around the briefing room gave her a queasy feeling of disorientation. Hadn't she just come from here? There were between two and three hundred officers seated in folding chairs. All were female and visibly pregnant. She spotted a familiar face, sidled awkwardly down a row, and sat beside Sergeant Inga Krupp. They touched palms. "'How's it with you?' Bach asked. She jerked her thumb toward Krupp's belly. "'And how long?' "'Just fighting gravity, trying not to let the entropy get me down. Two more weeks. How about you?' "'More like three. Girl or boy? Girl. Me too. Bach squirmed on the hard chair. Sitting was no longer her favorite position. Not that standing was all that great. What is this, some kind of medical thing? Krupp spoke quietly from the corner of her mouth. Keep it under your suit. The crosstalk is that pregnancy leave is being cut back. And half the force walks off the job tomorrow. Bach knew when she was being put on. The Union was far too powerful for any reduction in the one-year child-rearing sabbatical. Come on, what have you heard? Krupp shrugged, then eased down in her chair. Nobody said. But I don't think it's medical. You notice you don't know most of the people here? They come from all over the city. Bach didn't have time to reply because Commissioner Andrus had entered the room. He stepped up to a small podium and waited for quiet. When he got it, he spent a few seconds looking from face to face. "'You're probably wondering why I called you all here today.' There was a ripple of laughter. Andrus smiled briefly, but quickly became serious again. First, the disclaimer. "'You all know of the provision in your contract relating to hazardous duty and pregnancy. It is not the policy of this department to endanger civilians, and each of you is carrying a civilian.' Participation in the project I will outline is purely voluntary. Nothing will appear in your records if you choose not to volunteer. Those of you who wish to leave now may do so. He looked down and tactfully shuffled papers while about a dozen women filed out. Bach shifted uncomfortably. There was no denying she would feel diminished personally if she left. Long tradition decreed that an officer took what assignments were offered. But she felt a responsibility to protect Joanna. She decided she was sick to death of desk work. There would be no harm in hearing him out. Andrus looked up and smiled bleakly. Thank you. Frankly, I hadn't expected so many to stay. Nevertheless, the rest of you may opt out at any time. He gave his attention to the straightening of his papers by tapping the bottom edges on the podium. He was a tall, cadaverous man with a big nose and hollows under his cheekbones. He would have looked menacing, but his tiny mouth and chin spoiled the effect. Perhaps I should warn you before— But the show had already begun. On a big hollow screen behind him a picture leaped into focus. There was a collective gasp, and the room seemed to chill for a moment. Bach had to look away, queasy for the first time since her rookie days. Two women got up and hurried from the room. I'm sorry, Andrew said, looking over his shoulder and frowning. 
I had meant to prepare you for that. But none of this is pretty. Bach forced her eyes back to the picture. One does not spend twelve years in the homicide division of a metropolitan police force without becoming accustomed to the sight of violent death. Bach had seen it all and thought herself unshockable, but she had not reckoned on what someone had done to the woman on the screen. The woman had been pregnant. Someone had performed an impromptu cesarean section on her. She was opened up from the genitals to the breastbone. The incision was ragged, hacked in an irregular semicircle, with a large flap of skin and muscle pulled to one side. Loops of intestine bulged through ruptured fascial tissue, still looking wet in the harsh photographer's light. She was frozen solid, posed on a metal autopsy table with her head and shoulders up, slumped against a wall that was no longer there. It caused her body to balance on its buttocks. Her legs were in an attitude of repose, yet lifted at a slight angle to the table. Her skin was faint blue and shiny like mother of pearl, and her chin and throat were caked with rusty brown frozen blood. Her eyes were open and strangely peaceful. She gazed at a spot just over Bach's left shoulder. All oh, that was bad enough, as bad as any atrocity Bach had ever seen. But the single detail that had leaped to her attention was a tiny hand, severed, lying frozen in the red mouth of the wound. Her name was Elfrida Tong, age twenty-seven, a lifelong resident of New Dresden. We have a biographical sheet you can read later. She was reported missing three days ago, but nothing was developed. Yesterday we found this. Her body was in an airlock in the West Quadrant. Map reference Delta Omicron Sigma 97. This is a new section of town, as yet underpopulated. The corridor in question leads nowhere, though in time it will connect a new warren with the Cross Chrysium. She was killed by decompression, not by wounds. Use tapes from the airlock service module reveal that she entered the lock alone, probably without a suit. She must have been pursued, else why would she have sought refuge in an airlock? In any case, she unsealed the outer door, knowing that the inner door could not then be moved. He sighed and shook his head. It might have worked, too, in an older lock. She had the misfortune to discover a design deficiency in the new style locks, which are fitted with manual pressure controls on the corridor phone plates. It was simply never contemplated that anyone would want to enter a lock without a suit and unseal the outer door. Bach shuddered. She could understand that thinking. In common with almost all Lunarians, she had a deep-seated fear of vacuum, impressed on her from her earliest days. Andrus went on. Pathology could not determine time of death, but computer records show a timeline that might be significant. As those of you who work in homicide know, murder victims often disappear totally on Luna. They can be buried on the surface and never seen again. It would have been easy to do so in this case. Someone went to a lot of trouble to remove the fetus, for reasons we'll get to in a moment, and could have hidden the body fifty meters away. It's unlikely the crime would have been discovered. We theorize the murderer was rushed. Someone attempted to use the lock, found it not functioning because of the open outer door, and called repair service. The killer correctly assumed the frustrated citizen in the corridor would go to the next lock and return on the outside to determine the cause of the obstruction, which he did to find Elfrida as you see her now. As you can see, he pointed to a round object partially concealed in the wound. The killer was in such haste that he or she failed to get the entire fetus. This is the child's head, and of course you can see her hand. Andrus coughed nervously and turned from the picture. From the back of the room a woman hurried for the door. We believe the killer to be insane. Doubtless this act makes sense according to some tortured pathology unique to this individual. Psychology section says the killer is probably male, which does not rule out female suspects. This is disturbing enough, of course, but aside from the fact that this sort of behavior is rarely isolated, the killer is compelled eventually to repeat it, we believe that Ms. Tong is not the first. Analysis of missing persons reveals a shocking percentage of pregnant females over the last two years. It seems that someone is on the loose who preys on expectant mothers and may already have killed between fifteen and twenty of them. Andrus looked up and stared directly at Bach for a moment, 
then fixed his gaze on several more women in turn. You will have guessed by now that we intend using you as bait. Being bait was something Bach had managed to avoid in twelve eventful years on the force. It was not something that was useful in homicide work, which was a gratifyingly straightforward job in a world of fuzzy moral perplexities. Undercover operations did not appeal to her. But she wanted to catch this killer, and she could not think of any other way to do it. Even this method is not very satisfactory, she said back in her office. She had called in Sergeants Lisa Babcock and Eric Steiner to work with her on the case. All we really have is computer printouts on the habits and profiles of the missing women. No physical evidence was developed at the murder scene. Sergeant Babcock crossed her legs and there was a faint whirring sound. Bach glanced down. It had been a while since the two of them had worked together. She had forgotten about the bionic legs. Babcock had lost her real ones to a gang who cut them off with a chain knife and left her to die. She didn't, and the bionic replacements were to have been temporary while new ones were grown. But she had liked them, pointing out that a lot of police work was still legwork and these didn't get tired. She was a small brunette woman with a long face and lazy eyes, one of the best officers Bach had ever worked with. Steiner was a good man, too, but Bach picked him over several other qualified candidates simply because of his body. She had lusted after him for a long time, bedded him once thirty-six weeks ago. He was Joanna's father, though he would never know it. He was also finely muscled, light brown, and hairless, three qualities Bach had never been able to resist. We'll be picking a place, taproom, sensorium, I don't know yet, and I'll start to frequent it. It'll take some time. He's not going to just jump out and grab a woman with a big belly. He'll probably try to lure her away to a safe place, maybe feed her some kind of line. We've been studying the profiles of his victims. You've decided the killer is male? Babcock asked. No. They say it's likely. They're calling him the Bellman. I don't know why. Lewis Carroll, Steiner said. Huh? Steiner made a wry face. From the hunting of the snark. But it was the snark that made people softly and suddenly vanish away, not the bellman. He hunted the snark. Bach shrugged. It won't be the first time we've screwed up a literary reference. Anyway, that's the code for this project. Bellman XXX. Top security access. She tossed copies of bound computer printout at each of them. Read this and tell me your thoughts tomorrow. How long will it take you to get your current work squared away? I could clear it up in an hour, Babcock said. I'll need a little more time. Okay, get to work on it right now. Steiner stood and edged around the floor, and Bach followed Babcock into the noisy command center. When I get done, how about knocking off early, Babcock suggested. We could start looking for a spot to set this up. Fine. I'll treat you to dinner. Hobson's choice led a Jekyll and Hyde existence a quiet and rather staid taproom by day, at night transformed by hologrammatic projection into the fastest flesh parlor in the East 380s. Bach and Babcock were interested in it because it fell midway between the posh establishments down at the bedrock and the sleazy joints that dotted the upper concourses. It was on the 60th level, at the intersection of the Midtown Arterial Slides, the heidelberg Senkrechtstrasse lifts, and the shopping arcade that lined 387 Strasse. Half a sector had been torn out to make a park cube, lined by sidewalk restaurants. They were there now, sitting at a plastwood table, waiting for their orders to arrive. Bach lit a cheroot, exhaled a thin cloud of lavender smoke, and looked at Babcock. What do you make of it? Babcock looked up from the printouts. She frowned, and her eyes lost their focus. Bach waited. Babcock was slow, but not stupid. She was methodical. Victims, lower middle class to poor. Five out of work, seven on welfare. Possible victims, Bach emphasized. Okay, but some of them had better be victims, or we're not going to get anywhere. The only reason we're looking for the bellman in these lower middle class taprooms is that it's something these women had in common. They were all lonely, according to the profiles. Bach frowned. She didn't trust computer profiles. 
The information in the profiles was of two types, physical and psychological. The psych portion included school records, doctor visits, job data, and monitored conversations, all tossed together and developed into what amounted to a psychoanalysis. It was reliable to a point. Physical data was registered every time a citizen passed through a pressure door, traveled on a slideway or tube, spent money or entered or left a locked room. In short, every time the citizen used an identiplate. Theoretically, the computers could construct a model showing where each citizen had gone on any day. In practice, of course, it didn't work that way. After all, criminals owned computers, too. Only two of them had steady lovers, Babcock was saying. Oddly, both of the lovers were women, and of the others there seems to be a slight preference for homosex. Means nothing, Box said. I don't know. There's also a predominance of male fetuses among the missing, sixty percent. Bach thought about it. Are you suggesting these women didn't want the babies? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just curious. The waiter arrived with her orders, and the bellman was shelved while they ate. How is that stuff? Babcock asked. This? Bach paused to swallow and regarded her plate judiciously. That's okay about what you'd expect at the price. She had ordered a tossed salad, steak plant, and baked potato, and a stein of beer. The steak plant had a faint metallic taste and was overdone. How's yours? Passable, she lisped around a mouthful. Have you ever had real meat? Bach did not quite choke, but it was a close thing. No, and the idea makes me a little sick. I have, Babcock said. Bach eyed her suspiciously, then nodded. That's right. You emigrated from Earth, didn't you? My family did. I was only nine at the time. She toyed with her beer mug. Pa was a closet carnivore. Every Christmas he got a chicken and cooked it. Saved money for it most of the year. I bet he was shocked when he got up here. Maybe. A little. Oh, he knew there wasn't any black market meat up here. Hell, it was rare enough down there. What? What's a chicken? Babcock laughed. Sort of a bird. I never saw one alive, and I never really liked it that much either. I like steak better. Bach thought it was perverted, but was fascinated anyway. What sort of steak? From an animal called a cow. We only had it once. What did it taste like? Babcock reached over and speared the bite Bach had just carved. She popped it into her mouth. A lot like that. A little different. They never get the taste just right, you know. Bach didn't know, had not even realized that her steak plant was supposed to taste like cow, and felt they'd talked about it enough, especially at mealtime. They returned to Hobson's that night. Bach was at the bar and saw Steiner and Babcock enter. They took a table across the dance floor from her. They were nude, Faces elaborately painted, bodies shaved and oiled. Bach was dressed in a manner she had avoided for eight months, in a blue lace maternity gown. It reached to her ankles and buttoned around her neck, covering everything but her protruding belly. There was one other woman dressed as she was, but in pink and with a much smaller bulge. Between the two of them they wore more clothing than everyone else in Hobson's put together. Lunarians tended to dress lightly, if at all, and what was covered was a matter of personal choice. But in flesh parlors it was what was uncovered that was important, and how it was emphasized and displayed. Bach didn't care for the place as much. There was an air of desperation to them. She was supposed to look forlorn. Damn it, if she'd wanted to act, she would have made a career on the stage. She brooded about her role as bait, considered calling the whole thing off. Very good. You look perfectly miserable. She glanced up to see Babcock wink as she followed Steiner onto the dance floor. She almost smiled. All right, now she had a handle on it. Just think about the stinking job, all the things she'd rather be doing, and her face would take care of itself. Hey there. She knew instantly she'd hate him. He was on the stool next to her, his bulging pectorals glistening in the violet light. He had even white teeth, a profile like a hatchet, and a candy-striped penis with a gold bell hanging from the pierced foreskin. 
I'm not feeling musically inclined, she said. Then what the hell are you doing here? Bach wished she knew. It's definitely the wrong sort of place, Babcock said, her eyes unfocused and staring at Bach's ceiling. That's the best news I've heard in months, Steiner said. There were dark circles under his eyes. It had been a strenuous night. Bach waved him to silence and waited for Babcock to go on. For some reason she had begun to feel that Babcock knew something about the bellman, though she might not know she knew it. She rubbed her forehead and wondered if that made any sense. The fact remained that when Babcock had said to wear blue instead of pink, Bach had done so. When she said to look lonely and in despair, Bach had done her best. Now, she said, Hobson's was wrong. Bach waited. I don't care if the computers say they spent their time in places like that, she said. They probably did, but not toward the end. They would have wanted something quieter. For one thing, you don't take somebody home from a place like Hobson's. You fuck them on the dance floor. Steiner moaned, and Babcock grinned at him. Remember, it was in the line of duty, Eric. Don't get me wrong, Steiner said. You're delightful, but all night long, and my feet hurt. But why a quieter place? Bach asked. I'm not sure. The depressive personalities. It's hard to cope with Hobson's when you're depressed. They went there for uncomplicated fucking. But when they got really blue, they went looking for a friend. And the bellman would want a place where he could hope to take someone home. People won't take someone home unless they're getting serious. That made sense to Bach. It followed the pattern of her own upbringing. In the crowded environment of Luna, it was important to keep a space for yourself, a place you invited only special friends. So you think he made friends with them first? Again, I'm only speculating. Okay, look, none of them had any close friends. Most of them had boy fetuses, but they were homosexual. It was too late to abort. They're not sure they want the kids. They got into it in the first place because the idea of a kid sounded nice, but... Now they don't think they want a son. The decision is to keep it or give it to the state. They need someone to talk to. She let it hang there, looking at Bach. It was all pretty tenuous, but what else was there to go on? And it wouldn't hurt to find another spot. It would probably help her nerves, not to mention Steiner's. Just the place for a snark, Steiner said. Is it? Bach asked studying the façade of the place and failing to notice Steiner's sarcasm. Maybe it was the place to find the bellman, she decided, but it didn't look too different from fifteen other places the team had haunted in three weeks. It was called the Gong, for reasons which were not apparent. It was an out-of-the-way taproom on 511-Strasse, level 73. Steiner and Babcock went in, and Bach walked twice around the block to be sure she was not associated with them, then entered. The lighting was subdued without making her wish for a flashlight. Only beer was served. There were booths, a long wooden bar with a brass rail and swiveling chairs, and a piano in one corner where a small, dark-haired woman was taking requests. The atmosphere was very twentieth century, a little too quaint. She found a seat at one end of the bar. Three hours passed. Bach took it stoically. The first week had nearly driven her out of her mind. Now she seemed to have developed a facility for staring into space or studying her reflection in the bar mirror, leaving her mind a blank. But tonight was to be the last night. In a few hours she would lock herself in her apartment, light a candle beside her bed, and not come out until she was a mother. You look like you've lost your best friend. Can I buy you a drink? If I had a tenth mark for every time I've heard that, Bach thought, but said, Suit yourself. He jingled as he sat, and Bach glanced down, then quickly up to his face. It was not the same man she had met on the first night at Hobson's. Genital bells had become the overnight sensation, bigger than pubic gardening had been three years before, when everyone ran around with tiny flowers growing in their crotches. When men wore the bells, they were called dongalings, or, with even more cloying cuteness, dingalingums. If you ask me to ring your bell, Bach said conversationally, I'll bust your balls. Who, me? he asked innocently. Farthest thing from my mind. Honest. 
She knew it had been on his lips, but he was smiling so ingenuously she had to smile back. He put out his palm, and she pressed it. "'Louise Brecht,' she said. "'I'm Ernst Freeman.' But he was not, not really, and it surprised Bach and saddened her. He was by far the nicest man she had talked to in the last three weeks. She allowed him to coax out her make-believe life history, the one Babcock had written the second day, and he really seemed to care. Bach found she almost believed the story herself, her sense of frustration giving a verisimilitude to Louise Breck's crashingly boring life that Bach had never really achieved before. So it was a shock when she saw Babcock walk behind her on her way to the toilet. Babcock and Steiner had not been idle during the twenty minutes she had been talking to Freeman. A microphone hidden in box clothing enabled them to hear the conversation while Steiner operated a tiny television camera. The results were fed to a computer, which used voice print and photo analysis to produce a positive ident. If the result didn't match, Babcock was forced to leave a note to that effect in the toilet, which she was presumably doing now. Bach saw her go back to the table and sit down, then caught her eye in the mirror. Babcock nodded slightly, and Bach felt goose pimples break out. This might not be the bellman. He could be working any of a number of cons, or have something else in mind for her. But it was the first real break for the team. She waited a decent interval, finishing a beer, then excused herself, saying she would be right back. She walked to the rear of the bar and through a curtain. She pushed through the first door she saw having been in so many tap-rooms lately, that she felt she could have found the toilet with her feet shackled in a blackout. And, indeed, it seemed to be the right place. It was twentieth-century design, with ceramic wash-basins, urinals, and commodes, the latter discreetly hidden in metal stalls. But a quick search failed to produce the expected note. Frowning, she pushed back out through the swinging door and nearly bumped into the piano player, who had been on her way in. Excuse me. Bach murmured, and looked at the door. It said, Men. Peculiarity of the gong, the piano player said. Twentieth century, remember? They were segregated. Of course. Silly of me. The correct door was across the hall, plainly marked women. Bach went in, found the note taped to the inside of one of the stall doors. It was the product of the tiny fax printer Babcock carried in her purse and crammed a lot of fine print onto an eight-by-twelve millimeter sheet. She opened her maternity dress, sat down, and began to read. His real registered name was Big Fucker Jones. With a handle like that, Bach was not surprised that he used aliases. But the name had been of his own choosing. He had been born Ellen Miller, on Earth. Miller had been a Negro, and her race and sex changes had been an attempt to lose a criminal record and evade the police. Both Miller and Jones had been involved in everything from robbery to meat-legging to murder. He had served several terms, including a transportation to the penal colony in Copernicus. When his term was up, he had elected to stay on Luna. Which meant nothing as far as the bellman was concerned. She had been hoping for some sort of sexual perversion record which would have jibed more closely with the profile on the bellman. For Jones to be the bellman, there should have been money involved. It was not until Bach saw the piano player's red shoes under the toilet stall door that something which had been nagging at her came to the surface. Why had she been going into the male's only toilet? Then something was tossed under the door, and there was a bright purple flash. Bach began to laugh. She stood up, fastening her buttons. Oh, no, she said, between giggles. That's not going to work on me. I always wondered what it'd be like to have somebody throw a flashball at me. She opened the stall door. The piano player was there, just putting her protective goggles back in her pocket. You must read too many cheap thriller novels, Bach told her, still laughing. Don't you know those things are out of date? The woman shrugged, spreading her hands with a rueful expression. I just do what I'm told. Bach made a long face, then burst out laughing again. But you should know a flashball doesn't work unless you slip the victim the primer drug beforehand. The beer? The woman suggested helpfully. Oh, wow. You mean you... And... And that guy with the comic book name? Oh, wow. She couldn't help it. She just had to laugh aloud again. In a way, she felt sorry for the woman. Well, what can I tell you? It didn't work. 
The warranty must have expired or something. She was about to tell the woman she was under arrest, but somehow she didn't want to hurt her feelings. Back to the old drawing board, I guess, the woman said. Oh, yeah, while I've got you here, I'd like for you to go to the West 500th Tube Station, one level up. Take this paper with you and punch this destination. As you punch each number, forget it. When you've done that, swallow the paper. You have all that? Bach frowned at the paper. West 500th, forget the number, eat the paper. She sighed. Well, I guess I can handle that. But, hey, you got to remember I'm doing this just as a favor to you. Just as soon as I get back, I'm going to. Okay, okay, just do it. Exactly as I said. I know you're humoring me, but let's just pretend the flashball worked, okay? It seemed like a reasonable enough suggestion. It was just the break Bach needed. Obviously, this woman and Jones were connected with the bellman, whoever he or she was. Here was Bach's big chance to catch him. Of course, she was not going to forget the number. She was about to warn the woman she would be arrested as soon as she returned from the address, but she was interrupted again. Go out the back door, and don't waste any time. Don't listen to anything anyone else says until someone says, I tell you three times. Then you can pretend the game is over. All right. Bach was excited at the prospect. Here at last was the sort of high adventure that everyone thought was a big part of police work. Actually, as Bach knew well, police work was dull as Muzak. And I'll take that robe. Bach handed it to her and hurried out the back door, wearing nothing but a big grin. It was astonishing. One by one she punched in the numbers, and one by one they vanished from her mind. She was left with a piece of paper that might have been printed in Swahili. What do you know, she said to herself, alone in the two-seat capsule. She laughed crumpled the paper, and popped it into her mouth, just like a spy. She had no idea where she might be. The capsule had shunted around for almost half an hour and come to rest in a private tube station just like thousands of others. There had been a man on hand for her arrival. She smiled at him. "'Are you the one I'm supposed to see?' she asked. He said something, but it was gibberish. He frowned when it became clear she didn't understand him. It took her a moment to see what the problem was. "'I'm sorry, but I'm not supposed to listen to anyone,' she shrugged helplessly. "'I had no idea it would work so well.' He began gesturing with something in his hands, and her brow furrowed. Then she grinned widely. "'Charades? Okay. Sounds like—' But he kept waving the object at her. It was a pair of handcuffs. "'Oh, all right, if it'll make you happy.' She held out her wrists close together, and he snapped them on. "'I tell you three times,' he said. Bach began to scream. It took hours to put her mind back together. For the longest time she could do nothing but shake and whimper and puke. Gradually she became aware of her surroundings. She was in a stripped apartment room, lying on a bare floor. The place smelled of urine and vomit and fear. She lifted her head cautiously. There were red streaks on the walls, some of them bright and new, others almost brown. She tried to sit up and winced. Her fingertips were raw and bloody. She tried the door first, but it didn't even have an interior handle. She probed around the racks, biting her tongue when the pain became too great in her shackled hands, satisfied herself that it could not be opened. She sat down again and considered her situation. It did not look promising, but she made her preparations to do what she could. It might have been two hours before the door opened. She had no way to tell. It was the same man, this time accompanied by an unfamiliar woman. They both stood back and let the door swing inward, wary of an ambush. Bach cowered in the far corner, and as they approached, she began to scream again. Something gleamed in the man's hand. It was a chain knife. The rubber grip containing the battery nestled in his palm, and the blunt fifteen-centimeter blade pointed out rimmed with hundreds of tiny teeth. The man squeezed the grip, and the knife emitted a high whine as the chain blurred into motion. Bach screamed louder and got to her feet, backed against the wall. Her whole posture betrayed defenselessness, and evidently they fell for it just enough, because when she kicked at the man's throat, his answering slash was a little bit too late, missing her leg, and he didn't get another try. 
He hit the floor, coughing blood. Bach grabbed the knife as it fell. The woman was unarmed, and she made the right decision, but again it was too late. She started toward the door, but crept over Bach's outstretched leg and went down on her face. Bach was going to kick her until she died, but all the activity had strained muscles that should not have been used so roughly. A cramp nearly doubled her over, and she fell, arms out to break her fall and protect her stomach. Her manacled hands were going to hit the woman's arm, and Bach didn't dare let go of the knife, nor did she dare take the fall on her abused fingertips. And while she agonized over what to do in that long second while she fell in the dreamy lunar gravity, her fists hit the floor just behind the woman's arm. There was an almost inaudible buzzing sound. A fine spray of blood hit Bach's arm and shoulder, and the wall three meters across the room, and the woman's arm fell off. Both of them stared at it for a moment. The woman's eyes registered astonishment as she looked over to Bach. "'There's no pain,' she said distinctly. Then she started to get up, forgetting about the arm that was no longer there, and fell over. She struggled for a while like an overturned turtle while the blood spurted, and she turned very white. Then she was still. Bach got up awkwardly, her breath coming in quick gasps. She stood for a moment, getting herself under control. The man was still alive, and his breathing was a lot worse than Bach's. She looked down at him. It seemed he might live. She looked at the chain knife in her hand, then knelt beside him, touched the tip of the blade to the side of his neck. When she stood up, it was certain that he would never again cut a child from a mother's body. She hurried to the door and looked carefully left and right. No one was there. Apparently her screams had not been anything remarkable, or she had killed everyone involved. She was fifty meters down the corridor before the labor pains began. She didn't know where she was, but could tell it was not anywhere near where Elfrida Tong had met her death. This was an old part of town, mostly industrial, possibly up close to the surface. She kept trying doors, hoping to find a way into the public corridors where she would have a chance to make a phone call. But the doors that would open led to storerooms, while the ones that might have been offices were locked up for the night. Finally, one office door came open. She looked in, saw it led nowhere. She was about to close the door and resume her flight when she saw the telephone. Her stomach muscles knotted again as she knelt behind the desk and punched Bellman XXX. The screen came to life, and she hastily thumbed the switch to blacken it. "'Identify yourself, please. This is Lieutenant Bach. I've got a Code 1, officer in trouble. I need you to trace this call and send me some help, and I need it quick. Anna, where are you? Lisa? She couldn't believe it was Babcock. Yes, I'm down at headquarters. We've been hoping you'd find a way to report in. Where do we go? That's just it. I don't know. They used a flashball on me. It made me forget where I went. And, yes, we know all that. Now, after you didn't show up for a couple minutes, we checked and you were gone. So we arrested everyone in the place. We got Jones and the piano player. Then get her to tell you where I am. We already used her up, I'm afraid. Died under questioning. I don't think she knew anyway. Whoever she worked for is very careful. As soon as we got the penithol in her veins, her head blew itself all over the interrogation room. She was a junkie, we know that. We're being more careful with the man, but he knows even less than she did. Great. But you've got to get away from there, Lieutenant. It's terrible. You're in— Shit, you know that. Babcock couldn't seem to go on for a moment, and when she did speak, her voice was shaking. They're meat-leggers, Anna. God help me, that's come to Luna now, too. Bach's brow furrowed. What are you talking about? They procure meat for carnivores, goddammit. Flesh junkies. People who are determined to eat meat and will pay any price. You're not trying to tell me. Why the hell not? Babcock flared. Just look at it. On Earth there are still places you can raise animals, if you're careful. But here we've got everything locked up so tight nobody dares try it. Somebody smells them, or the sewage monitors pick up traces of animal waste. Can't be done. Then why? So what kind of meat's available? Babcock went on remorselessly. There's tons of it on the hoof all around you. You don't have to raise it or hide it. You just harvest it when you have a customer. But cannibalism? Bach said faintly. Why not? Meat's meat to someone who wants it. They sell human meat on earth, too, and charge a high price because it's supposed to taste— Ah, I think I'm going to be sick. Me, too. 
Bach felt another spasm in her stomach. Ah, uh, how about that trace? Have you found me yet? Still proceeding? Seems to be some trouble. Bach felt a chill. She had not expected that, but there was nothing to do but wait. Surely the computers would get through in time. Lisa, babies? They want babies? Babcock sighed. I don't understand it either. If you see the bellman, why don't you ask him? We know they trade in adults, too, if it makes you feel any better. Lisa, my baby's on her way. Dear God. Several times in the next quarter hour, Bach heard running feet. Once the door opened and someone stuck his head in, glanced around and failed to see Bach behind the desk with one hand covering the ready light on the phone and the other gripping the chain knife. She used the time to saw through the metal band of her handcuffs with the knife. It only took a moment. Those tiny razors were sharp. Every few minutes, Babcock would come back on the line with a comment like, We're getting routed through every two-mark enclave in Luna. That told Bach that the phone she was using was protected with anti-tracer devices. It was out of her hands now. The two computers, the Bellmans and Babcocks, matching wits, and her labor pains were coming every five minutes. Run! Babcock shouted. Get out of there, quick! Bach struggled to ignore the constriction in her gut, fought off fogginess. She just wanted to relax and give birth. Couldn't a person find any peace anywhere? What? What happened? Somebody at your end figured out that you might be using a phone. They know which one you're using, and they'll be there any second. Get out, quick! Bach got to her feet and looked out the door. Nothing, no sounds, no movement. Left or right? It didn't seem to matter. She doubled over, holding her belly, and shuffled down the corridor. At last, something different. The door was marked, Farm, Authorized Personnel Only, Pressure Suit Area. Behind it was corn, corn growing on eight-meter-high stalks, corn in endless rows and files that made dizzying vanishing points in the distance. Sunlight beat down through a clear plastic bubble, the harsh white sunlight of Luna. In ten minutes she was lost. At the same time she knew where she was. If only she could get back to the phone, but it was surely under guard by now. Discovering her location had been easy. She had picked one of the golden ears, long as her arm and fat as her thigh, peeled back the shuck, and there on each thumb-sized yellow kernel was the trademark a green discoloration in the shape of a laughing man with his arms folded across his chest. So she was in the Luna Food Plantation. Oddly, it was only five levels above the precinct house, but it might as well have been a billion kilometers. Being lost in the cornstalks didn't seem like such a bad idea just now. She hobbled down the rows as long as she could stay on her feet. Every step away from the walls should make the search that much more difficult. But her breathing was coming in huge gasps now, and she had the queasy urge to hold her hands tightly against her crotch. It didn't hurt. The midwife was working, so while she was in the grip of the most intense sensations she had ever imagined, nothing hurt at all. But it could not be ignored, and her body did not want to keep moving. It wanted to lie down and give up. She wouldn't let it. One foot in front of the other. Her bare feet were caked in mud. It was drier on the rows of mounds where the corn grew. She tried to stay on them, hoping to minimize her trail. Hot. It must have been over fifty degrees with high humidity, a steam bath. Sweat poured from her body. She watched it drip from her nose and chin as she plodded on. Her universe narrowed to only two things, the sight of her feet moving mechanically in and out of her narrowed vision and the band of tightness in her gut. Then her feet were no longer visible. She worried over it for a moment, wondering where they had gone. In fact, nothing was visible at all. She rolled over onto her back and spit out dirt. A stalk of corn had snapped off at the base when she tumbled into it. She had a clear view upward of the dome, a catwalk hanging below it, and about a dozen golden tassels far overhead, drooping languidly in the still air. It was pretty, the view from down here. The corn tassels all huddled close to the black patch of sky— with green stalks radiating away in all directions. It looked like a good place to stay. She never wanted to get up again. And this time it hurt some, despite the midwife. She moaned, grabbed the fallen cornstalk in both hands, and gritted her teeth. 
When she opened her eyes again, the stalk was snapped in two. Joanna was here. Box eyes bulged in amazement, and her mouth hung open. Something was moving down through her body, something far too large to be a baby, something that was surely going to split her wide open. She relaxed for just a moment, breathing shallowly, not thinking of anything, and her hands went down over her belly. There was a round, wet thing emerging from her. She felt its shape, found tiny hollows on the underside. How utterly amazing! She smiled for the first time in a million years, and bore down. Her heels dug into the sod, then her toes, and her hips lifted from the black dirt. It was moving again. She was moving again. Joanna! Joanna, Joanna was being born. It was over so quickly she gasped in surprise. Wet slithering, and her child fell away from her and into the dirt. Bach rolled to her side and pressed her forehead to the ground. The child nestled in blood and wetness between her legs. She did what had to be done. When it came time to cut the cord, her hand automatically went to the chain knife. She stopped, seeing a man's threatening hand hearing an almost supersonic whir that would in seconds disembowel her and rip Joanna away. She dropped the knife, leaned over, and bit down hard. Handfuls of corn silk pressed between her legs eventually stopped the bleeding. The placenta arrived. She was weak and shaky and would have liked nothing better than to just lie there in the mothering soil and heat. But there was a shout from above. A man was up there, leaning over the edge of the catwalk. Answering shouts came from all around her. Far down at the end of her row, almost at the vanishing point, a tiny figure appeared and started coming toward her. She had not thought she could get up, but she did. There seemed little point in running, but she ran, holding the chain knife in one hand and hugging Joanna in the other. If they would only come up to her and fight, she would die on a heap of slashed bodies. A green finger of light sizzled into the ground at her heels. She instantly crossed into an adjacent row. So much for hand-to-hand -hand combat. The running was harder now, going over the hills rather than between them, but the man behind her could not keep her in view long enough for another shot. Yet she had known it couldn't last. Vast as the corn plantation was, she could now see the end of it. She came out onto the ten-meter strip of bare ground between the corn plants and the edge of the dome. There was a four-meter wall of bare metal in front of her. On top of the wall was the beginning of the clear material of the dome. It was shaped and anchored by a network of thin cables attached to the top of the wall on the outside. It seemed there was no place to run, until she spotted the familiar blue light. Inner door latches shut, outer ones open. Bach quickly did what Tong had done, but knew she had a better chance, if only for a while. This was an old lock, without an outside override. They would have to disconnect the alarms inside, then burn through the door. That would take some time. Only after she had assured herself that she was not vulnerable to a depressurized command from the outside, a possibility she had not thought about before, but which she could negate by opening one of the four inner door latches, thus engaging the safety overrides, only then did she look around the inside of the lock. It was a five-person model, designed to pass work gangs. There was a toolbox on the floor, coils of nylon rope in one corner, and a closet built into the wall. She opened it and found the pressure suit. It was a large one, but Bach was a large woman. She struggled with adjustment straps until she had the middle let out enough to take both her and Joanna. Her mind worked furiously, fighting through the exhaustion. Why was the suit here? She couldn't find an answer at first, then recalled that the man who had shot at her had not been wearing a suit, nor had the man on the catwalk. There were others chasing her that she hadn't seen and she was willing to bet they didn't have suits on either. So the posted sign she had passed was a safety regulation that was widely ignored. Everyone knew that air conservation and safety regs were many times more stringent than they had to be. The farm had a plastic dome, which was the only surface separating it from vacuum, and that automatically classified it as a vacuum hazard area. But in reality, it was safe to enter it without a pressure suit. The suit was kept there for the rare occasions when it was necessary for someone to go outside. It was a large suit, so it would fit anyone who happened to need it, with adjustment. Interesting. Joanna cried for the first time when Bach got the suit sealed. And no wonder. The child was held against her body, but there was no other support for her. 
She quickly got both tiny legs jammed down one of the suit legs, and that couldn't have been too comfortable. Vok tried her best to ignore it, at the same time noting how hard it was to resist the impulse to try and touch her with her hands. She faced the lock controls. There was a manual evacuation valve. She turned it slowly, opening it a crack so the air would bleed off without making a racket the people inside would hear. Part of the inner door was beginning to glow now. She wasn't too worried about it. Hand lasers were not likely to burn through the metal. Someone would be going for heavy equipment by now. It would do them no good to go to adjacent airlocks, which would probably have suits in them, too, because on the outside they couldn't force the door against the air pressure, and they couldn't force the lock to cycle as long as she was inside to override the command. Unless it occurred to them that she would be suiting up, and someone would be waiting outside as soon as the outer door opened. She spent a few bad minutes waiting for the air to leak to the outside. It didn't help her state of mind when the bellman began to speak to her. Your situation is hopeless. I presume you know that. She jumped, then realized he was speaking to her through the intercom, and it was being relayed to her suit radio. He didn't know she was in the suit then. I don't know anything of the kind, she said. The police will be here in a few minutes. You'd better get going while you've got the chance. Sorry, that won't work. I know you got through, but I also know they didn't trace you. The air pressure dial read zero. Bach held the chain knife and pulled the door open. She stuck her head out. No one was waiting for her. She was fifty meters away across the gently rolling plain when she suddenly stopped. It was at least four kilometers to the nearest airlock that did not lead back into the plantation. She had plenty of air but was not sure about her strength. The midwife, mercifully, spared her the pain she should have been going through, but her arms and legs felt like lead. Could they follow her faster than she could run? It seemed likely. Of course, there was another alternative. She thought about what they had planned for Joanna, then loped back to the dome. She moved like a skater with her feet close to the ground. It took three jumps before she could grab the upper edge of the metal wall with one gauntlet. Then she could not lift her weight with just the one arm. She realized she was a step away from total exhaustion. With both hands, she managed to clamber up to stand on a narrow ledge with her feet among the bolts which secured the hold-down cables to the top of the wall. She leaned down and looked through the transparent vacuplast. A group of five people stood around the inner locked door. One of them, who had been squatting with his elbows on his knees, stood up now and pressed a button beside the lock. She could only see the top of his head, which was protected by a blue cap. "'You found the suit, didn't you?' the bellman said. His voice was quiet, unemotional. Bach said nothing. Can you still hear me? I can hear you, Bach said. She held the chain knife and squeezed the handle. A slight vibration in her glove was the only indication that it was working. She put the edge of the blade to the plastic film and began to trace the sides of a square, one meter wide. I thought you could, he said. You're on your way already. Of course, I wouldn't have mentioned the suit in case you hadn't found it, until one of my own men reached the next lock and was on his way around the outside, which he is. Um-hmm. Uh Bach wanted him to keep talking. She was worried they would hear the sound of the knife as it slowly cut its way through the tough plastic. What you might like to know is that he has an infrared detector with him. We used it to track you inside. It makes your footprints glow. Even your suit loses heat enough through the boots to make the machine useful. It's a very good machine. Bach hadn't thought of that and didn't like it at all. It might have been best to take her chances trying to reach the next airlock. When the man arrived, he would quickly see that she had doubled back. Why are you telling me all this? she asked. The square was now bordered with shallow grooves, but it was taking too long. She began to concentrate just on the lower edge, moving the knife back and forth. Thinking out loud, he said with a self-conscious laugh. This is an exhilarating game, don't you agree? And you're the most skilled quarry I've pursued in many years. Is there a secret to your success? I'm with the police, Bach said. Your people stumbled into a stakeout. Ah, that explains a lot, he said almost gratefully. Who are you anyway, she asked. Just call me the bellman. When I heard you people had named me that, I took a fancy to it. Why, babies, that's the part I can't understand. 
Why veal? Why baby lamb chops? How should I know? I don't eat the stuff. I don't know anything about meat, but I know a good racket and a fertile market when I see them. One of my customers wants babies. That's what he gets. I can get any age. He sighed again. And it's so easy, we grow sloppy. We get careless. The work is so routine. From now on, we'll kill quickly. If we'd killed you when you got out of the tube, we'd have avoided a lot of bother. A lot more than you expect, I hope. Damn, why wasn't the knife through yet? She hadn't thought it would take this long. I don't understand, frankly, why you let me live as long as you did. Why lock me up, then come to kill me hours later? Greed, I'm afraid, the bellman said. You see, they were not coming to kill you. You overreacted. I was attempting to combine one business with another. There are uses for live pregnant women. I have many customers. Uses for live babies, too. We generally keep them for a few months. Bach knew she should question him about that, as a good police officer. The department would want to know what he did. Instead, she bore down on the knife with all her strength and nearly bit through her lower lip. "'I could use someone like you,' he said. "'You don't really think you can get away, do you? Why don't you think it over? We could make—' Peering down through the bubble, Bach saw the bellman look up. He never finished his offer, whatever it was. She saw his face for an instant, a perfectly ordinary face that would not have seemed out of place on an accountant or a bank teller, and had the satisfaction of seeing him realize his mistake. He did not waste time in regrets. He instantly saw his only chance, abandoned the people working on the lock without warning them, and began to run at full speed back into the cornfield. The bottom edge of the square parted at that moment. Bach felt something tugging on her hand, and she moved along the narrow ledge away from the hole. There was no sound as the sides of the square peeled back, then the whole panel broke free, and the material began to tear from each of the corners. The surface of the bubble began to undulate sluggishly. It was eerie. There was nothing to hear and little to see as the air rushed out of the gaping hole. Then suddenly storms of cornstalks, shorn of leaves and ears, erupted like flights of artillery rockets and flung themselves into the blackness. The stream turned white, and Bach could not figure out why that should be. The first body came through and sailed an amazing distance before it impacted in the gray dust. The place was a beehive of activity when Lisa Babcock arrived. A dozen police crawlers were parked outside the wall with dozens more on their way. The blue lights revolved silently. She heard nothing but her own breathing, the occasional terse comment on the emergency band, and the faint whirring of her legs. Five bodies were arranged just outside the wall, beside the large hole which had been cut to give vehicle access to the interior of the plantation. She looked down at them dispassionately. They looked about as one would expect a body to look, which had been blown from a cannon and then quick frozen. Bach was not among them. She stepped inside the dome for a moment, unable to tell what the writhing white coating of spongy material was, until she picked up a handful. Popcorn. It was twenty centimeters deep inside and still growing, as raw sunlight and vacuum caused the kernels to dry and explode. If Bach was in there, it could take days to find her body. She went back outside and began to walk along the outer perimeter of the wall, away from where all the activity was concentrated. She found the body face down in the shadow of the wall. It was hard to see. She had nearly tripped over it. What surprised her was the spacesuit. If she had a suit, why had she died? Pursing her lips, she grabbed one shoulder and rolled it over. It was a man, looking down in considerable surprise at the hilt of a chain knife growing from his chest, surrounded by a black, broken flower of frozen blood. Babcock began to run. When she came to the lock, she pounded on the metal door, then put her helmet to it. After a long pause, she heard the answering taps. It was another fifteen minutes before they could bring a rescue truck around and made it to the door. Babcock was in the truck when the door swung open and stepped through first by the simple expedient of elbowing a fellow cop with enough force to bruise ribs. At first, she thought that, against all her hopes, Bach was dead. She sprawled loosely with her back propped against the wall, hugging the baby in her arms. She didn't seem to be breathing. Mother and child were coated with dirt, and Bach's legs were bloody. 
She seemed impossibly pale. Babcock went to her and reached for the baby. Bach jerked, showing surprising strength. Her sunken eyes slowly focused on Babcock's face. Then she looked down at Joanna and grinned foolishly. Isn't she the prettiest thing you ever saw? Afterward. Finally, a word about editors. I can't recall ever meeting an author who didn't have a major or minor horror story about editors. John Bruner once told me that an editor took an entire major character out of one of his books, just deleted all the sentences that referred to that character. The book made no sense at all. John didn't discover this until the book was published. I said at the beginning that I feel I've been very lucky. One of the best things has been the editors I have worked with. I don't have a single editor horror story to tell. Oh, sure, they always need the galleys back yesterday, but that seems to be standard industry practice. Nothing anybody can do about it. When I was first getting started, Ed Furman at FNSF, Jim Bain at Galaxy, and George Sithers and later Gardner Dozois at Asimov's were always wonderful, as were Damon Knight, Terry Carr, and David Gerald. Later, when I started writing novels, I started off with two of the best in the business, Don Benson and Jim Frankel, then moved on to an all-too-short association with David Hartwell and John Silbersack. For many years now, my editor has been Susan Allison at Penguin, Putnam, Ace, Berkeley, Halliburton, Mitsubishi, or whatever they're calling the company these days. She is possibly the most patient editor in the world, and has never lost faith in me no matter how late I am turning in the manuscript. She edited the book you're holding right now, and wouldn't you know it, I finished these introductions a month late. John Varley, January 2004, Oceano, California End of The John Varley Reader, Thirty Years of Short Fiction By John Varley, J-O-H-N-V-A-R-L-E-Y Read by Jack Fox in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, May 2007. Published by Ace Books, the Berkeley Publishing Group. A trademark of Penguin Group, USA Incorporated. 375 Hudson Street, New York, New York, 10014. www.penguin.com Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.